Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. Each week at this time, the Kraft Cheese Company presents for your enjoyment, Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Evanson. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But right now, here's a message of very great importance for today's menu makers. I don't know how much you housewives actually know about modern margarine, but there's probably been no time in the history of America when it was so important for you to have the true facts about nourishing wholesome foods for your family. So I want to tell you about Parquet. Parquet is the new quality margarine made by Kraft, a delicious spread for bread, hot rolls, and toast. Now, of course, the fact that parquet does taste so good probably accounts for its popularity as a spread in millions of homes. But this is even more important. Parquet margarine is a protective food with exceptionally high nutritional value. It is one of the best energy foods you can serve and a reliable year-round source of vitamin A. There are 9,000 units of this vitamin in every pound of parquet. So tomorrow, ask your food dealer for a pound of parquet margarine made by Kraft. The whole family will like it because it tastes so good. And you'll know that you're giving them an economical, highly nutritious food made to the craft standards of quality. Just say Parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now for the adventures of the great Gildersleeve. Wistful Vista. You say this is, oh, Wistful Vista, where Pippa McGee and Molly live? Yes, madam. Oh, my. Do you think I'll be able to see them from the train window? No, lady, the McGees are on their vacation. Oh. But say, there's a next-door neighbor of theirs, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Where? Where? That portly gent with the mustache on the platform, the one making a speech to his employees. How do you know they're his employees? Because every time he goes away, he gives them an hour off to come down to the station and wave goodbye. Oh, so that's Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, I never thought... And furthermore, I can't tell you how touched I am to see all the employees of the Gildersleeve Girdle Works down here at the station to bid me goodbye. (laughs) It's indeed... Uh, By the way, is there anyone left at the plant? Uh, Well, uh, no. What if some orders come in? Who'll take the phone calls? Uh, Mert. Oh, Mert, eh? (laughs) As I was saying while I'm away, I expect every one of you to uphold Gildersleeve girdles to the best of your ability. And don't forget our motto. If you want the best of corsets, of course it's Gildersleeve. (laughs) Very good, T.P., very good. Thank you, thank you. You'll get a raise. <laughs> and though it's necessary for me to go away and attend to other enterprises, the one thing closest to my heart is the Gildersleeve girdle. How long will you be gone, T.P.? At least three days and maybe till the end of the week. Oh, <laughs> uh, before you go, T.P., the Gildersleeve Girdle Workers Guild wishes to present you with this handsome leather briefcase as a uh, token of our esteem for you. Yeah. Yeah. Me? I don't know what to say oh, except... Yes, all aboard? Oh, no. Oh, my goodness. Out of my way, everybody. Where are my bags? On the train, T.P. Thanks. I forgot to buy a ticket. Where do I buy a ticket? On the train, T.P. Oh, yes. Let go of me, boys. Where are you pushing me? On the train, T.P. Goodbye, children. Goodbye, children. your ticket, Mr. Gildersleeve. Sorry I haven't any berths left. Uh, couldn't you squeeze me in somewhere? I'll try, though it'll probably be a tight squeeze. <laughs> yeah, tight squeeze. <laughs> Side splitting, isn't it? Going to be in Summerfield long? Oh, no, just three or four days. I'm taking over the administration of my brother-in-law's estate. They're going to run it for my niece and nephew. Yeah, but that's quite involved, and I'm hungry. Which way is the diner? Why, an old, experienced traveler like you should know where the diner is. Huh? Oh, of course. No matter where you are, the diner's always at the other end of the train. <laughs> See you later. Oh? Uh. 
Excuse me, madam. <laughs> Yes, pretty crowded in this diner. By George, I'm so hungry I could eat the waiter. <laughs> yes, sir. Is it all right if I sit at this table? Uh, yes, sir. Sit right down, sir. If this gentleman doesn't mind reading his paper on his own side. I said if this gentleman doesn't mind reading his paper on his own side. Uh, excuse me, sir. Does you mind? Yes, I do. I'm particular whom I eat with. <laughs> you are, eh? Well, I'm not. I'm hungry. Waiter, bring me a steak. A nice, juicy, double tenderloin rare. Waiter, where's my milk toast? I ordered it 15 minutes ago. Yeah. I'm sorry, but milk toast takes time, you know. And, waiter, I want a big, heaping plate of French fries. Yeah, French fries. And a cup of strong coffee with lots of cream. Yeah, I'll get it right away. And bring me my milk toast made with gluten bread, remember? Yes. Bread. Oh, that reminds me. Some hot biscuits and a little pot of jam. Gluten bread toasted and a cup of hot water. Uh, and then apple pie a la mode with cheese. Yeah, with cheese. Yeah. I can't stand this. Listening to you is giving me heartburn. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is, huh? A uh, waiter. Uh, don't forget the steak sauce, ketchup, piccalilli, and relish. Bring me a glass of bicarbonate of soda, quick. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Right away, sir. I'll be back. Of course, it's none of my business, mister. Then don't stick your nose in it. You... <laughs> well, all right. That's the way you feel about it. I was just going to tell you you're getting your newspaper in the mustard. I don't use mustard. No, I guess you don't need any. <laughs> but what I was going to say was... Never mind, never mind, never mind. Okay, I won't say it then. But that mustard from your newspaper is all over your sleeve now. I don't care. What? Of oh, all the messes I... Uh, 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 water only spreads it. <laughs> you see what they tell you? I'll thank you to mind your own business. What's the big idea of jumping down my throat? What do you expect addressing a perfect stranger? You're far from perfect, stranger. <laughs> and from now on, I'm going to make a career out of ignoring you. Uh, here comes my food. That's pretty snappy service, waiter. Uh, yes, sir. Well, where's my milk toast? Yeah, I'm sorry, sir, but the chef, he's all out of glutton bread. <laughs> He wants to know, would pumpernickel do just as well? No, pumpernickel wouldn't do just as well. And why keep me waiting all the time while you serve this big buffalo the minute he sits down? Oh, no, look here, mister. I don't want to look here. I'm sick of the sight of you. The idea. An overstuffed ox like you, guttling and gobbling and gorging yourself like an ostrich. <laughs> I've got a bad case of indigestion already just from looking at you. Why, you dyspeptic little dodo. Just because you're mean to your stomach and your stomach talks back to you, you bellyache. Excuse the expression. <laughs> you're not suffering from indigestion. You're just green with Epicurean envy. I won't sit here. Uh, here's your bicarbonate of soda, mister. Take it away. Take it away. I need something stronger than that now. I've got some pills down here in my briefcase. Just a minute there. What are you doing with my briefcase? Your briefcase? This is mine. It is not. My employees gave it to me just this afternoon. Take your fat paws off of my briefcase before I... Before you watch, you dried up little crab apple. <laughs> and, and now, wait a minute, gentlemen, please. Let go of my briefcase. I will not. It's mine. Why, Why the idea is... Uh, uh, oh, yes, ma'am. Waiter. Waiter. Did you see anything of my briefcase? I left it... Oh, you gentlemen have it. Thank you so much. Well, for <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve, I've located a berth for you at last. Oh, that's fine, Conductor. I was getting tired of sitting around here in my pajamas. Where is it? It's uh, upper nine in the next car. Upper nine? Oh, my goodness. The last time I was in an upper berth was, uh, let me see, uh, 50 pounds ago. <laughs> the porter's making it up for you now. Yeah, thanks. I do hope that porter gives me a wide berth. Uh, 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 it's a dark in here. Oh, uh, Porter? Uh, Porter? Quiet! Yes. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Must be sleeping. Oh, Porter? Yes, sir. Have you got up or nine ready yet? Yes, but I didn't anticipate no gentlemen of such ample proportions. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe I'd better take a ladder. Yes, I'd better take two. They're small. <laughs> well, all right. Come on. Yeah, uh, here we are, right up there, sir. Up there? Mm. Oh, my goodness. Hold these ladders steady, Porter. Remember, if they tip, I won't. 
the hours. Now, be careful, mister. Train's coming to a sharp quiet pretty soon. When? Then. Oh! Hold on, mister. Let us I can't hold on. I'm coming down. Look out below. Oh! No! Oh. What hit me? Oh, my sacrilege. <laughs> Yeah, miss, uh, let me help you up. I don't want to get up. I want to sleep. Not you, miss. The man in Dapa. He's now in the lower. And where am I? You're right here, brother. Get off of my poor stomach. Who is it? Uh? Oh, it's you. What are you doing sneaking into my berth? I'm not sneaking into your... <laughs> I'm not sneaking. I'm trying to climb into bed. I'm your upstairs neighbor. <laughs> Isn't that nice? I hope that swinging shelf snaps shut on you. Oh, yeah. If it's going to swing, I'll see that it swings your way. And if I land on you again, brother, you'll spend the rest of the night sleeping in the road bed. Oh, quiet. Let me go to sleep. Okay, Grandpa. Unpleasant dreams. All right, Porter. Give me a leg up again, will you? Thirty-two thousand four hundred and seventy-three. Thirty-two thousand four hundred and seventy-four. Thirty-two thousand four hundred and seventy-five. Oh, my goodness. Two o'clock already and still not a wink. Yes, thirty-two thousand four hundred and seventy-six. Thirty-two thousand four hundred and seventy-eight. Oh, what's the use? It was only some way of stopping that buzzsaw down there. <laughs> I can't stand this any longer. Where's that porter? I'll fix this guy. Did you call me, sir? Uh, yes. Would you mind getting me a drink of ice water? I can't sleep. Uh, yeah, sir. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the water, mister. Uh, thank you. You needn't wait. <laughs> good night, good night, good night. Uh, good night, sir. Yes. Now, if I can hold this cup in this hand and open the lower curtain with it. Ah, uh, I've got it. Yeah. Steady now, Gildersleeve. Ready. Aim. <laughs> oh, no. What, what was that? Porter! Porter! <laughs> Shut this window, will you? It's raining right in on my face. Quiet! Can a man get any rest around here? <laughs> Good morning, sir. He's just pulling into Summerfield. You want me to brush you off? No, I'll walk down the steps like the rest of the passengers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, Porter, you've given me such good service. Here's an order for a gilded sleeve girdle for your wife. Uh, thank you, sir. I happen to be a spinster at the moment. <laughs> but if it's all right with you, I'll put in my hope, sir. Yes. <laughs> Yes, that's perfectly all right. Uh, Summerfield, eh? By George, I'm certainly looking forward to seeing Marjorie and little Leroy again. Why can't I, Marjorie? Huh? Why can't I call them T.P. like they do down at this foundry? It isn't a foundry, Leroy. It's a... Oh, never mind. It's nothing that concerns little boys. And I'm sure that he will prefer to have you call him Uncle Throckmorton. Oh, shucks. You can't go around calling a big, tough guy who runs a steel foundry Throckmorton. It's positively derogatory. It's derogatory. Yes, that too. <laughs> Leroy, 
Who told you Uncle Throckmorton was in the seal business? Nah, you thought you were so smart. I saw one of his letterheads. The Gildersleeve Girder Company. Hmm? <laughs> oh. Oh, yes. The Gildersleeve Girder Company. See, he should be here by now, shouldn't he, Marjorie? Now, don't you worry, Leroy. Just as soon as his train arrives, Mr. Wills will bring him here for breakfast. Oh, I wanted to go down to the station, too. I know, but Ted has to discuss all the legal details with Uncle Throckmorton before we go to court. Say, you're getting pretty darn stuck on that Ted guy, aren't you? Why, Leroy Forrester, I am not. Ted Wills is nearly our lawyer. He is not. Williams and Williams, Willies and Wills are our lawyers, and Ted's nothing but the tail end. <laughs> Well, he's young yet. You just give him time. Oh, there you go. Who oh, say, how's if I should call him Uncle Morton? Call who? Oh, Uncle Throckmorton. Well, I don't think he object to that. Wait, I can do better than that. How's this? Uncle Mort. Who's that? Uncle Mort. I'll answer it. Well, 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 I'll bet this is little Leroy. Hi, Uncle Mort. If I who? You, Uncle Mort. You don't mind if I call you Uncle Mort, do you, Uncle Mort? <laughs> no, not at all. Go right ahead. Uncle Mort, eh? <laughs> I like that. And this is Marjorie, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, Marjorie, eh? Uh, come here, my dear. <laughs> my, how you've grown. <laughs> Hello, Uncle Throckmorton. Let me take your hat and coat. Will you have some breakfast? Uh, no, thanks. I've already had mine on the... Well, I'll have a cup of coffee. <laughs> sit right here, Uncle. Ted, you sit over there. Oh, thanks. My, this looks wonderful. Hey, Uncle, will you take me back to Wistful Vista with you and let me work in your factory? Uh, what? Well, I didn't think you'd be interested in that sort of thing. Now, Leroy... Gee, I am, Uncle Mort. That must be some layout. I bet you make the supports for a lot of big projects there. <laughs> Uh, uh, we don't turn out anything much like uh, We sort of confine ourselves to uh, foundations uh, oh. uh, Say, I'd like to go along sometime when you install some of those foundations I don't have the... <laughs> what, what did you say, young man? Oh, uh, please excuse Leroy, Uncle Mort He's been like that ever since he found out that you owned the Gildersleeve Girder Company. What? Uh, the Gildersleeve Girder? Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, yes, I see it all now. <laughs> yes, a bright boy. <laughs> Gee, Uncle, Uncle, do you ever have to slug it out with any of them tough steel workers of yours? Uh, no, no, I never do. You don't, huh? Uh, oh, well, of course, uh, there have been times when I've had to put uh, more snap into their work. <laughs> Yes. Once I was so angry, I picked up a badly made uh, foundation and bounced it right off the foreman's head. <laughs> you did? Yeah. Oh. Now, Leroy, let uh, your uncle eat his breakfast. Yeah. Have some toast, Uncle Mort? Uh, no, thanks. Oh, uh, speaking of toast reminds me of an amusing incident on the train last night. Uh, you'll enjoy this, Leroy. When I went into the diner, the only empty chair was at a table with a sour little crab. And you should have heard that little rat yell when the ice water hit him in the face. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's time we leave for court, Mr. Gildersleeve. It is? Uh, come on, kids. This won't take long. Well, all I can say is we run things better than this in Whistle Vista. Eleven o'clock and the judge hasn't even shown up yet. Judge Hooker's usually very prompt. Yes, the trouble with some of these judges is they think they're little tin gods. Take those black robes away from them and what have they got? Bow legs. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, that's a hot one, Uncle Moore. Yeah, I'm glad you like it. Everyone rise, please. Ah, at last. Superior Court, Department 25, the Uncle Hitter, they took a judge for signing is now in session. Be seated. Sit down, Uncle Moore. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Who's that man sitting in the judge's chair? Why, that's Judge Hooker. Judge Hooker? That's the man in the lower berth. <laughs> Gildersleeve for appointment as of State of Ray Forrester. Oh, that's us. Come on, Mr. Gildersleeve. I'm not feeling very well, Ted. <laughs> uh, couldn't we postpone this over to another judge? Oh, come on, Uncle Mort. Remember what you said. This guy will be a pushover. Yes, a pushover. Oh, come on, come on. Step up. Don't dawdle. I am 
and got all day. Make a snappy, folks. The judge is pretty short temper this morning. He didn't get any sleep last night. Oh, my. <laughs> Uh, Your Honor, with your permission, I'll put Mr. Gildersleeve on the stand first. Go ahead, Mr. Wills. Swear in the witness, Beth. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, help you? I do. (laughs) Well, do you or don't you speak up? I do. That voice is very familiar. (laughs) Turn around, Mr. Oh, so it's you. Yes. Uh, Hello, Judge. (laughs) Mr. Wills. Yes, Your Honor. I will examine this man's qualifications if you don't mind. I don't, Your Honor. But I do. Silence. (laughs) Now then, Gildersleeve, what do you do for a living? I make girdles, Your Honor. (laughs) Order in the court. Order in the court. Order in the court. Order. Order. And you, Gildersleeve, any more cheap humor and I'll judge you in contempt. But it's true, Your Honor. I'm the president of the Gildersleeve Girdle Company. Uncle Moore, tell him the truth. He doesn't make girdles, Judge. And what does he do? Steal foundations. I bet he would, too. (laughs) Now, no more interruptions, my boy. Remember, this is a courtroom. You realize who I am, of course. Sure, and you're a bow-legged little tin god. Yeah. Wow. Howdy, Roy. But, but you just said so yourself, Uncle Morton. Oh, you did. Uh, just a little joke, Your Honor. You know how I kid. Uh, I know. Uh. Well, I'm going to ask you a plain question, and I want a plain answer. Uh. What business are you in? Well, I... Uh, oh, uh, that is... Uh, Leroy, would you mind going out into the hall and get me some uh, some ice water? One moment. Who's running this court? You or I? Better not get Uncle Mort mad, Judge. Last night he threw a whole bucket of water on a guy in the bus under him. Oh, my. Here we go again. <laughs> he did, did he? Yeah. And this poor sap woke up and thought it was raining. Oh. <laughs> you ought to hear Uncle Mort tell him. <laughs> Thanks, I will. Let's hear all about it, Uncle Mort. What, Judge Hooker? It's after five o'clock. This poor man's been on the witness stand all day. All right, all right. One more question, then I'll hand down my decision. Mr. Gildersleeve, what makes you think that you have executive ability? Well, I have a large staff of my own. And through years of experience, I know the proper relationship between employer and employee. Your Honor. Yes, Mr. Wells? Our firm has thoroughly investigated Mr. Gildersleeve, and we're satisfied as to his qualifications. Uh Mr. Wells, I have great respect for you and your associates. That is probably the only reason why I'm going to grant your petition. However... In order to protect these children from their own misguided enthusiasm, I'm going to require this Gildersleeve to report to me every single week. Uh, But, Your Honor... He must get an okay for every cent that he spends. But, Judge... And I will require him to post a bond of $50,000 in cash. Now, see here, Hooker. (laughs) I won't stand for this. I'll resign. Quiet. Gildersleeve, I never sent for you. You came here begging for this job. To quote from Brawby versus Union Buggy Corporation, Civil Court of Nebraska, you made your bed and you can't lie out of it. But my business in Wistful Vista... You remain here and make this estate pay or go to jail for contempt. Now, wait a minute. I'm not going to... Court is adjourned. I'll kill that old goat. (laughs) Ted, we've got to do something about this. Do you realize that a $50,000 bond would not only take every cent of my ready cash, but also means a mortgage on my Gordel Works? <laughs> Gee, I'm sorry about how the whole thing went, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, maybe if we went into the judge's chambers, we could persuade him to lower the bond, Uncle Moore. Sure, just let me talk to him. Young man, you've talked enough for one day. Well, how about it, Ted? Well, it won't hurt to try. Come on. Yeah. Come in. Uh, excuse us, Judge Hooker. Uh, you remember me, don't you? <laughs> I, I thought perhaps maybe we could possibly get that little cash bond reduced. I don't see why I should have... If you spoke to somebody who'd known me for a long time, they might convince you that I'm not such a bad fellow. <laughs> oh, that would be fine, Uncle Moore. Yeah. Who could the judge talk to? Why, uh, the president of the Whistle Vista Chamber of Commerce. He's my next-door neighbor, too. That chap named Fibber McGee. We can call him long distance, Your Honor. <laughs> Yes, yes, I see, Mr. McGee. 
Yes, I'm glad you put me straight on that. Yes, I knew my little chum would set me in right. That's a very good point. Leroy, I want you to meet McGee one of these days. There's one of nature's noblemen. I guess you've made up my mind for me, Fibber. Yeah, Fibber. <laughs> Hold the phone a second, and I'll tell him. Gildersleeve. Uh, yes, Judge? Gildersleeve, I've decided to rescind that $50,000 bond. Uh, I knew that would happen if you spoke to my little pal. Yes, after talking to McGee, I'm going to make that bond $100,000. What? Give me that telephone. Hello? You're a hard man, McGee. <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. While Uncle Throck recovers from that one, I want to say a word that I believe will make every thinking housewife want to try parquet margarine tomorrow. This delicious new craft product is most popular as a spread for bread and a seasoning for hot cooked foods because of its delicate, pleasing flavor. But the same qualities that make it so good for table use make it an extra fine shortening for baking. I say extra fine because it has all the qualities of an ordinary shortening plus fine flavor and added nourishment. Let me read you a statement from Mrs. Lillian Watts, who, having been born and raised on a farm, is mighty particular about food. She says, quote, I have a family of eight, and they all like parquet margarine. I use it in various ways, cakes, bread, muffins, biscuits, soup, spreads, and other ways too numerous to mention. Thank you a thousand times for this wonderful product. End of quote. Now, that's a mighty enthusiastic statement. But you'll be just as enthusiastic once you have tried parquet. It's so delicious, so nourishing, so grand in every way. Tomorrow, be sure to order parquet, the economical spread made by Kraft. And remember, every pound of parquet margarine contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. George Leroy, I'm going to show that judge I can run that estate, or my name won't be Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. You better won't, Uncle Mort. You won't even have a name. Yeah, no. I'll just have a number. Good night, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Original music on tonight's program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon saying good night for Kraft and reminding you to tune in again next week at the same time to hear the further adventures of the great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. (laughs) 
Each week at this time, the Kraft Cheese Company presents for your enjoyment Harold Terry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from The Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But right now, here's an important message for you. Probably all of you are aware of the efforts of our government to make us a healthier, more vigorous nation by improving our diets. Yes, food, proper nutrition, is as important these days as airplanes. And that's why you should know about parquet margarine, made by Kraft. It's not only a delicious spread for bread, it's also rich in nourishing food elements your whole family needs. Of course, most people like parquet margarine because it tastes so good spread on bread, hot rolls, or toast. But health-conscious housewives also use parquet because it's a protective food of exceptionally high nutritional value. Yes, parquet margarine is one of the best energy foods you can serve. And to make its natural, wholesome goodness even better for you, Kraft adds 9,000 units of vitamin A to every pound of parquet, making it a reliable year-round source of this important vitamin. Why not ask your food dealer for parquet margarine tomorrow? One taste will tell you it's a superior product made to Kraft's exacting standards of quality. Yes, you'll like its flavor, and you'll like its economy, too. Just say parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Last week, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, Fibber McGee's next-door neighbor, left Wistful Vista to become the legal guardian of his niece and nephew, Marjorie and Leroy Forrester, in the city of Summerfield. Relaxing after a hard week's work as father, mother, and big brother to the pair, we find the great Gildersleeve explaining the finer points of baseball to Leroy. Now, as a result of that play, Leroy, we have a member of our team on each base. You understand? Yeah, the bags are loaded. Yeah. Come on, gang! Yoo-hoo! Uh, Now, Leroy, don't get so excited. Remember, this is only a baseball game. Why, you robber? Uh, As I was saying, Leroy, we mustn't give way to our emotions. No, sir, Uncle Mort. Yes. Let's remember to be sportsmen. Get an umpire. Always give the other fellow the benefit of the doubt, Leroy. Right three, your grandmother. Oh, shut up, you big wind bag. I am not. The umpire's nothing but a horse thief. Or Steve? Hey, I'm sorry, sir, but I've warned you before. Everybody's complaining. What do you mean, everybody? I'm not complaining, am I? Hey, Jesse James, where's your horse? Uh, we can't tolerate this any longer. Now, you'll have to get out. All right, we'll get out. Come on, Leroy. We've seen this newsreel three times already anyway. <laughs> hey, don't forget your cap. <laughs> Careful stepping on people's feet. Hey, Uncle Morris. If you'll give me an advance on next week's allowance, I'll treat you to an ice cream cone. Yeah. No, thanks, Leroy. It's time we go home and fix up for that tea party your sister's giving at 5 o'clock. Oh, gee, do we have to go to be at that sissy party? Well, I'm afraid so, Leroy. Marjorie seems to think a lot of young Ted Wills. Yeah, they're stuck on each other, all right. But why drag us into it? Well, now that I'm guardian for you two, she wants me to meet Ted's parents under the proper social circumstances. Couldn't you just bump into them someplace, like in the butcher shop? Uh, you mean meet them in the meat market? <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm afraid it's too late for that. Uh, Marjorie's worked awfully hard preparing for this afternoon, and she must be all ready by now. Come on, Leroy. Now, that's all taken care of. Oh, Bertie. Yes, Miss Marge. Will you please put the cake in the back of the pantry while I fold? Yes, ma'am. My, you sure work hard, and it sure is pretty. <laughs> That's my big surprise, and I don't want anything to happen to it. County Courthouse. Judge Hooker, please. One moment. Hooker speaking. What is it? Hello, Judge Hooker. This is Marjorie Forrester. You remember me, don't you? Well, should I? Well, of course. Just last week, you appointed my uncle as guardian for my brother and me. I did? Who is your uncle? Rock Morton P. Gildersleeve. Who? Gildersleeve? Two years in the state penitentiary. What? Oh, I'm in the courtroom, my dear, uh, sentencing a prisoner. What'd you call about? Oh, 
I'd like to have you come to tea this afternoon so you and Uncle Moore can get to be better friends. How can we get to be better friends when we hate each other's... Uh, when we hate each other to begin with? Oh, now, Judge, I planned this as a surprise for Uncle Moore. Oh, going to surprise him, eh? Mm-hmm. All right, I'll come. And when he sees me, won't all of his chins drop? <laughs> Oh, Bertie, Judge Hooker's coming. Won't Uncle Mort be pleased? And some says yes, and some says no. Oh, oh, look at the time. I'm late for my manicure appointment. And I'll walk as far as the store with you. I got some things to pick up. Oh, I do hope everybody will like my cake, all right. <laughs> they sure will, honey. It's just simply scrimmage. Oh, thanks, Bertie. It's got to be good. Ted's mother is so discriminating and critical. Yes, and she keeps her nose up in the air like she ain't been introduced to what she's smelling. <laughs> Never mind, Bertie. <laughs> Let's go out the back way. It's quicker. Oh, uh, Marjorie, uh, we're back. Uh, hello, anybody home? Uh, Leroy, I don't believe anybody's home. Doggone it, I thought we could get something to eat. It's been a long time since lunch. Yes, at least two hours. <laughs> I suppose we rummage around in the kitchen. There's bound to be something here. I usually look in the pantry first. Ah, the voice of experience. Well, here's a lot of canned goods we could open. Uh, kitchen cleanser, tennis balls, shellac, motor oil. <laughs> Just call out if there's anything you like. <laughs> Crunchy cornies. Some genuine New England chopped suey sauce. Hey, what's that in the back of the cupboard, Uncle Morris? Where? Oh, boy, a cake. Say, hey, it's lucky you saw this. It's a honey. Looks good enough to eat. Well, then what are we waiting for? Here's a knife. Uh, one moment, Leroy. This cake hasn't been started yet. I don't think we should cut into it. Oh, it won't hurt to take one piece, Uncle Mort. Well, maybe not. But remember, just a piece a piece. Okay, here's the knife. Yeah. Thanks. Here you are. Hmm. Is that so? Mm. Well, excuse me while I try my piece. Uh, yes, sir. My fine cake. <laughs> That's the end of it. Yeah, stuffy in here, isn't it? Stuffy in where? Yeah, I see what you mean. Hello, Mr. Gilkley. Oh, uh, hello, Bertie. Oh, there you are, Leroy. Messing around the kitchen for some heat, I speculate. Who, me? I don't want anything to eat. Not now. Yeah. Good. You saved your appetite for the tea party. Your sister done whipped together the most delectable cake. Mm-hmm. Yes, we know of her, yes. Mm-hmm. She did it because it's important to impress Mr. Will's mother that she's a good housewife. Uh. <laughs> Looks like Mr. Will's going to get a house and a wife. Oh, I see. <laughs> uh, yes, Miss Marge worked her pretty fingers to the bone, baking all day. That's the surprise she's been talking about. Uh. Uh-uh. Did... Now, you want to take a peek at it? I'll show you. No, 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 no. <laughs> Oh, but she got it so beautifully redecorated. Uh, now, Bertie, don't go spoiling the surprise. It ain't go spoil nothing. Oh, yes, it would. Leroy, isn't there something Bertie could go to the store after? After when? If... I mean, uh, Bertie, would you mind running down to the cigar store and getting me some, uh, some, uh, punchinillo panatellas? But I got work to do. Leroy can get them. Oh, no, he's a miner. They won't sell him. I mean, uh... <laughs> Here's a dollar. Get a whole box. But, Mr. Gillis, please. Hurry now, hurry. They may sell out. Remember, uh, Punchinello Panatella. Yes. Yeah. Hi, George. That isn't a bad name for a cigar, seeing that I just made it up. <laughs> it, oh, my goodness, Leroy. Why didn't you stop me from eating that cake? Boy, are we going to catch it when Marge gets back? Yeah. Uh, what do you say we take a short walk till about bedtime? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's very good. No. No. We've got to face the consequences. Not me, Uncle Mort. I'll see you later. Come back here, young man. You don't see me running away. I'm going to stick my chin out and take it. That's not your chin sticking out, Uncle Moore. Never mind. <laughs> uh, Leroy, we've got to find some way to get an exact duplicate of that cake before that party starts. Come on, Oh, my. Who's that? That's old lady Snoop who lives next door. Oh. She's worse than an earache, Uncle Moore. I don't know the lady, Leroy, but I'm sure you're mistaken. 
Well, I'll just see what Mrs. Snoop wants. No, no, Uncle, her name isn't... Ah, how do you do, Mrs. Snoop? Uh, Mrs. Snoop? Oh, uh, this is Miss Dinwiddie, Uncle. But you said... Oh, I'm so glad to meet you, Mr. Gildersleeve. I'm the girl who lives next door. Yes. Your niece, Marjorie, told me so much about you. I feel we're practically old friends. <laughs> Uncle Mort. <laughs> yes. Is, uh, is Marjorie here? Well, I... Uh, no, no, I remember seeing her go down the street half an hour ago through my front curtain. Uh... <laughs> You'd be surprised at all that I see through them. Yes. I see what you meant, Leroy. Uh, well, uh, anyway, I was looking for Marjorie, but I suppose you'll do instead. Uh, I will? Oh, well, what for, Miss... Uh... Dinwiddie. Yes. Henrietta Dinwiddie. Yes. With an N, not an M. And the accent's on the witty, not on the din. What do you want me for, Mrs. Uh, Dinwiddle? Oh, you'd be surprised, Mr... Oh, I mean, I just dropped in to get a cup of sugar. Why, of course. Uh, Leroy, where's the sugar? Where's the cup? Yes. Oh, dear, imagine me. Oh, I forgot to bring one. I guess I'll just have to borrow a cup, too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, now, now, Mr. Gildersleeve, you'll have to excuse a poor little flustered bachelor girl. Yes. No, Leroy, not the lump sugar, the granulated, just like I always borrow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, as I was saying, it isn't often that I get to meet such a handsome man with dark curly hair and merry brown eyes. <laughs> Here's your sugar. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you, Leroy. Uh, well, it was it was so nice being introduced to you, Mr. Gildersleeve. And don't you worry about the sugar. You'll be getting it back sooner than you expect. <laughs> oh, that old hen, she makes me sick. Me too. Yeah, and a couple of weeks ago, Marjorie showed her a picture of you, and she said you look like Ronald Coleman. Yeah. Ronald Coleman, eh? Yeah. Can you imagine that silly day? Leroy, this is a free country. A lady's entitled to her opinion. <laughs> Uh, uh, better put the sugar back. Oh, wait a minute. They use sugar in baking cakes, don't they? Sure. Leroy, I know how we can save Marjorie's party. How? Bake her another cake. Uh, can you bake a cake, Uncle Mort? Yes, I don't know. I never tried. <laughs> but it ought to be simple. After all, millions of women bake cakes every day. We ought to be able to do anything they can do. Yeah, what do you mean, we? I'm not going to get mixed up in no sissy proposition like that. Uh, but, Leroy, there's nothing sissy about baking. Uh, look at the cowboys who bake their own sourdough bread. And the Indians grinding their own corn into corn fritters. Uh, and the cooks in the Navy making uh, sea biscuits. <laughs> well, I, I guess you're right. Yes, well, let's get started. Uh, should we use a cookbook or make it up as we go along? Well, it should be a cookbook in one of these drawers. Yeah. Uh, here's one right here. Uh, cooking in six easy lessons or the bride's best friend. <laughs> well, let me see now. Here's one. A mocha coca tapioca cake. Oh. Sounds too complicated. Tomato soup cake with gumdrop icing. Gee, Uncle Mort, don't they make cake out of cake anymore? Uh, I guess not. Uh, look at this picture, Leroy. Doesn't it look like the cake we ate? Yeah, Lady Baltimore cake. Yes, that's it. Now all we got to do is copy this one. Okay, what do we do? Uh, first, uh, three cups of sifted cake flour. We got any cake flour? Nope. Here's some buckwheat flour. Well, I doubt if there's any difference. <laughs> Uh, next, uh, three teaspoons of baking powder. Uh, here's a box of baking soda. Uh, is, is it powdered? Yeah, it is. Uh, that's what they must have meant anyway. <laughs> now, uh, salt, shortening, sugar, half a cup of milk. Used all of today's milk, and yesterday's is sour. Fine. My mother always used sour milk in her cakes. It'll give it that old-fashioned sour taste. <laughs> uh, uh, teaspoon of vanilla and six egg whites. Hard boiled or post? Uh, no, Leroy, raw. It's easier to separate the white from the yellow if they're hard-boiling, Uncle Morse. Leroy, this is no picnic. Now, you sift the flour, the baking powder, and the salt together. Here, use this sifter. Okay. And I'll take the other stuff. Beat egg whites until stiff, it says. Who, me, or the eggs? Hey, hey, Uncle Morse. Uh, yes? This sifter leaks. It leaks? <laughs> Oh, oh, yes, and look at the flour on the floor. Uh, get some more, Leroy. <laughs> Wait, I know how we can speed things up. We'll just dump all the ingredients in the electric mixer. Oh, that's a swell idea. Yes, it takes a man to figure out all the shortcuts in life. Uh, let's just pour everything into the bowl. There. Shall I turn on the mixer now, Uncle Morris? Yeah. Excuse me. Oh, my goodness, Bertie. She must have seen this mess. I'll get rid of her. You stay here. 
Uh, well, Bertie, uh, did you get me those uh, Punchinello Panatellas? Not exactly, Mr. Gillsleeve. I've been to seven stores looking for them cigars, and three of them was fresh out, whilst the other four have them in the morning. <laughs> they will, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Now, I better be getting back in the kitchen. Yes. Oh, no, no. I mean, uh, I've got to have those cigars, Bertie. Oh, well, maybe after I finish my work in the kitchen. It'd be worth a dollar to me to get those cigars now. Huh? It would? Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe in that case I could. Uh, uh, what's that? Uh, I suppose it's a truck coming up the hill. <laughs> there ain't no hill around here. Sounds like my electric mixing machine in distress. I better go see. Uh, go ahead if you want to lose that three dollars. What three dollars? Uh, for bringing back those cigars. Does I get it in advance? Yeah, yes. <laughs> Here you are, Bertie. Uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> I'll just go on out the back way. It's quicker. No, no, no. <laughs> use the front door. It's bad luck to use the back door uh, when you're buying cigars. Take your time, Bertie. Hey, goodbye. <laughs> wow. That was a close shave. Hey, Uncle Boy! Oh, sounds like the boy's in trouble. Uh, coming, Leroy. Hey, right, don't come out. The boy's go back. I can't hear you. What's wrong with the mixer? It's throwing the cake back all over. Oh, my goodness, turn it off. I can't, I got better in my eyes. Well, I will then. I'm not going to be intimidated by any... Oh! Get you in the kisser, Uncle. Right in the pan. Where's that switch, Leroy? Well, watch your fingers, Uncle Mark. I think I've got it now. Yes. Oh. Yes. Oh, what a mess. Here's a towel, Leroy. Wipe the cake out of your eyes. Oh, jumping jelly beans. There's that woman from next door again. Oh, don't let her in here, Uncle Mort. She'll blab everything to Marge. Don't worry. I'll get rid of that gargoyle. <laughs> hey, coming, Miss Dunwoody. Ah, there you are. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, I bet you think I'm an awful pest. Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> but I wonder if I could trouble you for an egg. Uh, an egg? Yes, an egg. Uh, chicken's hometown. <laughs> I, I know just where Marjorie keeps them, so if you don't mind... Uh, don't I'll... trouble yourself. Uh, uh, Leroy, hand me out an egg, please. How do you want it? Hard-boiled or poached? In the shell. <laughs> Bright boy. <laughs> Lovely weather we're having, isn't it? Yes. It's perfect weather for a ride in the country. I just love to pack a picnic basket and go Here's out... Here's your egg. Uh, thanks, uh, Leroy. <laughs> yes, thanks, Leroy. Thanks very much. Uh, goodbye, Miss Dunworthy. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. <laughs> Did you brush her off, Hunk? No, she's walking down the steps. <laughs> yeah, let's hurry with the cake. All we have to do is pour the batter into the pan. Fine, but before I mess myself up anymore, I'm going to put on Bertie's bungalow apron. Help me into it, Leroy. Oh, but gee, Uncle Moore. Hold it up higher, Leroy. Fine. Now run around the back and tie the strings. <laughs> Oop, uh, not so tight, my boy. That's it. <laughs> you sure look funny, Uncle Mort. <laughs> oh, Front doorbell. What kind of a house is this? Leroy, see if you can get that cake into the oven. I'm going to answer the door. Oh, but Uncle, that apron! It's all right. It's dark in the hallway. That's right. Waste the electricity. Ah, ha, ha. Good afternoon, madam. Do you sag and slump over heavy scrubbing? Uh, Have you got that dishwashing droop? Droop, droop. Are you proud of the shape you're in? Uh, I'll see here. <laughs> you nearsighted little nincompoop. Bad cold you have there, madam. Now, I've got a girdle here that's the answer to all your prayers. It's a gilded sleeve glamour girdle. It'll keep you in, but you'll never wear it out. <laughs> yes, sir. Now, as a special inducement, I've persuaded old man Gildersleeve to cut the price of this girdle to $3.99. You persuaded old man Gildersleeve, eh? Yeah, sure. You'd be surprised how palsy walsy I am with the old fuddy duddy. <laughs> <laughs> Why of all this? I know, but you should do something about that coal lady. Now, madam, if you'd care to try on... No, no, I happen to own... You already own a Gildersleeve girdle? Yes. Very good. But have you got a spare? Mister, you'd be surprised how many Gildersleeve girdles I have to spare. Good day. (laughs) Of all the interruptions. How's the cake doing, Leroy? Oh, swell, Uncle Mort. It looks better every time I open the oven door. Splendid. Now, who's that? A man can't even bake a cake around here. All right, all right, I'm coming. Now, see here, you... See what, Mr. Gildersleeve? Oh, oh, hello, Judge Hooker. (laughs) Come in. This is quite a surprise. That's what it was meant to be. What are you doing in the apron? Playing house? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's very funny. No, I'm not playing house. Hey, Uncle Mort, I just took the cake out of the oven. Oh, sh... Oh, boy, does it look swell. Oh, hello, 
Judge Hooker. What are you doing here? Hello, Leroy, my boy. What have you and your uncle been up to now? Why, we Yeah, uh, Nothing at all, Your Honor. Uh, Leroy, time to get cleaned up. And my, look at me, I'm a mess. Yes. I'll go with you, Leroy. Uh, make yourself at home, Judgey. But I came early just to ask you two a few questions. We'll be back, Your Honor. Something funny going on around here. It smells like a cake I'm smelling. I better see what they've been doing in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. A layer cake. Looks like it would taste good, too. I wish I wasn't on that darn diet. I'd take a piece. <laughs> Not that one piece would hurt me. I, George, I believe I will. <laughs> Good cake. I think I'll have another piece. Ah, oh, there you are, Your Honor. <coughs> uh, oh, that's a bad cough you got there. Here, let me get you a glass of water. Oh, you've been eating our nice new cake. And after I worked my fingers to the bone... Oh, my goodness, I'm getting sick. By George, you are white around the gills. That cake, that cake, I ate some. Uh, no good, eh? Uh, now, uh, my pills, pills, I left them home. You better take me there now. Oh, why did I ever take up baking? Uh, Leroy, Leroy! I better throw this cake out of the window. There. Farewell, Lady Baltimore. Oh. You want me, Uncle Morris? Yes, call me a cab, quickly. Gee, what's wrong with the judge? I've got to take him home. He's suffering from a bad attack of uh, Lady Baltimore. What can I do for you, sir? I happen to see that big cake in your shop window. I'd like to buy it. Uh, but that's a wedding cake. Yeah, I know, but it could pass for a party cake if we knock off the bride and groom. Uh, how much do you want for it? Well, I'm sorry. I couldn't sell it to you. Oh, baked it for a wedding, eh? But they'll just have to get married tomorrow. Oh, but really, mister, I couldn't let you... You couldn't, huh? Here's a $10 bill. Now do I get that cake? Well, if you insist... Never mind wrapping it. I've got a taxi outside. Just hand it here. Yeah, thanks. Now open the door, will you? Yeah. Goodbye. Oh, Mama! I just made a big sale. A man bought that wedding cake we've had in the window for the last two years. Psst. Uh, Leroy, anybody in the kitchen with you? No, come on in. Uh, Did you find a cake? Did I? Take a look. Oh, boy, that's a dilly. Not bad, eh? Who says you can't eat your cake and have it, too? Excuse <laughs> me. Oh, that's Miss Dinwiddie again. Uh, Leroy, put this cake in the pantry while I answer the door. I'll strangle that old seagull. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, you must think I'm terrible running in and out all the live long day. Yes. <laughs> and borrowing things all the time. Well, uh, it's because the road to a man's heart is through his stomach. And if that's the case, why, your road, uh, it's uh, so wide. It's, I, uh, well, I mean, I... Well, uh, what do you want yeah. this time? Oh, it's nothing, really. I Well, I just brought you something I baked for you with my own little hands. A cake. Well, thank you just the same, Miss Dinwitted. But I have a cake. A great, big, beautiful $10 cake. And furthermore, I'm fed up on cake. Goodbye. That takes care of that. Oh, Uncle Moore. Uh, I'm looking all over for you. Come in the living room and meet everyone. I'm about to serve the cake I baked this afternoon. The uh, cake. Oh, yes. Uh, Marjorie... There's something deep down inside of me that's weighing heavily on my conscience. What is it? It's your cake. I ate it. But, Uncle Mort, how could you? Uh, Leroy, help me. Oh, Uncle... Oh, Uncle Throckmorton, what'll I do now? Uh, don't worry, honey. I went out and got the biggest and best-looking cake money could buy. Oh, but I couldn't deceive you. It, it's all right. What they don't know won't hurt them. Now, let's go in and meet the folks, huh? Oh, there he is, Mr. Gillsleeve. Yeah, I got him for you. Uh, got what for me, Bertie? Them Punchinella Panatellas. Uh, the man, he didn't have none in stock, but he rolled them while I waited, and it cost $8 a box. Oh, my. <laughs> More expense. Well, never mind that now. Uh, Bertie, get that big cake out of the pantry and you serve it. And remember, no matter how different it looks, that's the one Miss Marjorie baked. Who? Huh? Yeah, come on, Marjorie. <laughs> Oh, yes. Here comes Mrs. Wills. Uh, Wills. Oh, Mrs. Wills, I want you to meet my uncle, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, charmed, Mrs. Wills. <laughs> Excuse me for being tardy, but I had to take home a friend who was suffering from a sick cake. I mean, a sick headache. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, speaking of cakes, Marjorie, Ted has told me about the angel food cake you've baked. Uh, angel food? 
But I thought it was more of a Lady Baltimore cake, like they serve at weddings. Oh, really, Mr. Gildersleeve? They don't serve Baltimore cakes at weddings. Not even in Maryland? <laughs> well, no matter what kind of a cake Marjorie bakes, it's always delicious. Oh, now, Uncle Moore. Uh, just wait, Mrs. Wills, till you sink your teeth into this one. Ah, Bertie's bringing it in now. Well, 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 oh, my, it, it looks quite professional, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, I don't believe a pastry chef could do any better. <laughs> hey, go ahead, Marjorie, you cut it. Oh, you cut the first slice, Uncle Mort. Huh? After all, if it weren't for you, we wouldn't be eating this cake. I see what you mean. Uh, <laughs> hey, give me the knife, Bertie. You. Uh, oh. Uh, uh, well. Uh, frosting's a little thick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, dull knife. Uh, Bertie, haven't we got a sharper knife? No, Mr. Gillsley, but we've got an axe. <laughs> Never mind, I'll manage with this. Uh, oh, oh uh, careful, Uncle Morton. Slip off the table. What? Oh, my goodness, it's made out of plaster of Paris. <laughs> Greg Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a minute. But first, I want to tell you something that should make every quality-wise and economy-minded housewife want to try parquet margarine first thing tomorrow. Here it is. Now you can have a high-quality product made by Kraft that's so downright good as a spread for bread, toast, or rolls that you'll want to use it lavishly as a seasoning for hot vegetables, a shortening for baking, and for pan frying, too. Yes, that quality Kraft product is parquet margarine. It tastes so good that you'll want to use lots of it at the table and for cooking. And it costs so little, you can use all you want without being extravagant at all. Yes, use all you want for baking. Remember, parquet is a real flavor shortening that makes better tasting cakes and cookies. Here's what one user says about parquet margarine. I'll read you a few lines from a letter from Mrs. Emma Hartman of Cave Town, Maryland. Now, we didn't ask Mrs. Hartman for this letter. She was so enthusiastic about parquet, she just had to tell us about it. Quote, I would like to tell you how well I like parquet. I use it for everything I want to be especially nice because of fine flavor, unquote. You see, the secret of parquet's popularity is its delicious flavor. And housewives with an eye to food value like it because it's such a nourishing energy food that contains plenty of vitamin A. Yes, every pound of parquet margarine contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. So you know it's not only good tasting, but good for you, too. Dinwiddie. Yes? Oh, you're angry. You took me seriously when you when I was just kidding. Well, really, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, that cake you baked for me. Uh, some people just dropped in at our place, and that cake would just about save the day for me, Angel, a cake. <laughs> oh, oh, it would? Yes. Oh, well, then, take it by, by all means. Oh, Miss Dinwiddie, you're an angel. I'm so happy I could kiss you. Oh, oh, oh Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, that is, I... I didn't quite mean. Uh, it was so nice of you. Say, where are you going? In to bake you another cake. Oh, my. Oh. Good night. <laughs> Music was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for the further adventures of The Great Gilders. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. <laughs> Each
Each week at this time, the Kraft Cheese Company presents for your enjoyment, Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, let me remind you that fall is coming in winter, too. And when chilly winter weather really comes, your family is going to need plenty of wholesome, nourishing energy food. Now, one reliable and economical source of energy is parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Yes, this delicious new margarine called parquet is a protective food of high nutritional value. And to make it even better for you, Kraft adds important vitamin A to parquet margarine's natural goodness. 9,000 units to every single pound. Now, of course, all this wholesome food value wouldn't do much good if your family didn't like parquet margarine. Well, we think they will. Thousands of American families do. Yes, they like parquet margarine's delicate, satisfying flavor for table use, for baking, and for pan frying. Best of all, parquet margarine is economical, yet it's made by Kraft to the same high standards as all Kraft food products. But why not find out for yourself? Yes, why not try a pound or two of wholesome, nourishing parquet margarine tomorrow? Just ask for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now for the adventures of the great Gildersleeve. Yes, and now I'll check the grocery bill. Nine and nine is 18, and eight is 28. Uh, no, 26. And seven is, uh, let me see, 33 and five is... Uh, what are you doing, Uncle 33 Moore? and... Uh, oh, now I've lost my place. Sorry, I disturbed you. Yeah, that's all right, Marjorie. I was just checking your household expenses. Part of my job is guardian for you and Leroy, you know. But we never had any trouble with little things like that before. We never had to count a Judge Hooker before either. Why, that dyspeptic little judicial blunder. Oh, now, Uncle Moore. I'll let you get on with your work. Yes. Yes, I'll have to start all over again. Nine and nine is 18, and eight is 28. Uh, no, 26. And seven is... Uh, Excuse and... me, Mr. Gildersleeve. Ham or beef? And seven... Lost it again. Ham or beef what? Filling. What filling? Sandwich filling. What sandwich? That's what I want to know. Ham or beef? Uh, cheese. Yes, sir. Yes. Nine and a cheese sandwich is 18 and... Twenty-six. Well, I got it right the first time. And seven is... Say, Uncle uh, Mort, supposing I could buy a swell airplane motor cheap, what would you say? Nine and nine is eighteen. Where am I? Oh, back at the bottom again. But I can, Uncle Mort. I can buy a practically brand new Bumblebee plane motor for nineteen dollars from Piggy Banks. It, what are Piggy Banks? They aren't anything. He's my pal. Ew. And this engine is such a bargain, I'm ashamed to buy it for that price. You needn't be ashamed, Leroy. You're not going to buy it. But Uncle Mort... Young man, you're far too young to take up flying. But this is a miniature plane. Motors. It's right in my model super duper swooper. You... Uh, oh, a model plane. Well, I forgot you were a flying bug. <laughs> That's a good one, Uncle Mort. Yeah. How's about that $19? Yeah. Now, hold on, Leroy. $19 is a lot of money. Oh, not for this motor, Unc. Piggy never part with it except his plane made an emergency landing into his pop store window. And he wants $19 for the motor? No, he wants $19 for a new window. Yeah. Can I have the dough, Uncle Mort? Well, I'm afraid not, Leroy. That's quite a large sum. And you know I've got to account to Judge Hooker for every penny you children spend. Oh, why can't he keep his nose out of our business? Uh, but that is his business, Leroy, sticking his nose into other people's. And he's got plenty of equipment for the job, too. <laughs> oh, but gee whiz, Uncle Moore. I bet you had a model airplane motor when you were my age. When I was your age, my boy, there were no airplanes. Everybody thought the Wright brothers were wrong. Well, <laughs> well I, I bet you had some hobby. Uh, let me see. What did I have? Oh, yes, yes, I had dynamite. Dynamite? Yes, dynamite was the name of my Shetland pony. Oh. He was my hobby, that little horse. <laughs> I can see him now. Bless his shaggy coat. Well, if you could have a big horse, Unc, why can't I have a little motor? Because I earned the money to buy dynamite, my boy. You earned 19 bucks? How'd you do it, huh? Well, uh, selling lobsters. I lived on the East Coast when I was a lad, and I got my spending money out of a string of lobster pots. I never knew lobsters grew in pots. Yes, they, they don't grow there, Leroy. That's how you catch them. I can still remember how hard it was in the winter. Getting up before dawn, rowing five miles, sometimes in a biting gale, just to tend my pots. 
rowing back to market with my boat full of lobsters and my hands full of blisters and walking five miles to school. Yes. It's wonderful to think what you'll do when you're young and you want a pony. Say, whatever became of that pony? Well, I took dynamite to school one day and he bit the teacher. We didn't have school for a month. <laughs> 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 Gee, instead of a motor, maybe I should get a pony. Yeah? No, I guess not. I'll stick to aviation. There's more of a future in that. Yes. But, Leroy, I said I wasn't going to give you the money. Oh, that's all right, Uncle Mort. I'm going to earn it, just like you did. A splendid idea. <laughs> It'll help build your character, like it did mine. <laughs> How are you going to do it? Oh, all I got to do is find a job and earn $19. Then would you let me buy Piggy's Bumblebee engine? I'll do better than that, my boy. Seeing that you're so ambitious, I'll advance you the money out of my own pocket. You will? Yes, and you can pay me back as you earn it. Oh, gee, Uncle Mort. <laughs> You've got a heart as big as your... As big as you are, Uncle Mort. <laughs> and, and don't worry about me paying you back. Uh? I'll get a job in no time. Yeah. And the, uh, can I have the $19 now, Uncle Mort? Now? Yeah, Piggy's here with me. He can't go home until he gets the money. Oh, yes, I see. Well, here you are. Uh... Ten, fifteen, uh, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Hey, Piggy, it's a deal. Here's the dough. Yeah. Youth with its trivial problems. I wonder what kind of a job that boy will get. Need a boy? Oh, you don't. Need a boy? Oh, you don't. Yes, we have a morning paper route open. Got a bike? Sure. When do I start? Five o'clock tomorrow morning. Now, this is no sense job, young man. You've got to deliver those papers every morning, rain or shine. Now, do you think you can swing it? Oh, sure. I'm awfully reliable, mister. I take after my uncle. He used to get up every morning and roll five miles into the teeth of a gale and then roll five miles back. Oh, delivering papers? No, lobsters. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess you'll do. What's your name and address, young man? Leroy Forrester, 747 Parkside Avenue. Okay, Leroy. Now advance and take the early bird's pledge. <clears throat> Neither snow nor rain nor hail nor flood shall stop the carriers of the Summerfield Indicative Indicator from delivering their papers and collecting at the end of the month. I do. Good. Now wear this pin, your badge of honor as an early bird. And may its luster never be tarnished. No, sir. And remember, for every paper that isn't delivered before 7 a.m., you'll be Dr. Nickel. Strange, Leroy isn't usually late for dinner, is he, Bertie? No, ma'am. Dinner's usually late for him. Uh have you tried phoning any place? I don't know where. To... Well, how about this young friend of his, uh, Porky Pine? No, uh, Hogface something or other. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, Piggy Banks. Uh, what's his phone number? Let's call him, huh? I got a job. I got a job. Well, congratulations, my boy. What you doing getting jobs at supper time? Yeah. What kind of a job is it, Leroy? Delivering a paper route for the Indicator Vindicator. Well, isn't that peachy? Indicator Vindicator, huh? Yeah. When do you start? Tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock. Five in the morning? Yeah. Did he say five? You hear what the boys say? Yeah. Yeah, that, that means I gotta get up at four. Oh, and... Leroy, you can't get up that early. Oh, yes, I can. I'll set all the alarm clocks in the house. Oh, and. <laughs> Leroy, I'm afraid you're a little too young for that sort of thing. <laughs> Maybe next year. Oh, but you had a much tougher job, won't you, Tony? But Uncle's a big man. Yeah. Well, he wasn't a man then. He wasn't even an uncle. You promised me I could do this. Uncle Mort, you promised me I could do it, and I promised the circulation manager. How'd it look if we both broke our promises? It looked better than getting up in the middle of the night. Yeah, 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 I agree with you. Uh, this puts me in rather a bad spot, Leroy. What would Judge Hooker say about this? That it's building my character. Well, now, I better go to bed if I'm going to get up at 4 o'clock. But you haven't had dinner yet. Okay, then, let's eat. What's delaying dinner, Bertie? What's delaying, he said. Look here, you, Leroy. We've got ham for dinner, and whilst waiting for you, I've frizzled it, defrizzled it, and refrizzled it until it's fabled. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
Are you dressed already, Leroy? Yep, up bright and early, Bertie. Hello, Bertie. Good morning, Leroy. Oh, don't look at me. I haven't had time to put on my makeup. I'm a sight. Gee, sis, I never knew you looked like that. <laughs> I like you better without makeup. <laughs> Looks like a skin rabbit to me. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> have you had anything to eat, Leroy? Oh, yeah, I fixed myself a swell breakfast. What did you have? A ketchup sandwich and a peanut bar. <laughs> Land of Goshen, boy, that ain't no breakfast. I'm going to fix you some pancakes. What was that? Oh, just a little drizzle. A little drizzle? Why, Leroy, it's coming down in buckets. Why? <coughs> Why, look at that street. It's flooded. Why, the water's running over the curb. You can't go out in weather like this. Oh, yes, I can. Neither snow nor rain nor hail nor flood shall stop the carriers of the indicator vindicator. I do. <laughs> You don't. Not this morning. Oh, gee, Marge, I got my rubber boots and my slicker and my rain cap out in the hall, and I'll be riding my bike. You're not going out in that rain. Oh, shucks. This is nothing to what Uncle Mort had a face when he was a boy. He used to row five miles out to sea in a lobster pot. <laughs> I don't care if he... Oh, Uncle Mort. Well, he could take out the car and drive you around. I'm going to wake him up right now. Oh, gee whiz. Who ever heard of a guy's uncle driving him around a paper route? Oh, Uncle Throckmorton. That's very good, Judge Hooker. <laughs> uncle Mort? Yeah. Giddy up, dynamite. <laughs> uncle Mort, yeah. wake up. Wake up, Uncle Mort. Uh, well, who's that? It's me, Marjorie. Uh, Marjorie who? Oh, Marjorie you. <laughs> yeah. Good night, Marjorie. <laughs> no. Wake up, Uncle. Uh, what's the matter? Fire? No, rain. Uh, hmm? <laughs> Coming down in torrents, Uncle Mort. It is, huh? Yes. Well, don't try to stop it. Oh, no, 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 Uncle Mort, you've got to get up. Yes, that's nice. <laughs> Leroy insists on starting his job this morning, and you've got to help him. Yes, a very good point. Then. You must get the car out and drive him all over his paper route. Yes, to build his character. What? I do? <laughs> yes. Now put on some clothes and come into the kitchen. Bertie's fixing some coffee. Uh, but coffee will keep me awake. Hurry now, Uncle Mort. Yes, all right. Uh, where's the light? Oh! What's wrong? I burned myself. That bulb is still hot. Why, Uncle Mort, what time did you get to bed? Well, I was reading a detective novel. It must have been about 3.30. What time is it now? Four. Oh, my. Why don't you go back to sleep? Leroy's waiting for you in the kitchen. Yes, bright boy. But if people don't get the papers, Leroy, they'll understand it because it's on account of the rain. Bertie's right, Leroy. No, no, look. I got almost a hundred customers. And if I don't deliver a hundred papers, I get docked a nickel apiece. That's five dollars. You do? Yeah, and suppose it rains steady for a week. Then I'll owe the company thirty-five bucks. Why, at that rate, it'll cost me a hundred and fifty dollars a month just not to deliver papers. <laughs> I can't afford it. <laughs> Uncle Mort is very kindly consented to drive you around, Leroy. Oh, gee, you shouldn't have disturbed him. He had it tough enough when he was a kid. He's entitled to some rest now. Uh, coffee. <laughs> Here you is, Mr. Gill, please. Thanks. Yeah, somebody hold the saucer. I think I can handle the cup. <laughs> Uncle Mort, but we'll have to hurry. Uh, hurry? Where are we going? You're driving Leroy around his paper route, Uncle Mort, because of the rain. Uh, you better put on something warmer than that bathrobe and them pajamas. You know, summer's all over. <laughs> he won't have to get out of the car. Here's your overcoat, Uncle. That's all you'll need. Yes, uh, thank you. There, we're all set. Now let's go. Okay. Which way is the door? <laughs> right through here. Yeah. Oh, it's raining. What am I doing out in the rain? <laughs> You're going to help me deliver my papers. The uh, papers? What papers? The man said they'd leave the bundle right here on the porch. Where? I can't see any... Oh! Hey, Uncle Mars. What? They left the papers all right. Yeah! <laughs> 
Pulitzer do they give you a newspaper route at the other end of town, Leroy? That was the only one open, Unc. Say, I bet this reminds you of the good old days. What good old days? You know, when you went out to the sea, lobster putting. Yeah. Why, <laughs> right, George, I wish I'd never brought those lobsters up. It... How much farther is it, Leroy? Oh, uh, just a block or two. Oh, no, stop right here. Yeah. Hey, here's my first customer. The Taj Mahal Bungalow Court. You... you just wait here while I deliver four papers. Yeah. Better turn on the radio or I'll fall asleep. And so, if you're troubled with insomnia, why don't you trot right down to your nearest open all-night drug store and purchase a can of Dr. Dollop's delicious dream drop? Is that so? Yes. <laughs> And tell the druggist that Bert, the night clerk, sent you. Yes. And after you've taken a dozen drops, you'll doze into a delightful delirium from... That guy would put an owl to sleep. <laughs> okay, Uncle Moore. Drive straight ahead to the next corner. Yes. Yeah. Now turn right. Right. Oh, careful of that milk wagon, Uncle Moore. What milk wagon? I don't... Oh! 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 Yeah, whoa. Running into my wagon. Uh, what are you doing in the middle of the road? I'm parked against the curb, you big chowderhead. Oh! Now, see here, don't you talk to me that way, or I'll I'll pasteurize you, you little half pint feather. Look out, Uncle Mort, he ain't so little. He ain't? I, I mean, he isn't? Oh. Well, he can't frighten me. I got a good notion to report you to the police. Skipping around that corner and stacking up against my wagon and shoving my horse into a mailbox. I didn't mail your horse, no? no? <laughs> yes, he's shaking up my milk, too. Well, that's good. Why don't you stay home nice like respectable folks? No, see here. And I'm always having trouble with you playboys. Playboys? What do you mean? Why don't you run the street? There, now see what you did. You woke up all my customers. I did not. You woke him up yourself. Uh, let's get out of here, Uncle yes. Ward. I still got a lot of papers to deliver. Yes, that's right. Let's get out of here. It's too noisy. The nerve of that milkman. Parked in the dark. And by Jove, he didn't have his taillight burning, did he, Leroy? I didn't notice. Well, he didn't. I think I'll go right back. Oh, and... no, no, no. We haven't got time, Uncle. Yes. We've just been out for 15 minutes, and I'm already half an hour behind schedule. Yeah. It's lucky for that milkman that you are. I'm just beginning to think of some things I should have told him. Funny, they always come just five minutes too late. You better watch where you're going, Uncle Mort. The water's pretty deep here. Oh. You might get off the road. Yeah. It does seem to be getting uh, deeper, doesn't it? Yep. Uh, throw your flashlight on that sign over there, Leroy. Sure. Uh, can you read it? What does it say? Warning! No fishing allowed. Oh! Oh, my goodness, a lake! Where's the street? I'd better turn around. Uh, it's back that way. Yes, I see it now. We'll be on dry land in a moment. Oh, <laughs> don't worry, Leroy. Everything's going to be all right. Yeah. I, I think the carburetor's flooded with water. Boy, now we are in a hole. Yeah. I wonder what we can do now. Well, I... Oh, oh boy. Huh? We're going to get a break, Uncle Mort. Somebody's coming down the street. Well. Hey, mister, will you pull us out? Sure, partner. Oh, Nelly. Oh, Nelly. Oh, Hey, ain't this the car that ran into me over on Quinn Avenue? <laughs> yes. But, wow. uh... <laughs> if you haven't got more brass than the Marine Band, asking me to pull you out. Yes, but I'm willing to pay you. No, thanks. Get it up, Nelly. <laughs> Go jump in your milk, both of you. It's getting pretty late, Uncle Morton. We still have a lot of papers to deliver. What are we going to do? Well, the car won't move, Leroy. Looks like we'll have to travel the rest of the way on foot. And I'm wearing bedroom slippers. Well, at least it stopped raining. Come on, Leroy. You take that bundle and I'll carry the rest. Ooh! <laughs> the water is cold. <laughs> you want me to carry a piggyback, Uncle Morton? There's no time for joking, Leroy. Oh, good gravy. It's starting to rain again. <sighs> Okay, come on, Uncle Mort. Just 12 more papers to deliver and we're through. Hi, uh, George. I'm soaked to the marrow. And on me, that's pretty far down. <laughs> Here's 2100 Burnside. 
It's your turn to put it on the floor, Junk. That's a long walk up there, Leroy, and I'm rapidly reaching the end of my tether. Suppose I just throw it up on the porch, huh? Oh, no, no, you can't do that. Us yeah. early birds aren't allowed to throw papers, Uncle Morse. Well, I'm no early bird. I'll bet my aim is still pretty good, too. Oh, but we've got orders. Oh, it's all right. Just this once, huh? Watch me place it on the porch. Yep. <clears throat> there it goes. Oh, oh, gee. It hit a window on the second floor. I told you you should Let's not go... stand around, Leroy. We delivered the paper, didn't we? Come on, quick. We might as well get going. Operator. Operator. Where's that operator? Get me to the police department at once. Hello, police. This is Judge Hooker at 2100 Burnside. An attempt has just been made on my life. Somebody threw something wrapped in a newspaper through my window. It might be a bomb. I'm trying a gangster in my court, and his mob is probably trying to rub me out. Get him at all costs. Spread out a dragnet. Do something. Attention, all cars. Proceed to 21st and Burnside Streets. Judge Hooker's home has been bombed. Stop and question everyone. Investigate all parked cars. Bring all suspicious characters to headquarters. That is all. Rosenblatt. Oh, listen to those sirens, Leroy. Must be some excitement around here. I wonder what... Uh, uh... <laughs> Did you sneeze, Uncle Morris? What did it sound like? Sounds like you're catching a cold. Oh. I only what? got four more papers to deliver. Why don't you go home from here? Oh, no, I wouldn't run out on you. Uh, well, if you insist, that's a different matter. Maybe I'd better get into some dry clothes. Oh, huh? sure. Just go straight down 21st Street to Parkside. So long. Yeah, so long, Leroy. <laughs> See you at home. Well, it's as cold as Judge Hooker's heart. And I'm as wet as a mad hen. I wonder if those policemen would mind giving me a lift home. Well, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Uh, hey, uh, officer. Yeah. Uh, hello, officer. I wonder if you're going my way. I'm all wet. I'll say you're all wet. Why don't you call a cab, mister? Well, you know how cabs are. They're like policemen. Anytime you need one, you can never find... Oh, what am I saying? <laughs> Uh, present company accepted, of course. <laughs> Where have you been, buddy? Uh, oh, uh, hello. Uh, two of you. Well, uh, uh, I, I've been out delivering morning papers. Delivering papers and pajamas and bedroom slippers? Yeah, an overcoat, don't forget. What do you think, Joe? Smells. <laughs> Smells to me, too. Well, I assure you, officers, it's true. I, I did it all for my little nephew's character. Uh, we're building it, you know. <laughs> It was raining too hard for him to take his bicycle, so I, I drove him around. Yeah? Where's your car? It, it broke down. Where? Well, I can't tell you exactly, but it was right near a, a no-fishing sign. Yeah? Well, where's your nephew? Uh, he went that way. <laughs> Say, fellows, I'm terribly cold. Couldn't you give me a lift? What do you think, Joe? Okay. Get in. Uh, oh, thanks very much. Ooh, uh, a gun. <laughs> yeah. I hope this isn't going to be out of your way, boys. I live at 747 Parkside. Got it, Joe? Sure. Oh, oh but you're headed the wrong way, Joe. Oh, no, I'm not, buddy. I'm headed for police headquarters. Oh, my goodness. Now, Mr. Gildersleeve, you say your aim wasn't very good. Yes, Judge Rand. I hadn't had much sleep, and, well, I had the wind and the rain and my hair and my eyes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, instead of uh, throwing the paper on this man's porch, you broke an upstairs window. Yes. I was trying to throw a curve, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Gildersleeve, your story sounds reasonable, and if you'll just wait in the sergeant's office till he can check it... Oh, gladly. I think you'll be able to go home in an hour or less. I want to thank you, Judge Rand, for being so nice to me. Yeah. Where is he? I hear you caught the man who tried to kill me. Let's get a look at him. Here, here, one moment. This is a police court, not a pool room. <clears throat> Who are you? Judge Hooker, Superior Court, Department 25. Well, I'm just as the piece ran to Sunrise Court. Take off your hat. Oh, excuse me. I'm a little excited. My life's been threatened, and I want to confront the coward who... Gildersleeve. Yeah, hello, Judge Hooker. Do you know this man? Well, of course. What's he doing here? Well, we picked him up near your place. He's the one... Uh-huh. I see it all now. You were trying to... I was not. Don't lie. Order. Order. Yes, order. Order in the court. Order. Yeah. Now, Gildersleeve, you better make a clean breast of it. Confess... And I might be inclined to be more lenient. Say, wait a second. It's all right, it's all right. I'm trying this case. 
Now tell me, Gildersleeve, what was in that newspaper you threw into my bedroom? I don't know what was in it, Judge. I didn't read it. <laughs> now, Judge Hooker, I've heard this man's story. I'll listen I... to you later. Gildersleeve, you're guilty of breaking and entering my home. But, Judge, I've never been in your home. You threw something, didn't you? Yes, but... And it broke something and entered somewhere, didn't it? Yes. Then, by your own admission, you're guilty, and by virtue of the laws of the state, I hereby sentence you to one year. One moment, Judge Hooker. This isn't your court. I'm the judge here, and I'm capable of running things. Uh, all right, all right. I don't want to tell you your business. Then don't. <clears throat> now, Mr. Gildersleeve, I don't think it's necessary to question your word any further. You broke Judge Hooker's window. Is that right? Yes, sir. And for that, Mr. Gildersleeve, I'm going to require you to pay for installing a new window. Uh, yes, sir. Is that all you're going to do? No, not quite. Well, that's better. I've never before seen such disregard for the dignity of a courtroom. Of the rights of others, as you've shown here this morning, Judge Hooker. Who, me? Yes, and I'm going to cite you for contempt of court. What? $25 fine or 30 days in jail. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this is wonderful. <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, I wonder what the parquet margarine users who are listening in would say if I asked them why they like parquet. Well, it's a pretty good guess that they like parquet first because of its delicious flavor. And a good many would answer, too, that they like parquet because they can use it so many ways. Yes, parquet margarine is so good tasting, you'll be proud to serve it at your table. And for the same reason, you'll like it for seasoning, for baking, and for pan frying, too. Why, more and more these days, good cooks are insisting on a flavor shortening for baking. A shortening that adds its own tempting taste to cookies, cakes, and pastries. And a flavor shortening is just what parquet margarine is. You'll find parquet's flavor makes it a delicious seasoning for hot vegetables, too. And a grand fat for pan frying that doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. And whether you use parquet margarine at the table, for seasoning as a flavor shortening, or for pan frying... Don't forget, parquet is a nutritious food and a reliable year-round source of vitamin A. Now, when you go to your food store, don't just ask for margarine. Ask for parquet margarine made by Kraft. Remember, Kraft's reputation for quality backs every pound of parquet. So be sure to say parquet margarine. It's made by Kraft. <laughs> You know, Leroy, I don't think this paper route was such a good idea after all. Uh, I wish you'd uh, give it up. Well, I wanted to talk to you about uh, that, If Uncle you quit Mark. this job, I'll pay for that motor myself. Well, thanks, Uncle Mark, but... Now, stop I... interrupting, Leroy. I'll even buy you the most expensive model plane there is, if you don't carry papers anymore. Oh, but, Jim... Now, I'm make up to... your mind, Leroy. Will you take my offer? Well, if you feel that way about it, okay. Fine. Yeah. Now, what were you going to say? I was trying to tell you, Uncle Mort, I was fired this morning. What? <laughs> yeah. Good night. <laughs> You have probably heard that September 15th through 20th is Retailers for Defense Week. During this week, your regular food dealer will be selling defense stamps. When shopping, you can help this patriotic cause by taking your change in defense stamps. Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> week at this time, Kraft presents from Hollywood, California, Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. Today's program is dedicated to the citizens of Gildersleeve, Connecticut, who are today celebrating their 100th anniversary.
We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, I wonder how much you know about vitamins and other important food elements so essential to our health. Well, with all the talk about proper nutrition these days, you probably know quite a lot. Yes, you know how important it is to serve your family the right kind of foods. Protective foods that are nourishing and wholesome. That's why you should know about delicious, wholesome parquet margarine made by Kraft. This quality margarine called parquet is a protective food of exceptionally high nutritional value. It is one of the best energy foods you can serve. And important to everyone who knows how essential vitamins are, every pound of parquet margarine contains 9,000 units of vitamin A, making it a reliable winter and summer source of this valuable vitamin. Best of all, parquet margarine has such a pleasing, delicate taste that your family is bound to like it, whether you use it at the table for baking or for pan frying. Yes, you won't have to urge them to eat all of this nutritious food they need. So for nourishment and flavor, serve your family economical parquet margarine. Just ask for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. And remember, parquet is a craft product. And now for the adventures of the great Gildersleeve. If you take the other end of this trunk, Bernie... I got it, Mr. Gildersleeve. All right, now, let's lift it. Oh, I can't budge it. Marjorie, what does Leroy keep in this trunk of his? Rocks? Yes, Uncle Mort. That's his mineral collection. Oh, well, we'll have to drag it out later. You can let your end down, Bertie. Oh, I can tote this whole thing myself, Mr. Gildersleeve. You can, eh? Hello, everybody. I'm home from school. Say, what are you guys doing in my room? Uh, your sister will explain, Leroy. Well, Dora Bell Claiborne, the girl I room with at school, is coming to visit. You mean that giddy little Georgia gal? Oh, she isn't giddy, Leroy. She's vivacious. Uh. Honestly, Uncle Mort, all the boys at school were crazy about her. She had the cutest draw. Yeah, she always talked with a soap and a loaf. <laughs> Bright boy. Cut that out, Leroy. Excuse me, Uncle Mort. Leroy. Dorabelle's just about the best girlfriend I've got. What's that got to do with my room? Oh, I forgot to tell you, Leroy. Dorabelle's going to be in your room while she's here. Yeah? Where do I sleep? On a cot in my room. Oh, gee, Uncle Mort. Well, what's wrong with staying in Uncle Mort's room? Well, if you must know, he snores all the time. Oh, no. Only when I sleep. <laughs> and when I do, just to roll me over on my side. Oh, me? If you don't mind, I'd rather sleep in my own room. Let that silly dame go to a hotel. Oh, now, stop that, Leroy. Uncle Mort, make him quit. Yes. You're too young to uh, bully our sister, Leroy. Well, you're older. <laughs> I mean, uh, this girl is Marjorie's chum, and naturally she has to give her the key to the city. But all she's given her is the key to my room. Yes. I thought you liked Dorabelle when you met her three years ago. Oh, I was just a kid then. I used to like anything. <laughs> Nevertheless, Leroy, we must show Miss Claiborne some of that famous southern hospitality. Uh, now help us move all this juvenile junk out of here. Oh, well, I'll take the things out of the bathroom. Yeah, all right. Uh, tell Brady to get some fresh towels. And... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what's wrong? In the bathtub. A frog. Yeah. Nonsense, there's no frog in the bathtub. Or is there, Leroy? There should be, too. <laughs> Their names are Jake and Lena. Yeah. Oh, get them out. Get them out. Oh, don't be afraid, sis. These aren't wild frogs. Young man, how long have you had these frogs in your bathtub? Oh, just a week or so. Do you mean to say it's been a week since you had a bath? Oh, keep your shirt on, sis. I take a shower every day at school. Your school started yesterday. <laughs> now, you get rid of Jake and Lena. But frogs are a benefit to mankind. I read where they catch flies in the encyclopedia. Encyclopedia? By George, I'll take them out myself. Oh, there. Uh, stay still, uh, Lena. Oh, jumping jelly beans. What's wrong, Uncle? They've escaped. Leroy, oh. help me catch them. Okay. Marge, fetch that butterfly oh, yes, now. Uh, here, Jake. Here, Lena. Uh, nice froggies. Here, nice froggies. Say, how do you call a frog? Oh, slippery, aren't they? home of Miss Marjorie Forrester. Yes, ma'am. Come right in. Oh, Dora Bell. Marjorie. Mm. 
Oh, my, how lovely you look, Doraville. And you, my dear, you look just exactly the same, only four years older. <laughs> it's just three years, Doraville. Oh, yes. I'm so forgetful. I never did have a head for figures. <clears throat> oh, <laughs> come here, Doraville. I want you to meet my Uncle Mort. Uncle Mort, it's Dorabelle Claiborne. Uh, charmed, I'm sure. Well, I do declare, Marjorie, if you haven't got the handsomest uncle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come now. Hey, here's your bags, miss. All 12 of them. Oh. I'll have Bertie put them away. Oh, thank you, sugar. Mr. Gildersleeve, you're much younger than I expected. And, uh... You're much prettier than I expected. <laughs> oh, uh, there's Leroy. Leroy, come over here and say hello to Miss Claiborne. Oh, 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 don't tell me this is little Leroy. Yeah. Why, the last time I saw you, you were nothing but a baby. And now, isn't he developing into the handsomest boy? Oh, horse feathers. <laughs> uh, Leroy. Come with me, Darbell. Your room's ready. Oh, but you shouldn't have bothered, honey. Goodbye for now, Uncle Maud. It was so charming meeting y'all. Yeah, so long, uh, Dorabelle. <laughs> this way, darling. There, here's your room. Oh, how nice and cozy. I just love being here. I just can't wait till I meet some of your charming northern boys. But what about Harvey? Harvey? Who's that? Why, the boy you were engaged to. Remember you wrote me about him in April? In April? Oh, that must have been Harvey Jackson. Did something come between you? Yes, the draft. I've been engaged to Joe Patterson and Sammy Full and Davy Lee since then. All at once? Oh, no. What do you think I am, a flirt? <laughs> <laughs> of course not. I'm not engaged at all at the moment, so I thought I'd come up here and meet some nice, reliable men. Well, Ted knows a lot of nice boys. Ted, is that your fiancé? Well, not exactly. Yes. Yeah. Is he nice? Uh, the kind you dream about. At least the kind I dream about. Wow. <laughs> He's been awfully attentive, but we haven't any understanding yet. Well, my idea would be a man who can give a girl a nice home and lots of servants and cars and shopping money. Why, Dorabelle, there's more to marriage than that. What about your happiness? That's just what I was thinking about, Sugar Lion. Uh, can I come in? Oh, of course, Uncle Mort. Uh, hello, Dorabelle. My, don't you smell nice. Yeah. <laughs> and don't you look handsome with your hair all slicked down. Oh, uh, yeah, you uh, like it that way? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Makes you look like a movie star. Well, I have been told that I resembled Ronald Coleman. <laughs> Except that he has a mustache, and so have I. <laughs> Now, Uncle Maud, I like you a lot better than Ronald Coleman. Yeah. Why, you'd make two of him. Yeah, I would, eh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, is there anything I could do for you? Well, uh, you could go down to the railroad station and fetch Tuffy. Yeah, Tuffy? Who, who's that? My little dog. He's waiting in the baggage room. Oh, well, I'll be very glad to go. What kind of a hound is he? A little Mexican hairless. Yes. Oh, uh, Tuffy, eh? Hey, yeah. everybody, here's Ted. Uh, hello, boys. Well, hello, Ted. Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, hello, Ted. Darbell, this is Ted. Well, I do declare, Marjorie, if you haven't got the handsomest boyfriend. Yeah. Uh-oh. Oh, now, you know better than that, Miss Claiborne. Oh, don't be so formal. Just call me Dorabel, Ted. Well, okay, Dorabel. Now, how do you like Summerfield? Well, give her a chance, Ted. She's been here less than an hour. But I know I'm going to like it, darling. Course, I'll be just a trifle miserable till I get my Tuffy. Oh, yes, a Tuffy. Tuffy? Uh, that's my little dog. He's been waiting for me at the depot. Well, I'll be very glad to drive down there and get him. Yeah, but I oh, was... Oh, thank uh... you, Ted. I don't know what I'd have done. But I oh, was... Uh... Nothing at all. Won't take me more than 20 minutes. But I was... Is uh... that all? Well, maybe I'd better come along. <laughs> Tuffy might be frightened. But I was... We'll uh... be right back, everybody. Come on, Ted. Yeah, we'll be right back. But I was... Uh... What was I? <laughs> oh, yes, I was stood up. Hey, sis, why didn't you go along? I don't know. Oh, yes, I do. I wasn't invited. Well, well, chicken a la king for lunch again. For the third day in a row. Are you practicing to open a tea room, Bertie? No, sir. 
Dorabelle's favorite dish, Uncle Moore. It is, huh? Where is Dorabelle? Oh, Ted is showing her some of the sights around town. Shall we wait luncheon for them? No, they just phoned that they were having lunch out. You know, Marjorie, it's really none of my business, but... Hello, everybody. What's for lunch? Oh, cream chicken again. Why can't we have ham sandwiches for a change? Yes. Why can't we have ham sandwiches? Bertie, take this mess away and bring us some ham sandwiches. Yes, sir. Right away, quick. Won't take but if it. Oh, uh, wait a minute. What am I running for? We ain't got no ham. <laughs> well, go out and buy some. You, you want a ham sandwich, too, don't you, Marjorie? No, I, I'm not very hungry. If you'll excuse me, I, I won't have anything. Hey, what's biting her? A little bull weevil. Dorabelle, huh? <laughs> he gives me a pain, too. Say, Uncle Mort, does Marjorie know Dorabelle is making a play for Ted Will? Why do you think she left the table? Because she hates ham sandwiches? <laughs> Gee, I had a feeling that dame was poison. Uh, when did you get this feeling? The minute you gave her my room. <laughs> By George, I wish we'd left the frogs in the bathtub. I can put them back. No, 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 no. <laughs> Not that, Leroy. We'll fall back on that only if everything else fails. Uncle Mort, this doorbell's given Marjorie the old sabotage. Yes. Now, we can't count on Sister to do anything about it. She's too proud to fight back. So we got to do something. That's right. We've got to do something. Uh, what have we got to do? Let me see. Uh, I've got it. And it's foolproof. Uh, no, no. What do you mean, no? Let's hear it. What's the use? This idea would work like a charm, but you wouldn't stand for it. Leroy... In the past few days, I've stood for a lot more than I can stand for, and I guess I can stand for a little more. What is it? Well, if some high-powered guy stepped in and gave Ted a lot of competition with Dorabelle, I bet she'd get rid of Ted. You're a bright boy, Leroy. <laughs> Especially if this other man was a bigger shot than Ted. Somebody older with plenty of dough. Marvelous. Uh, but who could we get? I've got them all picked out already. You have? Who is he? You. Who? You. Who? You. Stop you hooing, Leroy. <laughs> uh, what do you mean, uh, me? Gee whiz, you answered the description perfectly, Uncle Mort. Look, you're older than Ted, aren't you? I am. And you're wealthier than he is. I am. And you're handsomer. I am? <laughs> sure you are. Uh, then why have you got your fingers crossed? Why, she says you look like Ronald Coleman. I heard her myself. No, no. Let's not kid ourselves, Leroy. She's half my age, and I'm twice her weight. <laughs> but she's tired of all these young, skinny sprouts, Uncle Morse. She wants to hook a rich guy. Oh, uh, the practical type, eh? Now, I'll do all the hard work, convincing her you're a millionaire, yes. and all you have to do is be nice to her. Give her things. Yes. Take her out to the movies. Uh, the mushy ones. But I don't like mushy movies. I like Hopalong Cassidy. <laughs> You've got to do this for Marge, Uncle Morse. How about it? By George, I almost would. If she'd only stop using that overpowering perfume of hers, I can't stand it. Oh, I can fix that in no time. How? It's easy. I'll just sneak into a room, pour half the bottle out, and fill it up again with water. Keep this up, my boy, and someday you'll be... Uh, well, just keep it up. <laughs> then you'll do it, huh? Remember, it's your duty as our uncle, Uncle. You're right, Leroy. I'll do it. But something tells me it would have been a lot easier if we'd have put those frogs in her bed. Hiya, Nora Bell. Hello, Sugarfoot. Uh, Ted called just now, but I thought you were out with Uncle Morse. Oh, I better phone Ted back. I've been neglecting him shamefully lately. Oh, it's no use calling. He was going right out. Hey, have you seen Uncle Mort around? I think he's resting in his room till dinner time. We went to a movie this afternoon. What did you see? Hop along, Cassidy. I only went along to please him. I think Uncle Mort's doing all he can to please you, too. Yes, I wonder why he's doing it. Oh, you'll find out someday. You think I will? I hope so. How oh, aren't you, sweet? Your uncle's a very interesting man, Leroy. Yeah. Do you know he started out as a boy with only one lobster pot, and now he's got millions? Of lobster pot? No, dollars. Oh, I never knew that. I thought he was well off, but I never dreamed he was a millionaire. Well, don't let on. He, he doesn't like people to like him just because he has loads of money. As if anybody would. No. He's just charming and lovable and sweet and handsome all by his own self. How did he make his money, Leroy? Why, uh, in enterprises. Enterprises? Yes, he's got them scattered all over the country. What kind of enterprises? Oh, uh, 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 various, you know, various. Uh, of course, Uncle has always said he'd trade all of his wealth. 
just not to be so lonesome. He did? Yeah. And you know something, Dora Bell? What, Sugar Pie? Since he met you, he's been a different man. Too bad he's so much older than you are. Oh, not too much. And besides, what of it? And you're interested in somebody else. Why, Leroy Forrester, whatever gave you that idea? Oh, I don't know. Uh, you and Ted? Ted Wills? Why, he's Marjorie's fella. I'm not interested in him. And when he calls up, you keep telling him I'm out. You mean you're going to brush him off? I will not. Let him take care of his clothes himself. <laughs> now, you run along out, Angel Cake, whilst I fix up for dinner. Okay. How did it go? Oh, swell. Mickey Rooney couldn't have done it any better. Yes. And you think it's going to work? Sure, if you do your share. Remember, from here on, it's up to you. I'll try my best. It isn't easy, you know, playing patty cake with that little rattle brain, taking that darn dog of hers out for a walk every afternoon. Yeah. Say, how do you keep Tuffy in line? Well, we go to the park, I buy him four hamburger sandwiches, then we both take a nap under a tree. <laughs> <laughs> I think Dora Bell's about ready to give Ted the gig. Good. That'll make Marjorie happy. Say, you better go in and try to cheer Marge up. Huh? She's been looking terrible lately. By George, you're right. I'll do it right now. Uh, there's another favor I'd like to ask, Leroy. Shoot. See if you can dilute Dora Bell's perfume just once more. <laughs> Who's there? Uh, it's me, Uncle Mort. Uh, do you mind if I come in? What's wrong, Marjorie? Oh, sometimes people are a terrible disappointment. Oh, there are plenty of nice people in this world. They just seem to be nice first. Yeah. Then somebody else comes along and you see them in their true colors. Oh, now, my dear, sometimes people get their heads turned by uh, other people. And these other people shouldn't be allowed to come between people and... And the people they like. They should go back home where they... Where they belong. Now, now, my dear. Time wounds all heals. <laughs> why, why, before you know it, uh, you'll be smiling and laughing and happy again. But I'm happy now. Yes, yes, of course. I can see that. Uh, here's a handkerchief. Yes, uh, that's it. It blow hard, my dear. Now, don't worry. Just leave it to your Uncle Mort. You mean you've done something? I surely have, Marjorie. Everything's going to be all right. It is? Sure. I'll let you in on a little secret. I've got a date tonight with Dorabelle. What? You too? Huh? Oh, come on. I'll cut you. Oh. But I'm telling you, Leroy, I can't go through with this another evening. Dora Bell's had me doing the rumba and the conga and the tango and the fandango till I walk with a Spanish accent. <laughs> and tonight we're going to the country club dance, and she's going to teach me how to be a jitterbug. If I could only tell her what I thought of her, oh, I'd be a happy man. Uh, cheer up, Uncle Mort. This can't last much longer. No, well, neither can I. Now you run upstairs and get my hat. Okay. Good idea. A jitterbug at my age. Uh, Hello? Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, this is Ted. Oh, hello, Ted. Are you alone? Let me look. <laughs> yes. What is it? Well, this is rather hard for me to say, Mr. Gildersleeve, but I guess I've been pretty much of a fool. That's a pretty good guess. <laughs> There's no use in going over the whole thing now, but I've got to see Marjorie alone and try to get her to forgive me. An excellent idea. I'm taking Dorabelle out of the house anyway. Oh, you're a pal, Mr. Gildersleeve. And don't think I don't know what you've done to open my eyes. I wish I could keep mine open. I don't ever seem to get any sleep anymore. <laughs> that Southern Bell has put me through the ringer. I can sympathize with you. Huh? Yes. If it wasn't for you, I'd never be in this mess. When shall I come around? Just as soon as you can get here. Dorabelle and I were supposed to leave an hour ago. She should be down any minute now. I see. And when she does, I'm going to tell that... Oh, there you are, Dorabelle. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, goodbye, Mr. McGonagall. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. 
Uh, that was Mr. McGonagall. <laughs> Did I keep y'all waiting long, Socky Walky? Yeah. Uh, no. And now, young lady, there's something I've been waiting to tell you ever since you walked into this house. Hey, Unc, I couldn't find your hat anywhere. Well, I'd better get myself so we can get going. But Lammy Pie, you were starting to say. I'll tell you on the way over to the house. Lammy Pie. I can't understand your uncle. He's been so droopy lately. Why, that's because he's in love with you. Don't you get droopy when you're in love? Come to think of it, I do. Sure, why, why right now you're a little droopy. <laughs> Am I, Leroy? You bet you droop. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, you droop. And, and you think your Uncle Malt really and truly has a fever for me? Why, he was saying to me only just now. If I could only tell Dora Bell what I thought about her, oh, I'd be a happy man. <laughs> That's right, Miss Dora Bell. Uh, call me Auntie Dora Bell, Leroy. Oh. And you can tell Uncle that we don't need to go through any proposal business. From now on, we'll just consider ourselves engaged. Uh, say, where, uh, where are you going? I'll be waiting in the car, nephew. Oh, gee, now what have I done? I better tell Uncle Moore so he can... Uh, where's Dora Bell, Leroy? Oh, in the car. Say, I said something, Dora, and she thinks... No you... need for any more shenanigans, Leroy. I've got good news. Ted snapped out of his dizzy doorbell spell. And, and he and Marjorie have made up? Well, they will as soon as I can get that Dixie Dietrich away from the house. And when I do, I'm going to invite her to pack up and go home. Oh, say, don't do that. I just told her... Oh, that... you told her. A bright boy. Saves me the trouble, then. How soon is she leaving? Uh, she didn't say. She thinks she's going to get... I haven't time to dilly-dally here, Leroy. Got to get her out of the way before Ted comes. Uh, goodbye. But I'm going to... Oh, my... Uh, Leroy told me what was on your mind, Shark Martin. Yes, I know. Saved me a lot of embarrassment, too. I just want you to know I'm ready any time you want to set the date, honey bunny. Well, uh, how about tomorrow morning? There's a train leaving. Oh, you mustn't rush me, you impetuous boy. <laughs> well, uh, why not? Why not? The sooner the better. <laughs> and it better be sooner. <laughs> Tell me, Throckmorton, are you sure you want me to go through with this? Positive. Say, you're not going to back out now, are you? Oh, no. You couldn't get me to change my mind now. Well, that's good. Well, this is our last night at the country club. <laughs> I have a marvelous idea. Let's announce it here. Uh, you think we should announce it? Oh, sure. There'll be just loads of people glad to hear the good news. Yes, probably more than you think. <laughs> Now, let me see. Yeah. Who'd be the proper person to make the announcement? Why, the orchestra leader, of course. Orchestra? They usually... Oh, well, look, who's the new leader? Uh, who? It's Danny Durant. He started playing around my hometown. Look, isn't he the handsomest orchestra leader? Yeah, here we go again. Oh, Danny. Uh, did you call me? Well, for heaven's sake, Dorabelle Claiborne, what are you doing up here? You'll soon find out. Uh, this is Mr. Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, Danny. Yeah, Hello. How do you do? And he and I have an important announcement we wish you'd make from the bandstand. Uh-oh. Up to your old tricks again. Huh? Yeah, that's right. And now, now she's going boys, home. Now, boys, stop teasing. Danny, we want you to announce my engagement and forthcoming marriage to Mr. Gildersleeve. Yes. What? <laughs> <laughs> engagement? <laughs> marriage? <laughs> excuse him, please, Danny. Yes, this excuse me. This is his first engagement, and he's kind of nervous. Nervous. Throckmorton, you just... Just calm yourself. But I, but you, but, but I we. I can't wait till Danny makes the announcement. Can uh, you, darling? No, I can't wait. I've got to get out of here. The orchestra has a short intermission right now, Dorabelle. Fine. That'll give Danny and me time to figure out a cute way of wording the announcement yeah. and to visit a bit. See you in a few minutes, baby lion. Oh, now you're in a mess, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. What'll people say? Yes, and they'd be right, too. <laughs> Oh, now, what can I do? Uncle Mort. Yeah? Uncle Mort, Ted and I hurried here as fast as we could. Yeah. Leroy told us he was afraid he proposed to Dora Bell for you. He did, Marjorie. Why didn't he ask me first? I'd have said no. <laughs> did you tell her it was all a mistake? How could I, Ted? I didn't know we were going to be married till she told that orchestra leader, and now he's going to tell everybody. Oh. Well, if I can stop him from... Oh, me. there he goes up to the bandstand now. Oh, where? Oh, there. come on, Uncle Mort. Uh, no. No, it's too late. I guess I'll just have to face the music. Yeah, there's the music. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 
I have an important announcement to make. Oh, here it comes. Not so long ago, Summerfield was visited by a beautiful vision of loveliness from down south. Yeah. <laughs> she charmed the hearts of all the boys, but there is only one man who is going to be happy for the rest of his days. Yes, slap happy. <laughs> this man, the envy of all Summerfield, is the one to whom she's just bestowed her hand. Bestowed. Thrust. <laughs> of course, you know the girl I've been talking about, Miss Dorabel Claver. She's an old friend from down home. I wish she were there now. Well, it gives me great pleasure to announce that Miss Dorabel Claver has just promised to become... My wife. The what? Uh, your wife? Hey, I've been jilted. Thank goodness. <laughs> the great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But first, I have a confession to make. You see, although I am the announcer on a food program, I'm no cooking expert. No, I'm more interested in eating good food than in preparing it. But I do know this. The most important quality in food, the quality that makes you a good cook, is the flavor you give to the dishes you serve. And that's the reason more and more women are using parquet margarine. You see, parquet is the new craft margarine that tastes so good. Yes, women everywhere are discovering that parquet is a delicious margarine that can be used so many ways. Served at the table, for instance, parquet is sure to impress everyone with its delicate, satisfying taste. You'll find parquet is a luscious seasoning melted over hot vegetables. For baking, parquet margarine is a genuine flavor shortening that makes cookies, cakes, and pie crusts that fairly melt in your mouth. And then there's pan frying. Yes, parquet adds flavor to pan fried foods, too, and it doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. And remember, parquet margarine is a nutritious food that contains vitamin A, yet it's economical, too. So next time you order, ask for delicious, economical parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Just say, I want parquet, the delicious margarine that's made by Kraft. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, yes, Mr. Bannon? I'd like to read the resolution we received from Gildersleeve, Connecticut. Oh, well, uh, go right ahead. Here it is. Whereas the town of Portland, celebrating its 100th anniversary, desires to honor that part of the town known as Gildersleeve, and the person who has chosen that name in providing joy and entertainment to the nation, and whereas the first Gildersleeve built the fleet which helped win the War of 1812, and the great Gildersleeve of the modern airways is building happiness for the American people... We, the Centennial Committee, do solemnly declare and herewith appoint the great Gildersleeve, honorary mayor of the village of Gildersleeve in the town of Portland, state of Connecticut, given under my hand and seal on this 19th day of September, 1941. Joseph P. Bransfield, chairman. Well... Well, I, I'm deeply honored. And let me say, from one Gildersleeve to another... I hope the old proverb about the first hundred years being the hardest is true. Then the next hundred years will be easier. Good night. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and reminding you that if the community in which you live does not observe daylight saving time, the great Gildersleeve will come to you one hour later beginning next week. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> at this time, Kraft presents from Hollywood, California, Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. 
But right now, here's a question for you. Did you know that you can overeat and still be undernourished? That it's not so much the quantity of food you eat as the kind of food you eat that's important. Well, it's true. And that's why you should learn all you can about the right foods to serve your family. Wholesome, protective foods that provide the energy and real nourishment your family needs. So it's important to you that delicious parquet margarine made by Kraft is one of the right foods. And that it's so economical you can serve your family all they need. Yes, parquet margarine is a protective food that's packed full of wholesome nourishment. Parquet is one of the best sources of food energy you can serve. And you all know how important vitamin A is. It's truly a protective vitamin. Well, parquet margarine is rich in vitamin A. There are 9,000 units in every pound. And don't forget, parquet is the margarine with the delicious flavor, whether you use it at the table for baking or for pan frying. So ask your dealer for delicious, economical Parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Just ask for Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve. Mr. Gildersleeve, report of a state of Marjorie and Leroy Forrester Miners submitted by Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve Guardian. Well, it looks very neat, Ted. Should impress Judge Hooker. Is it complete? All but the name of that firm that leased the 12th Street property. Oh, yes. Let's see. What was that firm? Oh, yes. The Swanky Hanky Shoppy. <laughs> Thanks. I'll just fill that in. It was a 99-year lease, wasn't it? Yes, 99 years with monthly options. <laughs> oh, Marjorie. Oh, okay. Hi, Margie. Say, hey, that's a new dress, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> what do you think of it? Uh, well, stop uh... asking him questions, Marjorie, or he'll charge the estate for giving a legal opinion. <laughs> I'll go in the other room, young man, and tend to your paper. Okay. <laughs> Did you want me? Yes. Uh, all ready to go to court, eh? Uh-huh. Hey, what about your brother? Where is Leroy? Oh, well, I sent him to change his shirt for the third time. Uh... Uncle, I wish we'd make him get rid of that printing press. Well, little boys will always revert to type. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, tell him to hurry. I don't want to be late. This is important, and I'm getting jittery about it. Oh, now, relax and take it easy, Uncle Throckmorton. Relax? Ted says the report is in fine shape. Why, there's nothing to be excited about. How is this? No, by George. Come to think of it, I've done wonders. If I do say so myself. In fact, I will say so myself. I've done wonders. <laughs> I think so. Why, since you arrived in Summerfield a month ago, you've straightened out all of our investments, rented that vacant property... And even put the kitchen on a budget. Why, Judge Hooker should be very pleased. I hope so. I made up my mind to demonstrate to that old... What is it Leroy calls him? Uh, old Leroy! Wonderful, boy! What was it I told you not to call Judge Hooker? Picklepuss! That's it. I made up my mind to show that old picklepuss that a competent businessman could administer this estate properly. Why? Because you can't put anything over on me. Excuse me, Mr. Gill, please. Uh, yes, Bertie? Where did you buy them bananas? Well, from a man in a truck. They were bargains, too. The stores want 30 cents a dozen, and he only charged me 25. Well, he done gypped you. There was only nine bananas. <laughs> yes. As I was saying, Marjorie, you can't put anything over on my type of businessman. We have a certain alertness. Uh, oh, Great Danes. What's wrong? Look at the time. We'll be late for court. Oh, but court stays open until 5 o'clock, Uncle Moore. Yes, but we can't just drop in whenever we want, my dear. It isn't a barbershop, you know. We have to be there when the judge is ready to take us. Oh, like a beauty parlor. <laughs> yes. You see, I don't want to arrive late and have trouble with old uh, cucumber face. I've got to get back here and pack up my bag so I can take the night train. The night train? Yes. Oh, I forgot to tell you. I'm going to back to Whistle Vista this evening. Oh, Uncle Mort. Huh? Well, I thought you were going to stay here and live with us. Well, I am. That's why I'm going back to Whistle Vista. Huh? To sell or lease my house there. You are? Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> oh, Leroy. Yeah, Uncle Moore's going to sell his house in Whistle Vista and come back here and live with us. Oh, boy, gee, that's wonderful, Uncle uh, Moore. Take it easy. Uh, do you want me to make you a for sale sign on my printing press? No, no, no. Thanks, just the same. You haven't got that many shirts to spare. <laughs> oh, uh, Ted, is it time to go? Yes, we should hurry down to the courthouse. Everybody ready? Uh, Leroy, Marjorie, Ted, Bertie? Oh, Bertie's not going to court with us, Uncle Moore. I know that. I just want a glass of water. That <laughs> ham I had for breakfast. Uh, water, Bertie. Yes, Mr. Gill, please. Bring it. Good. 
Anybody else want any water? No, oh, no. thank you. Here you are, sir. You better hurry, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah, one second while I drink this. <clears throat> Thanks, Bertie. Now I'm ready to go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Excuse me, I must have drunk too <laughs> fast. <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute, Ted. I think Uncle Mort has a hiccup. Oh, hiccups? No, I'll be all right. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Maybe you'd better do something about it. No, no, no. I'll be all right. Well, Uncle Mort, you better sit down and rest a minute. Well, what about court? You know, Judge... Sir? Judge Rucker, ah, he'll wait. Yes, I can have it put over till tomorrow. But I got to get back to Whistle Vista, Ted. I I couldn't do that. (laughs) Or could I? Why not, Uncle? No, no, no. (laughs) I'll be all right in a few minutes. No, isn't this silly? <laughs> don't try to talk, Uncle Mort. Just, just sit quietly for a few minutes and, and rest. Rest? All right, I'll rest. <laughs> Maybe it'd help if you unbuttoned your vest, Unc. Unbutton my vest? I'll try it. Yes, that seems a little better. <laughs> this spoke too soon. Better button it up again. Yeah. Say, I know a sure cure for hiccups. It never fails. It doesn't? Well, what is it? Drink a glass of water. Oh, but Marjorie, my dear, don't you remember? That's how I got them, uh, drinking water. No, but you didn't drink slowly. Slowly. You've got to take nine swallows of water and, and not breathe in between. Not breathe? What am I, a fish? <laughs> now, Uncle Mort, it's cured thousands. Sure, you know, a hair from the dog that bit you. Uh, Ted, this is hiccups, not hydrophobia. <laughs> Well, I'll get a glass of water. Yeah. You better get a pitcher in case one glass full won't do it. What are you trying to do? Drown them? <laughs> no, no, no more water, Marjorie. One more swallow and I'll fly back to Capistrano. <laughs> oh, help me out of this rocking chair. I'm getting seasick. Cheer up, Unc. If you can keep on hiccuping for another two hours, you'll get your picture and springs as a thing. You're a bright boy, Leroy. I'll keep quiet. Uh, Mr. Gildersleeve, I just remembered something that'll take care of those hiccups. You do, Ted? What is it? But it's simply a matter of breath control. Say, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers without taking a breath. Oh, I... Yeah, go on, try it, Uncle Moore. Well, all right. Peter Piper picked... <laughs> Uh, no, no, it's slower, like this. like this. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers, that way. Peter Piper picked up. Uh, picked up. Uh, picked up. Oh! oh, more water, Bertie. Yeah, we have Miss Gilsley. Thanks. Well, who's got the next suggestion? Step right up. Don't be bashful. Gildersleeve the guinea pig. Stop. That's me. <laughs> I wouldn't be bringing it up, Mr. Gildersleeve, except my know it'll work positively. Now, if you hold a cold silver knife on the back of your neck, then hiccups will be gone with the wind. Well, all right, I'll try anything once. If you got a cold knife, Bertie. Uh, yes, sir. I brought one right here with me, Mr. Gilfree. Unbutton your collar, Uncle. There. Ooh, it sends the shivers up and down my spine. Where'd you get that knife, Bertie? I had it in the refrigerator. You never can tell when a nice cold knife comes in handy. Hey, Uncle Mort! Lamar, I was outside talking to my pal, Piggy Banks, and when he had the hiccups, they... Say, what's that knife doing in your back? Did they operate on you? Well, no, Leroy. Bertie suggested cold silver against the back of my neck. Oh, that won't work. It will, too, you, Leroy. I've been watching your uncle since he tried it, and he ain't hit once. By George, come to think of it, I haven't hit. Now, this is wonderful, Bertie. Thanks very much. Uh, remind me to give you a dollar. Uh, Ted, let's get started for the courthouse. But, Uncle Moore, a cold knife against the back of the neck cures nosebleeds, not hiccups. Why, is that right? Oh, I thought so, too. You mean to say it's not good for <laughs> hiccups? Oh... <laughs> Jumping jelly beans. Oh, they've come back again. Forget about that dollar, Bertie. Say, Uncle Morris, I know a sure cure. I can't miss. No, Leroy. It's my turn this time. I've just remembered a remedy. But that isn't fair. I spoke up first. Say, whose hiccups are these? Yours or mine? Okay, go ahead. They're your hiccups. Uh, What's your remedy, Uncle Morris? Well, I'll, I'll take a cold shower. The shock should stop me. It sounds logical. Well, it won't hurt at any rate. We've got to do something so I won't keep speaking out of turn in court. I'll get the car out of the garage. I bet that shower doesn't work, Marge. Now, my idea is to scare Uncle Mort. What for? Well, that's an absolute positive cure for hiccups. How do you know? It cured Piggy Banks when he had him t- something terrible. How'd he get them? Drinking a whole bottle of pop at one gulp. Honest, his family tried everything. Then his kid brother put a string of firecrackers in his pocket and lit the fuse. 
That did the trick, all right, all right. But didn't those firecrackers burn a big hole in his coat pocket? No, Piggy wasn't wearing a coat. Gee, if I could only think of something stupid to pull on Uncle Mort, I bet I'd scare the hiccups right out of him. Now, you wait a minute, Leroy. Don't you do anything drastic. Oh, me? When did I ever do anything? Say, how's about it if I, I put ketchup on my head and stagger into his room and fall down on the floor? Leroy, Forrester, now don't you dare. Well, all right. Let's see. What else would frighten those Donald hiccups? Ooh. Oh, freezing in the shower. The birdie must be using the hot water in the kitchen. Oh, this water is ice cold. Oh. Uncle Mort! Uncle Mort! Uh, yes? Uncle Mort, where are you? The house is on fire! What? The house is on fire! Oh, I've got to get out of here. Oh, where's my clothes? There's no time to pose. My bathrobe, where'd I put it? Never mind, here's a big towel. All right, come on, Leroy, which way shall we go? No, 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 Uncle Mort, go back. Why? you still got the hiccups. What's that got to do with my house being on fire? It isn't on fire. I was just trying to scare you. Scare me? <laughs> What's the big idea? Gee, I only meant it for the best. I was just trying to frighten the hiccups away. If I ever ran out of the house like this, I'd frighten the neighbors away. <laughs> I'm awful sorry, Uncle Mort. Say, you better get back in the shower. There's a big drip on the carpet. Who, me? <laughs> oh. You clear out of here now. As soon as I get dry, we're going down to the court. Hiccups or no hiccups? All right, folks. <gasps> I'm ready to go now. Come on, Ted. Come on, Marjorie. We're coming. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where's Leroy? I think he went out. He must be waiting in the car. Good. I hope the judge doesn't mind. Okay, buddy, stick him up. Your money or your life. Leroy, come out of that closet and put back that water pistol. <laughs> oh, that didn't work either. You can't frighten me, Leroy. I'll go out and get in the car, young man. I told you, Leroy. Just you wait. I'll figure out a scheme that'll make Uncle Mort forget all about those beaks of his. Yeah. Uh, get in the car, everybody. <laughs> Lovely day, isn't it? Too bad I can't appreciate it. Maybe being in the fresh air like this, my hiccups will stop. Oh, no, they won't. Oh, the car is doing it, too. Boy, every time you hiccup, P.P., your foot goes down on the gas. Do you think so? Yes. You want to stop and let me drive? No, we haven't got time. Careful, Uncle Morse. Careful, you just went through a traffic signal. I can't help it. I'm afraid they're getting worse. Oh, lots worse. Yeah, they're curved. Yeah. What's the idea of driving down the street like a jackrabbit and jumping the signal? Where's your driver's license? Well, it's like this, officer. Oh, it's like that, is it? <laughs> hey, what's going on here? Well, my uncle has a severe attack of hiccups. Yes, he, yes he, he got it drinking a glass of water. Water, huh? Well, that's original anyway. <laughs> He's been hiccuping for hours. Show the officer how you've been hiccuping, uncle. See? Never mind, I've heard him before. Uh, officer, we're in somewhat of a hurry. We're rushing down to the... Uh, I get it. To a doctor. Well, come on. What? Oh, of course. That's it. Where's the nearest doctor, officer? Let's not dilly-dally. <laughs> Gee, you got it bad. Follow me. I'll clear away for you. Well, thank you. Medical Center building. Oh, I don't know how to thank you, officer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's all right. Same thing happened to my sister's kid two months ago. You know how we cured her? Made her eat a quart of ice cream fast. Oh, yes, yes. Well, I'll put that down on my list. Hurry, Uncle Mort. Shall we go with you? No, you two children stay here with Ted. Oh. 
Going up? Yes. Is there a doctor in the building who specializes in hiccups? I mean, a, a cure for hiccups. Oh, you might try Dr. Simard on 7. Get in, please. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Say, you've got some bad, mister. Yes. Yeah. Well, I know something that will cure them in no time. You do? What is it? Eat a quart of ice cream fast. Yes. Yeah. Seven floor. Uh, there's Dr. Smart's waiting room. Four doors down. Uh, thank you very much. All this fuss over these silly hiccups. Well, at least I'll get rid of them for sure now. Uh, Dr. E.E. E. Simard, throat, chest, and stomach. That should cover hiccups, I guess. <laughs> oh. How do you do? Do you wish to see the doctor? No. I just dropped in to catch up on my last year's reading. <laughs> Well, you should do something about those hiccups. Now, a quart of ice cream eaten fast. I know, it's a sure cure. But I want some competent medical advice. Is the doctor busy? Not at the moment. Uh, now, if you'll step in here and disrobe. I don't want to disrobe. I want to see the doctor. But if the doctor is going to examine you, you... He keeps his clothes on, doesn't he? Yes. Well, then I'll keep mine on, too. Stop! Where is he? Uh, step in here. Doctor, this gentleman wishes to consult you. Cut that, Miss Wood. How many times have I told you that patients must disrobe? We've been all through that, Doctor. <laughs> There's no need for me to do that. You can see what's wrong with me. <laughs> hmm. Open your mouth, please, and unbutton your vest. <laughs> Thank you. You can close your mouth now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it didn't take me long to diagnose this case. No? No, you're suffering from an intermittent, uncontrollable diaphragmatic spasm causing a sudden inhalation which is interrupted by a spasmodic closure of the glottis. I am? Yes. <laughs> well, what does that mean, Doctor? You hiccup. I know I hiccup. <laughs> I can hear myself. Uh, how do I get rid of them? Uh, now, don't get excited. I have a painless and infallible cure. Oh, uh, you have? What is it? Eat a quart of ice cream fast. That'll be five dollars, please. Oh! <laughs> so... Judges' chambers are down at the end of the hall, T.P. Oh, jumping jeeps. Look at the clock. This is a th of a time to show up. Feeling better, Uncle Mo? No. I've eaten so much ice cream, I sound like a good humor man. Now, take it easy, Uncle Mo. Uh, you take it easy, young man. And don't say anything to the judge. Shh. Here we are. Ted, did you send the financial report down this morning? Keep quiet. Now, don't worry. That report went down early. It should make a wonderful impression. Well, come on, let's go. Yeah, might as well face old pickle puss. You, careful, Leroy. Anything you say will be used against me. Come in. Uh, hello, Judge Hooker. At last. I was ready to go home. <laughs> what are you hiccuping for, Gildersleeve? For about four hours now. <laughs> Uncle Mark's been suffering all day long, Judge. Yeah, maybe if you could frighten him, uh, Quiet, Judge. Leroy, quiet. Uh, yes, Judge. Uh, I'd have been here sooner except for that. Well, I'm glad you sent down your report, Mr. Gildersleeve. Gave me time to study it. I'm pleased with what I found. Gee, that's swell, Judge. I thought you could do a good job for these children. You, uh, you did? Yeah. Well, thank you, Judge Hooker. Uh, in that case, we can leave. Uh, come on, Leroy. Come on, Marjorie. Come on, Ted. What's your rush, Gildersleeve? Take it easy. Oh. Uh, you're nothing but a bundle of nerves. Yes. Yeah. I never knew nerves came in such large bundles. That's <laughs> very good. I wonder if it'd be all right if I was absent from my duties for a while, Judge. I have some business to wind up in Whistle Vista. Uh, sure, sure. Go right ahead. Take all the time you want. Oh? Only be back next week. Oh. Yes, I see. Well, thanks, Judge. Excuse me, please. Oh, poor Uncle Mort. You can't travel in that condition. I bet Mr. Fowler at the drugstore would have something to relieve you. Let us two go see him, Marge. And if he can't help, I know a couple of other guys that can. All right. If you'll excuse us, we'll run along. Certainly. <laughs> goodbye, then. Uh, goodbye, goodbye. Can you drive Uncle Mort home? Oh, sure. Hey, Leroy. Well, Ted, let's get started. <laughs> oh, I can't stop that. Hey, those hiccups must be annoying. They are, indeed they are. By the way, I know a sure cure for hiccups. <laughs> what, you too? Oh, this one never fails. All you need is a brown paper bag. A brown paper bag? Well, that takes the prize. Uh, shall I go out and get one, Judge? No, no, here's the bag. Wait a minute. Wait till I dump the apples out. The uh, apples? <laughs> I teach a class at law school, and the boys always bring me apples. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's try this remedy. Oh, no, don't bother, Judge. I think they're stopping now. Now, let's make sure. 
All you have to do is to breathe in and out of this bag. Understand? I understand what to do, but I don't understand why. Well, you will. Just put your face in the bag. Fine. You look better already. <laughs> now go ahead and breathe. Oh. Now, <laughs> The principle is this. Normally, you exhale carbon dioxide and inhale oxygen. Oh, I see. But this way, you inhale the carbon dioxide you've already exhaled. Oh, I see. Is that clear? No. <laughs> well, if you stop inhaling oxygen, you'll stop hiccuping. It's really very simple. So are you. <laughs> you ought to be all right, but now, how are you feeling? <laughs> Worse. Oh, my, and I almost had him licked. Strange, it's never failed before. Let me see. <laughs> There's a hole in the bag. Oh, take me home, Ted. <laughs> I'm going right to bed. <laughs> oh, stop that. Hey, Lefty. Yeah? Here's a pillowcase. The ball is somewhere in here. Okay. Now, when we go out... If anyone asks who we are, we're the laundry man. I got you, Red. Uh, shall we uh, take this silver cup, too? Let me see. Yeah. Awarded to Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. First place, potato race, annual picnic, Gildersleeve Gertelway. <laughs> hey, I guess he was the whole works, huh? What do you say? No, no, no. It's more trouble than it's worth. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Too easily traced, huh? Hey. You sure there's no dough laying around? No, no. I looked every place, even behind the wallpaper. You think we should, uh... Think we should take any more clothes, Lefty? No. I'm wearing three of this guy's suits already. One on top of the other. I'd hate to have to run from some copper this way. Yeah, it's too bad we didn't snag any dough. Well, let's get going. Okay, you take it easy. Say, look. Get away from that window. Hey, there's a big fat guy coming up the walk. Quick, out the back way. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Is he alone? Yes, yeah, let's get out of here. No, 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 wait. I bet he's got a fat bankroll in his pocket. Let's hide behind these curtains. But where? Make it snappy. But where? Shh! Darling, you and I don't know the reason. Okay, buddy, stick him up. No, Leroy. What do you mean, Leroy? Get him up. Oh, I see. You must be a friend of Leroy. Yeah, he put you up to this, eh? <laughs> What'll that boy think of next? <laughs> I says for you to get them hands up and keep quiet, too. I'm sorry, mister, but it didn't work. I still got him. You see? Hey, Brad. Oh, uh, you brought a friend, eh? Hey, what's the matter with this guy? I thought you knew. I've got the hiccups. You see? Look, you, look. This is a gun in my hand. Yep. And I've got a good notion to let you have it. No, thanks. I wouldn't know what to do with it if you did. You... <laughs> hey, hey, Brad. Yeah. Should I give it to him? No, I don't want yours either. You're, you're, you're asking for it, mister. I am not. I don't want any guns. I'm afraid of guns. Oh! Sometimes they're loaded. <laughs> Shall I plug them, Red? Well, I don't think that'd cure me either, mister. Stand out of the way, Red. I'll show this smart aleck. <laughs> well, very realistic. Blanks, eh? <laughs> you, you missed. Hey, Mo. I'll try again. Don't do that. You'll have every cop in town here. Oh, a uh, gangbuster. <laughs> what are you going to do with a guy like that? I know, I know. Lefty, you stick your gat in his ribs and I'll frisk him. Okay. Now hold still, will you? This time I can't miss. <laughs> <laughs> now cut it out. Cut oh, it out. Stop. <laughs> Sorry, I'm tickly. You... Stop it. Here, uh, give me that gun. No, no, no. no. Oh, you get away from there. Hurry up, Fred. I can't, I can't. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's take his pants off. What? Yeah. That way we get his roll and he can't follow us either. Okay. Oh, no, you don't. By George, that's carrying things too far. Fine friends Leroy has taking my... <laughs> Keep your hands off me, you little... Grab him, Red. Oh, oh, look out for those flowers. <laughs> I warned you. Now you see what you... Uh, oh! That's right, Lefty. Throw him in the floor. Oh, you want to fight, eh? Well, all right. Oh, get off of me before I... Wait a minute, boys. Wait a minute. Stop. Stop. Oh, you give in, huh? Yes. You can quit now. My hiccups are all gone. More double talk. Yeah. Grab his like grab his leg. Get away from me, Red. Oh, Leroy should have never done this. That's right, Lefty. Sit on him. What is this? Wearing my new blue third suit. This is the last straw. I like to stand for you. Hold still, Red. Get him off. Hold still. Hold still while I hit him. No, no, no. Now, don't move. Now, I... Now, look what you've done. 
You've clunked your little partner. Hey, Lefty. Hey, Lefty. Speak to me. Yeah, speak to him, Lefty. All right, George, he's out cold. Give me that gun before you do any more damage. Oh, no, you don't. Ouch, my foot! Oh. The minute I saw those tight shoes, I knew you had corn. <laughs> hey, mister, huh? mister, please. What? Please don't point that gun at me. You're just nuts enough to shoot me. That's a very good idea. A couple of blanks might teach you not to go no, around. No, no, no. Huh? Come on, Uncle Mark, what's the big idea of leaving the front door open? Well, at last you're here, young man. Those two friends of yours are nothing but a couple of roughnecks. What friends? Who are these guys? Come, come, Leroy. Stop pretending. It's all right. My hiccups have disappeared. Oh, Mark. Oh! Look at this room. What? Who's that man? Sleeping on the floor. That's one of Leroy's friends, and he's not sleeping. Ah, uh, don't try to sneak out, Red. Uh, gee, I, I come back here, Red, and tell Leroy what you did to me. Well, Uncle, I never saw these men before in my life. And what's all our silver we're doing in a pillowcase? Uncle Mark, these guys are burglars. They are? What? They weren't fooling? And to think that I... Ah! Oh, my. Now I've got the hiccups all over again. Ah! Oh. <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But first, I want to say that being a mere man puts me at quite a disadvantage in talking to you housewives, especially you housewives who are really good cooks, because so many of you are probably already using delicious parquet margarine made by Kraft, and already know from your own experience that it's a grand-tasting, economical margarine that can be used in many ways. Yes, you know, for instance, that parquet margarine is really delicious for table use. And good for your family, too. You know that parquet makes cookies, cakes, and pie crust taste better because it's a genuine flavor shortening that adds its own delicate taste to all baked foods. You know that parquet margarine seasons hot vegetables to a queen's taste, makes pan-fried foods taste better, too, and it doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. And don't overlook the fact that parquet margarine is a highly nutritious energy food and a year-round source of vitamin A. Yes, you housewives who use parquet know how good it is. But some of you listeners probably haven't tried parquet margarine yet. Well, if you haven't, try it. Yes, ask your dealer for a pound or two of parquet margarine tomorrow. Just say parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. It's made by Kraft. Bags all packed, Uncle Mort. Oh, thank you, Marjorie. Say, Uncle, how soon will you get back from Wistful Vista? Uh, not until Wednesday. Oh, you'll be gone that long? Yes. I've got to put my house up for sale, and I also want to be on hand to greet my two little chums, Fibber McGee and Molly, when they return from their vacation Tuesday night. Say, maybe Fibber McGee would buy your house. No, no, no. From my past experience with Fibber McGee, he wouldn't buy the place. He'd just borrow it. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of the great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Present the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Each 
week at this time, Kraft presents from Hollywood, California, Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve. Written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from The Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, here's something I'd certainly be puzzling about if I were a housewife these days, and that's the problem of how to serve my family all the wholesome, nutritious foods they need and still keep within my budget. Well, here's one way to help solve that problem, and it's a mighty pleasant way, too. Yes, for nourishment your family needs, and for flavor they're sure to like. Serve them delicious, economical parquet margarine, made by Kraft. You see, parquet margarine is a highly nutritious food that's one of the best sources of food energy. And to parquet's natural wholesome goodness, Kraft adds vitamin A, 9,000 units to every single pound. But rich food value isn't all. Important, too, is parquet margarine's flavor, that delicate, appetizing taste that makes it the favorite of thousands of families for table use, for seasoning, for baking, and for pan frying. Just one taste will tell you about parquet's flavor. So why not try delicious parquet margarine tomorrow? Yes, ask your dealer for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve. Don't eat your luncheon so fast, Leroy. Yes, Leroy. Why do you think you're going in such a hurry? To a fire. Uncle Mort gave me a quarter to burn my leaves. Yes. Say, leaf burning might be a good business for me to go into. Better get outside, Leroy. There's a wind coming up and you're liable to blow your business right down the street. Okay. Hey, did anybody see my sweater? Excuse me while I can't be Yes. Hello, Bertie. Mr. Gilbert, please. Yes, Mr. Bill. Just finishing lunch. Now, come on in, Judge. Thank you. Well, hello, Ted. Uh, hello, Judge Hooker. This is an unexpected pleasure. Would you gentlemen care to indulge in a cup of coffee? No, no, only going to stay a moment. Mr. Wills and I have a little matter we want to discuss with you, Gildersleeve, in confidence. Oh, surely, surely. Let's go into the library. Thank you. Well, Leroy, what are you looking for? My sweater. I left it here somewhere. Yes, on my moose head. That's no place for a sweater. I put it in your room. Thanks. Oh, hi, Judge Hooker. Hello, Leroy. Ted. Hello, Leroy. Say, who do you think's going to win the game tomorrow? Leroy, we've got some business to talk over. Now, please imitate a priority and make yourself scarce. Uh, 23 skidoo. 23 skidoo? Yes, scram. Oh, uh, uh, I get you. 23 skidoo. Must be a new kind of jive. Wait till I spring that one on the jive. Yes, jive. Well, now that we're alone, let's get to the point. Yes, let's get right to the point, Judge. Uh, what is the point? Well, Ted tells me that you're interested in civic and municipal affairs. Yes, I am. It was Thomas Jefferson who said, if, or was it Benjamin Franklin? No, it was Thomas Jefferson who said... It, what did he say? Well, whatever it was, you can be sure it was right to the point, Judge. <laughs> We've got an organization here in Summerfield, Gildersleeve, known as the CGA. Yeah. We strive to make our city a finer and cleaner place to live in. And now that you've become a resident of Summerfield, we want you as a member. Well, uh, that's a great honor. I, I'm not sure that I deserve it, Judge. By the way, what is the CGA? Uh, the Clean Government Association, T.P. Oh. Well, I suggested that you were just the man to add the proper weight. Huh? Uh, I mean the proper weight in the right places. The right places, yeah. We want you to head the committee investigating conditions at our city jail. Oh, well, uh, city jail, eh? Well, well, thanks. What's wrong down there? If I told you what's going on, it'd make your mustache curl. Uh, yeah, the place can't hold on to its guests. Well, what's the trouble? Poor service? No. Prisoners keep escaping. Turnover is suspiciously high. Oh. Uh, we're getting ready to demand a cleanup. We want to get rid of the jailer. Everybody says he's made the place what it is. Yeah. Well, it sounds like he's created quite a stir. <laughs> <laughs> but we've got no evidence that we can put before the grand jury. Oh. We need the testimony of a reputable citizen who can gather the facts secretly. Well, now, how could we do that? Uh, one of our members offered to have himself arrested on some minor charge just so that he could get inside information. A splendid idea. Yeah, it would have been, except everybody knows him. The jailer and his gang is smell a rat. Oh. In fact, all our members are prominent, well-known citizens. Oh, that's too bad. Would have been a peachy plan. Well, if there was some good, substantial citizen who was new here in Summerfield... Yes, who wouldn't be recognized when he broke some petty law and landed in jail. Oh, but... that's right. A new man. A very excellent... Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> 
I can see what's coming. I'm the guy you're leading up to. I won't do it. Pull your chin in, Gildersleeve. Uh, I'm disappointed in you. I thought you were going to be a useful citizen. But I don't like jails. What's wrong with them? I don't want to find out what's wrong with them. For one thing, they're too confining. They give me claustrophobia. Oh, poppycock. That's just your imagination. It is not. I've got claustrophobia so bad I can't even wear a double-breasted vest. But you're, you're just the man we need. Where else can we find someone with your alertness and intelligence and daring? No place. Thanks for the compliment, Ted. I appreciate the honor, too. But no matter how thin you slice it, it's still 30 days in the clink. <laughs> oh, what's the use, Ted? He's all bull and bellow. No beef and brawn. No, look here, you. One more crack like that, and I'll fracture your skull with a hot marshmallow. Gildersleeve, you couldn't fracture a poached egg without getting winded. Why, you little legal linthead, I've got a good idea. Oh, you haven't had a good idea since you put on long pants. That settles it, Ted. Don't hold me back. I'm good. Gentlemen, please, please, this is a meeting about law and order. Well, just because he's a law, he can't order me around. I'm not... I am not trying to order you around, Gildy, old man. Oh, so now I'm an old man, am I? Stop acting like a baby. Yeah, I did. If you had any gumption, you'd help us clean up this town, Gildersleeve. It could lead to a long and honorable civic career. Yeah. Someday they'd put your statue in the park. Yeah? Who knows? Maybe they'd even name the park after you. Think of it. The Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve Memorial Park. Memorial Park? You quit burying me. I'm not dead yet. <laughs> But this plan is foolproof, T.P. The minute you have all the evidence, let us know, and Judge Hooker will get you out of jail with a writ of habeas corpus. Sure. You see? Oh, will you do it? What do you say, T.P.? Well, I didn't know about that, the, the habeas, about that. Then you'll do it? Well, if, if I really can make this town a cleaner, finer place to live in, yes. Ooh, what am I saying? I knew he'd do it, Ted. Well, what's our first move? Gildy's got to get himself arrested for some minor offense. Now, let's see. What could he do? I know. Go downtown, Gildersleeve, and pick a fight with a policeman. Talk back. Make him mad. Sass him. Say, that's something I've always wanted to do. <laughs> Sass a cop. This is going to be fun. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Better pick a small cop. Go ahead. Well, if everything's settled, I'll drive you home, Dad. Uh, all right now, boys. And don't forget, Hooker, when I give the CGA the SOS, you get me out PDQ. How do you like your uncle's new fall outfit? Why, Uncle Mullard! You look like a tramp. Yeah, well, what's the idea of the dark glasses? I'm going downtown to have myself arrested. What's the matter? Lose a bet on the Dodgers? You... No, Leroy. I'm only doing this to help make Summerfield a finer, cleaner place to live in. By going to jail? Yes. I don't tell a soul, but I'm going there to investigate conditions for the Clean Government Association. Oh, I didn't understand. Yeah. Well, don't you get it, sis? Unk something like a G-man. Yeah. Oh, boy, wait till I tell the gang. Leroy, if one word leaks out about this, I'll be thrown right out of jail. Oh, gee, Unk, I wouldn't want that to happen. Yeah. Uh, I'll keep quiet, yeah. but I still don't understand why you're wearing those terrible-looking old clothes. Yeah, boy, is that a corny outfit. It's, it's a disguise, Leroy. Do you like it? It's an old sack suit. Sack suit, huh? Looks like I forgot to take out the potatoes. Yeah. Well, it's, it's seven or eight years old, Leroy. I wonder if suits fitted tighter then or if I've expanded. You shouldn't wear those pants, Uncle Moore. Huh? You can't stand up in jail all the time. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, Miss Mark. Who that man? What you want with these children? Go away, you tramp. Uh, take it easy, Bertie. It's me, uh, Mr. Gildersleeve. You sure? Why, of course. Well, you done frightened me from here to Christmas. What you doing dressed up like a scarecrow, only not so skinny? <laughs> well, well, Bertie, the truth of the matter is... Oh, 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 don't tell her, Uncle Moore. You know how women are. I can't keep a secret. Yeah. She'll be telling it all around town before you even get to jail. Jail? Who's going to jail? You, oh. Mr. Gillespie? What for are you going to the pokey? The yeah, pokey? <laughs> I tell you, she's starting to broadcast already. Leroy, you spill the beans yourself. What beans? Now, what's going on around here? Oh, Marjorie will explain to you later, Bertie. And meanwhile, if you just keep quiet and don't mention this to anybody, I'll be able to get any jail without any trouble. You will? Yes. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of things I can say at this point, but I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. Oh, run along, Bertie. I'll try to explain to you later on. If I ever find out myself. Yeah. Okay, but I've got a feeling in my bones and it ain't rheumatism. Yeah. <laughs> well, what do you think, children? Do I look shabby enough? Sure, you look pretty good. Uh, that is, pretty bad, pretty good. Uh, uh, don't you think so, Marge? Well, I don't know. 
Something that doesn't quite fit in with the rest. Hmm? Oh, oh, yes, your mustache. That's it. Now, see here, Marjorie. I'm not going to shave off my mustache, even if it means I won't be able to get into that jail. Oh, you needn't shave it. Just trim it a little so it won't look so dapper. No, no, oh, no. Yes, now, come on. Here's a pair of manicures. Nothing okay. doing, Marjorie. Don't you ah, dare is. touch a hair. Hold his head, Leroy. Okay, sis. Hold still, huh? Oh, Leroy, stop now, that. Quit. Cut it Call out, me, children. Now. Call it's off. taken me years to stop, Marjorie. You'll ruin the shape. Hold still. Uncle. Stop it, sis. Leave my mustache alone. <laughs> oh, that's my nose, you Trimmy. Everything all right, Uncle Mark? Well, my upper lip was kind of cold. Keep it stiff, Uncle. It looks great. Yes. Uh, say, is it all right if we stick around and watch you get arrested? I should say not. I wouldn't have even let you drive me downtown if that conductor hadn't thrown me off the streetcar. Say, how do you plan to get arrested, Uncle Moore? Huh? I hope you're not going to do anything against the law. Well, nothing really bad. I'm just going to tease a cop. <laughs> well, I have fun getting that cop mad. Hey, Uncle Moore, stop. Huh? I see a policeman. Where? Coming down the street. See him? Boy, is he a big guy, too. Hey, Uncle Moore, you're not stopping. It, no sense in taking just the first policeman, you see, Leroy. <laughs> What's wrong with this one? Well, I'd kind of like to shop around for a little one. Uh, for a little while, I mean. <laughs> but you know how hard policemen ought to find when you want one. Huh? Now's your chance. Gee, Uncle, okay, ain't you going to... Well, all right, if you insist. Come on, Uncle. Uh, don't rush me, young man. Well, what are we waiting for? Well, I, I just don't know how to begin this. Why don't you just bump into him? Look how big he is. There wouldn't be any fun in that. Then step on his corn. Yeah, step on his corn. That's like putting one foot in the grave. Hurry up before he passes, huh? Now, quit pushing me out of the car, Leroy. Now, stop that. Whoop! Oh. Yeah. Say, look where you're going, you. You stepped right on my foot. Yeah. I did, officer? Well, why don't you keep those big, uh, flat feet out of my way? They are big, aren't they? Huh? <laughs> yes. Yes, they are big. And uh, clumsy, too. That's true. But you know, I have the worst time with them, especially when I dance. Yes. Yeah. I'm not interested in your waltzing dogs. Now, out of my way before I get tough. Oh, don't, don't shout. I've got a splitting headache as it is. Oh, you have? Uh, I'll shout if I want to. Yes, by George, I'd like to see you stop me. Now, really, really, mister, if you're going to create a disturbance, I'm not going to stand here and take it. You're not, eh? Uh, what are you going to do? I'm going home to bed. Oh! <laughs> Wait a minute, aren't you going to arrest me? Oh, oh no, no. As a citizen and no. taxpayer, I insist on being arrested. Well, in that case, you'd better find a policeman. Yes. Yeah. Aren't you a policeman? Shh. Don't tell a soul. But I'm just getting home from a masquerade ball. Oh. Hey, Uncle Mark, here we are. Oh, I wish you two children would stop following me around. You're just a jinx. Oh. No matter what I try, I can't get myself arrested. Well, um... Did you walk on the grass in the park and pick the flowers like I told you to do? Yes, but that didn't work. Well, you should have waited till you saw a policeman. I did, and all he did was wink at me. How about jaywalking? No arresting people for that these days. I tried jaywalking right on a busy street. What happened? A couple of big trucks just missed me and ran into each other. And the officer didn't arrest you? No, he was too busy separating the truck drivers. <laughs> I even tried to steal a mounted policeman's horse. That should have landed you smack in the hoose gout. Well, it would have, except this was a burglar-proof horse. What do you mean? He just sat down in the gutter and refused to move. <laughs> You better give up, Uncle Moore. No, sir. I'm just as stubborn as the police department. I'm going to jail this afternoon if it takes me all night. Uncle, I've been thinking. I know it'll do the trick. It, what is it, my boy? What is it? You see that pile of bricks? The bricks? Yes. Yeah. And see all the pretty straw windows? Oh, Leroy, I don't want to hurt those shopkeepers. Okay, then. How about that row of empty stores across the street? You couldn't hurt anybody there. You're a bright boy, Leroy. <laughs> now, you children go back to the car and pretend you don't know me. All right. So long, Uncle Moore. I hope you make it this time. Yeah, thanks. Uh, better take an armful in case I miss. Well, here goes. <laughs> it doesn't seem to attract any attention. I better try again. What kind of a neighborhood is this? Well, I'll wake him up this time. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> Uh, what's wrong, Marjorie? Look at the signs in those windows you broke. Signs? Where? Oh, yes. Uh, these stores for rent by the Forester Estate. Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve agent. Oh, my. Now, go on, Uncle. Here, 
wrong the guy. Yeah? Do as I told you, and I can't keep you out of the coop. Oh, but this is ridiculous, Leroy. I'm a little embarrassed. I'll get stage fright. Well, you said it was for a worthy cause. I'll be waiting. I'll... Yeah. Oh, I, I don't like this. Uh, excuse me, buddy, but could you spare a dime for a worthy cup of coffee? Why, sure, pal. I've been up against it myself. Here, here's a quarter. Oh. That's all right. Keep it up. Sooner or later, somebody's going to complain to the cop on the corner. Oh, to think. A Gildersleeve hustling handouts on the highway. Here comes another customer, Uncle Moore. Okay. Makes me feel like a cat. <clears throat> uh, pardon me, lady, but could you spare a dime for a cup of coffee? Why, you poor man, I'll do better than that. I'm going to take you to the nearest restaurant and buy you a nice hot meal. But, madam, I've had my luncheon already. I just forgot to drink my coffee. <laughs> I simply refuse to ask another person for another dime for another cup of coffee. Why, I've collected over $7 already. <laughs> Here, to give it to some worthy charity. Start a fund to buy glasses for her nearsighted policeman. What are you going to do now? I'm giving up. I never knew it would be so hard to get yourself arrested. Come on. Your sister's waiting in the car. Oh, well, look, that lady dropped her purse. Hand it here, Leroy. Thanks. Which lady was it, Unc? The one with the hat like a waffle. Uh, hey, lady! Uh, Leroy, you go to the car while I run ahead and give it back to her. Uh, lady! Oh, oh, lady! Uh, uh, lady! Oh, lady! Uh, uh, lady, I've been whistling at you for a block. I heard you. How dare you follow me? Uh, I wasn't following you. I was trying to catch you. Oh, what? Uh, here's your purse, lady. You dropped it back there. I did not. But I thought I saw you. I have my purse right here in my hand. What? That was just an excuse to stop me and try to flirt. You masher. Masher? Who, oh, lady? Yes, yes. A girl isn't safe anymore with wolves like you roaming the streets. Wolves? No, see here. I wish there was a policeman around. I'd teach you a lesson. Quiet, lady. You're attracting a crowd. Why, you ought to be ashamed. Oh, Whistling and shouting at a poor girl. Girl? You wouldn't be so bold and sassy if my brother-in-law was here to protect me. Oh, oh. Oh, my God. Excuse me, lady. Uh, maybe I can help you. Quiet, quiet, please. Quiet. Yes, quiet. What's wrong? This man is bothering me. I am not. Move on, bum. You're bothering the lady. But I just ran after her. It bothered her. Now run away. But I want to give her this purse. I don't want your old purse. My purse? She says she don't want your purse. Now beat it. All right, Mr. Abuse. Wait a second. Who are you to tell me I should beat it? I'm a deputy sheriff, see? Now, if you don't want to be pulled in for mashing... But I swear, I... Mr. Mr. Huh? Got my purse. Oh, is this your purse? Well, I thought it belonged to the other lady. Oh, the <laughs> lady's pocketbooks, too, huh? Huh? Now I got you on two charges. Mashing and purse snatching. Oh, but I tell you, Deputy, I'm innocent. Oh, yeah? Come on now, fatty. Let's get down to the sheriff's office. Well, I just saw it lying there on the sidewalk, mister, and I thought that... Are you coming quietly, or do I have to drag you to jail? I won't come quietly. You can't make me... If... What? You're going to take me to jail? You catch on fast. Well, why didn't you say so? Come on, come on, come on. I just can't wait till we get there. <laughs> in here, fatso. If that's all. Come on, step in there. You think I'm going to carry you across the threshold? Uh, no, no. I'll walk. <laughs> Spud, you got a roommate. Show this guy the ropes. Sure. Well, make yourself at home, Bunky. What's your name? Uh, Gildersleeve. Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Boy, did you pick yourself a phony moniker. Uh, what? Nobody'd ever believe that one. But I assure you, sir, that's my name. Uh, look here, Spud. Uh, I don't want to stay around here a moment longer than I have to. Who does? <laughs> How's their chances of getting out? I don't know. Got a good lawyer? No, no, no. I mean, how's, how's chances of escaping? You mean take it on the lamb? Well, if you want to be technical, yes. Uh, not a chance in the world, Funky. This joint is airtight. Shh. But I've heard otherwise. Yeah, sure. So did I. But I'm still here. What? Why, I bet I tried everything. And I know all the tricks. Shh. You do? Yeah. That's why I'm here. Oh. On account of busting out of all the other joints. But I was told that lots of you robber chaps got free. Then somebody gave you a bum steer, pal. Huh? Why, this is the place that gave him the idea for Alcatraz. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Nobody's ever cracked this jug. Oh, I can hardly believe that. Oh, no? Huh? Well, I'll show you. Hey, deputy. You. Yeah? What is it, Spud? Anybody ever escape out of this cooler? No, nobody's ever escaped out of this cooler. Oh. Hey, Gildersleeve. Oh, uh, yes, sir? You got visitors. Oh, thank you. Come on. 
fine mess Judge Hooker and Ted have gotten me into. The hot cooler. Oh, oh. oh uh, hello, children. Are you all right, Uncle? Gee, you made it after all, didn't you, Uncle? How did you manage to do it? Oh, it's a long story, Marjorie. Remind me to tell it to you some cold winter night when we've got nothing better to do. Now, I want you to get a hold of Ted and Judge Hooker. Yes? Tell them that their information was all wrong. Nobody's ever escaped out of this cooler. You mean you're just wasting your time? That's it exactly, Roy. Now, you tell them to get me out of this rabbit hutch quick like a bunny. Judge Hooker's chambers. Uh, let me talk to Judge Hooker, please. This is Ted Will speaking. Oh, sorry, Mr. Will. He just left. Oh, I see. When will he be back? Well, in about a week, he said. What? A, a week? Uh, he can't do that. Oh, yes, he can. He's just gone to New York on court business. But he can't go. He's left someone in the lurch. Oh, my goodness. Where's the judge stopping in New York? Well, he hasn't decided. He's going to let me know. Uh, what's the trouble? He's left an innocent man here in jail. Oh, that's what all you lawyers say. Oh. Goodbye. Marge, Leroy, what are we going to do? Poor Uncle Mort. Yeah, poor Uncle Mort. Darling, you and I know the reason why I'm going to get out of this jail by and by. Oh, stop it, stop it, Throckmorton, stop it. That's all you've been doing all day long. What are you so cheerful about? You'll soon see, Spud. I'll be out of here quicker than you can walk across this cell. Yeah, well, cut out that singing. I'm punished enough without that. Yeah. I can't help it. I'm so happy about leaving this place. I've just got to sing. Uh, darling, you and I... You know... Hey, Gildersleeve. Huh? You got a visitor. Oh, <laughs> you see, Spud? What did I tell you? <laughs> Thank you, Deputy. Darling, you and I know the reason why I'm such a happy guy. Oh, well, hello, Bertie. I'm glad to see you. Uh, where is everybody? They were afraid to come down, Mr. Gilsleeve. Uh, afraid? What were they afraid of? Afraid of you. They sent me down to break the bad news. What bad news? Judge Hooker done forgot all about you and went to New York for a week. What? Yes, sir. I told you something bad was going to happen. He can't do this to me. Bertie, did you ring me a habeas corpus? I'm sorry, Mr. Gillsleeve. All I brought you was a roast chicken. I don't want a roast chicken. I would... Hey, I do want a roast chicken. Where is it? The man at the door, he done took it away from me. Why, that petty chiseler. But I don't think he's going to enjoy eating it. Why not? <laughs> I stuffed it with some little sauce, some fries, and a little gun. <laughs> Let me out of here. You can't keep me in here. It's against the law. Rock Morton, if you don't shut up, the warden's going to send you to solitary. Uh, let him send me to any place. As long as it's out of here. You know, you're the screwiest cellmate I ever roomed with, Funky. Yeah? The other prisoners are circulating a petition demanding your removal. Oh. Now, why don't you just sit down like a good little fella and write another letter to the newspaper? No, I've been framed and double-crossed. And they were going to name a statue after me in a memorial park. I'm really a member of the Clean Government Association. Well, you certainly don't act like it. Huh? In the past three days, you've tried to set the cell on fire four times. Yeah. And the rest of the time, you're either trying to bribe the guards or you're organizing a jailbreak. Gildersleeve, you ain't playing the game. <laughs> play any games. I just want to play the anvil chorus on a certain judge's head with a baseball bat. All right, Gildersleeve, get your things. You're leaving. Uh, leaving? I am? Oh, I can hardly believe that. <laughs> oh, this makes me very happy. Uh, that makes it unanimous. Oh, uh, uh, goodbye, Spud. Ah! <laughs> uh, try, to, uh, try to keep out of mischief from now on, Spud. Well, goodbye, boys. Uh, behave yourselves. Yeah! Yeah, glad to, <laughs> bum. Uncle <laughs> Moore, you're free. Oh, hello, children. Yeah. Hello, Ted. Hello, Hooker. Hello. Well, it took you long enough to get me out of here. How guilty it was all a mistake. Yeah, let's not discuss it here. Shall we go? Yes. But first, I want to ask you two great civic leaders a question. Where did you get your phony information? From a fortune teller? It wasn't phony. And why did you have to yell your head off about our investigation? It's all over town now. What difference does that make now, Hooker? There's nothing to prosecute here. The jail is escape-proof. I found that out. 
And from what I saw, it's run on the level, too. Of course it is. I knew that all along. Then why in the name of common sense did you send me here? That's just it. We didn't tell you to come here, Gildersleeve. What? No, this is the county jail. We told you to go to the city jail. Oh, my... Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, I wonder how many of you housewives baked a cake or some cookies yesterday for your Sunday dinner today. A lot of you did, I'm sure, because there's just nothing like that real home-baked flavor. Well, here's a hint for the next time you bake. For luscious extra flavor in cookies, cakes, or pastries, use delicious parquet margarine for the shortening. You see, parquet margarine is a genuine flavor shortening, not just a bland, tasteless fat. Yes, the same delicious flavor that makes parquet grand for table use makes it marvelous for baking, too. And that's why so many women also use parquet margarine for seasoning hot vegetables and for pan frying. But whether you use parquet margarine at the table, for seasoning, for baking, or for pan frying, you're adding valuable nourishment to your family's diet. And every pound of parquet contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. And remember, good as parquet tastes and nourishing as it is, Parquet is so economical, you can use all you want. So why not join the thousands of Parquet users and order a pound or two tomorrow? Just ask for Parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. It's the margarine that's made by Kraft. Spud, how? Well, somebody did escape out of that cooler. Uh, they did? Who? Me. So long, Rocky. Uh, Spud, uh, Spud, you're not playing the game. Good night. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents... The Great Gildersleeve. (laughs) Each week at this time, Kraft presents from Hollywood, California, Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, I want to remind you that these are challenging days for every one of us. It's our duty to produce more to help meet our country's increasing needs. And that takes plenty of good food, as you wise homemakers know. Wholesome, nutritious food that provides the energy and nourishment your hard-working, hard-playing family needs. That's why you should know about parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Parquet margarine is a delicious food that's packed full of wholesome nourishment. It's one of the best sources of food energy you can serve. And important to you housewives who know how essential vitamins are, every pound of parquet margarine contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. 
making it a reliable year-round source for your whole family. What's more, parquet is the margarine with the delicious flavor, whether you use it at the table for baking or for pan frying. So why not give your family the benefit of this grand-tasting, nourishing food? Tomorrow, ask your dealer for a pound or two of economical parquet margarine made by Kraft. Just ask for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve. Come on, wake up, Judge Hooker. Pay attention to your checkers. It's your move. I know it, Gildersleeve. I was merely studying the board. What, with your eyes closed? <laughs> let's speed this up. We haven't got all night here. All right. There, there. There and there. <laughs> now crown me. I'd love to, but I haven't got anything to do it with. Hooker, I don't see how you keep beating me, honestly. In fact, I don't think you do, honestly. Gildersleeve, you're a pushover. You couldn't win a game from a backward baboon with a dozen checkers up your sleeve. I could, too. Um, I mean, I wouldn't need a dozen checkers. I'll show you, Hooker. Set them up again and pull in your belt. Because this time I'm going to beat the hell of Leroy. How are you tonight? <laughs> Hooker. Leroy. Say, Unc, can I... Uh, can you what, Leroy? Well, I hate to keep pestering you, Bart, but can I see the circus tomorrow afternoon? Not unless they happen to pitch the tent in the front yard of the Peter B. Flugelhammer Junior High School. Is that where you go, Leroy? Yeah, Flugie Junior High. Say, I grew up with Peter B. Flugelhammer Sr. That's who the junior high school was named after. If, well, I thought the school was named after Peter B. Flugelhammer Jr. No, Junior was the son of Sr. after whom the junior high school was named. Poor Junior. He never could finish senior high. Yo. But, gee, Uncle Mort, could you call up school and ask if I could skip tomorrow? I did, Leroy. I even went so far as to predict that you wouldn't be feeling very well tomorrow. What did they say? They told me that an excuse for illness while the circus is in town must be accompanied by a note from your doctor. Shucks, that's a heck of a note. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, there's no use grousing, young man. Remember, school must come first. Now, sit down and get started with your homework. Yes, Leroy, your homework, that's the thing that's going to count in later life, not going to the circus. I don't think so, Judge, because in my later life, I expect to be a lion tamer. Oh? You don't need any education for that. All you need is a kitchen chair and the right kind of breakfast food. <laughs> well, yes. This lion taming is new, though. Last week, you were going to become a pitcher with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Oh, that was last week. Oh. Gee, I wouldn't mind missing the circus so much, Uncle Mort, but I hate to see those passes go to waste. Oh, did you get passes, Gildersleeve? Did I get passes? Yes, sir. I've got certain connections. Yeah, Uncle Mort gets the right number of beans in that jar in the drugstore window. Oh. Yes, I connected that time. <laughs> Gee, Uncle Mort, are you sure you can't take me? Uh, I'm sorry, Leroy, but you'd better make up your mind to skip the circus. Oh, gee, a guy can't get any fun out of life. Yeah. You know, Gildersleeve, sometimes I think our school system has become too scientific, too streamlined. You're right, Judge. These days, everything is streamlined. Uh, except me. <laughs> Yes. Things were a lot different in the days when I went to school. <laughs> what a memory. I sat, I sat next to Petey Flugelhammer. Huh? That was long before he was elected lieutenant governor and then named the school after himself. Oh. We had none of this modern stuff like getting a doctor's prescription to go to the circus. Yes, it was the same in my school days, too, Judge. Of course, I'm not as old as you are. What do you mean, Gildersleeve? You were shaving when I was a little shaver. I was not. You were, too. All right, all right. I was always taught not to contradict my elders. <laughs> it, come to think of it, Judge, we kids used to have a lot more fun than modern children have. I can still remember some of the tricks we pulled at school. So do I. Shenanigans, they were called. Yes. I'll never forget the time I dropped a paper bag full of water on the Spanish teacher. Only it turned out to be the new athletic coach. And when he caught me, boy, was he athletic. <laughs> That's nothing. I once sneaked up behind Miss Pettibone's desk and tacked her dress to the floor. <laughs> kids don't do a thing like that these days. Yeah, kids can't do a thing like that these days. <laughs> Say, a Judge, did you ever put eggs in the principal's umbrella? No, did you? Uh-huh. I had my own hen and I saved eggs for a rainy day. <laughs> <laughs> 
I can still see him lifting that umbrella over his head. <laughs> well, I put alum in the water pitcher at our graduation exercises. Oh, that's a peachy stunt. <laughs> what happened? I didn't graduate. <laughs> oh, yes, youth. Sometimes I wish I were a kid again, just so I could pull a few more of those cute little innocent juvenile pranks. Well, they're a thing of the past. Yeah. I never hear of kids doing those things these days. Not enough imagination, I guess. That's right. You know, I remember when a dog and pony show came to our town and all us kids made up our minds to go. You know how we got the afternoon off? No, how? Well, I climbed up on the schoolhouse roof and stuffed my coat into the chimney. <laughs> Boy, I wish you could have seen that smoke pour in and those kids pour out. <laughs> Gildy, I'll bet you were car. Oh, that wasn't anything. Did I ever tell you about the time we smuggled the horse up in the bell tower at college? Gee, no, Uncle Mort, tell us about it. Well, I borrowed this. Leroy, I didn't know that you were still here. Sure, you told me to do my homework. Say, did you ever do any homework, Uncle Mort? Uh, stacks of it. Gee, when did you find the time? Didn't it interfere with your jokes? Now see what you've done, Gildersleeve, giving the boy a wrong impression of our childhood. Me? You started it, tacking teacher's skirts to the floor. And you, a superior court judge. Why aren't you ashamed? Well, how about you, egging the principal on and trying to brain everybody with bags of water? What do you mean, everybody? Just our Spanish teacher, Miss Olofsson, that's all. <laughs> now, Leroy, don't get us wrong. Judge Hooker and I were merely reminiscing about an era that doesn't exist anymore. I'll say it doesn't. You couldn't get away with those corny gags today. Those gags weren't corny, Leroy. They were mighty clever. <coughs> huh? Oh, oh, yes, yes. They were terrible. Uh, the big kids made me do them. I'm ashamed of myself. Aren't you, Judge Hooker? Yes. I was a bad boy. <laughs> you, you see, Leroy... Gee, you two treat me as if I was 12 years old. You are 12 years old, Leroy. Sure, I know, but I don't like to be treated that way. Yeah. You'll have to hurry, Marjorie, if you're going to the circus with me. I'm almost ready. What's the rush, Uncle Mort? Well, I'd like to get there on time for once. No matter when I start, it seems I always arrive in time to get caught in the opening procession. One year, a hippopotamus chased me around the ring twice. I never did find my seat. <laughs> it's too bad Leroy couldn't get off from school to come with us. Yes, the poor boy. Well, we'll bring him back a red balloon and a little whip it, with a tassel. <laughs> hey, anybody home? Hi. Leroy. Gee, I'm glad I caught you before you left for the circus. Well, Leroy, what are you doing home at this hour? School was dismissed just now. Come on, let's go to the circus. By the way, Leroy... Why were classes dismissed? Well, uh, you might call it an accident. Accident? What was the accident? Oh, nothing serious. Then what was it? Oh, it seems they had to get all the students out quick on account of all the rooms had to be aired out. Aired out? They did? Why? Well, nobody knows for sure exactly, but the general opinion is that uh, somehow or other, a stunt got into the air conditioning system. Oh! <laughs> I've ever seen. How did you like the fellow who did the swan dive into the tank of burning gasoline, Uncle Mort? I liked him, but I don't think Secretary Ickes would. <laughs> Leroy, there's something that's been troubling me. It's that skunk in your school. You mean Mr. Proctor, the principal? No, Leroy. <laughs> the one that got into the air conditioning system. Do you happen to know how it got in there? No, I don't. Say, remember the tiger that rode on the elephant's back? How did they train him to do that, Uncle Mort? Oh, with kindness, I suppose. Uh, Leroy, did you happen to have anything to do with it? With the tiger, Uncle Mort? No, the skunk! That wasn't a skunk, Uncle. It was a tiger. Tigers and skunks have different kinds of stripes. I know they have. I'm talking about school. But, you know, I've been thinking... Isn't it a strange coincidence that this accident occurred on the day the circus came to town? Yeah, funny, ain't it? Uh, uh. Say, Uncle Mort, what do you think would happen if when the lion tamer had his head in the lion's mouth, the lion suddenly had a sneeze? Well, I don't think anyone would say tight. <laughs> <laughs> now, Leroy, I hope that nothing Judge Hooker and I said about our school day pranks caused you to try to imitate us. Oh, no, sir. You understand we were just talking about old times. Yes, sir, like Judge Hooker says. That's about all you old-timers have got left. Your memory. Yeah. What did you say? Uh, good 
afternoon, Bertie. Is Leroy home from school yet? Well, let me look in the refrigerator. Uh, no, sir. Did you expect to find him in there? <laughs> no, but I can tell if he's here by what ain't. <laughs> well, maybe he wasn't hungry this afternoon. That boy? Why, he's nothing but appetite held together by skin and bones. Oh, what's the matter? Well, there's a lot of strange things going on at Leroy's school, and I'm afraid that maybe I'm partly to blame. How come you messing around the school? Is you one of them pants teachers? <laughs> no, it's just that Judge Hooker and I were talking about some little pranks we used to play when we were in school. A little uh, harmless things, you know. Uh-huh. Uh, well, Leroy happened to overhear us, and now I'm afraid he's showing us the modern versions with the uh, chromium trimmings. Uh-huh. Uh, what makes you think little Leroy's doing for my diddles? Well, uh, did you read the afternoon paper? No, sir. It never gets to me till the following morning. Oh, yes. Well, I've got it right here. Listen to this. Juvenile jokers startle school. Police were called early today to investigate a large, stout lady's body seen suspended from the window of Principal Poultney Proctor at Flugelhammer Junior High School. Oh, who was it, Miss Proctor? Yes. No. Listen. Closer inspection revealed that the body was a dummy, stuffed with old football pads, wearing a green and purple silk dress, size 48. Green and purple silk? Size 48? Yeah. Sounds like my Sunday go-to-meeting dress. The one that was kidnapped off the clothesline last night. Yes, doesn't it? Well, what's my dress doing in the newspaper? Uh, I don't know, Bertie. <laughs> Shh, hey, Bertie, here comes Leroy. Do you think he did it? Shh. Afternoon, Uncle Morse. Hiya, Bertie. Say, is this your old dress? That's my new dress, Leroy, and what you doing with it? Why, Piggy Banks just gave it to me. He says the wind must have blown it over into his yard. He found it under a window. Young man, isn't this the dress that was hanging out of Mr. Proctor's window this morning? You mean on the dummy that was suspended from school? If... Well, how could it be if it belongs to Bertie? What do you think, Bertie? I ain't saying nothing. I'm only too glad to get my dress back without paying ransom. I'm going to hide it this time. Yeah. I don't know what to do. Uh, look, Leroy, don't think of me just as your uncle and your guardian. Think of me as your pal, your buddy. Now, if there's anything that's troubling your little mind, why don't you just come right out with it? Well... Okay, Uncle. There is something that's been bothering me. I understand. Go right ahead, my boy. What is it? Well, how did you ever get that horse up into the bell tower at college? Oh! <laughs> I asked you to come here tonight, Judge Hooker, is because you and I are turning Leroy's school topsy-turvy. Why, I haven't been near the place... We've been we... doing it by remote control. Remember how we shot off our mouths in front of Leroy about our school day monkey shines? Yes, and say, I just remembered another one. Forget it. Leroy has been up to all our old tricks. Oh, his teachers have caught him, huh? No, that kid's smarter than we were. But we got to stop him from going on with him. Well, maybe if I gave him a little lecture... Hooker, you don't understand children. That wouldn't work at all. We've got to pretend we don't know what's going on. That shouldn't be hard for you to do. <laughs> when Leroy comes in, that'll be our cue to start casually chatting about the evils of practical joking. Yeah. Yeah. Subtle propaganda, you know. How about it, Hooker? We can try it. Too bad this whole thing had to happen. You know, Gildersleeve, it would never have started if you hadn't opened your fat face. Me? Why, it was you that started it, you little travesty on justice. Is that so? Why, Gildersleeve, if you had the intelligence of a jackass... Uh, but no, why should I daydream? <laughs> There's no use arguing with you. Why not? Because I don't argue with blubberheads. Well, I do, you blubberhead. <laughs> Just because you're a judge, do you think? No, I can answer that myself. You don't think. Don't you provoke me, you big water wind. Oh, that settles it. I'm going to lambaste you with... Oh, excuse me, I didn't think... Oh, uh, any... oh, come right in, Leroy. I was, uh, I was just telling Judge Hooker how to uh, baste the lamb, wasn't I, Judge Hooker? <laughs> huh? huh? Oh, yes, yeah. yes. Don't let us disturb you, Leroy, my boy. Go right ahead and do your homework. Just pay no attention to us. I won't. Uh, uh, as we were saying, Judge, uh, don't you think that juvenile delinquency often starts with some innocent boyish prank? When were we saying that? Oh, uh, of course, Gildersleeve. Uh. Quite often, a young fella starts out for a lark and winds up in a cage. How's that? Oh, Judge. 
Then you think that uh, practical joking can lead to uh, serious consequences? Surely. Yeah. It starts out with a fellow dipping girls' pigtails into ink wells, and then he becomes bored with that and puts firecrackers in the coal scuttle. Yes. Or water in the teacher's galoshes, and then setting them out to freeze. Never heard of that one before. Huh? That's only good in real cold weather. Well, in summertime, you can always put flypaper on all the chairs. Yes. With the words, kick me, printed on the back. Yeah. Say, I did that when I was in fourth grade. You should have seen the fun at recess. You know, I used to hunt for frogs during recess and put them all in the lunchboxes. <laughs> Once I made a mistake and put one in my own lunchbox. <laughs> <laughs> Did I tell you about the time that I snagged our principal's wig with a fish pole and then hoisted it to the top of the flagpole? Oh, boy. I wish I could have seen... Oh, my goodness. What have we been saying? Huh? Leroy, don't you pay any attention to this old... Go- uh, say, where is Leroy? I don't know. You said pretend he wasn't here, and by George, he isn't. Yes, and a lucky thing, too. How did we ever get started talking like that again? I remember distinctly. You began it, Gildersleeve. Me? Who are you people, little fuddle-headed funny duddy Smile when you say that, Gildersleeve. Smile? I'll laugh right out loud. <laughs> Hello, Marjorie. Hello, Pierpont. I came to see Meatball. Who? Meatball. You know, Leroy. Only he don't like us kids to call him Leroy anymore. Like I don't like to be called Pierpont. All right. Piggy. <laughs> Come on in. Oh, Leroy. Piggy Banks is here to see you. Come on to the library, Piggy. It's right that way. Thanks. Well, come on in. Don't be bashful. But your uncle, that's him behind that newspaper, ain't it? What's the matter with him? Oh, nothing. He always does that after dinner. He's digesting his food. Oh. Ain't we going to disturb him? No, we had roast beef and potatoes for dinner. Nothing will bother Unc for another hour at least. Now, let's get going on that history stuff. Well, I know Miss Keller's going to ask us about the vice presidents tomorrow. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. She's going through the book exactly the way she did last year, the first time I took the course. (laughs) Okay, I I think I've got to memorize. But is she going to ask us the names of all the vice presidents? She did last year. I kept a diary. All right, but gee, what a question to ask. Well, you check the list and see if I get them right. Shoot. Uh, John Adams... Thomas Jefferson, Aaron Burr, uh, uh, Aaron Burr... You said that. Mm. Say, Meatball, what do you think of the stuff that's been pulled off at school lately? Oh, I don't know. What do you think of it? Oh, I don't know. Have any idea who's doing it? Gee, I don't know. You got any idea? Well, I don't know. Who do you think? I don't know. Let's get back to the vice president. Okay. (laughs) Shoot. Uh, John Adams, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Aaron Burr, uh... Say, I wonder who put the iron sulfide in Miss Keller's inkwell. How'd you know it was iron sulfide, Meatball? Shucks, anybody knows that's the stuff that puts the smell in inkwell. You know who pulled that one, Piggy? Let's get back to Vice President. Okay. (laughs) Uh, uh, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Aaron Burr. uh, Oh, gee, I don't know what good knowing the Vice President is going to do a guy who's going to be a stuntman in the movies. I thought you were going to be a lion tamer. Well, lion taming's just one of the stunts I'm going to do. Talking about stunts, did you hear about the one somebody just pulled tonight over in the schoolyard? Which one's that? Ah, I bet you know about it already. Well, maybe I do and maybe I don't. I ain't saying. What are you talking about? Oh, about what they did to old man Flugerhammer's statue. <laughs> somebody dressed him up in a set of red flannel underwear and a corset. No kidding! <laughs> yeah. Boy, if they ever find out who did that, they'd be expelled from school prano, I bet. <laughs> Let's get on with the vice president's pig. All right. Say, could I borrow a glass of water? We had corned beef for dinner. Sure. Come on out in the kitchen. I'll get it for you. Boy, wait till Mr. Proctor sees the woolies on Flugy. <laughs> Did I hear right? Red flannels and a corset on Flugy? Or was I just dreaming? No. There's Piggy Banks' hat. It's true. Oh, let me think. Yes, that's what I'll have to do. 
Yes, six. Hooker is just as much to blame as I am. I can't let Leroy be expelled. Hello, Judge. This is Gildersleeve. You got to help me with something. I can't explain now, but I'll pick you up in about ten minutes. We got a date with an old schoolmate of yours. This is the right part of the schoolyard? Why, of course. Not so loud, Gildersleeve. Oh. I'm a superior court judge. Can you picture what would happen if I'm caught? Yes, yeah, scandalous, isn't it? <laughs> oh, why do I let you get me into situations like this? Because you haven't got any more brains than I have. And where in the name of Goots and Borglum is that statue? Oof. Never mind, I found it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Flugelhammer up there. Flannels, corsets, and all. Let's not hang around here all night, Gildersleeve. Come on, I'll boost you up. Well, wait a minute, I'll take this top coat off. All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's better. All right, get down now. <sighs> up, see, Daisy. Oh! oh, my poor back. You'll cave it in. <laughs> Push my other foot up, Judge. I will if you take it out of my hip pocket. <laughs> yeah, there. Is that better? No. Ow! Now it's in my ear. Well, in one ear, not the other. Gildersleeve, get up there. Yeah. Okay. Uh oh. What's wrong? Judge, you notice a sudden cold wind? <laughs> no, can't say that I do. Which way is it coming? Up. <laughs> the judge, hold my feet so I won't fall. I got him, I got him. You're all right, solid as a rock. No, no, you're holding Pete's feet. What? The flat-footed Fugelhammer. Yeah, that's better. Now I can get to work. I wonder where Leroy ever found this corset. Make it snappy, Gildersleeve. Who do you think you are, Gypsy Rose Lee? Yep. Okay, okay, I've got it now. Here, catch it, Judge. Hurry up before somebody catches us. All right. Hey, Leroy must have sewn this underwear on. I never knew the little rascal could sew. How's it coming, Gildy? Just another second. Yeah. Cut out that whistling, Judge. I'm not whistling. That must be the night watchman. Oh. Come on, rip it off. Let's grab. Okay, head for the car, Judge. Hey, who's there? Uh, this way, Judge. Quit calling me Judge, Gildersleeve. Oh, there are you. Don't you believe him, Gildy? Oh. oh! Scatter, Judge, scatter. I'll meet you at the drugstore. <laughs> the principal sent for us, Uncle Mort? Well, now, you let me handle the whole thing, Marjorie. Do you think that Leroy might be in some trouble? Well, I didn't want to tell you, Marjorie, but your brother has turned his school into a midget version of Hell's a Poppin'. <gasps> Leroy? But he had such a fine record. He had, until he heard Judge Hooker and me brag about the foolish antics we performed as children. Oh, I hang my head when I think of it. And I'd like to hang the judges, too. Oh, now, Uncle Mort, it can't be that serious. No? Well, come on. You'll see. You know, after all, boys will be boys. Leroy is just a bit high-spirited. And what's wrong with that, sir? You were a boy once yourself, weren't you? Me? No. Uh, I was talking to the principal. <laughs> Rehearsing, I mean. <laughs> after you, my dear. Yes. Look at George Washington and the cherry tree. Just high spirits? Washington was a boy, too. We were all boys. Uncle, are you all right? Of course I am. No, no, I'm not. It's been a long, long time since I was called to the principal's office, but I still get that old feeling. Me too. Yeah. Well, brace up, Uncle Mort. Here we are. Okay. Let's go in. Hope he doesn't make a say after school, Marjorie. Uh, Mr. Proctor? Yes? If I'm Leroy Forrester's uncle, and this is his sister, Marjorie. Well, I'm glad to see you two. I want to talk to you about that young man. Yes, I know, Mr. Proctor. Really, he's a fine boy at heart. I realize that. There's something I want to tell you Sure, about. but you were a boy once yourself, weren't you, Mr. Proctor? Oh, of course I was. Uh, you see, Marjorie, didn't I tell you? <laughs> Mr. Proctor was a boy once himself. <laughs> Probably high-spirited, too. Surely. Now about your nephew. I hope you're not going to be harsh with him. But why should I be, Mr. Forrester? Uh, excuse me, my name's Gildersleeve. Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Glad to meet you, Mr. G Did you say Gildersleeve? Yes. Did I say something wrong? That happens to be my name. And does that happen to be your top coat hanging on that hook? Where? If... Yes. 
How did it happen to get here? Last night, that coat with your name in it was found by our night watchman. Oh, my goodness. Excuse me. I just remembered a dental appointment. One moment. Here's something else that belongs to you. Your red flannel underwear and your corset. Corset? What? Uncle Mort! I don't understand. Neither does Mr. Proctor. I understand only too well. Are you ashamed of yourself? A grown man. A big, fat, grown man. Going around at night putting union suits on statues. Yes. Uncle Mort, what is it? Now, can't you explain? Sure, if I can get a word in edgewise. Actions speak louder than words, Gildersleeve. It's a lucky thing for you that Leroy Forrester is your nephew. It is? Yes. I'd expose you in a minute, but I don't want to spoil Leroy's big day. Leroy's big day? Oh, what has he done now? That's why I sent for you. Today, he's going to be presented with the Chamber of Commerce Medal as the outstanding student in Flugelhammer Junior High School. What? Leroy? Well, I knew it all along. The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, I want to ask you, what is the most welcome compliment a hostess can receive? Well, I'm told it's sincere appreciation of the dishes she serves, comments on the lightness of her cakes, the flakiness of her pie crusts, exclamations on how downright good everything tastes. So here's a tip for you housewives. For baking that's sure to win compliments, use delicious parquet margarine made by Kraft. You see, parquet margarine is a genuine flavor shortening, not a bland, tasteless fat. Yes, the same delicate appetizing taste that makes parquet margarine so delicious for table use gives added flavor to baked foods, too. And parquet mixes so easily and creams so smoothly, it's really pleasant to use. Remember, too, that parquet margarine's flavor makes pan-fried foods taste better, and it doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. And whether you serve delicious parquet margarine at the table or use it for cooking, you are giving your family a nutritious, wholesome energy food. Remember, too, that parquet is an excellent source of vitamin A. So give your family the benefits of this delightful, nourishing food. Serve them economical parquet margarine tomorrow. Just ask your dealer for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. It's made by Kraft. That's a beautiful medal, Leroy, and I'm mighty proud of you. But, uh... Won't you answer just one question for me, my boy? What is it, Unc? Who was responsible for all those escapades around your school? Now, Uncle Mort, I, I positively don't know. What's more, I don't want to know. And, and even if I did know, you don't think I'd squeal on my pal Piggy, do you? Uh, you're a bright boy, Leroy. Good night. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Each week at this time, Kraft presents from Hollywood, California, Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, here's what a prominent government official said about nutrition not long ago. This official said that in times like these, proper nutrition is as important as fighting planes. Yes, we all need the right foods and plenty of them to keep up the pace our great defense effort demands. So you'll be glad to know that parquet margarine, made by Kraft, is one of the right foods and that it's so economical you can use all you need. You see, parquet margarine not only has delicious flavor that makes it grand for table use, baking, and pan frying, parquet contains lots of valuable food elements, too, 
Yes, wholesome parquet margarine is a highly nutritious food. In fact, one of the best energy foods you can serve. And what's more, every pound of parquet contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. But just because parquet margarine is good for you, don't think it isn't good tasting. Why, parquet's delicate, appetizing flavor has made it a favorite with families all over the country, both for table use and for cooking. So try it. Buy a pound or two of delicious parquet margarine tomorrow. Yes, ask your dealer for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve, and his niece and nephew, Marjorie and Leroy. They're trying to entertain a friend of Marjorie's, Oliver Honeywell, a chap who's taken so many pills that he's beginning to look like one. Today, Oliver is the man who came to lunch and stayed through tea and dinner. It's after nine now, and a quiz game is in progress. That's very good. Yes. Very good. Now, the next question is for you, Uncle Mort. Okay. I love quizzes. Let's hear it, Leroy. Well, what's the difference between Niagara Falls and your friend Judge Hooker? There's no difference. They're both big drips. <laughs> no, no, that's wrong. Oh, is it? The difference between them is that Niagara is a mountain fountain and the judges are legal legal. Oh, oh yeah. Leroy. Well, I see. Now whose turn is it? It's your turn next, Oliver. Uh -huh. Boy, this one's a sin. Uh -huh. Can you tell us who was the third assistant secretary of agriculture in President McKinley's administration? Oof. Oh, that wasn't fair, Leroy. No, that, that's too hard, Leroy. Oh, no, 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 it isn't. Uh, third Assistant Secretary of Agriculture, McKinney's administration, uh, Lucius Ann Follins. Yep, that's right. I, <laughs> I remember. It is? That's great, Oliver. Oliver, that's wonderful. Oh, really, it's nothing. A fellow shouldn't get any credit for remembering his own grandfather's name. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, you had me fooled for a minute. I thought you were smart. Yes, Leroy. Well, next is Marjorie's turn. Huh? Hmm? Sis, what does it mean if you say, throw up the sponge? Um, I give up. Absolutely correct. Oh, <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now, the scores so far are Oliver, 27, uh -huh. Marjorie, 19, and Uncle Mort, minus two. Uh, young man, <laughs> what do you mean, minus two? You answer one question wrong twice. It's twice? <laughs> now, here's your chance to make up, Uncle. Huh? It's an arithmetic. Arithmetic. If Jones buys 50 bales of hay and 100 bushels of barley for $300... Yes? ...and the barley costs four times as much as the hay, how much did each bale cost? Oh, my. Let me get paper and pencils. 50 bales, 100 bushels, $300. Mr. Jones should have bought defense bonds. <laughs> the idea. Oh, What's that? Half past nine. Leroy, I've got a question for you this time. If 9.30 equals your bedtime and you haven't done your homework yet, how do you expect to know your lessons tomorrow if you have to go to sleep now? Gee, that's an easy one, Uncle Mort. All those questions I've been asking you people are my homework. Oh, well, it's all done. It is? <laughs> You're a bright boy, Leroy. Say, can we just finish this game, Uncle Mort? Yeah. <clears throat> I sort of lost interest in this Gee, game. I thought it was fun. So you would. Oh. Now scamper off to bed, Leroy. Gee whiz, I'm not a bit sleepy. Why can't I stay up? It's the same thing every Sunday night. First Jack Benny, then Charlie McCarthy, and after that trying to get Leroy to go to bed. But Uncle Mort, you stay up a lot later than this. Why can't I? Because you're growing, Leroy, and I'm not. No, maybe not in the same direction as I am. Have one up, Leroy. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh. What? Leave Uncle's waistline out of this. You leave it out. You brought it in. Yep. <laughs> children, children, let's drop my waistline. It's dropped too far already. Yeah. <laughs> Good night, young man. Oh, are you going to bed, Uncle Mort? Sweet dreams. No, you're the one who's going to bed. Yes, and let's not discuss it anymore. But, but... That's but... all, brother. <laughs> but it isn't fair. It's not democratical. I'd like to stay up as late as everybody else. Well, let me see. Can I, Uncle Mort? Uh, promise to go to bed the minute we do? Gee, of course I promise. Then you can remain up as late as Marjorie and I. Boy, that's keen. Well, I'm pretty sleepy right now. How about you, Marjorie? What? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, oh, I can hardly keep my eyes open. Yeah. Oh, I catch on. It's a trick to make me go to bed now. <laughs> You've made your bed, Leroy. Now get into it. <laughs> 
In that case, maybe I should... I'll get it. Well, if that's my mama, you tell her not to worry. Yes. Yeah. Hello? Hello? Oh, hi, Pig. You're pe- it's for me. It's Piggy Banks. Piggy huh? Banks. What did you say, Pig? What for? Oh, no, no, Uncle Mort wouldn't... Huh? No, I wouldn't even ask him. Oh, it's too bad, Pig, but that's the breaks of the game. Goodbye. Uh... I don't want to intrude in your private affairs, Leroy, but what is it Piggy Banks wanted to do? Oh, he wanted to come over here tonight to carve out his pumpkin for Halloween. Well, I'd have no objection to that. Yeah, but he wanted to use you for the model. You? <laughs> you go straight to bed, young man. We're all going to bed now. All right. Uh, well, in that case, maybe I should. Yes, you should, Oliver. Oh. Uh, good night. Uh, Marjorie, don't let Oliver forget his overcoat tonight. It's awfully chilly, and he might catch something he hasn't got already. <laughs> Mr. Gilsleeve, I didn't bring any overcoat. I didn't expect to be invited for tea and dinner, too. I... Invited? Oh, oh, my. I hate to think you'd be going clear across town on the streetcar. Oh, Midgey, the streetcar doesn't bother me. It's the waiting and the walking. Yes, and in the dark, too. <laughs> Say, uh, why don't you stay here for the night, Oliver? Oh, that's a splendid idea. Where can we put him, Uncle Moore? Uh, on the sofa in the study. It's the kind that collapses into a bed. <laughs> Oh, no, thanks, really. I don't think I should. Why no. not? I'll fix you up with a pair of my pajamas. Oh, I don't think I could sleep in a strange pair of pajamas. Yes. <laughs> uh, and besides, huh? besides that, don't you think they'd be a trifle large? Oh, come, come, Oliver. It'll be fun. Like sleeping in a tent. <laughs> yes. But I'll bring out a couple of spare blankets and a pillow. Oh, yes. never mind the pillow, Midgey. I'm allergic to feathers. Uh, feathers? Is that so? Oh, yes. Uh, you know, I have it so bad I even break out with spots when I eat chicken broth. <laughs> well, uh, you better telephone your parents and tell them you won't be home tonight, Oliver. Oh, yes, I better. Otherwise, Mom would have to send Pop out to look for me. Uh, then she'd have to go out to look for Pop. Yes. <laughs> well, I'll get the blankets. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Oh, hello, Mama. Mama, this is Oliver. Yes. What's that? Papa's been out looking for me already. Well, it isn't ten yet, Mama. Oh, we want to get an early start. Uh, you better go find him, Mama. Uh, try the place on the corner. Oh, not the drugstore. The place in the other corner. I don't know why he always goes there. I never do. Well, you just push open the doors and call in. That's a... What? Oh, I'm still at Midgey's house. Yeah, Mama. They invited me to spend the night here on account I didn't bring an overcoat. I did? I must have left on a streetcar. Huh? Well, I got my pills. Uh, don't worry, I'll keep out of drafts. Good night, Mama. Poor Mama. You know, she doesn't seem to realize that I'm a big boy now. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's very hard to believe, Oliver. Oh, I, I almost forgot. Here. Uh, what's this nickel for? Oh, for the phone call. I never like to be under obligations to people. Yes, I can see that. Well, everything's ready for you, Oliver. Yeah, go right in and make yourself comfortable, Oliver. I'm going to lock up. Uh-huh. Oh, be sure all the downstairs windows are fastened, Uncle Mort. There have been some burglars in the neighborhood lately. Burglars? Oh, don't worry, Oliver. Go right in and get ready for bed. If a burglar ever saw you in my pajamas, he'd put back everything he took. <laughs> I wonder who built these windows. The Pullman Company? Oh, Oh, my bunion. Oh, I almost forgot to wind the kitchen clock. (laughs) Somebody already wound it. Oh, oh! excuse me, Aesop. <laughs> I didn't mean to step on your tail. <laughs> now, scat cat, scram. Go. Outside. Yeah. Everything locked up tight, Uncle Moore? Yes. A burglar would need three policemen to help him get in here. <laughs> uh, excuse me. I guess it was the company we had for dinner. <laughs> well, see you in the morning. Huh? Good night, Uncle Moore. Yeah, good night, my dear. Good night, Uncle Moore. What? You still up? Uh, good night, Leroy. Good night, Uncle Roy. Good night. What's that? Oh, oh, good night, Oliver.
up. There must be a fire somewhere near here. How about let's go on and see? You better ask your Uncle Mort first. Okay. Fear, Mom and Pop. Hey, Uncle Mort, can I go to a fire? Huh? What's that? There's a fire somewhere as close. Can I go see it? A fire? Oh, boy, I haven't done one for years. And I just love to go to blazes. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Moore, hurry. No, no, not that door. That's the bathroom. Oh, excuse me. I should have known. This way. Yeah, thanks. Now, let's hurry outside or the fire will be out before we are. See, this is fun. Huh? Hey, Marge, let's go. Here's Uncle Moore. Yeah, let's get Oliver. You think he'd be interested? Sure, it'll be a tonic for his nerves. Oh, Oliver. Yes, Mom, I'm getting off. You? <laughs> I'm not your mama. Come on outside with us. Hurry up. What's wrong? There's a fire, Oliver. Fire? Oh, oh my goodness. Come on, let's go. Oh. I know we are. Follow me. Wait a minute. Wait for us, Oliver. Uh, Leroy, bring Oliver's shoes. Hey, come on, Marjorie. Hey, Oliver, come back here. Where's the fire? It's somewhere around the corner, Oliver. Is it coming this way? No, we're going that way. Come on. <laughs> Here's your shoes, Oliver. You better put them on before you wear out your socks. Oh, thanks, Leroy. Uh, all right. Let's not spend all night here. The fire won't wait for us, you know. Oliver, you can tie your shoelaces afterwards. Oh, as you say, Mr. Gill. Oh, thank you. Oh. On second thought, Oliver, you better tie him now. I might as well, now that I'm down. Gee, this is the latest I've been out since the night I went walking in my sleep. Yeah. Well, let's take a quick look at the fire and scoot back to bed. I wonder whose house it is. Well, we'll soon see. I think the engine's right around the corner. They are? Oh, oh I see yes, a lot of people. Yes, there they yeah. are. Gee, look at all the neighbors. There's nothing like a good fire to bring out all the best people. <laughs> Everybody must have gotten up. Huh? Oh, look. There's Edie Quinn. Wearing the same kimono she wore to that fire last year. Yes. We'll be carrying on. Well, here we are. I don't see any fire. I better find out what this is all about. Uh, let me through here, please. Uh, excuse me, lady. Oh, uh, pardon me, Chief, but could you direct me to the fire? Mister, I wish you could direct me. We can't find it. Oh, well, it may be a little unprofessional, but have you asked anybody? Say, that's an idea. Thanks. Oh, it's all right. Uh, uh, quiet, please. Let's have quiet, everybody. Yes, quiet, uh... Now, did anyone here turn in a fire alarm? Oh, I'm Excuse me. I was the one who called. Oh, hello, Mrs. Beasley. Well, where's the fire? Oh, there isn't any fire. My poor little cat is stranded on top of that telephone pole up there. What? Yes. Oh, good grief. Madam, do you mean you got us all out of bed and dragged the firemen away from their gin rummy game just to look at a cat? Oh, disappointed because someone's home isn't burning down. <laughs> huh? I know who you are. You're the man who does want to set the world on fire. <laughs> now, see here, Mrs. Uh... Oh, this is Mrs. Huh? Beasley, Uncle Mort. Mrs. Beasley, this is my uncle, Mr. Gildersleeve. How do you do? Uh, charmed, I'm sure. Now, see here, Mrs. Beasley. What do you mean by waking up the whole neighborhood? Now, take it easy, mister. I won't take it easy. Chief, are you going to waste the taxpayers' money climbing telephone poles for tomcats? Well, what's wrong with that? Well, give me a reason why you should go to all that trouble. Sure, I'll give you a reason. This lady happens to be the mayor's sister-in-law. Yeah, just as I thought. Politics. Hey, boys, yeah. get out the 40-footer and bring down that cat. Right. Thank you, Chief. I'll see that my brother-in-law hears about this. Yes, and I'll see that the newspapers hear about it, too. I'll write letters to the editors. And I write a nasty letter, madam. <laughs> and as for you, Chief... You're paid to fight fires, not to go sky hooting around town all night. Now, I've heard enough out of you, fatso. Yep. If you don't pipe down, I'll turn you over to the police, you big false alarm. I'm a false alarm, you little brass pole polisher. Take off that fireman's uniform and say that. Now, don't get so hot under the collar, beef crust, or I'll have the boys cool you up with a hose. I'm not afraid of you and all your little squirts. <laughs> You twitch a thumb at me, and I'll push that tin hat of yours so far down, you'll have to breathe through a straw. <laughs> well, now you have gone too far. Logan! Yes, Here, hold my coat. That suits me. Oliver! Yes, Mr. Gildersleeve? Keep off the grass, you'll get your feet wet. <laughs> hey, look! Look, they've got the cat down, Uncle Mort. Oh, oh, thank goodness. Where's the lady that owns the cat? Please. Right here, Kelsey. Now I've seen everything. The idea... Using thousands of dollars worth of fire equipment, waking up hundreds of people in the middle of the night just to snag a mangy cat off a telephone pole. Here it is, ladies. Safe and sound. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, dear me, this isn't my cat at all. Well, now it isn't even her cat. 
Lady, if you aren't... Shh, Uncle Mort. Yes. What's wrong, Marjorie? I'll tell you what's wrong, Mr. Gildersleeve. This is your cat. Yes. <laughs> Our cat? Yes. Uh, Aesop? <laughs> is that a hot one? Oh, my goodness. Let's get home. Come on, children. Uh, come on, Aesop. Uh, goodbye, Chief. Thank you, boys, for doing a noble and humane deed. Ah, go back to bed, you big mattress. Oh. Come on, man, let's go. I don't like the way he said that. Too bad there wasn't a fire. We could have at least gotten warm. Oliver, but don't you dare catch a chill. I'll try my best not to, Missy. Wish I'd brought along my cold pills. Uh, let's hurry into the house, Oliver. We'll fix you up a nice hot cup of... Uh, well, what can you drink a nice hot cup of? Water, if it's distilled. Uh, well, it'll be nice to get back into a nice warm bed. Uh, open the door, Leroy. Okay. Uh-oh, it's locked. Locked? Why didn't I go home on the same time? Uh, now, don't get excited. Don't be nervous. Uh, take it easy, everybody. I have the key right here. Right here in my pants pocket. Oh, no. No what? No pants. <laughs> I'm just wearing pajamas. Here, let me try that door. Ooh, no shoes either. <laughs> Maybe it's stuck. No, we're stuck, Oliver. The wind must have blown it shut. Well, I guess the joke's on us. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Gildersleeve, I don't get it. You keep asking questions like that, Oliver, and you'll get it all right. There must be a window around the side or in back that I could climb into. No, Leroy. Before we went to bed, I made sure that everything was locked as tight as a drum in a bagpipe band. Oh, wait a minute. We forgot something. Huh? I know how we can get in. You do? Well, what is it? Birdie. A clever girl, Marjorie. Birdie. Yeah, come on, everybody. Where are we going now, Major? We're going to see if we can wake Birdie, our mate. Yes. Oh, Birdie. Oh, Birdie. Oh, Birdie. Yes. Too many Birdies. Hey, let me do it. <laughs> uh, oh, Birdie. Yes, yeah, Mr. Gill, please. Uh, uh, Birdie, uh, will you please come downstairs and open the front door? Yes, I'm locked out. And so is Marjorie and Leroy and Oliver. What an unfortunate coincidence. Yes, Bertie, quit stalling and hurry down here. I would if I could, Mr. Gillespie, but I just can't. Why can't you? Because I'm locked out, too. What? If... <laughs> Bertie, aren't you upstairs? No, sir, I'm right here on the back post. Oh, this is a pretty pickle of fish. How did you get locked out? Well, I just got home from a lodge meeting. Yeah. You know, the mysterious and bewildering orders of the daughters of Cleopatra. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the head Sphinx. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sphinx? You are? Yes, sir. And I found the back door bolted. You know, that's contrary to the customary procedure. Yes, well, I wonder if the people next door have got a pass key. Oh, they went away on their weekend. <laughs> I'm getting terribly cold. Maybe I'd better go home after all. Uh, no, Oliver. We'll get inside in two shakes of a jiffy. Uh, the only trouble is all the downstairs windows are locked. If we could only reach the second floor. I can do it. If you boost me up, I can climb this tree and then crawl out on that branch and drop down on the roof of the porch there. Who do you think you is, Leroy? A Superman man? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I won't let you risk your neck, my boy. You're too young. I do it myself, only why ruin a tree that never did me any harm? Oh, dear. Now, isn't it too bad that we don't have anyone big enough and thin enough to come to our rescue? <clears throat> it's getting colder, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I can't help thinking what King Arthur or one of his knights would do in a case like this. Yes, it, <laughs> I believe it is getting cold. <laughs> Why, he'd leap off his horse, spring to the tree, and just just swarm up to his lady love's window. If I'd only brought along some of my vitality tablets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, what's the use? Oliver, why don't you go climb a tree? Who, oh, me? Midget, you know I get dizzy spells from high places. <laughs> Oliver, it's really very easy. You can do it with your eyes shut. Well, I don't like this. Give him a boost up, huh? Can't you see he's raring to go? Uh-huh, raring to go home. Yeah. <laughs> Come, Oliver, you've got to be brave. Pull up my pajamas. Mm. No, I mean the ones you're wearing. <laughs> Yeah. Now tighten your belt. I didn't say yes. You shook your head. Can I help it if I shiver in the affirmative? <laughs> well, 
Now, you take his other leg, Leroy. Okay. Yeah. Careful now. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Uh, Grab hold of the branch, Oliver, right above you. Well, yeah. don't drop me. I bruise easily. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. I'm right below you. Mm-hmm. Now, just pull yourself up. Uh, no, no, Oliver. Go the other way. Uh, You're getting out on the wrong limb. Uh, Gee, if I only had my slingshot here, I'd head him in the right direction quick enough. Leroy. <laughs> Uh, keep going, Oliver. You're doing fine. Right. Oh, what are you stopping for now? The spring on my pajamas, bro. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm falling. Oh. 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 I made it. <laughs> I made it. I landed on the roof. Yeah, well, congratulations, Oliver. Uh, I never thought you'd make it. How about it, Missy Wizzy? Am I as good as any night? Oh, yes, Oliver. You're wonderful. Yeah. Bye, George, for a week night. He finished strong on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Oliver. Now, just climb in one of the windows and all our troubles will be over. Mr. Gildersleeve. Huh? I've got bad news for you. What? There aren't any windows over the porch. <laughs> what? A porch without windows? I never heard of such a thing. Let me look. Well, that's one for Ripley. <laughs> you better come on down, Oliver. Oh, I can't reach that limb again. Uh, Jeepers, we stranded Oliver. Is that bad? Now what are we going to do, Unc? Well, there's only one thing to do. I've got to get a ladder someplace. And a piece of string! <laughs> <laughs> All right, Oliver. Oh, hurry, Mr. Gillespie. It's terribly cold up here. Yeah. yeah. The people in the back got a nice big ladder. Yeah? Why don't you just pussyfoot over and throw the bar? Well, thanks, Bertie. I suppose that's all I can do. Uh, children, you just stay where you are. And Oliver, uh, don't go away. Very funny. <laughs> I'll be back as soon as I can, Oliver. Fine state of affairs when a man can't break into his own home. Well, that's what you get for chasing fires in the middle of the room. Uh, oh, it's you, Aesop. Out of my way, you slimy snake in the grass. Now, uh, let me see. There's a loose board somewhere along this fence. Ah, there it is. Tight squeeze, Rock Morton. You should really cut out the starches. <laughs> I wonder where that ladder is. It's as dark here as the back of a coal miner's neck. Who's there? Huh? Speak up or I'll shoot. Oh, oh, hello. Don't shoot, Mrs. Beasley. <laughs> it's only me, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> what are you doing in my backyard at this time of night? Uh, what am I doing here? Oh, oh, yes, we were locked out of our house, Mrs. Beasley. You happen to have a ladder I could borrow? It's in the shed, in the shed's lock. Well, then, if you could find the key and kind of throw it down to me, I... Nerve. Waking me up, scaring me half to death, and then having that call. Uh, what did you say, Mrs. Beasley? Wait where you are, Mr. Gildersleeve. I'll be right back. Yeah, lovely woman. A break at last. This time we're all set, T.P. Where are you, Mr. Gildersleeve? Yeah, right underneath your window, Mrs. Beasley. Directly underneath? Yes, directly underneath. Well, then, cat. Oh! <laughs> oh! on the grass. I hope Uncle Mort doesn't get his seat damp. Hey, sis, I did it all right, all right. Boy, that was a thrill. Well, it's only a matter of minutes now. Well, Oliver, it's only a matter of minutes now. Uh, only minutes before I freeze. I wish I brought a parachute. Shh. Who that there? It's me, your Uncle Throckmorton. <laughs> if I ever lay hands on that B- B- Beasley woman, I'll kill that old cow. <laughs> Why, Uncle, you're soaked. What happened? Uh, she lured me underneath her window and then threw a bucket of water on me. I'm going to tell the mayor about this. Oh, that's a shame. But don't you worry. Huh? We'll have you in the house and dry inside of five minutes. Oh, you g- g- got the door open? No, not yet, but soon. Poor Oliver's been freezing on that roof. He's freezing. Yes, yeah, so I sent Leroy down to the corner to ring the fire alarm. Oh, fine. Oh, my goodness. What'll the chief say when he sees me this time? Uh, can't you stop him, Leroy? I don't think so. Oh, in fact, I'm sure I can. Oh, my, here we go again. Stop right here, men. Okay, okay, where is it? Oh, hello, Chief. Well, you're just in time. Look. Where? Oh, say, what is this? First the cat on a pole and now a guy on the roof. Who's responsible for this call? Well, it was like this, Chief. Well, if it isn't the taxpayer's best friend in the fire department, Severus Critic, huh? Hi, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah, hi. Been writing any letters to the newspapers? No. Now, stop teasing, Uncle Mort, Chief. He's just soaked to the skin. Yeah, and that takes in an awful lot of territory. Yeah. How about saving those cracks for the fireman's minstrel show and getting our front door open? Oh, is that what you want? Well, why didn't you say so? 
Hey, Max, yeah. bring an axe. We've got a door to chop down. No, no, no. Can't you just send up a man and a ladder to one of the windows on the second floor? Oh, never mind the axe, Max. Bring a ladder. Okay. Say, gee, there's a cellar door open around on the other side. The cellar door's been open all this time? Oh, I could kick myself. We could help you with that, too. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you just the same, no. Say, boys, I'm awfully sorry about this whole thing. Let me make some amends, huh? How about you all coming in for coffee and sandwiches? Huh? Won't you? Yeah, come on. Just for good old Gildersleeve. Huh? Okay, sure. Yeah, come on, come on. Have another cup of coffee, Chief? No, no, thanks. I've had two already. You've had four, but have another anyhow. Oh. Sandwich, Mr. Grogan? No, no, no. I'm full clear up to here. Incidentally, I made sure that cellar door was locked tight this time. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Grogan. Well, this has been swell, Mr. Gildersleeve, but now we'd better be getting back, boys. Hey, hey, you guys in the kitchen, let's get wheeling. Okay, right. <laughs> Well, uh, goodbye, boys. Thanks for everything. Uh, and if I ever have a fire, you'll be the first people I'll call in. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I like firemen. Say, Uncle Mort, can yeah. I go out and watch them leave? Sure, we'll all go out and wave goodbye to them. Come on, Marjorie. Hey, you too, Bertie. Okay, Uncle Mort. Yeah. Well, thanks for the hospitality. Yeah, so long, boys. Okay. Don't take any wooden fire plugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nice fellas. <laughs> well, let's get back in. There they go. It's colder out. Catch the door, Bertie. It's good. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Again. Yes, this is where we didn't come in. Hey, isn't anybody ever going to get me down off this road? Oh, Oliver! The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, let me remind you that next Friday is Halloween. And if you mothers are the kind that worry about the children being out and getting into mischief, here's a worthwhile suggestion for you. Keep the kids at home with a well-stocked pantry. Yes, if you have plenty of popcorn and cookies and cakes on hand, you can be sure the kids won't go very far away. Now, to make popcorn extra good, drench it with plenty of melted parquet margarine made by Kraft. Yes, that delicate, tempting flavor that makes parquet a favorite for table use makes it delicious on popcorn, too. And remember, use parquet margarine in the cookies and cakes you bake. It makes them tastier because it's a real flavor shortening not just a bland, tasteless fat. And not just at Halloween, but the year round, Parquet Margarine provides your family with wholesome, nourishing food values. Yes, Parquet Margarine is a highly nutritious energy food that contains important vitamin A. So use Parquet Margarine made by Kraft all three ways, at the table, for baking, and for pan frying. It's delicious, it's nourishing, it's economical. Tomorrow, ask your dealer for a pound or two of Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, our time's up. Good night. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Each week at this time, Kraft presents from Hollywood, California, Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve. Written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. In the meantime, November is here again. Yes, and crisp, frosty November weather is going to make the whole family feel like working harder and playing harder, too. So now the right kind of energy food becomes more important than ever. Yes, right now it's very important that your family gets plenty of wholesome, nourishing food. 
Food that provides energy and vitamins that gives you and the children the kind of nourishment everyone needs. Now, parquet margarine, made by Kraft, is just such a food. Yes, parquet margarine is a wholesome, highly nutritious food made from selected American farm products. Parquet is one of the best sources of food energy you can serve. What's more, parquet margarine is a reliable source of vitamin A. Every pound contains 9,000 units of this important vitamin. Now, all this wouldn't do much good if your family didn't like parquet margarine. Well, we're sure they will. Yes, they're bound to like parquet's delicious flavor, whether you serve it at the table or use it for baking and pan frying. So order delicious, economical parquet margarine tomorrow. Just ask for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve. Uh, Leroy? Yes, Uncle Morris? Uh, come in here a minute, will you? I want to... Say, how did you get that scratch on your nose? And by George, your shirt's all torn, too. What's happened to you? Oh, I had a slight argument with a friend of mine. A yeah, slight argument with a friend, eh? I'd hate to see you after a big fight with a stranger. Where did you two argue? Inside a cement mixer? No. Nope. All the way from our backyard to Georgie Beasley's front steps. Oh. It was a sort of a running argument. Yes. Now, Leroy, I disapprove of you holding knuckle debates with your little chums. But, gee, Uncle Mort, you should have heard what Georgie said. No matter what he said, it wasn't the friendly thing to do. Well, if you'd have heard, you'd understand why I had to bop him on the smeller. You bop him on the smeller? <laughs> Leroy, where do you pick up that kind of language? From you. Uh. <laughs> Remember Wednesday when you almost ran into that truck? That truck almost ran into me, young man. And besides, I don't recall using those words. It was just after the truck driver told you to go... Leroy, to... never mind. <laughs> Let's get back to you. Young man, you must realize that you can't keep friendships by indulging in pugilistic altercations. What's that? Poking people in the puss. <laughs> Well, who wants to be friends with old Georgie Beasley anyhow? Now, now, Leroy. Friends are more precious than gold or diamonds. What would a man have if he didn't have any friends? Gold or diamonds? That's right. No! <laughs> Leroy, I want you to go over to Georgie Beasley's house and apologize. Well, not right now. His big brother is home. Oh. And besides, I'm not going to shake hands with him after what he said about you. Come, come. Remember, sticks and stones may break... About me? What did he say? <laughs> I don't like to repeat it. But I want to know. No, Uncle Mort, you'd only get angry. Yeah. And besides, your head isn't any fatter than anybody else's. <laughs> so he called me a fathead, did he? Yeah, how'd you find out? Yeah. Wait till I tell his mother about this. Oh, you won't have to do that, Uncle Mort. He was just repeating what she said. Oh. <laughs> Let's drop the subject, Leroy. Only remember one thing. Friends are wonderful things to have. Because when you're over your head in debt, a friend won't let you down. And when you're up to your ears in trouble, a friend won't let you down. And when you find out you're on a limb... A friend won't let you down then either. <laughs> yes. Say, that reminds me. I've been meaning to look up an old friend from back home ever since I came to Summerfield. Does he live here? Yes, fellow named Charlie Dapple. I'll get in touch with him right now. Hand me the phone book, will you please? Sure. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, great chap, Charlie. I remember when I was first struggling to get into the girdle business. It was Charlie who helped me. <laughs> To get into girdles? No, young man. Yes, yes. He owned Dapple's department store at the time. He snapped up the first ten dozen I made. <laughs> yes, he had a stretcher point to do it, too. Did that help you? Yes, sir. It pulled me out of a mighty tight squeeze. Uh, let me see. Uh, Daniels, Danner, Denty. Here we are. Dapple, Charles. 147 Olive Street. Pimento, 4733. That'll be good to see good old Charlie Dapple again after all these years. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Hello. Uh, could I speak to Charlie Dapple, please? Uh, well, he isn't home now. This is Mrs. Dapple. Uh, Mrs. Dapple. Well, don't tell me that good old Charlie's married after all these years. Congratulations, Mrs. Dapple. You're a mighty lucky woman. Thank you. That's what Charlie keeps saying. Uh, uh, who is this? <laughs> uh, what was that? Who is this? Uh, well, when did the big event take place? Three years ago, Labor Day. Who is this? Well, well, good old Charlie married on Labor Day. <laughs> Say, I'll bet you're a redhead. 
No, I'm a brunette. What made you think I was a redhead? Well, you know how Charlie always went, no, I guess you don't. <laughs> Maybe not, but I will. Who is this? Oh, it's an old friend from back home, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Uh, doesn't that name mean anything to you? No. Oh, but surely he's told you about the times we used to have together. Didn't he ever talk about Atlantic City? No. What about Atlantic City? Well, it's, uh, it's in New Jersey. Well, uh, he'll be home any minute and I'll ask him all about it. Oh, no, no. Let's uh, make it a surprise. Make what a surprise? Well, I'm going to drop over for a visit. Oh, but really, Mr. Now, come, come, Mrs. Dapple. I haven't seen your husband for five years. Let's see, you live at uh, 147 Olive, eh? Yes, it's an apartment house. The Venus de Milo Arms. If. <laughs> well, uh, I think I can find it. I'll drop in in half an hour. Oh, but I, I don't know if you should come today, Mr. Silvercoat. Uh, Gildersleeve's the name. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, don't fix anything special for me. Uh, just think of me as one of the family. Goodbye. Uh, this is going to be fun surprising Charlie. He loves surprises. I'll never forget the night he sneaked a lot of his wax dummies into my office to scare me the next morning. And did it? It would have if our night watchman hadn't shot six of them. <laughs> he claimed they pulled a knife on him. <laughs> Mr. Dapple sounds like a keen guy. He is, Leroy. Good old Charlie. Hey, come along and meet him. Oh, but I wanted to go to a movie. We can go afterwards. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> Yes? Uh, Mrs. Dapple? Yes? Well, well. Charlie certainly picked himself a lovely little bride. What? Oh, oh, you must be the man who phoned Mr. Silversleeve. Uh, Gildersleeve. Uh, by the way, is my old sidekick home yet? Well, no, and I've been expecting him for an hour. All right, Uncle, let's go to that movie. Uh, come back here, young man. Uh, Mrs. Dapple, this is my nephew, Leroy. Oh, how do you do? How do you well, do? come right in. Uh, thank you. Oh, now, don't look at this room. It's a mess. Oh, no, it just has that lived-in look. <laughs> yeah. Well, Charlie should be home any minute now. Mm -hmm. On Saturday afternoons, he usually stops at several places on the way home. Uh, uh, to get the football scores, you know. Yeah, yeah, yes, I know how it is. No, not a baby. Uh, mind if we look? Oh, no. Come on, Leroy, don't you want to see the baby? No, I just want to see the movie. Okay, young man, no baby, no movie. What? See the baby. Yeah, that better. Well, well, Mrs. Dapple, what a handsome husky child. What's his name, Charlie? No, Gertrude. Oh, pardon me, Gertrude. <laughs> Ooh, zitty bitty babums, zoo. <laughs> oh, dear, you frightened her. Maybe it's her face, Uncle Mort. Uh, nonsense, Leroy. Babies just love my face. Oh, now, now, Mother's little angel cake. Shush. Yeah. Uh, I know it'll quiet her, Mrs. Dapple. It's one trick that always works. I got it right here in my pocket. Gee, Uncle, are you carrying around a bottle of milk? No. It's my watch, Leroy. Yeah. Now listen, little cupcake. You hear the tick tick? Oh, isn't that cute? She's holding it to her ear. Yes. There's nothing like a piece of jewelry to stop a girl from crying. <laughs> Dear me, the phone again. Uh, phone? Now, let go of the gentleman's watch, darling, so I can put you down. No, now, Mother's Lamb, let go. <laughs> oh, dear, she won't let go. Well, you'll just have to hold him, Mr. Gildersleeve, while I take that call. Uh, but, but, but it's been years since I held a baby that young. Oh, no, no. Don't you be afraid. Huh? Once you've learned, you never forget. It's like swimming. Uh, swimming, I'll bet it is. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Here. Hold, Gertrude, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, well, all right. Uh, take it easy, Gertrude. Oh, uh, well, jiggly, isn't she? <laughs> Whoa, now. I'll be back in just a minute. Uh, you better come back now. She's getting restless. Now, see here, Gertrude. <laughs> oh, I was just kidding. Uh, relax. <laughs> kitchy, kitchy, goo. Kitchy, kitchy, goo. <laughs> Uncle Mort, I never knew you could take care of babies. I can't. Uh, Leroy, would you like to hold little Gertie a while? Huh? Not me. Come on, let's ditch her and go see Hop Along Cassidy. Yep, wait a minute. I can't get my watch and chain away from her. And now, Gertrude, you've had your little fun, so let loose. Uh, no use trying to force her, Uncle. Huh? She'll get tired of it pretty soon and just drop the whole thing. That's what I'm afraid of. I see. If she drops the watch, you get the works. <laughs> 
Leroy, don't poke fun. Now, now, Gertie, let go of Uncle Throckmorton's 21 jewel nasty gold watch. <laughs> yeah, that's a good girl. You see, Leroy, I got it back. Oh, now she's got a hold of my hair. Yeah, let go, Mother's little devil's food cake. <laughs> Say, she certainly is a cute kid. Leroy, don't stand there. Do something. Well, if I could find a pair of scissors, I could cut off that hunk of hair she's holding. Oh! Ouch! Gertrude, unhand my hair. <laughs> Say, she likes you. Yeah, she's practically drooling over me. Well, really, Mr. Gildersleeve, what are you doing to that baby? Madam, you better ask the baby what she's doing to me. Oh, oh, now, now, let go of the man's hair, darling. There. Uh, thanks. Oh, my scalp. Feels like I just lost the decision to sitting bull. Now you just lie in your blanket like a good little girl while Mama runs down to the gas company. Yes. Now? Yes, or else I don't know what we'll ever do over the weekend. Charlie was supposed to attend to it. But, but you're not going to leave us alone here with, with Gertrude. Oh, she won't give you any trouble, will you, sweetheart? <laughs> Yes. Well, Charlie will probably be here before I return. Oh, and in case he isn't, uh, just heat the baby's bottle in ten minutes. Uh, ten minutes? Uh, take the roast out of the oven in a quarter of an hour. Yeah, take the roast. Then uh, light a fire under the soup. The fire the soup. And if a COD package comes, it's all right to pay for it. But, but I... And if it gets any cooler, phone down to the janitor for more heat. Huh? Bye. Light a fire under the janitor. <laughs> Put the COD in the oven. Phone down for the baby's bottle. Oh, my... <laughs> Uh, Leroy, I know which way it folds. After all, I used to be a baby myself. Yeah, now, don't get fidgety, Gertie. Remember, Rome wasn't built in a day. Careful with that safety pin, Uncle Mort. Oh, my. Why don't these things come with zippers? <laughs> yes, yes, Mother's little leg of lamb. You better hurry up, Uncle Mort. Gertrude's getting restless. And cold, too. That's well. It's her own fault. She keeps kicking it off. Well, if you can't pin it, why don't you just leave it off altogether? No, Leroy. We've got to pin Gertrude down some way with this blanket. Ah. There we are. I wonder what makes her do that. Maybe she's just bored with everything. When she isn't yelling, she's yawning. Well, that's because she should be sleeping, Leroy. Possibly if I told her some little anecdote, that might put her to sleep. It always works at the Rotary Club. <laughs> Try singing or to sleep. That's a fine idea. Friends have told me my voice reminds them of a meadowlark singing bass. <laughs> okay, don't make with the lullabies. All right. Uh, what would you think of a sleep in the deep? You know. Many brave hearts are asleep in the deep. <laughs> Too deep. Yeah. <laughs> How about Rockabye Baby? That's it. Go ahead, Uncle Mort. All right, let me see. I think it goes, uh, Rockabye Baby in the treetop. <laughs> yes. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. <laughs> I can't remember how the rest goes. Down will come, baby, cradle and all. Yeah, that's it. Rockabye Gertrude on the treetop. She's going to sleep, so you better not stop. <laughs> when the bow breaks, the cradle goes lower. You're doing swell, Unc. Sing it once more. <laughs> Rockabye, baby, let's go, Leroy. She's closing her eyes, so let's tiptoe into the other room, my boy. Let's wait here till both eyes she shuts. Look out for that pen! <laughs> oh, nuts! <laughs> Rockabye, baby. Oh, what's the use? I have been singing till my tonsils are loose. You better 
give up, Unc. Whatever it is that kid wants, it ain't a meadow lark that sings bass. Yeah. I'm afraid you're right, Leroy. Gee, if this takes much longer, we won't see those two pictures before dinner. Leroy, if this takes much longer, we won't even see dinner. I better call home and tell your sister we'll be late. Hand me that telephone. The idea of me playing nursemaid to a baby. Fine thing. Hello? Oh, hello, Marjorie. Uh, looks like Leroy and I will be a little late for dinner tonight, my dear. We stopped in to see an old friend. <laughs> Who's that? Your old friend? Uh, no, it's Gertrude. Uh, she's just a baby. <laughs> yes. Leroy and I are taking care of her uh, for Mrs. Dapple. She's out taking care of the gas. Yes, and we're even taking care of the cookie. Oh, you, Uncle Moore, taking care of the cookie? Yes. I was supposed to take the roast out of the oven and put the soup on the fire. But I had to put the soup in the oven because the roast was on fire. <laughs> oh, poor Uncle Moore. Yeah. Have you been having much trouble with the baby? Well, I've been singing Rockabye Baby to her, but something tells me she'd prefer there'll be some changes made. <laughs> You. That's a marvelous idea. And bring Bertie, Marjorie. And maybe she can patch up the dinner I've ruined. <laughs> All right. Oh, I think I know what's wrong with that baby. It's probably hungry. Yeah, hungry? Say, I never thought of that. Uh, let me have a look. Oh, my goodness. That's what it must be. Marjorie, hurry over quickly. What's wrong? Gertrude's so hungry, she's trying to swallow her foot. <laughs> Have you got that all straight now? I think so, Mrs. Dapple. We're to shut off the gas at 147 hour this afternoon mm -hmm. and turn it on at 3214 Winslow. Is that right? Correct. We're moving away from the Olive Street apartment tonight, and I don't want any slip-up. Oh, there won't be. Oh, now, uh, can I change my light and water here, too? No, the light and water company's down at 10th and Spring Street. Oh, dear. Well, that'll take me an hour. I left someone with my baby, and I promised to be right back. Oh, well, they'll just have to wait. <laughs> Really, Marjorie, the way you've handled that baby is a revelation to me. <laughs> yeah, you're certainly tidy with a dighty. Yeah. <laughs> Where did you ever learn all that, my dear? Oh, I took child psychology in school. Yes, but Gertrude didn't. How did you ever two get together? Oh, it was easy. <laughs> In dealing with hysteria and psychoneurosis in the field of speculative philosophy relating to the young, the prime factor was a thorough understanding of the mental and nervous processes of the infant mind. Uh, Simple, isn't it? Uh, either it is or I am. <laughs> uh, say, Leroy, how's Bertie doing? Oh, Bertie, how's everything? I'm doing as well as a kid, considering. Uh, considering what, Bertie? The cupboards. Oh, what's wrong with the cupboards here, Bertie? Well, from the looks of them, these folks seem to have a mighty fine assortment of nothing. Uh, nothing? What do you mean? Make yourself plain. Okay, I speak plain, but it's going to sound ugly. Uh, these folks have got just about enough food in their kitchen for one meal. Uh, do you mean that Mrs. Dapple's cupboard is empty? <laughs> Man, that cupboard couldn't be any better than if that lady's name was Hubbard. Oh, <laughs> Oh, this is terrible. I, I never dreamed for a moment they were destitute. Well, what are we going to do, Uncle Moore? Don't worry. I'll fix things up, Marjorie. Uh, Bertie, take this $10 bill down to the nearest store and buy a lot of groceries. Yes, sir. Better make out a list. Yes. Some canned goods. Oh, Uncle Moore, that's terribly sweet of you. And some sugar. Oh, it's nothing, my dear. I get a lump in my throat. Lump sugar? It... <laughs> and a sinking feeling in my heart. Bacon soda? <laughs> When I think of what's ahead. A head of cabbage? Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. It brings the tears to my eyes. And onions. I suppose they just gradually got into debt and couldn't... Catch up. That's it. They couldn't catch up. <laughs> hey, Bertie, are you still here? You better get going. Take Leroy along to help you carry the bundle. Okay, All right. yeah. Hurry out the back way. I'll bet that's my old pal now. And will I clap hands if here comes Charlie. Now, see here, Dapple. We've exhausted our patience with you. Why do you ignore our letters? Why do you hang up when we telephone? Why don't you be a man and make your payments on that piano like you promised? No, see here, mister. I'm not dappled. But by George, if I was and you used that tone, I'd cuff you around till you'd crawl back into the woodwork. Oh, yeah? Well, if you're not dappled, what do you care how I talk to him, you, you big blimp? Oop! <laughs> He's my friend, and you can't abuse an absent friend in my presence. Especially if he isn't here. 
Not so loud. Huh? Oh, that's right. Not so loud, mister. If you want to fight, just step inside. Okay. But this time when I leave, I'm taking that piano with me. Over my dead body. That makes it even more attractive. Oh. <laughs> One more crack like that, and I'll shove that swollen zither down your noisy throat. Now, you take your hat off and state your business before I forget my manners and bop you on the smeller. Now, take it easy, Tubsy. Whoop. <laughs> my name is Baxter of the Summerfield Washing Machine and Piano Company. Now, this fellow Dapple has been buying this piano from us on the installment plan, only he ain't kept up his payments. Well, I happen to know that Mr. Dapple has been up against it pretty badly lately. Uh, couldn't you just uh, kind of forget the payments this month? Forget it? How can I? I've got a memory like an elephant. Yeah, and a hide like one, too. <laughs> All right, then. How much is the payment? I'll give it to you myself. No, oh, no, you won't. According to our contract, once a payment is defaulted, the entire remaining balance becomes automatically due. Oh, my goodness. How much does he still owe on it? Now, let's see. I've got it right here. It's uh, seventy-four dollars. Seventy-four dollars more? Why, that mahogany monstrosity over there was never worth that in the first place. Either I get the money or else the piano. Yes, I think you mean it. Well, Charlie Dapple helped me up when I was getting started, so I can't let him down when he's just about finished. I'll write you a check for the seventy-four dollars. Let's see, that'll leave me with a balance of uh, twenty-eight cents. <laughs> There's somebody at the back door. I better go see. I'm coming, you blasted woodpecker. Excuse me, I'm the gas man. Don't want any. I got enough gas. I come to shut it off. Shut it off? Uh, didn't Mrs. Dapple call at your office this afternoon, probably to pay the bill? Look, brother, I'm a guy who sticks strictly to his own job. Yeah. I got an order saying turn off gas at Dapple Apartment 147 Olive Street. And that's what I'm going to do, brother. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh... Let's not be too hasty about this, uh, brother. Uh, suppose I pay the bill to you right now. No, no, I ain't allowed to take no money. Uh, you don't understand, brother. I'm just the guy who gets orders to turn gas on and to turn it off. Yeah. Then I go where it says and I turn gas on or else I turn it off. <laughs> That's all I do. Oh, sounds mighty monotonous. I like being monotonous. Yeah. <laughs> uh... Look here, uh, brother. Uh, by the way, what's your name? Uh, uh, Herman Peebles. Uh, Herman Peebles. Uh, look here, Herbie. Uh, Peebles live here, too. Uh, simple Peebles. The kindly Peebles. The salt of the earth. Uh, things have been a little tough for him lately. Uh, and there's another mouth to feed, too. You mean... Yes, that's what I mean. A tiny baby named uh, Little Gertrude. Yeah, think what it would mean to poor Little Gertrude if she didn't have any gas. <laughs> No hot milk, uh, no hot water, no hot air. That's tough. Yes. Winter is approaching too, Herbie. Need I say more? No, no. Don't worry, mister. I'm not going to shut off the gas here today. Uh, you're not? No, I just can't. Well, I'm certainly, <laughs> certainly glad I convinced you. Wasn't you, mister. I just remembered I left my tools at the office. <laughs> Just as soon as a dapple shows its nose through that door. I, I done cooked this rib roast so long it's done shrunk down to the size of a lamb chop. Uh, well, personally, I wouldn't mind staying all evening, only I've got a previous engagement. It's them. I'll get the door. We come for the furniture. To take it away. This is the last straw. Don't let them do this to little Gertrude, Unc. You're right, Leroy. You men can't do this to a poor little helpless baby. We ain't doing nothing to no baby. Take the other end of this sofa, Terry. I got it. Now, get out of the way, mister. By George, they're not going to get away with this. Uncle, put down that vase. <laughs> I was just trying to help the men out, dear. Don't do us no favors. We'll help ourselves out. Careful coming out that door, Terry. Okay. Uh, quickly, Roy, lock the door. Okay. Now we've got to figure out some way to prevent them from stripping the apartment. Uh, Mr. Gillsleeve, huh? a lady just come in the back way and says she's Miss Dapple. Here she comes now. Oh, at last. <laughs> oh, thank you ever so much, Mr. Gildekoff. If... That's all right. Where's Charlie? Well, I can't imagine. Unless he's... Oh, of course. Huh? This was his Saturday to work late at the office. But he'll be here any minute now. Uh, that is, if he comes straight home. He better come straight home. There are a couple of men roaming around trying to repossess your furniture. Repossess our furniture? Well, I can't imagine... 
Oh, why, you must mean the moving men. Yeah, they're moving men. They're trying to move everything you got right out of here. Well, of course. We're moving over to Winslow Avenue today. Oh, my goodness. How can Charlie do this to me? And what about the piano? The collector tried to take it away, but I stopped it. Well, you should have let him have it. Huh? We just played it to break our lease here. It's your lease in my pocketbook, madam. Well, we better hurry up and get ready to leave. Oh, uh, did the men come to turn off the gas? Yeah, and you should have seen them turn on the tears. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, there's my husband now. Yeah? There's something about the way he knocks that I can always recognize. Oh, at last. Hey, Mrs. Dapple, I've been waiting for this moment all afternoon. Do you mind if I hide in the dining room and then when good old Charlie comes in, I'll jump out and yell surprise? Please, that's all I have left. Well, that'll be cute. Uh, all right, go right ahead. Uh, Leroy, Marjorie, hmm? uh, Bertie, I want you to get in on this. All right. Come on, let's hide. Hello, Charlie, darling. How are you, sweetheart? What's the idea of keeping the door locked? Well, I don't know. In fact, I don't know half of what's been going on around here. But come into the living room, dear. There's a little surprise for you. Surprise? What do you mean? Where's the surprise? Oh, boy! Surprise, Charlie! Surprise! Yeah, where's Charlie? I'm Charlie. Who in thunder are you? Oh, my goodness. Gee, Uncle, what's the matter? It's that man. I never saw him before. He's the wrong Charlie Dapple. <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But first, I wonder why I always talk to the ladies in our audience, because after all, some of us men aren't such bad cooks. Why, I can fry a wonderful egg. I can even make pretty good biscuits. So really, we men should know about delicious parquet margarine, too. So this is for men only. Next time you men feel like whipping up a batch of biscuits, use parquet margarine, made by Kraft. You see, parquet margarine is a real flavor shortening. It adds flavor to all baked foods. So no wonder the wife's cookies and cakes taste better when made with parquet. And if you like pan-fried foods, you'll find they're tastier, too, when you use parquet margarine. And you don't have to worry about parquet spattering or sticking to the pan. Of course, you'll want to use parquet margarine at the table, for you'll like its delicate, appetizing flavor. Now, maybe you men aren't as interested in nutrition as the women are, But you should know that parquet margarine is a nourishing energy food that contains vitamin A. So, men, if you can't find parquet margarine at home, buy a pound or two tomorrow. You'll be pleased to learn that it's mighty economical, too. Just ask the dealer for parquet. (laughs) P-A-R-K-A-Y. Just a second till I find my key, children. Oh, I'm tired. Yes. Hey, somebody put a note under the door. It's for you, Uncle Moore. Well, no, eh? I wonder who it's from. Uh, uh, dear pal Throcky, George Fiddy just told me you were in town, so I dropped over to see you. Sorry I missed you. Your old pal and sidekick, Charlie Dapple. Uh, good night. <laughs> music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Presents The Great Gildersleeve. (laughs) Each week at this time, Kraft presents from Hollywood, California, Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson.
We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, we might say that one good thing at least has come out of the world crisis, and that is that we Americans have learned that the right kind of food, and plenty of it, is vitally essential to national health and morale. And realizing this, we Americans can become the strongest nation on earth. That's why you homemakers should know about delicious parquet margarine made by Kraft. Because parquet margarine is an economical source of nourishment and energy your whole family needs. Yes, parquet margarine is a highly nutritious food, one of the best energy foods you can serve. And equally important is the fact that every pound of parquet contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. What's more, your whole family will like parquet margarine's delicate, appetizing flavor. Yes, delicious parquet margarine makes everything taste better, whether you serve it at the table or use it for baking or pan frying. So try this nourishing, economical food. Buy a pound or two of grand-tasting parquet margarine tomorrow. Just ask your dealer for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now, let's visit our friend, the Great Gildersleeve. Hello. Uh, Where is everybody? Oh. Oh, oh, there you are, Marjorie. Oh, hello, Mr. Morton. Did you bring the things I wanted for dinner? Yes. Here's the flowers, the after-dinner mints, and the candles for the cake. I hope this wasn't too much trouble. Not at all, my dear. The market was so crowded, I just drifted with the tide. That's how I happen to get this quart of clams. <laughs> yeah. How many of these candles do you think we should put on Judge Hooker's birthday cake, Uncle? Well, I don't know. How many cakes did Bertie bake? Oh, now, Uncle, I don't think it'd be polite to put on more than 30. Well, if that's all the candles you're going to use, you better burn them at both ends, then. <laughs> oh, I don't think he's that old. No? Say, he's got a Lincoln penny that he got from Lincoln. Oh. <laughs> Uncle Martin, I do wish you'd make an effort to get along better with the judge. Especially tonight at dinner. Well, seeing that it's his birthday, I'll give him a break. You will? Yes. I won't insult him until he insults me first. (laughs) Say, do you think he's going to be surprised when he finds out we know it's his birthday? Oh, he'll be dumbfounded. He's got a good start, too. He's been dumb ever since he was founded. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Uncle. Now, Judge Hooker is really awfully sweet. Well, it doesn't show on his face, then. Why, George, if I had a puss that sour, I'd take it out and drown it. Uh, say, something smells mighty nice around here. Oh, it's the dinner Bertie's fixing. Oh. And is it going to be delicious? You know, that Bertie is a real treasure. Her dinners are always delicious. The only trouble is I'm beginning to develop what is known as second helping spread. Well, what do you mean? Well, my laps are starting to overlap. Oh. <laughs> I don't talk that way, Uncle Mort. Huh? You're just the right weight for a man of your, uh, weight. Yeah. Well, maybe so. Everything's expanding these days. <laughs> oh, by the way, Oliver Honeywell's coming to dinner, too. What? Oliver again? Seems that every time we sit down to eat, there's that overgrown St. Bernard puppy yapping around the table. Well, his family's out of town, and Oliver doesn't like restaurants. Of course not. They charge for meals. <laughs> you know, I, I don't like to appear inhospitable, Marjorie, but I'm beginning to get bored with Oliver as a boarder. Well, his family will be back by Thanksgiving. Say, by the way, when is Thanksgiving? Anytime Oliver's family comes back. Uh, another thing, Marjorie, can't you persuade him to get a haircut? Oh, well, he says the barber shops frighten him. Huh? He cuts his own hair, and it gets long enough for him to reach. Ew. Well, somebody should uh, drop a hint that it's time for the fall harvest. Or else buy him a paper of booby pins. Uncle, you mean bobby pins. You heard me, Marjorie. Oh, uh, let me see. Have we forgotten anything? Oh, I don't think so. Let me see now. Dinner, uh-huh. presents. Yeah. Oh, I ordered a cute singing telegram delivered at 10 p.m. Oh. Say, what time did you tell... Did, did, huh? What time did you tell the judge to be here? Well, uh... Well, I said that... Uh, oh, my goodness. Where's my hat? Right in your hand. What's wrong? I forgot to invite somebody. Who? Judge Hooker. Oh. <laughs> Seabiscuit. Why, Leroy, what do you mean? Oh, hello, Oliver. Oh, Midgey Widgey. <laughs> Gee, you look lovely this evening. <laughs> How do I look? Gee, you look lovely too, Oliver. <laughs> hello, Meatball. 
Hi, Oliver. How's all your allergics tonight? Oh. Leroy, now be more polite. You mustn't make fun of me. Here's Judge Hooker, Marjorie. Oh, oh, hello. Hi, everybody. Hi. Dinner will be ready very soon now, Judge. Really, Marjorie, you folks shouldn't have gone to all this trouble. Uh, no trouble at all, Judge Hooker. We had to eat anyway. <laughs> By the way, Judge, do you know Oliver Honeywell? You mean that anemic young calf that hangs around Marjorie? I've heard about him, but I've never seen him. Uh, well, take a good look. This is him right here. <laughs> Hello. What? <laughs> oh, say, don't mind me. I'm always kidding, Oliver. That's the trouble. Everybody's always kidding, Oliver. No, no. <laughs> My boy, you mustn't get bitter. Say, why is your ear all bandaged up? Huh? Oh, I did this this afternoon when I was giving myself a haircut. <laughs> You mean to say you cut your own hair? Yeah, I do it with mirrors. Yeah. But what happened this afternoon? Did the bowl slip? No, no, I was using manicure scissors. I guess I didn't allow for the curve. Yeah. <laughs> well, your hair looks very pretty with the scalloped edges. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Sure. Hey, come in. I'm from the telegraph company. Oh, for goodness sakes, you're huh? too early, boy. Later. Yeah, but I got a message. Come back at 10 o'clock now. Beat it before you spoil everything. Yeah, but... <laughs> Wrong address, folks. <laughs> Say, Unc, can I give it to him now? What? Oh, oh, the present for the judge? Why, sure. Let's all give him his present now. For me? Now I wonder what's inside. Uh, listen to him. You think he was a sweet sixteen instead of a sour sixty. <laughs> Go on, unwrap him, Judge. All right, I will thank you. Oh. He's opening yours first, sis. Yeah. I hope you like it, Judge. I'm sure I will. Well, what do you think? A necktie. Well. Just what I need. Thank you, Marjorie. Now, let's look at the next one. With all best wishes from Oliver Honeywell. <laughs> well, 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 Honeywell. Yeah. You shouldn't have done this. Oh. Gee, another necktie. Yeah, isn't it nice? A yellow one with green polka dots. <laughs> you know, I got one just like that for Christmas last year. And I'll bet that's it. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's see about this one. Although it is not Christmas Eve, here's a present you will perceive from your old friend, Throckmorton Gilderson. Yeah. Catch on? It's a poem, Judge. Yeah, another necktie. Purple this time. Yes. Just matches your complexion, Judge. Thank you. I wonder what's in this package. It's from Leroy, I see. One guess, Judge Hooker. It's a necktie, all right, but this one's different. It's got a picture of Superman on it. Yeah. <laughs> well, now that the necktie party's over, let's trot into the dining room. Uh, Judge, uh, Bertie's fixed a special new dish in your honor. Is that so? I'm flattered. I thought you would be. What do you call it, Gildy? Uh, calves brains a la Judge Hooker. <laughs> no, thanks. No more. No more. My, that certainly was a delicious cake and beautiful, too. Yes. With all those candles lit up, we had enough heat to bake another cake. <laughs> Have your fun, Gildersleeve. I'm so full of wonderful food, I don't mind. Oh, that was a marvelous meal. I wish I had a cook like your birdie. Well, what happened to your cook, Judge? I let her go when I found out after fixing dinner for me, she'd go out and have her dinner in a restaurant. Oh, oh excuse me. I wonder who that can be. Uh, yes? I'm from the telegraph company. Not now, I said. Come back at 10 o'clock. Yeah, but I got a date at 10 o'clock. Break it. What was it, guilty old man? Uh, nothing at all, Judgy. Just a boy out looking for the wrong house. <laughs> Say, if you don't mind, I'm going into the kitchen and thank Bertie for that wonderful dinner. Oh, well, don't overpraise her, Judge. I won't. Remember, too many compliments spoil the cook. Uh, something I can do for you, Your Honor? No, Bertie. I just wanted to tell you that that dinner you just served was an Epicurean collation. Oh, is that considered good? I didn't think it was good. I thought it was a gastronomic achievement. Oh, you didn't like it. I did, too. And I consider myself a pretty good judge. And so do I, and I'll be glad to vote for you. When's the election? Next spring. <laughs> no, no, I mean judge of cooking. Wish you were working for me, Bertie. That Gildersleeve is a mighty lucky dog, but he doesn't really appreciate you. He don't? But look at the way he makes you wash those dishes, getting your hands all chapped and red. Well, man, them rubber gloves. <laughs> <laughs> well, the least he could do is to buy you a nice electrical dishwashing machine. I've got one in my kitchen. Say, you'd have a lot of fun operating it. <laughs> well, I don't know. I may be old-fashioned, but I prefer to dump the dishes in water instead of electric them. <laughs> <laughs> Great sense of humor you have there, Bertie. 
By the way, did I ever tell you about the fine big maid's room in my house? No, sir. Is it pretty? Is it? It's got everything but Rochester. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm, certainly sounds like the elephant's earrings to me. Yes, and uh, of course, I'm not home more than three, four nights a week, so that means my cook has plenty of days off and very little to do. What do you think, Bertie? Well, I think she's going to make some gal a wonderful employer. Well, you don't understand. I want you as my cook. Me? But I've already got a position. But think what it would mean to your social position among your friends if you were to cook for Horace Hooker. Yes, sir. That certainly would impress the other members of the mysterious and bewildering orders of the daughters of Cleopatra, which I, as the head, think. <laughs> but, of course, I just couldn't do it. Why not? Has Gildersleeve got you under contract? No, sir. I'm here strictly on a meal-to-meal -meal basis. Well, then, where no contractual entailment exists between principal and agent at the time of severance of service, notice of termination is not required, if so facto. Ain't that the truth? Yeah, that's common law. Oh, it happens often, huh? Well, yes. Say, after you've left Gildersleeve and come to work for me, you wish that you had left old stupid over... Old stupid over what, uh, uh, well, That is, uh, I was saying to Bertie that it must be hard working all stupid over a hot stove. Oh, yeah. I see. Well, come on back in the living room. The kids want to play pin the tail on the donkey, and you're going to be the Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm coming. Yeah. Hi, Bertie, and don't forget what I said. You mean about the ipso facto? Yes, yes, and the quicker you ipso, the sooner it'll be a facto. Come on, Gildy, old pal, let's go in the other room. Yeah, all right, Jack. <laughs> now, here he is. Well, children, what should we do? Well, I think it'll be just dandy if we play drop the Kleenex. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Oliver, don't you mean drop the handkerchief? Well, I figured that the other would be more sanitary. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> How about musical chairs or something like that? Well, I bet I know who that is. Hey, come in. Mister, this is positively my final appearance. Here's a telegram for you. Look, it's not for me. It's to this gray-haired gentleman right here. Oh. No, no, no. Don't hand it to him. It's supposed to be open and sung. Oh, but I don't think... You're not paid to think. You're paid to sing. I'll break in the song, young man. Well, okay, but remember, you asked for it. Uh. Me, me, me. Yes, you, you, you. Me, me, me. Mr. Throckmorton, T. Gildersleeve, I'm an awful bad jam. Can you send me $50 to bail me out? Sign your brother-in-law, Sam. What? <laughs> Old telegram, get out of here. Gildersleeve resident. Good morning, Bertie. This is Judge Hooker. How are you this bright and sunny morning? Dull and cloudy. I was up all night trying to decide between remaining where I is with the status quo or packing up and moving over to the ipso facto. I just telephoned to tell you that whatever your salary is now, I'll better it but $10 a month. $10 a month? Judge, you done just hide yourself a cook. Fine. How soon can you come to work? Well, that depends on how soon they let me go. Well, cook up some excuse to leave quick. Bye. Mm, that's going to take a mess of doing. Oh, nobody knows the trouble I'm getting into. Oh, Bertie, is breakfast ready? Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, Bertie. You better set another place, Bertie. Oliver invited himself over for breakfast again. More people to feed. Just working myself to a shadow. Uh-uh. Now, Bertie, can I help it if that biological blunder... Uh, come right in, Oliver. Thanks. Morning, Bert. Oh, prunes again, huh? Don't you like the way I fix breakfast? Uh, of course he does. Oliver, never wrinkle up your nose at a prune. Morning, everybody. You too, Oliver. Say, what is this? Prunes again? Now, if you don't like it... It is. Uh, Leroy, sit down and pass the toast. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Where's Marjorie? Isn't she? <coughs> oh, darn this toast. What's wrong with that toast? <coughs> it just went down the wrong way. Oh, you don't like it. And after I work my fingers to the bone, scraping it off for you. Yeah. <laughs> but all I said was the <coughs> wrong way. Oh, now I'm doing things the wrong way. Teaching me my business. I'm tired of not being appreciated around here. I was resigning. There's other people who like my cookery. Well, uh, Bertie seems to be a little twittery this morning. 
Gee, she never acted this way before. And you think she means that about resigning? Say, I better find out what's wrong. And now, Bertie, I don't understand what... Bertie, where are you? Oh, Bertie! Oh, Bertie! Oh, Bertie! Oh, Bertie! Oh, my goodness, Bertie has flown the coop. Come, come. Wake up, Leroy. It's time to go to school, young man. Oh, no. Just give me another 15 minutes, Bertie. Yep. This isn't Bertie. It's Uncle Mort. I just haven't shaved yet. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Unc. Where's Bertie? Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. Uh. Wake up, young man. Look at the clock. Do you want to be tardy? It's okay with me. You... Come on, Leroy. Wake up. Oliver's fixing some nice hot mush for breakfast. Ugh. Oh, just let me sleep ten minutes more. I can't, Leroy. Why, George, I'm going to pull the covers off of you. Oh, no, no, no. Don't do that. I'll get up. Yeah. Uh, say, where's Marjorie? She's downtown interviewing cooks at employment agencies. Help me, quick. Where? Oh, Oliver's in trouble in the kitchen. Uh, get up, Leroy. Uh, coming, Oliver. Yes. Now, what's the trouble? Oh, it's the mush I'm fixing for breakfast. It huh? keeps overflowing. Oh, yeah. I filled four pots already. Now I need another one. Oh. Well, it, here's a double boiler, Oliver. Now keep stirring or it'll start burning. Gee whiz, I never knew mush multiplied like this. <laughs> Just seems to go on and on and on. It's a morning cereal, isn't it? <laughs> oh, jumping jelly beans. What is it now? Oh, uh... Good morning, mailman. Oh, good morning, Mr. Gildersleeve. I've got a postage due letter here. It's uh, three cents, please. Uh, surely. Surely, three cents. Yeah. Yeah. Here you are. Oh, thank you. Say, this letter is for Bertie Lee Coggins. He doesn't work here anymore. Oh, yes, yes. That's your cook. Say, I've got a change of address for her. Better give me that letter back. Uh, certainly. Oh, by the way, what is her new address if it isn't violating any professional secrets? Oh, it's 2100 Burnside. It's 2100 Burnside. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's 20... That address sounds familiar to me. Where have I heard it before? 2100 Burnside. Why, of course. Leroy! Yeah? Oliver! Mm -hmm. I know who hired Bertie away from us. You do? Yes, I should have guessed it before. It was the judge. No! Yes, that crook of a hooker hooked our cook. The way who I lay my hands on him. He stole our Bertie, the horse thief. <laughs> that last hooker. I finally tracked you down. What do you mean, tracked me down? I'm always in my chambers this time of day. What do you want with me? Why, you oily worm, you got our birdie. We want her back. Nothing doing. Now get out. Oh, that does it. I'm going to create a vacancy on the Superior Court bench. Don't put down. Put down those bookends. I will not. Stand still, you old goat, so I can hit you. Now stay where you are, Gildersleeve, or I'll press this buzzer. I won't stay where I am. I'm going to knock you. What happens when you press the buzzer? My bailiff will come in and drag you down to jail. Yeah, it's a frame-up. That's what it is. First you steal my cook, then you upset our whole household, and now you're going to railroad me to the caboose. Uh-huh. So the big balloon's losing all its hot air. Your threats didn't work, Gildersleeve. You're a beaten man. You don't have to rub it in, you judicial Judas. I know, and I'm licked. We can't find anybody to do Bertie's work. We can't find where she puts anything. We haven't had a decent meal since she left. You haven't? Oh, that's too bad. Uh, well... I don't want to be too hard on you. So, if you promise to behave yourself, maybe I'll invite you over to the house for dinner sometime. I wouldn't sit down at the same table and eat a meal with you, Hooker, if I were starving. What am I talking about? If I were starving, I am starving. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that your stomach was bigger than your stubbornness. You can come to dinner tomorrow night if you want to. I don't want to. I wouldn't humiliate myself to the extent of what time tomorrow night? Seven o'clock. <laughs> And don't forget to bring Marjorie and Leroy. Of course I won't forget. But that's the only reason I'm coming. I'm just doing it for the kiddies. Remember, Uncle Mort, if this scheme is to work, you've got to keep a tight control over your temper. Uh, who, me? I never lose my temper. <laughs> and Leroy, now, don't overdo the business of being sassy. Oh, don't worry, sis. I'm a born actor. Well, I guess we're all ready. 
Gee, we surely look like tramps, don't we? Yeah. Well, go ahead and ring the bell, Uncle. Yeah, all right, all right. Now, on your guard, everybody. Here she comes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hello, Miss Mart. Hello. Hello, Leroy. Hello, Bertie. Good evening, Mr. Gillsleeve. Yes, good evening. <laughs> Won't y'all kindly come in and rest your hats and coats? They look kind of tired. Uh, oh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, come on in, children. Well, come right in. Oh, hello, Judge Hooker. So sweet of you to invite us. You have no idea how we're going to enjoy this. Hiya, Hooker. How's the cooker? Uh, Leroy, don't you talk that away. Oh, hooey fooey. You can't boss me anymore, Bertie. Oh, Leroy, behave yourself. Oh, I just can't imagine what's gotten into you lately. You used to be such a little gentleman. Oh, who wants to be a gentleman? I'm going to be a heavyweight prize fighter and, and true to back her. You ain't going to be no prize fighter long if somebody hits you smack on that chew of tobacco. And look at your hair. Somebody must have been trimming it with hedge clippers. Nope. Oliver showed me how to cut it all by myself. <laughs> you never did these farmer diddles when I was there. Why, Bertie, Bertie, isn't dinner ready? Yes, sir. Well, when, when you needed a haircut... Then cut, serve the first course, please. It's sitting on the table. Oh. oh, shall we go in now? Yes, sir. Come on, Leroy. Come on, Marjorie. Oh, I'm you. starved to death. Yes, sir. Well, how do you think everything looks? Oh, just splendid, except for Bertie. What's wrong with Bertie? Well, I think she must be worrying. She's got dark circles under her eyes. <laughs> Nonsense. Incidentally, you shouldn't talk coming here without a shave. Oh, yes, that reminds me. Uh, Bertie, where did you hide my good razor? I've looked high and low for it. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gillsleeve. It's out on the back porch. I used to carry it with me when I went out in the backyard at night, sort of discouraged, you know, late visitors. <laughs> Bertie, isn't it time to bring the soup? It's right here. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, I fixed a special turtle soup for you. I know it's your favorite. Well, thank you. It's a darn expensive to make. We don't have it very often. But I'll come over here every day if you'll cook it for me, Bertie. Oh, I'll be glad but, to. Uh, but, uh, Splendid. Do you mind if I bring over Oliver? He just loves turtle soup, Bertie. <laughs> well, you're invited, Gildy. Yeah. Boy, this soup is super. No matter how you like it, Leroy, you just eat it. Don't kiss it. <laughs> Leroy isn't your responsibility anymore, Bertie Yes, the judge is right, Bertie But I know how to handle him You just send him over here Bertie, pay attention to your work That's just what I'm doing Oh, Miss Marsh, that bandage You done cut your finger No, Bertie, I... I burned it Well, Arnie Oh, honey, how many times have I told you You ain't got no knack for ironing? Somebody's got to do it And we haven't found anyone else Yes and I'll come over tomorrow afternoon and do it for you. Now, wait a minute, Bertie. You're working for me. You can't do that. Oh, yes, I can. I got three afternoons off every week. And if I wants to spend a mining for Miss March, nothing in the world can stop me. Ipso facto, habeas corpus, or postmortem. <laughs> I tell you, I won't stand for it. As long as you're working for me, you can't spend all your time straightening out Gildersleeve's messes. Why, George, I can straighten out my own messes, you little... Oh, uh... Uncle, remember now, you mustn't. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> Excuse me, Judgy, what were you saying? I was just telling Bertie to quit acting like one of your family. Uh, well, I've been a member of that family so long, I just came up and quit all at once. Don't be foolish. Here you have all the extra time in the world. That's just the trouble. Nobody to cook for. Except one dyspeptic that eats itty-bitty dabs. There's no big parties with lots of work like over at Mr. Gillsleeve. Well, I must say that that is... And when I see that Leroy, who I practically raised myself, acting so fresh because he needs a guiding hand to slap him down once in a while. <laughs> well, I just don't like this job, Judge. And if I thought Miss Marge would have me back again, I'd go right upstairs and pack my bag. What? Why, you ungrateful... Bertie, we'd be very happy to have you come back. Okay, I was resigning, Judge. But you can't do that. You haven't given me any notice. I don't need to. Where does no contractual entailment exist between the principal and the agent at the time of severance of service, notice of termination is not required. If so, facto. <laughs> Oh, what's the use? <laughs> I'll get my things, and I'll be waiting out in the car when y'all get ready. Goodbye, George. Bye. Oh, it's a fine mess, and I have a sneaking suspicion regarding how it all came about, too. Why, Judgy, what are you hinting at? Never mind. 
Oh, whatever are we going to do about this dinner? Well, if you want to come over to our house, our birdie will be glad to fix us up some ham and eggs, Judge. No, thanks. You sneak in the grass. You, look who's calling who a what and a where. <laughs> come on, children. I won't let you remain in this atmosphere a moment longer. That suits me fine. Yes. But there's just one thing I've got to do before I go, Hooker. Let go of me. Get off of me. Help. Help. He's choking me to death. What? Oh, stop. Uncle, don't choke him. Now you must. I'm not choking the little pipsqueak. I'm just taking back the necktie I gave him for his birthday. <laughs> Come on, children. Did I do my part all right, Uncle? Oh, you were perfect, my boy. You were a regular dead-end kid. Oh, this bandage on my finger bothers me. Can I take it off now? No, no, no. Uh, keep it on for at least another day or so, Marjorie. Or else Bertie might get wise that this was all a put-up. Ah, oh, Bertie, there you are. <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Gill, please. Uh, are you all ready to come home with us now, Bertie? Yes, sir. <laughs> That was mighty cute the way y'all pretended things were wrong at home. Of course, it didn't fool me a bit. What? We didn't? Oh, my goodness. Greg Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, do you grown-ups listening and remember the good old cookie jar? Yes, and what a treat it was to come home after school and fill up on those wonderful cookies Mother used to make. Well, the cookie jar is an American institution. Every family with youngsters certainly ought to have one. And for making better-tasting cookies to put in the jar, let me tell you about parquet margarine, made by Kraft. You see, because parquet margarine is so delicious for table use... It makes better-tasting cookies, too. Yes, parquet margarine is a genuine flavor shortening, not bland and tasteless. Parquet adds flavor to all baked foods. That goes for cakes and pastries, too. And for the same reason, parquet margarine makes pan-fried foods tastier, too. And it doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. Another thing, whether you serve parquet margarine at the table or use it for baking and pan-frying, it's a nourishing, wholesome energy food and a reliable winter and summer source of vitamin A. Now, for all these reasons, you should keep plenty of economical parquet margarine on hand. So tomorrow, ask your dealer for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. It sure is good to be back in my own kitchen again. Well, we're glad to have you back, Bertie. <laughs> well, there's one thing you sure was a surprise. Well, what's that? I expected to find the sink piled high with dirty dishes and ain't a single one. No, we've been using paper plates. Yeah, we broke all the dishes. Yes. <laughs> good night. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randall. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. And reminding you that America's first line of defense is you and your support. So invest to the best of your ability in defense savings bonds. Good night. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The National Broadcasting Company. The National Broadcasting Company. National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Each week 
at this time from Hollywood, California, Kraft presents Harold Terry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levin. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, remember the saying, an army marches on its stomach? Well, nowadays, battles are won not by armies alone, but by entire populations. For total defense, we all must have plenty of the right kind of food. That means wholesome, nourishing food. Food that produces the energy we use up in hard work and play. That's why parquet margarine, the quality margarine made by Kraft, should be an important item on your shopping list. Because parquet margarine is an economical source of important food elements we all need. Parquet margarine not only has delicious flavor that makes it a favorite for table use, baking, and pan frying, parquet margarine is a highly nutritious food, one of the best energy foods you can serve. What's more, every pound of parquet contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. So why not give your family the benefits of this wholesome, nourishing food and start serving them parquet margarine now? They'll like its flavor. You'll know it's good for them. So tomorrow, ask your dealer for Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now, let's visit our friend, the Great Gildersleeve. My goodness, Bertie, the ashtrays are all empty for once. Uh, what is this, some special occasion? For me it is, Mr. Gildersleeve. I'd like to have the evening off. Oh, is this your night to leave early? No, sir, but I'd sort of like to get an advance on next week's night off. Oh, yeah. Uh, any reason why not, Marjorie? Oh, not at all. Go ahead, Bertie. <laughs> Thanks. I wouldn't ask, only we've got spectacular things tonight down at our lodge. Oh. That's the mysterious and bewildering orders of the daughters of Cleopatra. <laughs> yeah, our Bertie's the head sphinx. <laughs> Not no more, Leroy. I's now the exhausted ruler of the pyramid. Yeah. <laughs> I's been promoted. Uh, yeah, I see. Uh, does that make you the uh, head man? No, sir. I was practically a stowaway on the royal barge of the ancient Nile. Yes. And ahead of me comes the major domus of the outer chamber of the inner sanctum. Yes. Then the, 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 the chief searcher in the bulrushes for the daughters of Pharaoh. Oh, yes. And above her comes the royal rejecter of delinquent daughters. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, isn't there a queen, Bertie? Uh, Mr. Gill's leaving our organization every gal for queen. Oh, my pardon. Uh... <laughs> Well, what are you holding tonight, Bertie? An initiation? No, ma'am. It's the red, white, and blue fish fry in order of, uh, you know, to honor a group of our visiting soldier boys. Oh, yeah. The daughters of Clear Patriots are all 100% Americans. Well, that's a fine thing, Bertie, entertaining your uh, soldier friends. Yes, sir. We've even hired a military jitterbug band. Mm. The brown-skinned, boogie-woogie bugle boys. <laughs> well, <laughs> go right ahead. And if you want to take anything from the pantry for the fish fry, help yourself, Bertie. Yes. Yeah, you may want to broil a couple of cans of sardines. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Gill. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> yeah. Say, Unc, you know something? Leroy, I wish you wouldn't keep using that expression. Of course I know something. But what is it? <laughs> well, well, I was reading in the paper where there's going to be about a thousand soldiers in Summerfield over Thanksgiving. Yes? Well, let me see. Yeah, here it is. Well, uh, city will play host to 32nd Regiment Thursday. USO urges all citizens to invite army men to dinner. That's what I mean. Can we have a soldier for our Thanksgiving dinner, Uncle Mort? <laughs> Leroy, you sound like a cannibal. <laughs> Leroy, you mean can we invite a soldier to come to dinner? Yes, and I think it's a splendid idea. Oh, then we're going to have one? Why, of course. When I think of all those boys, many of them so far away from home, it takes me back to the lonesome Thanksgiving I spent in an army hospital back in 1918. Gee, Uncle, I never knew you were wounded. Well, it's, it's something I never talk about. Well, what happened to you, Uncle Moore? I was kicked by a mule. <laughs> Where were you kicked, Uncle? It... In the customary place. <laughs> uh, that mule kicked me so high they gave me a pilot's license. <laughs> You know, I spent three weeks in bed, flat on my stomach. 
In those days, I had a flat stomach. <laughs> but remember, kiddies, never mention a word of this to anybody. It's still a painful subject. Even now, I twitch when I pass a mule. <laughs> Gee, Uncle Mort, where did this happen? In France? Uh, no, Leroy, in Missouri. <laughs> I was buying mules for the Army. Uh, sort of talent scout for jackasses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, I, I got 9,000 of them before one of them got me. <laughs> Say, I never knew you knew anything about mules. Oh, yes, Leroy. I had quite an asinine education. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was a long time ago. Let's forget it, children. Yes. Does that paper say how we go about inviting a soldier for dinner? Uh, inviting? Let me see. Uh, oh, yes, here it is. Uh, patriotic families who wish to share their Thanksgiving dinner with members of the Army are requested to be at Bacon Square, opposite the City Hall, before noon Thursday to pick up their dinner guests. The Army men will be uh, bivouacked at the Square. What's bivouacked, Uncle? Uh, a, big wa- a bivouac is a place where barking dogs are cooled off in pup tents. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I gotta remember that. <laughs> also, that word. <laughs> well, but it's very simple. Huh? Just one more for dinner, sir. Yeah. You can drive down in the morning and pick up one of the boys, Uncle. Gee, that's gonna be keen. Yeah, uh, we better ask Bertie if it's all right with her first, though. Uh, oh, Bertie! Yes, it's all right with me. You... <laughs> uh, that woman's wasting her time as a cook. She'd get a job as an airplane detector. <laughs> Say, I have a better idea. Let's have a real celebration. We'll get a couple of extra turkeys and invite eight or ten boys. Eight or ten? Won't that be too much trouble, Marjorie? Oh, no. I'll ask some of my girlfriends to come over. Uh, girlfriends? Oh, uh, by all means. That'll be jolly uh, for the soldiers, too. <laughs> oh, gee, Unc, the whole idea sounded great till you brought in the girls. Do we have to have girls? Why not, Leroy? Yes. What's wrong with them? Jeepers, don't you think those soldiers are doing enough for their country as it is without wasting their day off with a bunch of silly girls? And in conclusion, fellow citizens of Summerfield, let me urge you once more on the eve of Thanksgiving... To open your hearts and your homes tomorrow to the soldiers visiting our fair city. Yep. Quit popping your bubble gum, Leroy. Especially while I'm rehearsing my radio speech. Oh, I'm sorry, Unc. I'm doing it unconscious. Yes, I'm sure you are. <laughs> Young man, if you keep playing with your gum that way, someday you're going to have a blowout. And remember, you haven't got a spare face. <laughs> Finish your talk, please, Uncle Moore. Well, I don't need to rehearse it anymore, Marjorie. I know that speech backwards. You do? Let's hear it. I bet it sounds even better backwards. Yep. <laughs> Leroy, you keep that up and you're going to get some applause backwards. You know, I think it's wonderful of you, Uncle Mort, to go on the air tonight and urge everyone to entertain the soldiers. Well, people have always told me I should be on the radio. They say I sound just like that fellow who used to be with Pippa McGee and Molly. <laughs> <laughs> Probably some of the girls now. Oh, wonderful. Hello, girls. Oh, yeah. Oh, pleasure, girl. Very beautiful. Cute, aren't they? Uncle Mort, I want you to meet Betty Wilkins and uh, Mildred Sherman. Hello, Mr. Well, well, How are you? What lovely friends you have, Marjorie. You should invite them here oftener. <laughs> Much oftener. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, not at all, my dear. I've always had an eye for redheads. But Uncle Mort, last year she was a blonde. Yeah. <laughs> I see. She's got a convertible top. <laughs> oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, huh? all of us girls think you're simply too tremendous starting these soldier parties. Uh, oh, he ain't so tremendous. It's that suit he's wearing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like him just the way he is, especially that straight military bearing. Yeah. After all, he was an army man, you know. He was? Mm-hmm. What branch of the service were you in? Uh, you flew, didn't you? Uh, for a short time. <laughs> What kind of a plane did you use? A plane? It's a, an old Jenny. <laughs> and, and you were wounded, too, weren't you? Uh, oh, dear. Whereabouts were you wounded, Major Gilbert? <laughs> At the front? No, it was in the... Leroy. <laughs> I, I was just going to tell him it was in the middle of... Uh, the... Leroy. But, Uncle, you told me yourself you were wounded right smack in the middle of Missouri. Oh. Yeah, 
Yes, that's right, in Jefferson City Mo. <laughs> but even so, you were lucky to have recovered. Yes, everybody said I had a horseshoe in my hip pocket. <laughs> I didn't get rid of it either till they operated. Well, what were you doing in the Army when you weren't flying, Major? Well, I, I was sort of a recruiting officer. Yes, I brought more than 9,000 uh, recruits into the field artillery alone. Uh, I got a kick out of it, too. <laughs> That must have been a lot of fun. A fun? Well, uh, only at the beginning, my dear. I got awfully tired in the end. Hey, um, Uncle, huh? isn't it time for you to go to the radio station? By George, you're right, Marjorie. Leroy, you want to come along? Well, I'd like to, Uncle, but I got a little surprise of my own for tomorrow. I'm going over to Piggy Banks' house. Oh, oh say, while you're there, Leroy, remind Piggy's sister Penny about coming tomorrow. If you mean that Piggy Banks has a sister named Penny Banks? Yes. Uh-huh. She was named after her Aunt Penelope, who lived in Indiana. Auntie is one of the... Don't tell me, Marjorie, I know. One of the banks of the Wabash. Look, Peggy, how's about lending me your bugle? Oh, I don't know, me, boy. What you want with it? I need it for Thanksgiving tomorrow. Oh, you got the wrong instrument. On Thanksgiving, you play with drumsticks. Uh, now beat it. Oh, for corn's sake. Look, Pig, the reason I wanted it is because we're going to have a lot of soldiers for dinner. So what? We're having our cousin Rockwell. He's a city alderman. Oh, what's a measly old alderman? My uncle used to be a big shot in the Army. A major in the Missouri Mules. What you mean? Oh, well, that, that's what they called his outfit. Say, he recruited the toughest, meanest, fightingest outfit that ever come out of Missouri. What kind of outfit was it? Uh, a field artillery. You know, the cannon ears with hairy ears. <laughs> Do they really have hairy ears? Oh, brother. I still can't see that this got anything to do with borrowing my bugle. Gee, you're dumb. I gotta make these soldiers feel at home so they can enjoy the turkey dinner. I'm gonna blow mess call on your bugle. Oh, I get you. That's a keen idea, Meatball. Now will you lend it to me? Sure. Swell. Now there's only one thing I gotta do. What's that? I gotta learn how to play a bugle. <laughs> Why, those turkeys sure look good, Bertie. You don't happen to have a spare leg, do you? No, sir, but I sure could use one with all the running around I've got to do. <laughs> uh, no, Bertie, I mean a spare turkey leg. No, sir. I ain't going to subdivide none of them birds before the zero hour. Oof. And when I serve them, they're going to be intact, a thing of beauty, and a joy for about two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how about some stuffing, then? Nobody's going to do no stuffing no how till everybody does. Yeah. And that includes stuffing yourself with stuffed olives, too. Oh, yeah. You're talking to me? Yes, sir. I've hardly got enough olives now to spell out welcome 32nd Regiment into mashed potatoes. <laughs> huh? You know, people have been coming to the door all morning asking for soldiers for dinner just because you went on the radio last night. Yeah, but I told them to go down to Bacon Square. <laughs> Jumping jeeps, what's that? Oh, it sounded like it came from the living room. Well, it can't be anything serious. Then again, maybe it can. I'll find out right away. Leroy! <laughs> what are you doing? Learning how to blow a mess call, Unc. Was that mess call? It sounded more like a moose call. <laughs> Boy, won't those soldiers be surprised when they hear me blowing the bugle? Yeah, and won't you, too. <laughs> oh, gee, give me a little time. All I need is practice. Yeah? I heard in school that Grace Moore practices six hours a day. Yeah, a lot of good it does her. I bet she still can't play the bugle. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a sweet thought, Leroy, even if your music is sour. Oh, there's a doorbell. I'll get it, folks. Yes? Uh, excuse me, please. Uh, is this the gentleman who was speaking last night by the radio from Soldiers for Thanksgiving? Uh, yes, madam. Well, uh, permit me to introduce myself. Uh, Mrs. Sapiro, glad to meet you. Uh, how do you do, Mrs. Sapiro? Glad to meet you. What can I do for you? <laughs> well, I got right now in the oven a nice young kosher toiki, and I am wanting a soldier who is likewise. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Sapiro, but I haven't anything to do with these soldiers officially. You'll find them down at Bacon Square. Please. 
If the soldier boy I'm looking for is at Bacon Square, then he's not the soldier boy I'm looking for. Uh. Goodbye. <laughs> Huh? You started downtown yet? You better get going. It's almost 12. Well, all right, just as soon as I get my coat and hat. And Leroy. Uh, Leroy, come on if you're going downtown with me. Okay, Uncle, here I come. Yeah. Oh, stop that for a little. Young man, what are you doing swimming around in my old army uniform? Here, yeah, that's part of the surprise. How do I look? You and the mothballs look fine. Oh, girls, come in here and see Leroy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, look cute at that. Look, he's got Uncle's uniform on, and it's all pinned up. <laughs> Almost reached to the floor and back. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Major Gildersleeve, why don't you put it on? Oh, I'm sorry, girls. But I couldn't get into that uniform if it were three times as big as it is now and I was twice as small as I am. <laughs> which would still be half again as large as the suit would be if it were double the size of what it is now, which it isn't, thank goodness, because if it was, I'd have to wear it and I can't because it doesn't fit. <laughs> Leroy, with all those girls coming over to our house this afternoon, I'm going to have to ask for about 12 soldiers instead of eight. Oh, well, that'll be super, Unc. Huh? Say, look at all those tents. Gee, where are all the soldiers? Oh, they must be inside. Say, you don't think they've all been invited out already, do you? Leroy, you get the most fantastic ideas. Uh, hello, uh, where is everybody? Uh, how do you knock on a pup tent? <laughs> There's nobody in here, Unc. Oh, my goodness, nobody home. Uh, Leroy, get away from that cannon before it goes off and takes you with it. Why did we wait so long? If all these pup tents are empty, I'm certainly going to be in the doghouse. Hey, Uncle Mort, here comes a soldier. Shall we invite him? Uh, yes, of course. Oh, uh, a soldier? Yeah? Uh, how would you like to come over to my house for dinner now? Well, I don't know. Uh, you... We're going to have a... Hey, one... wait a minute. You leave this boy alone. He's coming home to dinner with me. Is that so? Don't you try to rustle my recruit. I saw him first. Oh, no, you didn't. I saw him first. You did not. I saw him at least 20 seconds before you did. Mister, I saw this boy 20 years before you did. He's my son. You... <laughs> Come on, boy. Mom's waiting. Yeah, Mom's waiting. Oh, my goodness. Leroy, if I don't bring back a bevy of boys for that gang of girls, my goose will be cooked instead of my turkeys. Hey, let's look in this big tent. Maybe somebody's here. Huh? Oh, hello, mister. Hello. Uh, 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 this is the mess tent, Leroy. Hello, Sergeant. Leroy, this is the mess, Sergeant. Uh, where can I find some of your boarders, Sergeant? Uh, they deserted me. And after I've been working my fingers to the bone over a hot stove all morning. Oh. You, you mean they've all been invited to homes already? Everybody, including my dishwasher. Oh, Leroy, we're sunk. You're sunk? What about me? Fifty gallons of the finest turkey a la king made from a special recipe created by Prudence Penny. <laughs> Twenty dozen dainty Parker House rolls that couldn't be topped by Parker House himself. And 32 mince pies made out of the tenderest part of them mince. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I can sympathize with you, Sergeant, but maybe you can help us. How? Well, it, it just so happens that we've gotten ourselves in something of a mess, Sergeant. Uh, we have three turkeys and almost a dozen beautiful girls at our house just waiting to entertain some soldiers. Yeah, you should see the cookies that are waiting for the rookies. Yeah. <laughs> You'd have a wonderful time at our house, Sarge. How about taking off that apron and coming with us? I'm sorry, sir, but I'm on duty. Yeah? Like the captain of a ship, everybody else can leave. But I got to get down with me pot. Gee, that's too bad. Come on, Uncle. Uh, before you go, I got just one slight request I'd like to make. Uh, would you please take a taste of my turkey a la king? Well, I don't think oh, I... Oh, come on. Huh? Just one teensy weensy little taste. Well... Just so I didn't labor all morning in vain. Yeah. Here. It's conscientious, isn't it, Leroy? Well, thank you. Uh, you have some, son? Thank you, but it has spoiled my appetite for dinner. And I've been saving this appetite for a week. How do you like it, mister? Well, I think I'll have a little more. Oh, no, 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 Uncle huh? Mort. Come on, we got to dig up some soldiers. Yeah, you're right, Leroy. Are you sure you won't come with us, Sarge? No, buddy. Duty is duty. And besides, the colonel would be sure to catch me if I sneaked out. Oh, the colonel? I'll bet he's got a few soldiers up his sleeve. Where can I find him? Way over there at the other end of the square, sitting in his tent. Yes, sir. Well, come on, Leroy. We'll lay our troubles in his lap. <laughs> Yes, yes, I'm Colonel Atterbury. What can I do for you? Uh, Colonel, my name is Gildersleeve. Oh, yes, very unusual name. What can I do for you? Uh, 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 Colonel, uh, Colonel? <laughs> I, I have a lovely big home, a wonderful cook, and a dozen of the sweetest girls in Summerfield. What, no boys? Uh, no, that's the trouble. No boys. 
We get all prepared to entertain 10 or 12 soldiers at dinner today, and when I come down to pick them up, what do I find? No soldiers. Not a single solitary rear rank third assistant buck private. Well, I, I'm sorry. Sorry, he gargles. <laughs> By George, this is a pretty pickle for our army to get itself caught over a barrel into. Yeah. And that's where I've been practicing mess calls all day, too. Yes, the poor little fellow almost blew his brains out. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what I'll do, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh? Gildersleeve. Gil- so I think I know you from some place. Huh? Yes? Yes, I can't place your face, but your manners are awfully familiar. Yeah. <laughs> well, never mind. As soon as some of our men return, I'll send them out to your house. Yeah, huh? That's just the old brush-off. I'm just stubborn enough to stay right stubborn. here. Stubborn? That's it. I've got it. Huh? Yours. <laughs> That's where I know you from. You were stuck again, Gildersleeve. The officer who bought more bad mules than the whole artillery could shake a stick at. Why, you... <laughs> yeah. Don't pay any attention to the way he jokes, Leroy. Great kidders, these army men. Well, Colonel, now that you recognize me, I hope you'll trot out some suitable recruits for us to take home. Gildersleeve, I've got just the right detachment for you. Yeah, wonderful. Who are they? Some old friends of yours. Huh? A whole corral full of mules. They just love to be your guest. Uh, <laughs> Whoa! Come on, Leroy. Whoa. Let's get out of here. Uh, uh, what am I laughing at? Donna, wish you'd invited me to go to dinner today. Uh, Leroy, you better run along home now and tell the girls I'll bring back some soldiers if I have to call out the Marines. Okay, Uncle. Where are you going now? I'm going to try the USO headquarters. And if you see any soldiers on the way home, grab them, even if they're wearing Civil War uniforms. I'll do my best, Uncle Mort. See you when you get home. Yeah, all right, Leroy. Oh, uh, look who's standing on the corner. Well, hello, Judge Hooker. Hello, Gildersleeve. Uh, what's wrong? You look as though you've lost your last friend. But, of course, I know that happened years ago. <laughs> Gildersleeve, I'll thank you to keep your nose out of my business. I'll be only too glad to. Uh, what are you doing hanging around street corners? I'm... Well, it's a long story. Huh? I happened to turn on the radio at home last night, and there was a fellow urging everyone to invite a soldier to dinner. Oh, 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 he did. Ah, uh, that speaker. Uh, There's a man. Uh, the way he told every citizen to do his duty by our new army was stirring and inspirational. It's, it was, eh? Yes. Why, the first thing I did this morning was phone the best restaurant in town and order the most expensive turkey dinner out to my house. Uh, I was going to invite a soldier to share it. That's the effect that speaker had on me. Well, uh, where is your soldier? Well, that's where the trouble comes in. Huh? People at the USO headquarters tell me that there would have been plenty of them to go around if this radio speaker hadn't wrecked all their plans by urging everybody in town to come down after a soldier. Oh, my goodness. So that was it. Of all the numbskull notions... Not I... a word against that man, Gildersleeve. Huh? He made a wonderful impression on me. Uh... Clean cut vibrant personality. Uh One of nature's noblemen, I should judge. (laughs) Wish I could meet him someday. Would you really want to? Yes. Well, then shake hands. Oh, you'd like to meet him, too. Good gracious, no, I am him. Uh, What? You? Why, you hypocritical hippopotamus. What? No. No, that's wrong of me. I've misjudged you, Gildersleeve. Well, I... Yes, I've misjudged you too, Judge Hooker. I never thought you had a heart under that old thick hide of yours. No? No. I just thought your blood circulated because you brought it to a boil so often. (laughs) What are you doing roaming the streets on Thanksgiving afternoon, Gildy? Yeah, same thing as you are, Hooker. Looking for some military men to fight their way through a couple of 20-pound turkeys. Well, I suppose we do our hunting together, Gildy, old pal. Why not, old chum? After all, this is Thanksgiving Day, and we should treat each other like human beings for change. Splendid. That goes for me, too. At least for today. Yeah, well, come on, come on, come on. You work this side of the street, and I'll take the other side. All right. Oh, boy. Wait a moment. What is it? Look, here comes a young fellow in uniform now. And I saw him first. Yes, that's so. Hey, hey, son, come here, come here. Uh, stop that, you double-crossing little bot fly. Young man, how'd you like a delicious turkey dinner? Huh? Who, me? Yes, he wants you to come up to my house. I don't either. I'm in my house. I've got a great big turkey just for two of us. Uh, we got four turkeys at our house, and we'll give you a whole one for yourself, son. Oh, gee whiz, I couldn't eat that much. And besides, I'm supposed to report to USO headquarters. Uh, They're closed for the day, uh, Corporal. Come on out to my house. Oh, but I'm not a corporal. Of course not, Sergeant. Now my car's right over here. <laughs> so if you'll excuse us, Judge. No, nope. come this way with me, Lieutenant. <laughs> You wouldn't like it at his place, Captain. Oh, now, gentlemen, please. Wait, let go of me. Hey, you're tearing my uniform. Let go of the Major's uniform. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Let's trot along. Let's trot along. Okay. If you want to get indigestion... Now, my turkey is... His turkey is as old as he is and just as tough. Hey, I wish somebody would tell me what this is all about. Don't let him confuse you, son. I'll take you to a movie after dinner. A movie? Yeah. We're going to have dancing at our house. You'll have 12 beautiful hostesses to dance with. Oh, who wants to dance on a full stomach? You do, don't you, son? Well, gee, I don't know. I never learned. No time like right after dinner. Come on, that's my car right over there. Of all the low-down, backbiting, double-dyed, unscrupulouses, I've had enough. Come back here, young man. Who, me? Yes, you. I'm going to start off entertaining you this afternoon by making this fat worm fold up like a road map. Uh, here, hold my coat. I'll be very glad to. No, I won't. Now, see here, Hooker, you point a pinky at me, and I'll beat the daylights out of you and then back in again. Uh, gee, aren't you two fellas a little too old for this sort of thing? If you keep out of this. Who invited you to? Say, I invited you. Come on, let's go home. No, you don't, Gildersleeve. I'm going to knock you colder than an Eskimo mother-in-law's kiss. Why, you old... You... Oh. <laughs> What's the use of quarreling like this? If you've got your heart set on taking this young man home, Judge, I won't stand in your way. Yeah, but haven't I anything to say? No. Nope. Gildersleeve, do you mean this? Yes, Judge. Go on, get your car. Hurry up now before I change my mind. All right. You just wait right here, soldier. I'll be back in a jiffy, and then we'll have a wonderful dinner. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving, Gildy. Yeah. Yeah. Gee whiz, mister, you got me all confused. Do I have to have dinner with that other gentleman? With that old goat? Of course not. Huh? Wait till he turns the corner. All right, come on. I'll run like anything. But, but the judge went that way. I know that. My car is this way. Hurry up, boy. Huh? There they are now. Come on, girls. Let's go to the front door. Come on. Bertie, get things ready. Leroy, there's your pew. Yeah, well, well. Here we are at last. Step right in, son, and meet everybody. Mm, gee, thanks. Yeah. The girls, this is Jerry Arnold, Private Jerry Arnold of the United States Army. Oh, no, sir. Oh, you're not a private? Oh, no, sir. I'm not even in the Army. What? You're not? I know, sir. I'm a Boy Scout. Oh! The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, whether you celebrate Thanksgiving next Thursday or the week after, there's one thing that's the same everywhere. Yes, that turkey's going to taste mighty good with all its trimmings and fixings. And we all want to remember that we Americans still have plenty to be thankful for. And another thing that's certain... If you make your Thanksgiving cakes and pastries and cookies with parquet margarine, you're going to get plenty of compliments on their downright good taste. You see, the delicious flavor that makes parquet margarine so popular for table use makes it wonderful for baking, too. Yes, as sure as parquet is a delicious spread, it's a genuine flavor shortening, too, not a bland, tasteless fat. Parquet adds flavor to pan-fried foods, too, and it doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. So serve parquet margarine at the table... Use it for baking and pan frying, too. Remember, you can use all you want because parquet margarine is economical and good for your family. Yes, parquet margarine is a wholesome, nourishing energy food and a reliable source of vitamin A. So right now, add parquet margarine to your shopping list. Remember, it's parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. <laughs> Sorry, our time's up. Happy Thanksgiving, ladies and gentlemen. Good night. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. 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 Kraft presents the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> <laughs> Week at this time from Hollywood, California, Kraft presents Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson.
We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, is your family the hard-working, hard-playing kind? Of course, most of us are these days. Increased effort is expected of every one of us. And that's why plenty of wholesome, nourishing energy food is so vitally important. The kind of food that replaces the energy we use up every day. Well, one of the best energy foods you can serve is delicious parquet margarine made by Kraft. Yes, parquet margarine is an economical source of nourishment and energy your whole family needs. You'll be glad to know, too, that every pound of parquet contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. What's more, parquet margarine is so downright good tasting, your family will eat all they need. Yes, parquet margarine's delicate, satisfying flavor is sure to make a hit, whether you serve it at the table or use it for baking and pan frying. So why not give your family the benefits of this delicious, nourishing food and start serving them parquet margarine tomorrow? Yes, when you order, ask your dealer for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now let's visit our friend, the Great Gildersleeve. In the attic, yes. What about it, Leroy? Well, look what I found up there. An old family album. An uh, album? Oh, is that so? Any pictures of me in it? Ah, there. You're number one of a puss parade. Yes. Leroy. May I look at it, Uncle? Uh, sure, Marjorie. Go ahead if you want to. Thanks. Oh, look at this one. Huh? Oh, what a beautiful baby. Uh, Say, who is she? Well, if you must know, she's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You mean you didn't always have that mustache? Uh, well, not as a little shaver. <laughs> Turn the page, Marjorie. Huh? Oop. <laughs> Forgot about that one in the little Lord Fauntleroy outfit. <laughs> Wish I had those beautiful curls today. For corn's sake, look at the lace on your pants. <laughs> Leroy, at that age, did I know what I was doing? <laughs> look, here's one where you're a little older. Huh? With two pretty little rabbits. Oh, yes, my rabbits. Those are my pets. I called them Flopsy and Mopsy. I intended to raise them and make enough money to pay my way through college. What happened, Uncle Mort? Nothing. I paid two bucks for those rabbits. <laughs> what was the matter? That was it. Two bucks. <laughs> yeah. Say, Uncle, huh? are these your first long pants you're wearing in this picture? Yes. Uh, tight, weren't they? When people saw me wearing them, they just split. Who are the people of the pants? Yeah. First the pants, then the people. <laughs> Here's a picture taken not so long ago. Well, How can you tell? Well, Uncle Mort is almost as fat as he is now. Leroy, the bathing suit he's wearing. Yes. That suit was all wool and a yard wide. <laughs> What's that thing you're eating, Unc? Uh, let me see. Eating? Oh, uh, I wasn't eating anything. I was just blowing up my water wings. <laughs> Say, I feel kind of chilly. Uh, Bertie, uh, shut the front door. Oh, probably the change in the weather. I'll take care of it, children. Yeah. Now, what's the trouble, Bertie? But no wonder that door is stuck. There's a man's foot caught inside. I know that, and he refuses to take it out. Oh, well, let him in. He's probably a visitor. Say no visitor, a salesman. Salesman? How do you know? Because the hot air's coming from the outside inside. Oh. <laughs> Mister, get your foot out this door, because we ain't in the market for nothing. Yeah. Well, let me handle him now, Bertie. I'll brush him off quickly. Now, don't you go buying any foolish, worthless stuff like you did last time. Huh? That perfume was nothing but water. Well, how did you know, Bertie? Did you open the bottle? <laughs> no, sir. But the salesman come around to his back, and I bought some myself. Yeah. <laughs> well, you run along back to the kitchen. I'll get rid of this chap. Yes, sir. Yeah. Ah, good afternoon, sir. My company is introducing a new cigar. Well, I don't want it. And I'm giving out a few boxes to discriminating judges of tobacco as free sample. I said I just... Oh, uh, free? Uh -huh. Oh. <laughs> well, let's step in out of the cold, sir. Oh. Here, let me help you with those big, heavy boxes. Oh, thank you. You're thank such you. a little fellow. Yeah. Yeah. I was always considered quite an authority on good cigars. What's the name of this new brand? Mister, these are the genuine made in Havana, aged in the wood, soaked in the New England maple syrup La Rumba Panatella cigars. Sure. Once you get the La Rumba habit, you can't shake it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they certainly sound good. Oh, and they smell good, too. Uh, now, just sample the delicious aroma. Hmm? Go ahead. 
Let your nose run riot. Oh, uh, 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 let me see. Uh, 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 clears the head, doesn't it? Practically clears the room. <laughs> I'm afraid these are rather strong for me, young Oh, man. yeah, and after you've smoked a few, you'll be strong for them. I'll have to be, to be. Now, in consideration for advertising these wonderful cigars among your friends, we make absolutely no charge for them. Oh, you don't? Well, with Christmas coming on and everything, I think I could manage to get rid of five or ten boxes for you. Oh, it's splendid, splendid. I might add that while we make absolutely no charge for the cigars themselves, we ask you to pay for cellophane, band, and the box. That's yeah. only to be expected, of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what does that amount to? Oh, I hate to even mention it. So do I, but go ahead. Well, <laughs> let me see. Yeah. Four and two. Four and two. Eight and six cents. Huh? Well, that comes to a total of a dollar and ninety-eight cents per box. A dollar ninety-eight. Well, is that all? Oh gosh, I forgot taxes. What's the matter with me? Shall I tell you? <laughs> But you wouldn't expect us to lose money, now, would oh, you? Oh, no. I'd hate myself if you lost money. <laughs> How much are the taxes? Only 50 cents a box. Now, are you taking five or ten boxes? Well, come to think of it, I don't know an awful lot of people here in Summerfield. They're hardly more than a box full. <laughs> well, now, our company doesn't think it's worthwhile to send me all the way out here on a cold afternoon for just one lousy... I mean, one box, mister. <laughs> I'm afraid that at least uh, they'll let me give away free to you is uh, four boxes. Uh, no, thanks. Maybe I'll take more the next time you come around. Mister, with these cigars, there won't be no next time around. Uh, well, for the most I could accept is two boxes. Well, uh, I can't force you to take more. All right, here's your two free boxes. Now, that'll be $4.96. Yes, uh, $1.98 for two boxes. Four ninety six. yes, you're right. <laughs> I was always good on arithmetic. This is very, You're very generous, really. Here's a $5 bill. Oh, thank you. Now... Wait just a second. You've uh, got some change coming. Oh, yeah. Four yeah. cents. Four cents. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Funny, it's uh, lots of silver here, but no pennies. Oh, that's all right. You can forget it. Oh, no, no, no. I'll get it for you somehow. Oh. Oh, here we are. Yes. What's this? Your change. Your one cent stamp and three sticks of chewing gum. Goodbye. Oh! on in the living room, Piggy. We got the whole house to ourselves. Say, is there any more candy around? Nope. We ate all the cookies, too. Too bad. Nothing sweet left, huh? Nothing unless you want to try these new cigars of my uncle's. They're soaked in maple syrup. You mean these? Yeah. Let's see them. Lomba Panadolas. Say, I, I wouldn't open that box if I were you. Oh, it was open already. See? Some have been taken out. I bet no one would miss this one. Hey, what do you think of the doing? Smoking us? Maybe. What if I am? Oh, I bet you wouldn't dare. Is that so? Bet you I would, too. Only it's so long. I bet you'd be scared to go havers with me. Who, who me? Smoke a cigar? Ah, I knew you'd go chicken. I won't either. I ain't afraid of doing anything you ain't afraid of doing, I ain't. All right, let you smoke it, then. All right, give it here. Here. Bet you don't even know which end to put in your mouth. I do, too. Only I forgot. <laughs> which end is it? Ah, the one you don't like. Oh. My pa always bites off one end first. Like this? Uh-huh. What does he do with the end he bites off? I don't know. Well, is it, I guess. Boy, he does? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Oh, boy, it tastes terrible. Want me to light it for you? Sure, I guess so. No fun smoking hundred cigar, is there? Nope. Hold still and puff. No, puff in, not out. Oh. That's better. How's it taste? Well, <coughs> it's pretty hard to describe. <clears throat> here, here, you try it a while and find out for yourself. Look, I can exhale every puff. Well, don't hog it all day. It's my turn again. Well, I try blowing smoke through my nose. <laughs> uh, okay, you can have it now. Gee, you got it all unwrapped. Uh, I'm sorry. Want me to tie a piece of string around the outside cover? <laughs> or a rubber band? No, I think it'll be all right. Now watch me. What's that supposed to be? I'm blowing smoke rings. You ain't either. Them's clouds. <laughs> Heck. 
Look, I can do better than that. Okay, here, you take it. Oh, no, I didn't mean for you to do that. You can keep it as long as you want to. Oh, that's all right. I'm not selfish. Well, all right. How's this? <laughs> you better puff on it a while, pig. <laughs> Smoke gets in my eyes. <laughs> well, okay. It sure is a strong cigar, ain't it? Yeah, as strong as I ever smoked. <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter, Leroy? Don't you feel well? Well, there's been times when I felt better. Here, ready for another drag? No, no not just yet. I, I think I better sit down for a while. You mean you're you're dizzy? Yeah. Well, sitting down won't help. I know I'm sitting and I'm dizzy too. <laughs> wrong with us? I haven't any idea. Do you think it's... Say, Pig, sit still, will you? I ain't moving. Except my head seems to be going around. Gee, that's funny. You've got two heads. <laughs> and they're both kind of green. <laughs> two heads, huh? Well, that accounts for it, then. Counts for what? I can see two whole rooms. You know, I don't think I feel so good. Do you, do you think it could possibly be the... A cigar? I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Here, Leroy, you can have it. No, 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 you go ahead and keep it, keep it. There's lots more where that one came from. Oh, my goodness. Now my stomach's starting to go around, too. Yeah, I know just how you feel. If it's all right with you, Leroy, I think I'll go now. You're not mad or anything? Oh, no. If you want any more of the cigar, it's right here on the fern stand. <gasps> See, see, don't hurry off. I better go or you might be sorry I stayed. <laughs> oh, gee whiz. No, I'm beginning to see what you mean. I better get some fresh air, too. Hey, Piggy, wait for me. <laughs> Wowsy than woozy. How about you, Leroy? Oh, I'm all right, except for my head, which is awful light, and my feet, which are awful heavy, and my stomach, which is awful. Awful what? That's all, just awful. <laughs> Gee, I don't think I've got a stomach anymore. Boy, are you lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Take it easy. Just close your eyes. No, no, no. Every time I close my eyes, tapioca keeps floating in front of me. <laughs> tapioca with me on life. Do you think we should get up and walk around a while? No, no, no. Let's stay here in the garage until it stops going around. Darn the guy who invented cigars anyhow. Who was he? I don't know. Some Indian named Corona, I think. <laughs> can't see how Uncle Mort can keep smoking them all day long without falling over. Imagine going around like this all the time. Gee, I just thought of something. Do you think we're going to stop growing now? Oh, gosh, I don't know. We should have thought of that before. But suppose we do. How am I going to play football in college? I just weigh 97 pounds. Uh, are, are you sure that one cigar will stop you from growing? Since I started smoking, I ain't been sure of anything. I'm awful glad I stopped. Me too. Why, I wouldn't ever smoke another cigar. Oh, it makes me sick even to mention cigars. Oh, gee whiz. What is it now? What's going to happen when your folks come back and find a living room full of smoke? Jesus. Uncle Mort will send me to Alcatraz. Uh, we, we better sneak back and open all the windows so the place can air out. Not me. I'm going home just as soon as my legs will cooperate with each other. Ah. Uh, Ah, oh, Piggy, you can't run out on me now. Not now, but just as soon as I can stand up, I will. But how can you? Help, I didn't want to smoke a cigar. Help, get it was you. Help, hey, hit us out like Bertie. Come on. Look, smoke's coming out of the living room. Gee, it's lucky we got out. There's a fire. Good, now nobody will notice the cigar smoke. Cigar smoke. That's it. 
Davy, where'd you throw that cigar we were smoking? In the front stand. Why? I bet that's what's out of the fire. Come on. Get the water. We're coming, Bernie. Oh, there's the garden hose. Piggy, run and turn the water on. Here I come, Bernie. Put out the fire. Put out the fire. I will if you get away from the window. I want to climb in. What'd you say? Get away from the... <laughs> Come down, I'm not on fire. Sorry. I, I warned you. Levi, what you doing? Climbing in the wind and the water of the furnace. <laughs> oh, say this is only making the smoke worse. Well, keep it up, Levi. You putting it out. Oh, oh, oh that smoke. I guess I was getting over the last snow kill. <laughs> that does it. Now the fire's out. Turn off the water, Piggy. Yeah. Turn off the water out there, boy. Oh, I don't feel so good. Leroy, you're the hero. Uh, Leroy! Turn on the water again, boy. Leroy's not faded. Well, Marjorie... Are you sure we've ordered all the candy we need for Christmas? Oh, yes, Uncle Mort. My, you've been buying like Santa Claus with a sweet tooth. Well, why not? No matter how many Thanksgivings we have, Christmas comes once a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's run along home now, Uncle. All right, my dear. Say, let's get something for Leroy to have this afternoon. I see just the thing he's going to enjoy. You do? What is it? Oh, something that every boy likes. Wait till you see Leroy's face when he opens these chocolate cigars. <laughs> Tell you, Bertie, he's opening his eyes. Yeah, but he don't look like he's seeing anything. Leroy, honey, is you all right? Oh, oh, me? Oh, yes, I'm all right. And you just lay down on the sofa whilst I try to clean up this mess in the living room. I can't figure out for the life of me how that fire starts. Hey, Piggy. Yeah? Gee, what are we going to say when Uncle Moore comes home and asks us how the fire started? Well, we could say it was a spark from the fireplace if there was a fire in the fireplace. Except there's no fireplace. <laughs> Gee, if they ever find out how that fire really started, I'll be cooked. Haven't you got a good idea? Yes, I'm going home. So long, Leroy. See you in school. Oh, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, hello there, Piggy. Oh, now I'm really going to be sick. Uh, 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 hey, what's that I smell? Did Bertie burn something? Yeah, the living room. What? Why, Mr. Gildersleeve? Uh, come back here a moment, young man. Uh, where is Bertie? She's mopping up the water on the carpet. Uh, what water? The water Leroy squirted on the fern box just before he did a nosedive onto the floor. Oh, my goodness. Uncle, what's happened around here? I don't know for sure, Marjorie, but the way I understand it, Leroy was watering the fern box in the living room. After flooding the floor, he tried to dive on it while Bertie was cooking the rug. <laughs> Be. Well, that's Piggy's story. Yeah, well, it, it was nice visiting you. Here, here, come along with us, young man. We're going to get to the bottom of all this. Oh, dear. Huh? Oh, look at Leroy on the sofa. Yeah. Are you all right, Leroy? Oh, hello, Marge. Hello, Uncle Mort. Well, by George, he does look all washed out. Oh. Young man, what do you mean by diving on your nose in the carpet? You leave that poor little boy alone. He's a hero. Just like Dewey at Vanilla. Vanilla. <laughs> What do you mean, Bertie? Why, there was a fire, and Leroy ran in here with the hose and saved us all from being a lot of clinkers. Well, you're a brave boy, Leroy. By the way, Bertie, how did the fire happen to start? Oh, oh my huh? head. Oh, oh, my stomach. Yeah. Oh. oh, my. What's wrong? Oh, I know. He's inhaled too much smoke. Yes, that's it, Uncle Morse. Well, we're going to get you well in no time at all. No time at all. That's good. Yes. Marjorie, what's the office number of Dr. Schultz? Oh, no, no, no. I, I don't need a doctor. Yes, uh, Rosebud 2212. Uh, thanks. Uh, hand me that phone, please, Bertie. Uh, thank you. Uh, now, don't try to get up, Leroy. Just relax like a piece of liver. No! Uh, hello, Dr. Silsby? Uh, this is Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. I want you to come right over. There was a little fire at our place. I know you're not a fireman. My nephew, Leroy, put it out, and now he isn't feeling so hot. Yeah, get over here as quickly as you can, Doctor. <laughs> I don't know what in the world's keeping that, Doctor. 
Oh, uh, while we're waiting for him, Leroy, here's a little surprise I brought to you from downtown. Here. It's some chocolate cigars. No. Yeah. Quick, somebody water. He's going to paint again. No, no, I'll, I'll be all right, Uncle. Oh. Chocolate and cigars. I couldn't take it. Oh, well, I'm sorry, my boy. Uh, but you won't refuse a nice big chocolate cigar, will you, Piggy? Uh, yes, Mr. Ulysses, I couldn't. Huh? That is, Leroy might feel bad if he saw me eating it. Oh, yes, well, that's very considerate. We'll save them for later, then. Uh, by the way, uh, how did this fire in the living room start, Piggy? You mean the fire from the cigar in the front stand? Oh, 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 oh. oh! What's wrong, my boy? It hurts. The scar I got from the front stand that was on fire. Oh, yes. Piggy, isn't it time for you to go home? Uh-huh. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, I gotta be going now. Yes. Well, it gets me. How a fern stand can suddenly, without any cause, burst into flame as one for Ripley. Maybe it was spontaneous compulsion. You... <laughs> oh, those, those ferns were getting terribly parched, you know, late in the year, no rain inside the house. Oh. Well, I suppose we'll never know. Yeah, let's let sleeping dogs sleep. Yes. Excuse me, Mr. Gillespie, but look what I found in the ruins of that there furnery that was on fire. Well, looks like remnants of a cigar. Why, this could have started the whole thing. Well, folks, now I really got to go. So long, Leroy. Good night, Mr. Gillespie. What's bothering that young man? Well, that's Piggy's way, Unc. Here today, gone tomorrow. (laughs) Well, son, you rest till the doctor gets here. I'm going to look into a few matters. Come on, Bertie. Let Leroy sleep. I can't understand it. How did a cigar get into the fern stand? Oh, talking of cigars, Bertie, did anything happen to those two new boxes of La Rumba's? They putting them in boxes now? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm talking about my cigars. Oh, yes, here they are. Let me see. Uh, six missing, and I only took out five. Uh, Bertie, have you been putting the snatch on my stogies? Yes, sir. Aha! Uh-huh. I snatches them off the furniture, and I put them in the ashtray. You... No, I mean, have you been smoking my cigars? Me? Oh, I should say not. I ain't one of them society ladies. Yeah. <laughs> well, somebody took one. Uh, Marjorie? Yes, Uncle Uh, I've been doing a little detective work about that fire. You know, I've always fancied myself as another thin man. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I have a pretty good idea how it started, too. How, Uncle? Well, I think I know who dropped the cigar into that fern stand. Now, don't look at me with that steely glint in your eye, Sherlock Holmes. I haven't smoked a cigar since last election. Oh, yeah. Oh, be serious, Marjorie. Uh, did you notice how evasive Leroy and Piggy Banks were when I questioned them just now? No, I didn't. Oh, of course not. You weren't even there. But they were as hard to pin down as a baby on a roller coaster. But Leroy, smoking a cigar. Didn't you notice their appearance? They were both as pale around the gills as a white face. Does smoking a cigar have that effect? I should say. I'll never forget my first corn silk corona. <laughs> I was weak for days and in the days for weeks. Uh, and besides all this circumstantial evidence, there's one real incriminating clue. What's that? Leroy's little finger. What's wrong with his little finger? He's wearing the cigar band from that missing cigar. Ah, uh, at last, Doctor. What delayed you? Did you stop on the way to cure a couple of hams? Fine thanks for rushing away from an office full of patients. Well, where's the sick boy? Show me to him. Oh, yes. Just a second, Doc. Uh, Since I phoned you, I found out a few things. I think Leroy is sick because he smoked one of my cigars. Well, I can understand that. I smoked one of them, too. (laughs) Yes, but I I can't get him to admit it, Doctor. He just keeps groaning and changing the subject. Now, I've got an idea how we can smoke out this whole cigar business. What's that? Uh, What kind of sickness would have the same preliminary symptoms as smoking a cigar, Doc? Oh, almost any of these juvenile illnesses. Measles, chicken pox, or mumps, say? Say, mumps will do. You examine Leroy, and you tell him he's got the mumps. That'll bring the truth out of him. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, you and your scheme. Remember what to do, Doc. Ah, Leroy. Uh, Here's uh, Dr. Silsby to take care of our sick little boy. Oh, suffering stuff. Yes. You didn't need to bother uh, Dr. Hunk. I'll be all right in a couple of hours. Well, now that I'm here, boy, I better give you a quick once over. You see your tongue? Mm-hmm. Now, uh, say ah. Ah. Yeah. I better take your pulse. Dum 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 dum. Now you can put your tongue back in now. Thanks. <laughs> now tell me, after you inhaled the smoke, did you suffer any attack of vertigo? No, I was just dizzy. Oh yeah. And uh, this was accompanied by acute nausea. It was nausea, all right, but there was nothing cute about it. <laughs> well, just as I thought. Let me 
feel your jaws. Oh. Hey, what are you talking about? Mr. Gildersleeve, has this boy ever had the mumps? Uh, mumps? I don't think so. Have you ever had the mumps before, Leroy? No. Say, you don't think I got them now, do you, Doc? Well, it's a little early to say for sure, but the indications point that way. Oh. Yes, isn't that too bad? Looks like you'll have to stay in bed instead of going to that big football game, Leroy. Hey, 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 wait a minute. Gee, Doc, maybe you're mistaken. Maybe if you knew what really happened, you wouldn't call it mumps. Uh, what do you mean, what really happened, Leroy? Oh, gee, I, I should have told you before. I'll go more at the reason I got sick and looked so pale and everything is... Well, it, gee, I hate to tell you, but... Oh, why did I do it? Why did you do what, Leroy? Why did I smoke one of your cigars? Ah, at last. Now we're getting the truth. Young man, I'm surprised at you. Oh, gee, I'm, I'm sorry I ever did, Uncle Moore. Sorry as I can be. Yes, I think you've learned your lesson, Leroy. I have, Uncle Mort. I really have. And I know maybe Dr. Silsby can see it's the cigar that makes me look this way and, and not much. Well, Leroy, that was just a little put-up job. A little scheme to get the truth out of you. <laughs> You, uh, you really haven't got the mumps, has he, Doctor? No, he hasn't, Gildersleeve. But according to his pulse and his temperature and these spots on his chest, he has got the measles. Greg Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, do you grown-ups remember the old-fashioned kitchen on baking day? Mmm, what fragrance with cakes and pies and cookies in the oven. Why, everything smelled so good, my mouth barely watered in anticipation of all the good things to eat. And nowadays, lots of up-to-the-minute housewives are learning the modern secret of that old-time home-baked flavor. Yes, more and more good cooks are insisting on a real flavor shortening for baking, instead of bland, tasteless fat. That's why so many good housewives are using parquet margarine for baking. For a flavor shortening is just what parquet is. You see, the delicate taste that makes parquet so delicious for table use gives extra flavor to baked foods, too. Yes, and that's the secret of foods pan-fried in parquet. They're tastier, too, and parquet doesn't batter or stick to the pan. And remember, parquet margarine is good for you. Yes, parquet is a wholesome, nourishing energy food that contains important vitamin A. But why not try delicious, economical parquet margarine and find out how good it is yourself? Just ask your dealer for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. That's part of the cure for measles, you know. Who's that? Shh. Leroy, it's me, Piggy. I just sneaked back to see if they found out. Yeah, they did. Gee, did you catch it? I'll say I did. Yeah. Looks like you're going to catch it too, Piggy. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. And reminding you that every one of us can help in the nation's defense program by joining the Red Cross during its annual roll call, November 11th to November 30th. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Presents the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Each week at this time from Hollywood, California, Kraft presents Harold Terry as the Great Gildersleeve. Written by Leonard L. Levinson. 
We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, even though winter doesn't officially begin till December 22nd, it's here right now for most of us. Yes, and on cold, blustery days, plenty of good, nourishing food is all important. I mean food that supplies energy, food that produces body warmth, food that keeps us going despite the weather. Now, parquet margarine, the delicious vegetable margarine made by Kraft, is just such a food. Parquet margarine is one of the best sources of food energy you can serve. And that means it's tops in producing body warmth, too. And equally important in wintertime, parquet is rich in vitamin A. Yes, every pound of parquet margarine contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. But parquet margarine isn't just good for you. It's mighty good tasting, too, whether you serve it at the table or use it for baking and pan frying. So for all these reasons, wholesome, economical parquet margarine deserves a place on your shopping list. Why not order a pound or two tomorrow? Just ask your food dealer for Parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. It's the margarine that's made by Kraft. And now let's visit our friend, the Great Gildersleeve. Those certainly were two swell movies. Yes, thanks for taking us. Did you enjoy them? Well, Marjorie, I'll have to confess I fell asleep in the middle of the first feature and woke up toward the end of the second one. You did? Yes, Leroy. Those 65-cent seats are too darn comfortable. But tell me, did Betty Davis finally marry Hopalong Cassidy? <laughs> Uncle, they weren't even in the same picture. Oh, they weren't? Well, then he must have been singing to a blonde horse. <laughs> now I'm all confused. Uh, who was it that defeated Notre Dame in the newsreel? Tarzan or Popeye? <laughs> it was Charlie's aunt. Yes. And he wasn't in the newsreel. He's in the picture coming next week. Oh. <laughs> That's the trouble with the movies. You can't sleep there in peace. What they need are more actresses like Betty Grable. Yes. Now, there's a girl with beautiful possi- potential. Uh, she'll get somewhere, that young lady. <laughs> well, it's almost midnight, so we'd all better get... Well, look at that. A bird cage. Yeah, where did that come from? It, there's a canary inside. Well, I don't understand if this wasn't here when we left. Maybe Bertie brought it in. Yes, let's find out. Oh, Bertie. Yes, Mr. Gilsleeve. It's Bertie. Whose canary is this? It's yours, Mr. Gilsleeve. It, it is? Yes, yeah, so you just won Napoleon in a rack. Napoleon? I did? When did it happen? While I was asleep at the movies? No, sir, at my lodge. This is the night the mysterious and bewildering order of the daughters of Cleopatra hold their weekly business meeting and shag contest. <laughs> but Uncle couldn't have been there. He was with us. Yes. Well, your uncle bought a ticket on our big raffle. Oh, yes. Now, I remember. But I thought you said the drawing was for a beautiful big set of dishes. No, sir. The lodge is raising money to buy itself a set of dishes, but the prize they're giving away is a canary bird. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this is mighty nice to win on a 50-cent chance. First time I've won a prize since I wore my woolen underwear to that rumba contest. <laughs> Uncle. Yes. I'd like to thank whoever it was that drew out the lucky number, Bertie. <laughs> well, it just so happens that the drawing was done by the grand exhausted ruler of the pyramid. Yeah. <laughs> and it also just so happens that that happens to be me. Yeah. <laughs> Why, Bertie. Of course, it was just a coincidence, but did anybody say anything? No, ma'am, but the show was a lot of black looks. <laughs> yes, I guess they were. Say, yes. this Napoleon's a pretty feisty little bird. Will he sing? Of course he will. Only the man we brought him from says that in two, three days, he's got to get customized to his new surroundings. Oh. And after that, he'll sing just like this yeah, Eddie Nelson. Uh, Eddie Nelson. Oh, I see, yes. Well, it's time for all of us to get to bed. You better find a cloth someplace, Bertie, and drape Napoleon for the night. Oh, we don't have to do that, Mr. Gillsleeve. This is a special newfangled kind of cage. Look. Yes, yes. Well, imagine that. A bird cage with Venetian blinds. Uh-huh. <laughs> when the daughters of Cleopatra do something, they don't mess around by half. Uh, that reminds me of something I kind of hate to bring up. Uh, what's that, Bertie? Well, speaking of halves, you never did pay me them four bits you owed me for that raffle ticket. Oh, yes. <laughs> Now, 
Now, see here, Napoleon. You've been a free boarder around here for a week now, and you haven't sung once. Not one single solitary... Stop eating a moment, Napoleon, and listen to me. <laughs> oh, now I've frightened you. What's the trouble, old man? Haven't I tried to be a pal to you? Haven't I? By George, look me in the eye when I'm talking to you. <laughs> You've got to do something around here to earn your keep. You think bird seed grows on trees? You better find your voice, little chum, or you'll find yourself directing, decorating somebody's hat. Hello, Mr. Gilsley. Yeah, hello. Has Napoleon worked yourself into a vocalizing mood yet? Yeah, not yet. You know, Bertie, I'm not one to look at gift bird in the bill. But I'm afraid the cat's got this canary's tongue. No, sir, the cat was after this morning, but I chased him away. Oh, well, I don't know much about birds. But if, I, if, if ever I saw a moody mudlark, it's this jaundiced little jaybird. You know, I can't understand it, Mr. Gillsleeve. This canary bird was not only guaranteed to sing, but the man said positively. If, well, maybe we better take Napoleon back to the store and get the Duke of Wellington. <laughs> well, there was no store. No? You know, we bought that dicky bird off of a man that was selling him off the back of a truck. Well, but if he guaranteed him, he, he must have some permanent address. Well, he said something about if everything wasn't completely satisfactory to write him in care of the Canary Islands. Yeah. <laughs> Only he didn't say which island. Oh, uh, well, I suspect he was selling hot canaries. Only this one is not so hot. Good evening, Uncle Moore. Oh, good evening. Oh, is Napoleon still sulking? Well, I can't tell from the expression on his face. The only expression he's got. But what do you think, Bertie? I don't know nothing about canary birds. The only birds I've ever associated with is chickens. Yep. And even then only to the extent of southern frying them, you know. Yeah. Well, we, we may turn Napoleon into chicken a la king yet. Hi, folks. <laughs> huh? Is that dumb bird still dumb? Yes, Leroy. We better get some advice from an expert. I think I'll go to a pet store or an aviary. Oh, you better try a pet store, Uncle Mort. Those aviaries are too busy these days with defense work. Oh, oh Leroy, an aviary isn't a place where they work on aviation. Well, I know. It's a place where birds of a lot of different feathers all flock together. <laughs> Say, Uncle, why don't you come down to the library with me? i got to take a book back, and you can find out a lot of things about canaries there. That's an excellent idea. The bird stores are probably all closed, and... This way I can get the information I want tonight. Okay, but I can tell you one thing about that bird right now. What's that? He's no stool pigeon. What do you mean, Leroy? He won't sing. You... Uh, here's the 88 cents for your fine, Leroy. The next time you want to use a dictionary, we'll buy one. Uh, turn it in while I find where the canary literature is, will you? Here's the information desk. I'll be right back. Yeah, okay. Uh, 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 excuse me, young lady. Shh, not so loud, please. Won't you step closer? Uh, closer? Oh. Uh, hmm, I must come to the library oftener. <laughs> what can I do for you? If my canary refuses to sing. What? My canary, my canary won't sing. And I wonder if you could help me. Uh, I'd be glad to, only I don't sing either. <laughs> <laughs> You don't, eh? I'll bet you... Uh, have you got any books for a canary in that condition? Well, the music department has some volumes with bird calls. Oh, I don't think that would do. You see, my canary can't read music. Well, uh, how about a book that you could read? Oh, that'd be splendid. Something that would tell me the cause and cureness of curtness or coyness in canaries. You'll find that under C over there in the reference room. Uh, You'll have to hurry now. We're closing in just a few minutes. Yeah, thanks. I will. Oh, dear... Uh, Leroy, come along with me. I'm coming. Well, you better make it snappy, Unc. It's almost 9 o'clock. Oh, it won't take me long. Is this the reference room? Yeah. So let's see. Somewhere along here. The canopies. The canaries. The canaries. Oh, canaries. Ah, here's what we're looking for. Almost missed it. <laughs> it native birds of the Bronx and how to get the most out of them. <laughs> uh, what to do till the bird doctor comes. You're getting warm, Unc. Yes, I know I am. Here, hold my overcoat, will you? <laughs> 44 famous formulas for feeding our fine feathered friends by F. McGee. Oh, <laughs> that sounds like it. I don't think you'll have time to read much, Unc. Here's what we're after. A list of different feeds to food. I mean, uh, foods to feed Napoleon. You want to read them off, Unc, while I take them down? Oh, a splendid idea, young man. Ready? Sure, go ahead. Shoot the junk to me, Unc. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Uh, watercress? Watercress. Uh, nasturtiums? Nasturtiums. Uh, dandelions? Dandelions. Uh, marigolds? Marigolds. Uh, what's happened to the lights? 
Gee, they put them out. It must be 9 o'clock. Come on, Leroy. Let's get out of here before they lock us in. Okay, but I'm sort of mixed up. Which way is out? Uh, I think it's right over here. Oh. It, not that way, Leroy. Here, take my hand. Oh! Ooh, an avalanche! Oh, my goodness. Oh! Oh! Leroy, where are you? Right here, under the book. Oh, are you hurt? Gee, my, my head feels funny. Say, your head does feel funny. I can feel it going around and around. That's not me, Uncle Mort. I'm over here. But what am I touching, then? Oh, it must be that globe of the world. <laughs> if... Let's see if we can grope our way out into the other room. All right, take my hand. Oh, 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 to think of it. Trapped in a public library at my age. Gee, Uncle Mort, everybody must be gone. How are we going to get out of here? Uh, we'll find some door we can open, Leroy. Or else I'll locate a window big enough to crawl out of. Yeah, a bay window. If... Never mind, young man. I'll stay close to me so we won't get... Oh! 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 Where are we now, Leroy? We're in the juvenile department now, Uncle. Uh, juvenile department? How do you know? The books falling down are getting lighter. Oh! <laughs> Good morning, Leroy. Uh, good morning. My, but you two look pale and tired. You shouldn't stay out so late night. What kept you up so long? Well, it was like this, You better eat your breakfast, Leroy. Oh, oh, yes. Say, did you see the morning paper? There's the most mysterious story. Listen. Prowlers turn library topsy-turvy. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, my coffee went down the wrong way. <laughs> oh, gee, Uncle, we're sunk. Be quiet, Leroy. Let your sister read the morning paper. What else does it say, Marjorie? Oh, um, finding the door of the Summerfield Public Library open at 2 a.m. this morning, Patrolman Elmo Dunkel entered and discovered a scene of unparalleled confusion. Well, I wonder what that could have been. Gee, don't you know? (laughs) Thousands of books have been pushed from shelves, and the floor was, in some places, four feet deep in volume. That's an awful lie. I mean, awfully high, isn't it? (laughs) It was estimated by city librarian Helen Hunt Schultz... Oh, yes, Miss Schultz, yes. ...that the sorting and restacking of the books will require at least a week, during which the library will be closed. Boy, it's a good thing we got out. Our books last night. (laughs) Shall I go on? Oh, yes, yes. yes. Very interesting. Very interesting, yes. Members of the detective squad who are investigating believe it to be the work of a gang known as the the Laurel and Hardy mob. Um, (laughs) Led by a large, fat man and his skinny little lieutenant. Why, isn't it warm in here? (laughs) The detective discovered a clue in the form of a slip of paper reading... Watercress. Watercress. Nasturtium. That's oh. <laughs> dandelions. Eat your dandelions, Leroy. Um, oh. I'm, I'm, I'm really not terribly hungry. Yeah. But incidentally, weren't you two at the library last night? Why, uh, yes. Come to think of it, we were, yes. Oh, I suppose you missed the fun. There was no fun while we were there. <laughs> we were looking for information about canaries. Did you find anything? Oh, we stumbled across a few books. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, say, maybe we should give Napoleon a bath, huh? Uh, canaries are like people. They like to sing in the bathtub. <laughs> Shall we put the cage under the shower? Is, no, Leroy. Uh, Bertie, uh, you fill a soup plate with some tepid water, eh? Yes, sir. And if it'll help, I'll put some of my personal bath salts in it. Uh, they got the loveliest fragrance huh? called the last time I saw Harlem. <laughs> <laughs> No, thanks, Bertie. We can't take any chances in Napoleon singing Boogie Woogie. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's what you're saying, Mr. Gillespie. Yeah, all right. Maybe all he needs is a good wash job. Yeah. Now, here he is. I hope that canary bird can swim better than he can sing. Yes, thanks, Bertie. And now, you folks just go on with your breakfast. I'll handle this thing all by myself. Yeah, the last time I saw Harlem. <laughs> oh, hey, good morning, Napoleon. Uh, have a good night's rest? Yeah. Now, I've got a nice bath all fixed up for you. That better make you sing, brother. Gee, Uncle 
what, what are we going to do now? Uh, give this bird a ducky. No, no, I mean about the police and the library and stuff. Oh, don't worry. Don't worry, Leroy. They're not looking for us. They're after a couple of fellows who look like Laurel and Hardy. Oh, my goodness. They are looking for us. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yes. Oh, let's not borrow trouble, Leroy. Let's forget the whole matter, huh? <laughs> Say, I'm afraid this plate is too big to get into your cage, nappy old chappy. Can I get a smaller dish? No, we'll leave it here, just outside the cage, and open the door. Yeah. There you are. Well, come on out, Napoleon. Nobody's going to bite you. Yeah, don't be bashful. Maybe you should prod him with your finger. Oh, that's an idea. Oh! He pecked me, the darn little dive bomber. <laughs> I was afraid that had happened. Yeah, now he's going out. Yeah, come on, Napoleon. Make a snappy. We haven't got all... No, 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 Napoleon. Stop flying around the room. Hey, there's your knife, Bat. Here. Look out. He's heading for a window. Window? Keep away, up more. Check the window. Yeah, go back, you ding-dong devil. Oh, my goodness. He's gone. Yeah, he sure flew the coop. Oh, come on, Leroy. Bring the cage. we got to catch Napoleon before he heads for Florida. <laughs> I see him. Look, there he is on the branch of that tree. No, no, that's a yellow leaf. Oh, yes, I forgot it's November. I could have sworn it was Napoleon. <laughs> Say, don't look now, but what's that moving in the bushes? Where? Over there. Hi, George, I think it's the bird, all right. Come on. Now, you head him off in the back, Leroy, and I'll sneak up on him from this side. Okay. Let me know if you catch him. Yes. Uh-oh. There he goes into that shrub. <laughs> now, where did he disappear to? He must be somewhere in here. Hey, Napoleon. Hey, nice Napoleon. Be a good boy and come back to Uncle Throckmorton, Napoleon. Hello there. Yeah, hello. Oh, oh, hello, officer. Excuse me, but what are you doing down there on your hands and knees, mister? Now, don't be stubborn, Napoleon. Uh, Oh, say, you're a new man on the beat, aren't you? Yeah, what are you looking for in them bushes? Yeah, here, Napoleon. Come out of there. Uh, What's that, officer? Oh, I'm I'm just looking for Napoleon. He's escaped. (laughs) Oh, I see. Aren't you a little late to look for Napoleon? Late? I hurried as fast as I could. He just flew out the window. Oh, he flew out the window, huh? Naturally. And did you fly out after him? Why, of course not. What do you think I've got, wings? I don't know. Have you? Uh, You can see that I haven't. Napoleon has, though. Oh, Napoleon has wings, has he? Yes. I was just trying to make him take his bath, but I guess he didn't want to, so he zoomed right out of the house. (laughs) Well, didn't he wait to put on his clothes? Uh, Why should he? Napoleon never wears clothes. Yes. Here's Napoleon. Here, Napoleon. He uh, doesn't, huh? No. I'm afraid he'll catch cold in nothing but his feathers. <laughs> this is getting better by the minute. Say, are you sure you aren't Napoleon? No. See here, officer. Don't you stand there making jokes. If you want to be useful, come down here and help me find Napoleon. Here, Nappy. Here, Nappy. Here, oh, Nappy. fine. Huh? Hey, look, how small is this Napoleon you're looking for? Oh, he can't be over four inches high. Four inches high? Uh, okay, then, three inches. I thought I just saw him. Uh, Look, uh, about how long have you been seeing this Napoleon? Oh, ever since I won him on a raffle. Uh, You won him on a raffle? Yeah. Well, I have a report to fill out. Uh, Napoleon! You see, all this happened because Napoleon refuses to sing. You think it's on account of him being in a strange house? I don't know. Do you live there? Yes. Then it's a strange house. Now, look, mister, let's walk over to the station where it's nice and warm and quiet instead of squatting in these bushes waiting for Napoleon to come marching out. Say, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with me? Now, look here, mister, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but Napoleon's been dead already for close to 120 years. Oh, (laughs) I didn't mean that, Napoleon. The Napoleon I'm looking for is a bird. Yeah, well, he must be a cuckoo. Now, look, are you coming along quietly or do I have to... Not a sound. There he is. You see him? Uh, here, Napoleon. Well, what do you know? It is a bird. Of course. Uh, Leroy, head him off. I am. Uh, Leroy, use your hat. Be careful you don't crush him. Nice birdie. Hop into your cage. There he goes in, Uncle Mort. I got him. Uh, you better take him in the house. Well, officer, uh, you satisfied? Yeah, but it's lucky that canary showed up when he did. Why? Well, I, I was ready to run you in as one of them screwballs that busted into the public library last night. <laughs> That'd have been pretty silly, wouldn't it? Uh, yes, it would. <laughs> <laughs> Just listen to that, children. Oui. They're beautiful, isn't it? He's sure on the groove, all right, all right. Oh, it's certainly worth a lot of trouble to get a bird to sing like that. You're right, Marjorie. 
Let's ask the clerk what kind of bird seeds he feeds this canary and then buy some just like it for our Napoleon. Oh, miss, will you please come here? Uh, what can I do for you? Pleased to meet you. If we have a canary and he refuses to sing, lady. Yeah, he won't give out with a jive. Libro, he's not supposed to be a jitter bird. Yeah. Uh, possibly the boy needs a change from diet. Uh, what have you been feeding him if I am not too inquisitive? Oh, well, you're not. Uh, we tried everything the books recommended. Uh, cuttlebone, watercress, bacon, vegetables, apples. Have you tried Boyd's seeds? It, Boyd's? Uh, of course. Uh, he's gotten so fat on seeds, he keeps falling off his perch. Well, for falling off the perch, we carry a special padded bottom. Yeah. What have you got for birds who won't sing? Well, we have a number of remedies. Uh, he is Marble's Bobble Goggle, guaranteed to make the saddest canary a Pollyanna. Uh, that sounds good already. And uh, you also might try our Melody Restorer and Whistle Food. Uh, <laughs> it's revived more songs than Bing Crosby. Uh, and this is a positive sure cure. A bottle from Philharmonic Symphonic Tonic for chronic lack of harmonics. Uh, Which one would you care to try? Well, lady, we're in this thing so deep, we might as well go the whole hall. Please, not in here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, we'll take all of them. Are you sure they'll work? Oh, any one of them would work. But if you put them all together, the boy will simply whistle you out of house and home. Oh, well, that's all we need to do then, eh? Oh, yes. Uh, but just to be on the safe side, you might try singing to him. Oh. But the idea is to get him to sing to us. That I understand. However, if you sing to him, it is only natural for him to show you how much better he can do. Oh, well, then we're all set. Three different kinds of medicine and also singing. <laughs> now we can't fail, can we? Oh, no, not a chance under the sun. Uh, but you might take along this card just to be on the safe side. A card? Uh, what's this? Oh, uh, Dr. D.J. Roller, bird physician. If everything else fails, let me put your birds in a Twitter. all sing like the birdies sing. Tweet, 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 tweet. Come on, Napoleon, sing like Bing. Tweet, 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 tweet. If we warble, then so can you. Eight bars to the beat. Now, Napoleon, do. Or you'll meet Waterloo. Tweet, 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 tweet. tweet. Well, come on, Napoleon, sing. Oh, I guess it's no use, Uncle. Yeah. Shall we try another song, Unc? Uh, what other song, Leroy? Uh, how about that old one, uh, Just a Bird in a Gildersleeve Cage? Yeah. Oh, oh brother. Yes. Say, Uncle, are you sure none of those remedies we bought at the pet store will work? How can they? Napoleon keeps kicking him out of the cage. Oh, all except the gargle, he sits in that. <laughs> what about that bird doctor? Why don't you try him? Say, I'd forgotten all about him. Dr. Ruler. Yes, I'll take Napoleon there. And if I won't bring him back singing, I won't bring him back, period. Uh, oh, oh, excuse me. Is Dr. Roller in? Yes, uh, we are waiting for him, too. Uh, we? Yes, me and Butch. Yeah, but... See? Oh. A Butch is a little Yorkshire cinnamon buff copy. Of what kind of you? Oh, uh, just a plain sawed-off yellow sulker. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think a doctor will be long? Well, I don't think so. He's doing a plastic surgery operation. Is that so? A plastic surgery, eh? Uh, yes, it's a nose-straightening job on a parrot. <laughs> Well, I don't think I'll say that'll take all week. I... Oh, no. Uh, you may have our place. We're in no hurry. Oh, well, I don't know. I'm just about ready to give up canaries altogether. Oh, uh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. No. Perhaps you don't realize all the joys and fun of owning a lovely little feathered companion. Do you have fun out of Butch? Udo. Yeah. <laughs> And I'll be very sorry to part with him tomorrow, too. Oh, uh, is something coming between you? Oh, yes. My mother-in-law. Yeah. She's coming back, you'll say. A butch is really hers, you'll say. Only she doesn't call him butch. She calls him a fluffy raffle. Uh, well, that's too bad. Uh, about her coming back. Oh, yes. And just when I heard him trying so nicely. Uh, trying? Yes. A butch, you'll say, is a fighting canary. Oh, yeah. 
Now don't say a word of this to my mother-in-law, but Bush has kicked the living daylights out of half the canaries on the north side of town. Oh, well, I never knew people matched canaries in battles. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, Especially a lonesome men that people leave canaries with when they go away someplace. Yeah. It's a lot better than just sitting at home and listening to the darn thing singing, you know. <laughs> I agree with you. Uh, but why are you bringing him in here? Uh, well, sir, uh, before my mother-in-law gets home, I'm having the doctor do a little work on him. You see, likely he's developed something of a cauliflower beak. It, oh, I, I think I understand. Uh, yeah. Patient, please. Uh, go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, here we are, doctor. Just bring the cage in here. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's a nice bird you have there. Huh? What seems to be the trouble? Well, Doctor, it's something like this. Oh, excuse me. There's a $5 consultation fee in advance. Oh, well, isn't that a lot for such a little bird? Mister, the smaller the patient, the more difficult to treat. Yes. Hummingbirds are $15 and ostriches are a dollar and a quarter. Oh. <laughs> I see your point. Uh, harder to hold. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here you are. Thanks. Uh, now, once again, what seems to be the trouble? Well, it's very simple. This bird, our Napoleon, doesn't sing. Well, that's a common affliction. Hmm, especially in this particular species of bird. Mm-hmm, yes, yes of course. Uh, turn the cage around. Yes, uh, yes. Thank you. Mm-hmm, uh, no question about it. That's it, all right. Mm-hmm, knew it the minute I saw it. Well, for goodness sakes, tell me, what is it? Uh, mister, as you should know and apparently don't, there are two separate and distinct kinds of canaries. Uh, there are? Yes, the one kind, happy, gay, carefree, singing practically all the time. Yes. Yeah. Then the other kind, sad, always worrying, busy and distracted. Hardly ever letting out a peep. Well, this is all news to me. What are the names of these two different kinds of canary? The kind that sings is called the male. The kind that doesn't sing is known as the female. Is that so? Yes. And this Napoleon you have here isn't a Napoleon at all. He's a Josephine. Oh! <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, let me ask you housewives a question. What is it that makes the difference between the meals prepared by a good cook and just an ordinary one? Well, in this man's opinion, it's flavor. Yes, it's that appetite-satisfying extra flavor that good cooks give to the dishes they serve. That's why so many good cooks are using delicious parquet margarine made by Kraft. They've discovered, you see, this important point. That because parquet is so delicious for table use... It adds flavor in cooking, too. The extra flavor that makes the difference between a good and an ordinary cook. Yes, parquet margarine is a genuine flavor shortening for baking, not a bland, tasteless fat. Parquet is a delicious seasoning for hot vegetables, too. And because parquet tastes so good itself, it makes pan-fried foods taste better. And it doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. Now, just because you'll be proud to serve parquet margarine at the table, don't think it's extravagant to use all you want in cooking. It isn't. Even though parquet is wholesome, nourishing, and perfectly delicious, it's so economical you'll be pleasantly surprised. So join the good cooks using parquet margarine and buy a pound or two tomorrow. Remember, it's parquet. (laughs) P-A-R-K-A-Y. Christmas list is getting me down. Cigars for Judge Hooker, a necktie for the mailman, and then for Birdie. Let's see. Oh, Uncle Moore. Uh, what is it, Marjorie? Have you thought of anything to give Birdie for Christmas? Oh, yes, you bet I have. Good. What is it? Josephine. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Thank you, Mr.
Gildersleeve. <laughs> Each week at this time from Hollywood, California, Kraft presents Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, what if you hadn't ridden in an automobile since the old Model T days? And then a friend gave you a ride in a fast, smooth-running modern automobile. Wouldn't that convince you there have been some things that made? Well, if you haven't tasted margarine for a good long time, you'll get that same kind of surprise when you try parquet margarine. The margarine that's made by Kraft. Yes, you just can't imagine how downright good tasting modern margarine can be till you've tried delicious parquet. That's why with food prices rising, so many housewives are using parquet margarine. Serving it at the table, using it for baking and pan frying too. Because this modern margarine, parquet margarine, not only has a delicate, satisfying flavor the whole family loves, it's also an economical source of food values the whole family needs. Yes, parquet margarine is a wholesome, highly nutritious energy food. And every pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. So don't make up your mind about any margarine till you found out how good, delicious, nourishing parquet is. Tomorrow, sure, ask your dealer for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildas. He and Marjorie and Leroy wait in the Summerfield Railroad Station for the arrival of that well-known authoress, lecturer, and second cousin, Octavia Gildersleeve. Yes? I'm sure you'll be able to recognize cousin Octavia. Oh, yes, my dear. Although I haven't seen her for years, her face comes back to me frequently in nightmares. See, what does she look like, Unc? Well, Leroy, did you ever see the USS Idaho in a bat storm? No. Then stick around until she gets off. <laughs> she's been very successful as a writer, hasn't she? Yes, yes. She's the author of Is Your Child a Problem or Why Bring That Up? <laughs> yes, she was first to advocate a policy of never striking a child except in self-defense. <laughs> <laughs> How long is Cousin Octavia going to be here, Uncle Moore? They're just between trains. She's on a lecture tour and has to hop around the country. It seems her new manager doesn't know much about geography. He booked her alphabetically. How's that? She's on her way from Akron to Albuquerque. And from there, she goes to Altoona, Pennsylvania, then Amarillo, Texas, and then Atlantic City. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, at that rate, you won't get to talk in summer fields for years. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? <laughs> oh, and there she is. Well, well, well. Hello, Octavia. I'm Throckmorton. Oh, Throckmorton. Well, let me look at you. Uh, now, turn around. Yes. Oh, yes, I'd have known you any place. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, this is Marjorie and Leroy, and this is your cousin Octavia. Oh, hello, Fabulous. Yes. How's everything on the Idaho, cousin Octavia? Idaho? Uh, you mean Jackson. You got his battleship mix. I mean, uh, how is cousin Sibley? Yes. Yeah. Still got his seat on the stock exchange? Oh, no, he lost it. Yeah. How's your little daughter, Lula Bell? Oh, he's Barbara Ann. Well, here she is, right here. Oh, I didn't know you were going to bring her along. Uh, children, meet your little cousin. Oh, uh, oh Barbara, Barbara, Barbara Ann. Ann. Here's cousin Throckmorton, uh, cousin Marjorie, and cousin Leroy. I am very pleased to meet you, cousin Throckmorton, cousin Marjorie, and cousin Leroy. Uh, oh, isn't she just a little doll? I do hope you can come home for lunch. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Marjorie, but our train for Albuquerque leaves in six or seven minutes. Oh, oh that's too bad. We would have enjoyed having you. Yeah. Well, I would have liked to, but when one's public makes as many demands upon one as mine does on me, well, one must flit about like a butterfly, mustn't one? Quiet, Leroy. I didn't say anything. Oh. <laughs> uh, however, I'll be returning this way again next week, and if you're really determined to... Well, Barbara Ann can stay here with you, and I'll pick her up next Thursday. Next Thursday? Yeah. Huh? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, that'll be splendid, my dear. Oh, now, isn't that nice? And won't you have a good time, Barbara Ann? I don't know. Will I, Mother? Of course you will. Yes. 
And I know just what room uh, we'll give you, too. So do I. My room. Yes. Yeah. Now, oh, oh, isn't that hospitable of the Roy? Oh, really, now that you've whipped us off our feet, I'm a little sorry I let you persuade me. But you must promise to take good care of Mother's little treasure. Now, Octavia, you needn't worry yourself into a new set of wrinkles. We'll take good care of her. <laughs> She's just welcome as long as she wants to stay here. Now, by the way, how soon will you be back to pick her up? Well, let's see. Oh, in a week or eight days at the most. Uh? Now, verify for Anne's bag with her music portfolio. Music. Now, be sure she practices her piano and vocalizing every day, won't she? Oh, my goodness. Oh, now, Barbara Ann, before Mother gets on the train, I want one little word alone with you, darling. You'll be cute you. Oh, yes, yes sure, go right ahead, sure. Now, darling. I want you to promise me you'll be a good girl while you're visiting Cousin Popcorn. You know me, Mama. Yes, I know you. That's why I'm warning you, young lady. Now, remember, no stuffing pillows and chimneys like you did at Uncle Sanders. Or painting the baby green, which you did at Aunt Sylvia's. I won't have it. Really, Mother, don't raise your voice. It's so middle class. Oh, sometimes I wonder if you're deserving of all I'm doing for you, Barbara Ann. Writing these books and making these lecture tours. You just don't seem to appreciate it. Oh, pipe down, Mother. I'll lay on the floor and scream. Oh, uh, no more time for fond farewell, my dear. That cousin Octavia's train is ready to pull out. Now, Barbara Ann, I want you to be a brave. We interrupt the program for a special bulletin. Tokyo, Monday, December 8th. Japan went to war against the United States and Great Britain today with air and sea attacks against Hawaii, followed by a formal declaration of hostilities. Japanese Imperial Headquarters announced at 6 a.m., that's 4 p.m. Sunday Eastern Standard Time, that a state of war existed among these nations in the Western Pacific as of dawn. Shortly afterwards, Domai announced that naval operations are progressing off Hawaii with at least one Japanese aircraft carrier in action against Pearl Harbor, the American naval base in the island. We return you now to the Great Gildersleeve. Well, if you were to ask me... Leroy, nobody asked you. Well, go ahead. Ask me, I dare you. Yes. Quiet, Leroy. It was well done, Barbara. Yes. Can I have my quarter now? A quarter? Yes, I always get a quarter when I play. Sometimes my father gives it to me even before I'm finished. <laughs> yes, I'm beginning to see why. <laughs> well, here you are, young lady. Now, you and Leroy run along somewhere and play. All right, Uncle Moore. All right, Uncle Moore. What do you mean, Uncle Moore? He's just a cousin. Uh, lovely, innocent youth. Uh, oh, say, Uncle Moore. Yes, Marjorie. You haven't been trying on my hat, have you? Don't be silly. I haven't had on a lady's hat since the last time I was court not. Oh, then it must have been Barbara Ann. And she's wrecked them. Oh, my dear, not her. Why, she's a regular little angel, a little this. Why, Leroy, what's wrong? Just, what is it, Leroy? Yeah. 
We shouldn't let things like this happen around here, Bertie. This... What are you looking for, Bertie? Oh, I've got to find some paper and a pencil, Mr. Gill, please. A paper and a pencil? What do you want them for? Well, I don't know exactly why myself. So Miss Barbara Andrews told me she wants me to draw her a bath. Yeah. Oh, 
Well, who's this same little Miss Gildy? Oh, this is little Barbara Ann Gildersleeve, Judge. Barbara, and this is Judge Cooker. Oh, is this Judge Cooker? Yes. Yeah. Why, somehow I expected you to have a little white chin whisker from what Cousin Brockmorton said. <laughs> yeah, well, what did I say that gave you that impression, child? Didn't he say he was an old goat? <laughs> <laughs> Watch this. That's just a little cold, Judge. Barbara, wouldn't you like to sing Pale Hands on the Piano for the Judge? You mean so he'll okay your report? Sure. Watch this. Yeah. Is that the reason you invited me to dinner, Gildersleeve? Oh, no, Judge, not at all. My children, I thought that was the case. I'd turn you down flatter than a stranded soprano. Yes. Barbara, I think we've heard enough. So do I. Uh, please leave the room, young lady. All right, Cousin Clark Norton. Glad to have met you, Judge Hooker. Uh, well, Gildersleeve, now that we're alone, take off your coat. Uh, now, Judge, don't be hasty. Take off your coat, Gildersleeve. Yes, I, I don't want to fight with you, Judge. Neither do I, but the little brat tend to kick me, sign on the back of your coat. What? <laughs> More war bulletins. London, Monday. The British Parliament was called into special session for 3 p.m. today to hear a government statement, which everyone agreed would be a declaration of war against Japan that was expected to coincide with similar action by the United States. Sitka, Alaska. A blackout was ordered for tonight at this site of a naval air station as police officials began a roundup of questionable characters. We return you now to Hollywood. That child is her imagination. She's never been farther south than the first balcony had gone with the wind. Oh, I think you're doing a poor little thing in injustice, too. What? Okay, okay. Any opinions I express are purely my own and not to be misconstrued by nobody else. <laughs> Bertie, I think we can leave you out of this conference. Yes, I'll go, but why? Well, I'm afraid you might turn into another Matahari. Me? <laughs> why, thank you, Mr. Kill, please. That's the nicest compliment I've had in years. Yeah. Uh, now, look, children. Cousin Octavia isn't due for five days yet. This is a desperate situation, and it needs desperate measures. I hate to do this. It doesn't set you a very good example. What are you going to do, Uncle Moore? I haven't the faintest idea. But whatever it's going to be, it won't be honest. Can't we uh, just take her out into the country someplace and lose her? Yes. Leroy, isn't that kind of a cat? Yes, my dear. That child has gotten me in wrong with every one of my boyfriends. Oh. That's tough, yes. Especially just before Christmas. <laughs> yes. Hey, I know what we'll do. We'll send Cousin Octavia a telegram. What kind of a telegram? Well, listen to this. Uh, you better take this down. Oh, okay. Uh, Mrs. Octavia Gildersleeve, Fred Harvey Hotel, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, dear darling mama, I'm terribly, terribly homesick for you. I don't think I can stand it another minute long. I get lonesomer for you every day. Please come soon, your loving daughter, Barbara Ann. Will you hear that, Mr. Llewellyn? I don't wait. Oh, <laughs> really? It, it doesn't sound anything like her. Well, she's probably sick, suffering from lonesomeness. <laughs> well, there's another relic of Barbara Ann at disposal. I'm really coming to the end of my gilded sleeve. Tough work. Well, now, let's see. I'll do my lecture tonight. By tomorrow, pick up my baby, go on to Altoona. Oh, Mrs. Gildersleeve, we just had a wire saying the Altoona date is out, and they pushed up your Amawuo lecture. Oh, oh, of course. But that means I can't go to Summerfield for weeks. That's correct. Oh, and I can't leave my little girl with those unkind Summerfield relatives. And why not play? Well, I'm almost tempted. Oh, no, no, no. Mr. Llewellyn, I've got an idea. Oh, no. When you get an idea in your head and a look in your eye, you better also get a new secretary on your payroll. But who else have I got to turn to? Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Gildersleeve. I'd swim the widest river. I'd climb the highest mountain. But Wolfus for Llewellyn refuses to play nursemaid again to that widow flat of yours, not for all the kangaroos in Australia. But, Mr. Llewellyn, as my secretary, it's your job to go where I send you. Oh, but Mrs. Gildersleeve, I'm allergic to your little girl. Don't you remember the time in Buffalo when she flew all my trousers out of the train window? Oh, why, that was just one of her girly pranks. Wank, whip, raspberries. There's been a hundred similar peccaduos. It's enough to make a grown man cry. No, I won't do it. I won't go. Absolutely no. <laughs> Another war 
Baltimore Bulletin, New York. Reports received by the Associated Press from Europe tonight said the German army was preparing an effort to take both Moscow and Leningrad and recapture Rostov within two weeks in a move linked with the outbreak of war in the Pacific. We return you now to Hollywood. That isn't what you said in your telegram. What telegram? The one you sent begging your mother to rescue you from Flockmorton P. Gildersleeve. I never sent any such message. Now, you can go right back and tell her so. This is just another twit. Now, I got a taxi waiting outside, so you hurry and pack your luggage. I'll do nothing of the kind. I like it here and I'm staying. I'll just give you till I count to three to start getting ready. One, two, three. Well, all the bags 
dear. Yes, Uncle Boss. I guess we're all ready to go to the airport. I don't want to go. I want to stay here. I'm not going. Oh, you're not going, eh? Yes, you are, young dear. We've got plenty of time. It's a full hour before that plane arrives. We're going to be on the safe side and get there early. No, I want to stay here. I'll be good. Yes, well, I guess I'll have to pick you up then. Oh, excuse me a moment, Miss Barbara Ann. Uh, hello? Mr. Osborne. Yes? This is Octavia. Oh, hello, Octavia. Where about are you phoning from? From the airport. Why aren't you down here? It's the airport. What are you talking about? Your plane isn't due until less 4.35. It's after 4.35 now. It's almost 4.40. Yes. What's the matter? Didn't you get my telegram? Why haven't you got Barbara Ann down here to go on the plane? Oh, my goodness. Our clock's an hour slow. Uh, wait there, Octavia. We'll be right now. I can't. The plane is ready to take off. It's... I've got a lecture in Atlantic City tonight. Oh, oh, my goodness, they're calling for me. Uh, when do you come back? In another two weeks. Goodbye. Yes, sure. Oh, I've got a headache. What happened, little Mark? Our clock was an hour slow. Somebody's been fooling around with our clock. And I think I know who it was. No. No, not me, Uncle Mort. I didn't do it. Oh, this time you're going to get what's coming to you, young lady. You come here. No, you wouldn't dare. Oh, no? <laughs> I want you to know that this is going to hurt you a lot more than it hurt me. Hail and by love. Here's more late news. Dublin. Prime Minister de Valera warns the people of Ireland to be prepared for war. But he says Ireland is continuing its policy of strict neutrality in the spreading hostilities. In his warning, de Valera said war might come to Ireland, quote, as a thief in the night. Moscow. The Red Russian Army is striving to drive the Germans into a full Napoleonic retreat on all three Russian fronts. And tonight they're still sweeping the Germans before them in the north, the center, and the south. Canberra, Australia. The Australians have started blackouts, and in Sydney, the people are sandbagging buildings. Munitions workers are keeping war industries going 24 hours a day. They've also offered to abandon their holidays, and Australian youths are flocking to the recruiting stations in increasing numbers. London. The British Communist Party urges the closest coordination of the Allied forces. An official statement describes the Japanese attack as fascism's offensive for the enslavement of the world. This report came to you from the NBC Newsroom. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Each week at this time from Hollywood, California, Kraft presents Harold Terry of The Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, maybe some of us accept progress without giving it much thought. Why, nowadays, most people take the wonders of radio and the airplane for granted. Yet, when you stop and think, these modern developments are really astounding. And, of course, there's been a lot of progress in foods, too. Take margarine, for example. Modern margarine, like parquet. The margarine made by Kraft. 
Why, people who haven't tasted margarine for a long time are amazed when they discover how deliciously good parquet tastes. That's because parquet margarine isn't just an ordinary margarine. It's as different from old-time margarine as the modern automobile is from the horseless carriage. You see, parquet margarine is outstanding because of the rich delicacy of its flavor. Also because it's an economical source of food values your whole family needs. Yes, unlike old-time margarine, parquet margarine contains important vitamin A, 9,000 units in every pound. Besides that, parquet margarine is about as nourishing and wholesome an energy food as you could serve. So don't put it off. Try this delicious modern margarine tomorrow. Remember, it's parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. <laughs> And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve. Uh, laundry for month of November, $24.32. I never saw such a clean family in my life. <laughs> Groceries for the month, $103. For such a hungry family either. Yeah. Gas, water, and... Uh, oh, hello, Leroy. Light for the month amounted to... What is it, Leroy. Well, gee, Uncle Mort, I just hate to mention this to you. Well, Leroy, if you hate it so much, don't do it, especially if it's about money. How did you know, Unc? You combed your hair, put on a tie, and tucked in your shirt. Anytime I see so much change in you, it means a little more change out of me. <laughs> well, but, Uncle, it was Christmas practically here. I'm a little shy. It, shy? You don't seem very shy to me. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm embarrassed. Financially embarrassed. Yes. Yeah. What about all of those Christmas presents you were making in your manual training and handcraft classes in school? Well, all my plans went haywire. Yeah? Gee, I made a keen smoking stand for you, Uncle Moore. Well. Only I could never get the legs even. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I must have soared them 30 times. Well. Say, I did just as soon have a footstool, wouldn't you? Yes. <laughs> Yes, of course, of course. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, I fixed all your favorite things to eat for lunch. Is that anything special you might be wishing for in addition? Yes, Bertie. Quit stuffing me just so you can hit me for another advance on your salary. <laughs> well, Mr. Gildersleeve, you positively can read my mind even before I mix it up. Yeah. <laughs> Bertie, I can't let you have any more advances. Your salary is so overdrawn right now that it needs a blood transfusion. <laughs> But I don't need my January salary. I just want to nibble into February. Yeah. <laughs> Bertie, you've eaten halfway through March already. Mm, that's bad. But I made some powerful miscalculations in my Christmas figures. I added up two zeros, and all the time there should have been an eight. <laughs> well, I'm having enough trouble with my own bookkeeping. By George, I wish I had the bookkeeper here that I had at my girdle works. He was a wizard with figures. <laughs> Oh, hello, Marjorie. Oh, say, Uncle Mort, speaking of figures, my checking account is all in a mess. I'm going to need $50 more for my Christmas shopping. No, see here, all of you. There won't be any more money available in this household till the first of the month. Well, why? Well, what happened? Well, uh, last Monday, I rushed down to the bank and put all our money into defense bonds and stamps. Oh, oh I'm glad right. I did. Yes, I'm afraid I overdid a little bit, though. I gave them all our ready cash. Well, Uncle Mort, what have you been using for spending money since? Well, Marjorie, do you remember my collection of rare buffalo nickels? Yes. Well, they've gone the way of the buffalo. <laughs> but I don't mind, though. I want to do everything I can to help. Oh, oh me too. Yeah. I'm all riled up myself. I want to join the Japanese army. You yes. what? <laughs> Why, Bertie, what do you mean? Well, I'd like to cook for them people for just one day. That's all. <laughs> Yes, Bertie, I see what you mean. Anyway, we won't mind skipping a few things this Christmas, will we, children? After all, half of what we buy each other always winds up in the storeroom anyway. Hey, I've got an idea. Yes, Uncle Mort? Let's see what we can sell out of that storeroom, huh? Of course, I never thought of that. Come on, let's look now. Yes, come on, everybody, come on. <laughs> Must be a million things in here. Yes. What did I tell you? Look. Oh, look. Maybe I can sell that old dress form. But you don't promise that to me, Miss Marsh. Oh, isn't that dress form a little, uh, a little, uh, little for you, Bertie? Uh, no, sir. I just measures everything on that, and then I multiply by three, and that's me. 
Yes, I see. <laughs> well, Leroy, you've certainly outgrown that old scooter of yours there. Yeah, but I need the wheels to make a wagon. You know how things are these days. A man can't go around wasting rubber. Yeah. Hey, how about selling buck? It's buck? Yes, that's what we call the iron deer in the corner. Oh, that? We used to stand out on the lawn. Yeah, until one Christmas Eve when Grandpa thought he was Santa Claus and tried to ride it home all night long. <laughs> There's a powerful lot of iron in that animal. It ought to be worth some money. Ain't scrap iron valuable when a country's scrapping? <laughs> yes, sir. I think we can get a little dough out of that deer. I'll tell you what we'll do. If any of you can sell it, you can keep the proceeds. Me too, Mr. Gilkey? Yes, of course, Bertie. However, I'll deduct the money out of your April wages. <laughs> hey, I'd better get busy. Maybe this will be the beginning of my entire business career. Yes. Yeah. Buys anything from a safety pin to a secondhand skyscraper? That's me. Mr. Skinner, I got a big business deal for you. What are you paying for scrap iron these days? 80 cents a hundred. How much you got? Oh, plenty. You better come out and see me. 747 Parkside Avenue. Okay, who's just talking? Uh, just ask for Mr. Leroy Forrester. And remember, don't buy it from anybody else. Hot dog. Now I'll get the money to buy Marjorie that slow chemistry set I like so much for Christmas. <laughs> Yes, this is the Cemetery Line Works, Phelps speaking. Uh, this is Marjorie Forrester. Well, how can I be of service, Miss Forrester? Uh, it is uh, Miss Forrester, isn't it? Yes. I want to know if your company is interested in purchasing a quantity of used iron. Why, well, yes, we are. In what form is this iron? Oh, really? It's a little dear. Oh, oh we won't quibble about prices, Miss Forrester. <laughs> An electric iron, darling? <laughs> no, no, no. An iron deer. Deer. Um, a farm husband. <laughs> Better let the buyer come out and see for himself. A buyer? Why, I'd like to see what the little deer looks like myself. <laughs> and I'd like to come face to face with that lovely voice of yours. of the Sister Lodge, the mysterious and bewildering order of the daughters of Cleopatra. <laughs> uh, greetings from the grand, exhausted ruler of the pyramids. <laughs> yeah, brother, that's me. <laughs> uh, Pope Day, you know whereabouts I work on Parkside Avenue? Well, hitch your horse to the wagon and trot right up here. I'll sell you a piece of junk that's really a piece of high-class junk. <laughs> uh, what is it? Well, I don't know for sure, but it's something in the shape of a mule, only it's got his head stuck in a hat rack. <laughs> Leroy, can't you sit still a moment? You've been running to the door like a strip of hall carpet. Well, it's on a car. I'm waiting for Mr. Skinner. Skinner? What does he do? He buys anything from a safety pin to a secondhand skyscraper. I'm going to sell him buck. Well, how much is he going to pay you? Eighty cents, a hundred pounds, and that deer must weigh a couple of thousand pounds at least. Oh, no, Leroy, you'll be lucky if it weighs two hundred pounds. Oh, but it looks heavier than you, Uncle Morton. You must weigh over... Never mind what I weigh over, Leroy. <laughs> Don't forget that deer is hollow, and I'm not. No. <laughs> no, you're not, but he's got horns, and you haven't. But I wear shoes, and he doesn't. Yes, you're right, then all I'll get will be between a dollar and a half and two dollars. Uh, Leroy, we really ought to try to get a better price. Have you called any other junk dealer to bid against your Mr. Skinner? No, I haven't. Well, if you had, uh, uh, wait a minute. I know how we can get a decent sum for our cast iron cast off. How, Unc? Uh, competition is the spice of the pudding, my boy. And if Mr. Skinner had a little competition... I know. You're going to pretend you're another junk man, aren't you, Uncle Mort? Oh, you went and guessed it. <laughs> but Mr. Skinner won't. Gee, it's a regular super-duper of a scheme. Do you think so? Well, let's try it then. 
You just introduce me by some other name, some uh, pseudonym, and I'll keep boosting the price up for you. It looks fishy unless you put on a hat and coat. You better get old one. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, John, I bet that's him now. Uh, Skinner? Uh, well, I find an old overcoat and hat. Tell me quickly, Roy. Right there on the stove. Oh, yes. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I better get him something for Leroy. He comes back with that real junk man. Ah, here's something I've always wanted to wear. Now, let me get this all clear, kid. Are you sure that you're Mr. Leroy Forrester? Of course, Mr. Skinner. Well, then who's this fat chen here with the doiby hat and the old army overcoat? Oh, boy! <laughs> What's so funny, young man? Uh, nothing, nothing at all. Uh, uh, Mr. Skinner, this is another junk dealer, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Student. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, pleased to meet you, sir. Hey, what kind of a junk man are you, given I would have pleased to meet you, sir? Uh, and say, I never heard of no local dealer with a name like Studenheim. Uh, are you a member of the JMCA? Uh, no, however, I am a member of the YMCA. I mean the Junk and Metal Collectors Association. Oh. Are you sure you're a legitimate junk man? You sure don't talk like one. Oh, well, uh, that's because I come from Boston. Yeah. We talk this way up that way. <laughs> okay? Okay. Yeah. Only one thing. Kind of watch your step around this town. Get it? Yeah, got it. <laughs> Say, how much will you give me for this swell iron deer, huh? Well, where's the rest of the scrap you want to sell? That's all there is, isn't it enough? For Pete's sake. You mean you drag me all the way here for one rusty mildew chunk of metal venison? You mean you don't want it, eh? Well, we'd like to have this little number up in uh, Boston. Uh, yeah. Uh, buddy, I'll give you uh, two dollars for it. Hey, if you give that much your way off your bean, Mr. Pseudohammer, what? it ain't worth it at all. I'll give you two and a quarter. Why, you, <laughs> you little overbearing overbitter? You can't do that to Throckmorton P. Uh, uh, pseudonym. <laughs> I'll wipe that nasty little grin off your face and just about I bid $3. Well, I'll show you the two can play at that game. I bid $3.05. Uh, five cents. <laughs> just keep skate, I'll make it $4. Oh, you do? Well, you can have it, bumper belt. I'm through. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Don't go. Hey, no, don't go. <laughs> Aren't you going to make another bid? I should say not. I wouldn't give a cent more than three seventy-five. I'll give three eighty. You don't, Uncle. Yes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, Uncle, eh? Huh? <laughs> Aha! I see it all now. You ain't no junk man. Yeah? I can tell from that derby hat you're wearing. You're nothing but a pawnbroker. What? <laughs> Yes, yes, that's it. Uh, a pawn uh, broker. <laughs> Uncle Mort, they call me. <laughs> hey, kid, you better take my offer. This guy don't look reliable to me. Well, okay, Mr. Skinner. Okay, it's a deal. I'll be back this afternoon for this hunk of junk. And by the way, Sooty. Uh, yeah? I'll give you a buck for that hat and coat you're wearing. You will? Yeah, what do you say? So. <laughs> <laughs> Leroy, you go ahead and shop as far as your 375 will take you. I'm going into this bank. Okay, Uncle Mort. Yeah, and remember, Leroy, go straight home as soon as you're finished. Uh, say, who is this fellow coming this way? I don't know, Uncle. His face is mighty... Fr oh, yes, of course. Uh, hello, Mr. Llewellyn. Oh, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> I'd like to have you meet my nephew, Leroy Forrester. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Forrester. Or may I address you as we Roy? <laughs> Mr. Llewellyn uh, was formerly your cousin Octavia's secretary, Leroy. I'm glad to have made your acquaintance. i got to go now. So long, Mr. Moore. Uh, goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Hey, say, Llewellyn, how does it happen that you're still in Summerfield? Well, I was in such a rush to resign from your cousin's employ, I neglected to collect my last week's salary. Oh, I see. Did that leave you in an awkward financial position? It left me stranded high and dry. Yes. Yeah. Willie, really, I'm rather discouraged and depressed. Now, now, Llewellyn, old chap, remember every cloud has a silver lining. Okay, every cloud has a silver lining, so what? <laughs> Can I take a silver lining to my landlady and say, here, Mrs. Rafferty, this is to pay the rent. <laughs> or can I slice it like bologna and have it for lunch? Or can I use the silver lining in my shoes instead of weather? <laughs> no, 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 of course not. I didn't well, realize your predicament. Well, it happens that I need some clerical assistance. Would oh, you like a job? Oh, more emphatically. Oh, it, it, do you know anything about bookkeeping? Oh, yeah, double entry, plopping and loss, wedges. Let me recite my experiences. Uh, I isn't necessary. I'll give you a trial. You will? Yes. I really need a bookkeeper badly. And I imagine that's just how you keep books. <laughs> Oh, you don't know how glad I really am. This means I won't have to take the job that was offered to me. Oh, you had a position you could have taken. Oh, yes. I could have gone to work reading news flashes on the radio. 
They said I'd be a woo-woo. Yeah. Buddy! Oh, Buddy! Yeah, is you, Leroy? What's all the fuss for? Somebody swiped Buck the Iron Deer. The man I sold it to was here just now, and we couldn't find it anyplace. Of course not. The man I sold it to just hauled it away. You sold it to? Jeepers, now we're in a mess. Mr. Skinner is coming back in three hours. Well, just give him a refund on his money. I can't. I spent it. Besides, he told me to have the deer here or he'd go to the police station. What for? They ain't got no deer there. Only bulls. <laughs> well, well, Skinner's going to have me arrested for selling what I haven't got if I can't deliver what he thought he was saying for when he bought what you just sold. Well, say that over again and take out the lump. <laughs> He's going to get me arrested for selling him a disappearing iron deer. Oh, hold on, Uncle Mort. Hold on, Mr. Llewellyn. Hello? Here, Uncle Mort, we're in a jam. A jam? What's wrong? You remember Mr. Skinner who bought the deer for three seventy-five? Yes. Well, he didn't. How could he didn't? <laughs> well, when he came to pick it up, Bertie had already sold it to somebody else. And now Skinner says he's going to have me arrested if he doesn't get the deer back. Oh, my. And I had a lot of matters to straighten out with Mr. Llewellyn here this afternoon. Well, what's to him later? Huh? <laughs> What's wrong with your ears, Bertie? Mr. Llewellyn said, let's do them later. Uh-huh. <laughs> There's only one thing to do, and that's to get the deer back. Uh, who'd you sell it to, Bertie? Joe Cephas Bush. Oh, yes, Joe Bush. I've heard that name before. Uh, where is his place of business? In the alley. Uh, <laughs> no, where does he transact his affairs from? Oh, from a horse and wagon. Of course. Oh, no, no, Bertie. What Mr. Gildersweave is driving at is, where does he win? Where does he sweep? Where does he get his telephone calls? At the corner of 33rd and the railroad track. What's he say? Well, let's go to the railroad twice. Yes, we've got to get that deer back before that Skinner returns. Oh, that reminds me, Mr. Gildersweave. Isn't it a little bit late in the season to be hunting deer? Yeah. with those antlers, Llewellyn. Yes, sir. All right, Mr. Mailman, you lower the other end. Yeah. Uh, you boys in the middle, steady now. Yes, yeah, steady. Yes, yeah, there it is. Thank you very much, boys. Oh, I'm, I'm pretty tuckered out. Yes. Yeah. Trouble is you don't keep yourself in condition, Llewellyn. Well, shall we move Bucket back into the storeroom or let him stay here in the hallway for Mr. Skinner to pick up? Personally, I was hired as a bookkeeper, not as a longshoreman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, let's leave it right here for Skinner. Uh, and remind me to tell Bertie that her friend, uh, Joe Bush, charges $7 out of her April wages to get this metal moose back here. Yes, sir. You know something, Mr. Gildersweave? Every time I look at this statue, it reminds me of something. Uh, anybody you know? No. I just can't recollect just what it reminds me of. Oh, uh, well, come with me, Llewellyn, and I'll show you where to wash up. Oh, gladly. Yeah, moving a thing like that's no Halloween prank. All right. Thank you for a very lovely lunch, Mr. Phelps. Oh, don't thank me, Miss Marjorie. Thanks for some of the iron work. After all, they're the ones who are going to pay for it. They will? Sure. It's a necessary expense. You know, like uh, entertaining an out-of-town buyer. Only in this case, it's, a, it's an in-town seller. Boy, what a line. You could <laughs> use it as a leash for an elephant. <laughs> oh, look, somebody's moved the deer out of the storeroom for us. Well, I wonder how they knew you were buying it. Well, I'll have my men loaded onto the truck. Oh, Pete. You and Charlie can come in here now. It was terribly nice of you to give me $20 for Buck, Mr. Phelps. Are you sure it's worth that much? Oh, yes, yes, of course. They're not putting iron like that into deers these days, you know. No. Not unless they feed them spinach. <laughs> so what are you going to do with it? Use it as a radiator cap for a tank? <laughs> no, no, we'll break it up with hammers and convert it back into pig iron. Oh, that was a bright idea, telephoning us. Yes, wasn't it? And won't everybody be surprised when they find out that I sold it? <laughs> well, here comes Mr. Skinner back again, Uncle Moore. I'll get it. Yes, all right. Well, thank goodness. Now, Leroy, you can let him cart that deer away, and we'll have the whole matter off our chest, Llewellyn. A good wedding, too, I say. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly wasn't worth all the trouble it took. Now, Leroy got three seventy-five, and it cost me seven dollars to get it back after Bertie sold it. Hey, Uncle Mort, Mr. Skinner, all right. Yeah. Where'd you put the deer? It isn't in the storeroom. Of course not. We left it in the hall. Can't you use your eyes? Well, it isn't there now. But, well, it couldn't walk away. <laughs> Did you move it, Llewellyn? Me? After the struggle and trouble I had getting it through the front door? 
<laughs> oh, sir, my mother never waste any foolish children. Yeah. We'll do it. <laughs> oh, I can't find it, Uncle Morgan. I heard a number of horses around. Who's the head of this wacky household? <laughs> I am, sir. What's the meaning of this intrusion? Oh, it's you. Who oh, forgot? Say, how many different people are you? <laughs> First a junk man, then a pawnbroker, and now the papa around here. He's our Uncle Mort. That's right. Oh, he's your uncle, too. Oh, no. <laughs> Not exactly. It's the, I uh, think he's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and probably two other fellas. Hello, yes. <laughs> Uncle Mort. Say, what's going on in here? Uh, this man, Skinner, bought our iron deer from Leroy, and now it's disappeared for the second time. <gasps> oh, my goodness. I just sold it to the Summerfield Ironworks for $20. Well, 20 bucks. I no wonder you didn't want to turn it over to me for three seventy-five. Oh. Better give him back his money, we boy. I can't. I spent it already. Well, well, then you better give it to him out of the twenty, Marjorie. I spent all mine too. Oh, jumping jeeps! Well, I'll have to give you the three seventy-five, Mister. Oh no, you don't. What about all the time I wasted huh? and the cab fare and the two trips with the truck and the profit I'd have made selling it to the ironworks? You got to give me at least ten bucks for all my trouble. Yep. Ten bucks for one buck? Why, you can go down to the river and take a trip. <laughs> You can take a good jump in the lake for yourself. Yeah, well, I'll sue. Excuse me, Mr. Gildersleeve. Can uh, I speak to you privately? Uh, is it important? Privately. Come on over here. Uh, uh, what is it, Llewellyn? You remember that there was something about that deer that reminded me of something, only I couldn't recall what? Yes, yes, yes. What is it? Well, I just recollected. Iron deers like that are scarce. They're wear antiques. They are? They are? Yeah, I went somewhere that they're a vanishing form of Americana. They're worth anywhere from $150 up to collectors and at museums. Shh, not so loud. That mule skinner will hear you. Do you think we could, should pay him the $10 and get rid of him? Absolutely. Then we should wash right down to the ironworks and rescue the deer before they break it up. Oh, that's right. Break it up. Oh, we'll have to pay them back, too. Yep. $20 there, $10 to Skinner, $7 to Joe Bush. That's $37 it's going to cost me to get the deer back. Llewellyn. You better be right about the value of that iron casting or... Or what, Mr. Gildersleeve? Or else I'll clown you. Uh, Llewellyn, are you holding that statue carefully in the rumble seat? I'm tweeting it as if it were very fragile. Well, all we have to do is drive across town now and see what the antique dealers will offer. Oh, wasn't it marvelous that we caught Harry? Yes. I mean, Mr. Phelps. Oh. Well, he ordered them to break up, Buck? Yes. Well, I was going to tell you about that, Marjorie. I found out that young Phelps was going to save that thing as a souvenir. He was? Yes. But it wasn't his to keep. It belonged to the company. Oh, yes? Fat chance any company would pay $20 for $2 worth of scrap metal. That young man bought it for himself. He did? Well, I wonder why. Yes. If you don't know why, nobody else does. <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve, this is Mr. Abernathy, who's an expert on old hitching post sundials and iron deer. Yeah, how do you do, sir? Oh, I, I'm glad to meet you. Yeah. I thought there was no use voting and unvoting the statuary till its authenticity was established. Yes, that's right. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Abernathy. To climb up and examine it to your heart's content. Well, well, uh, thank you. Well, say, this seems to be rather an unusual item. In fine condition. It is? Oh, that's good news. Well, there are several simple little tests, uh, like the sound it makes when you knock on it. Oh. Uh, oh, just listen to that. Isn't that music to the ear? I don't know. Does that mean it's genuine? Yes. And it certainly is music to the ear. Gee, Uncle, isn't it wonderful? Oh, it's just like finding buried treasure. Yeah. Hey, say, I like this item. I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, bring it in and I'll give you a check for $160. How's that? Now, wait a minute. I'll make it $170. Hey, cut that out, Leroy. <laughs> That's a very nice offer, Mr. Abernathy. We'll take it. Llewellyn, yeah. I suppose you help me lift it out and then hand it down to me. Okay. Yeah. You grab hold of the wake, Mr. Gillis. Yes, all right. All right. All right. I've got him. Uh, now, be careful. Lucifer well, Llewellyn is always careful. Yes. Yeah. Easy now. This is worth a lot of money. Yep. Watch out. It doesn't get away from you. Well, I'll try to, but it's got an off we swift we wump. What? <laughs> oh, look out. Oh, look out. Oh. Oh, my. It's in a hundred pieces. Well, that's the last time we'll ever try to pass that buck. <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. 
You know, food shopping is getting to be a science these days. Yes, I certainly take my hat off to you housewives. You know a lot about the quality and nutritional value of food and how to serve your families really tasty and nourishing meals and still keep within your budget. And that's why I'm sure so many housewives are asking for parquet margarine instead of just saying, some margarine, please. They know, you see, that parquet margarine is the modern margarine, outstanding because it tastes so good, outstanding, too, because of its fine quality and because it's a nourishing and wholesome year-round source of vitamin A. Yes, and these women know that parquet is an all-purpose margarine, Delicious for table use, a real flavor shortening for baking, and just about perfect for pan frying because it adds flavor and doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. So take a tip from these wise housewives. When you go to your food store, don't just ask for margarine. Ask for parquet margarine. Then you'll know you're getting margarine at its best. Yes, tomorrow, ask your food dealer for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. It's the delicious modern margarine... Made by Kraft. Uh, Leroy, how can you whistle and chuckle and grin when we've just smashed $160 worth of iron deer? I wanted to wait till we were alone, Unc. When old Buck busted up, something that was hidden inside of him came rolling out. It did? What was it? I picked it up to rub it his tea. It's a great big wad of money. Oh, my goodness. Maybe that crash was for the best. There's nobody else around here. Let me see it. Here, Unc. Wow, what a roll. Cut the string, Leroy. There. Oh, boy. Oh, darn it, we lose again. It's Confederate money. Good night. heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for the further adventures of the Great Gilders League. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Each week at this time from Hollywood, California, Kraft presents Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve. Written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, I wonder what you mean when you use the word progress. Because here's what I mean. Progress means making the old things better and inventing new things that are better than the old. Well, that applies to foods as well as to other things. And modern margarine is an outstanding example. Yes, modern margarine, like parquet margarine made by Kraft, is certainly a lot different from the margarines of even just a few years ago. Yes, all you have to do is to try parquet margarine once to know it's different and better because it tastes so deliciously good. That's why parquet margarine is a favorite everywhere, both for table use and for cooking, too. Now, you all know that proper nutrition is necessary to national defense. Well, parquet margarine is a wholesome, highly nutritious food. In fact, it's one of the best sources of food energy you could serve. And every pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. So get acquainted with this nourishing modern margarine. Delicious parquet margarine made by Kraft. Remember, it's parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve. Let me have some more of that green paper, Leroy. Thanks. Hey, who are you sending that necktie to? It's for Cousin Clinton in Iowa. Leroy, you can't do that. He's the one who sent you that tie last year. Oh. 
Well, in that case, I'll mail it to Uncle Stanley. Oh, no. Uncle Stanley gave it to Cousin Clinton the year before. Well, Uncle Mort, how do you know? Because I gave it to Uncle Stanley four years ago. Oh, are you sure it's the same tie? Oh, positively, Marjorie. I'd know those purple stripes and those orange dots anyplace. But, gee, what will I give Cousin Clinton? Oh, I think we can skip him this year if we send him a Christmas card. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Llewellyn. Yes, Miss Marjorie. Be sure to address a card to our Cousin Clinton, will you please? Yes, ma'am. Right away. Yes, uh, say. How are you coming along with the addressing in the ceiling, Llewellyn? Well, I'm a widow groggy. Yeah? I feel as if I'd whipped my weight in Christmas seals. <laughs> I wish they'd get some different flavored glue, like strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, or lime. <laughs> It'll come to that, Llewellyn. You're just a little ahead of time. <laughs> yeah. Here, Leroy, what are you doing? Me? Oh, I just thought I'd see what's in this package Piggy Banks gave me. But, Leroy, it's marked don't open until Christmas. Yes. Haven't you any self-control or willpower, young man? Don't you realize that if you opened all your gifts ahead of time, when Christmas morning came around, you wouldn't have a single toy left to uh, break? But, gee, I caught Marjorie sniffing around the present you gave her, Uncle Mort. I was not, Leroy. Or two. I just happened to drop it, and I was afraid it might be perfume. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, it's not perfume. It's a whoops. I almost told you then. <laughs> now, both of you children stop acting childish. Let me alone while I wrap this present. It's for Fibber McGee. I've already sent Molly McGee a big bottle of perfume, so I... Better get Fibber McGee's present in the mail for Wistful Vista tonight. Oh, what did you get for him, Uncle Mort? Something he needs badly. An electrical pants presser. <laughs> it's a neat little gadget, isn't it? Although I doubt if it'll make much of an impression on those gunny sacks McGee wears. <laughs> you think that's enough of a gift for Mr. McGee? Why not? Cost me 39 cents at the cut-rate drugstore. 39 cents? Yeah. Well, I thought Mr. McGee was a close friend of yours. He is, Leroy. He's the closest friend I've got. <laughs> I'm not speaking geographically or intimately. I'm speaking financially. Well, I never knew that. Well, he isn't exactly tight. He's more of the borrow a tool today and return when rusty type. <laughs> the more I think about the things McGee has borrowed, the less I think of him. Who does he imagine he is? The doorbell? I mean the doorbell. It's ringing. <laughs> yeah, I'll get it. Uh, yes? Is this a domicile of Trot Morton P. Gillisleaf? It, it is. This is it, shorty. Okay, lift. Hey, this is plenty heavy. Hey, where do you want this box, mister? Uh, Put it right down here for now. Uh, What's in it, uh, mister? Just keep your shirt on, will you, buddy? Uh, Are you ready, Spike? Yeah, let's get this over with. All right. A one, a two, a three. Oh, Oh, build a sleeve, oh, build a sleeve. A A Merry Christmas to to you. Singing expressman, eh? Yeah, yeah. We are something in the nature of an experiment. Oh, I see. <laughs> You're doing it for the company to see if it's satisfactory. Yeah? Uh, oh, no, we're doing it for the men to see if it's remunerative. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes, I get it. Well, here you are, boys. A dime for each of you. A dime. Why, Spike, this guy ain't got no respect for music. Yeah. But he sure got a lot of respect for money. Yeah. Well, I never saw a box so hard to get open. Oh. Must have taken me an hour. Yeah. Now to see what Fibber McGee has sent me. What is it, Uncle Moore? Huh? Yeah. Uh... Gee, another box. Yeah? And all done up with Christmas wrappings and stuff. Oh, my goodness. Hand me the hatchet again, Leroy. Oh, no, no, Unc. Can't you see what it says? Where? Who? Oh, uh, don't open till Christmas. And this means you'll kill the old snoop. <laughs> 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 McGee never means what he says. Uh, the hatchet, please, Leroy. But, Uncle Mort, where's your willpower? Yes, and how about your self-control? Oh, they're fine. It's my curiosity has got the best of me. <laughs> 
Oh, gee. Let me take one little peek, will you, huh? Now who's acting childish, Uncle Mort? Uh, you're right, Marjorie. I wasn't setting you a good example. Hand me some of that ribbon and I'll get this pants presser off to my old chum. Oh, what am I saying? I can't send McGee this dinky little present now. Why not? Because that box probably contains a large, valuable gift for me. Alongside of it, my cheap little crease iron will look like, uh, well, 39 cents. Well, what do you think you should do, Uncle? I better go right downtown and get him something better. Oh, I think that's very nice of you, Uncle Moore. It sure is. I think so, too. Uh, now, in order to get an idea of how much McGee spent so I won't spend any more, uh, don't you think I should take one quick little look as to what he sent me? No! Uh, all right, I'll just suggest it. Say, if you're going downtown, you better hurry up. It's getting late and the stores are awfully overcrowded. Oh, I won't have any trouble. Get your cap and coat, Leroy. I'll be right with you. Are you taking Leroy through those mobs with you? Yes, Marjorie. He and I have worked out a wonderful system for Christmas shopping. Haven't we, Leroy? I'll say. What kind of a system? Uh, it's called the angle worm formation. Leroy goes ahead and figures out an angle, then I wear my way through. <laughs> Gee, Uncle Mort, this is certainly a ritzy store. Yes. Haven't I always said that the best is none too good for Fibber McGee? Well, how do you do, sir? What will it be? Uh, I'm looking for a present for a friend. Do you think he might like a half dozen imported cravats? Say, uh, what's a cravat? A cravat is a necktie that sells for five dollars, Leroy. No, I, I'd like to get him a more substantial gift. Oh, here's something. Maybe he'd like a dressing gown or a robe, huh? Why, yes, we have some lovely ones. Say, in the neighborhood of a hundred dollars. Have you got anything in a cheaper neighborhood? <laughs> Well, here are a few in the vicinity of $60. Oh, yes, yes. This brown silk one would be exactly the right thing. If you have it in a smaller size and some other color and a different material and a little less expensive. <laughs> well, then I'll have to go back in the stock room and see what we have there. If you'll just wait a moment. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. Hmm? Yes. Quit trying on those derbies, Leroy. You can never tell who wore them before you did. Well, I only wanted to see how I looked in one, Uncle. How can you see when they come to, down to your nose on you? Now, just stand still. Oh, please. just the sort of person I'm looking for. Oh, uh, excuse me, sir, but there's a little favor I'd like to ask of you. Uh, certainly, madam. What can I do for you? Well, if you see that man standing over there at the sweater counter. Oh, you mean the funny-looking gent with the bat-wing ears and the dirty look? Has he been annoying you? No, he's my husband. Oh, he is? Oh, well, I didn't mean that nice-looking chap. I, I was talking about the one in the checkered overcoat standing next to him. Uh, the fat guy that looks like a cross between a scow and a barge. <laughs> That's the one who's my husband, sir. Yeah. You see, I want to surprise him with this pretty blue robe for Christmas. Oh. But I don't know if it's the right size for him, so I thought that being that you two are of the same build... What? Do you think I'm as chubby as that tubby? No. Oh, now, please, please. I don't want him to suspect a thing. Why don't you help the lady out, Uncle Mort? Huh? Yes, why not? Here, let me have it, madam. Uh, hold it up, Leroy. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks. Yes. Oh, this is so nice of you, really. Not at all. Uh, would you care to have me parade up and down like one of those models? Oh, no. No, thank you. Now, uh, just tie the belt. There. Yeah. Oh, there. Now, turn around, please. Yeah? Oh, dear. What's wrong? Is my slip showing? <laughs> <laughs> well, either I picked the wrong size or else you're stouter than my husband. No, I'll see here, lady. Well, we can soon see. I have a tape measure here in my bag somewhere. Tape measure? I know Leo's size. Oh. Let me see. Oh, yes. Here it is. Now, if you'll just put your arms up, I'll flip this tape around your waist and find out what size. Hey, what are you doing with your arms around that man? Oh, Oh, my goodness. Huh? He mustn't find out about the surprise. Uh, pretend that you're my, uh, my cousin George. I it's... said, why are you hugging this fellow, Fanny? Oh, uh, why, uh, Leo, it, it's cousin George. I haven't seen him for years. You don't blame me for being glad to see my own cousin, do you? No, not at all. Glad to meet you, George. The pleasure's, the pleasure's, uh, the pleasure's all mine. Voice still changing, huh? Yeah. Well, George, Fanny's told me all about you, but I always picked you as a different man. Well, I was a different man up till quite recently. <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it's just too bad that Cousin George is just passing through town and can't stop over for a visit. Huh? Aren't you, Cousin George? Who? Oh, me. Oh, yes, Cousin George. I just happen to be driving Driving? Through. I thought you hated automobiles. Uh, do I? Yeah. Didn't the automobile ruin your horse collar business? Oh, I don't know, did it? Oh, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> But I'm not one to hold a grudge. You're not? Well, not more than 20 years, anyway. 
Hey, that reminds me. What's happened to Francis these days? Uh, Francis? Oh, he's all right. He? Since when is Francis a he? I mean, she's just dandy. Uh, I talked to her long distance only last night. Talk to her? How can you talk long distance to a horse? Well, you pick... <laughs> Oh, oh, that Francis. Yes. Yeah. I thought you meant the other Francis. You know, the one I mean, don't you, Cousin Fanny? Of course. Your wife. Yeah, my what? I never knew you were married, George, old boy. Oh, well, it's uh, all sort of a secret. We eloped uh, to Niagara Falls. Niagara... Ha, <laughs> ha, Niagara Falls. <laughs> yeah. Boy, that's a hot one. <laughs> What's so hot about Niagara Falls? Well, uh, Leo just thinks it's funny that you'd eloped to Niagara Falls when you lived right there all your life. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can't stand around here, folks. I've got to catch a train. What about your automobile? I hate him again. Come on, Leroy. I'm coming, Pappy. So yes. that was your cousin George, well, Fanny. Yes, and you got yes, the nerve yes, to criticize my yes, yes. Oh, dear. Wait a minute, Uncle Mark. Where are we going? Out. Let's get away from there before that gorilla gets hep. But if you'll just... He'll ring my neck. How do I manage to get into such affairs? It was Cousin Fanny that did it. Where are you taking me, Uncle Mark? As far away as our chubby little legs will carry us. Now, don't just dally-dally, Leroy. But, Dio, you can't scram like this. I can't, huh? Why not? By George, it was a lucky thing I kept calm and cool all through that encounter. But, Uncle Mort... What have you been but Uncle Morning about, Leroy? Come out with it. I've been trying to tell you all along. We've got to go back to the store. Why? You're still wearing that baby blue bathrobe. Oh! Now, Mr. Llewellyn. Oh, yeah. Hello, Uncle Mort. Hello, Leroy. Uh, hello. Oh. Did you get something nice for Mr. McGee? No, we had a terrible time. I haven't been pushed around so much since my baby carriage days. Gosh, you never saw so many places out of so much stuff that so many people wanted so bad. Uh, what sort of present were you working for? Well, Llewellyn, something unusual and expensive that he doesn't have already. Yeah. Uncle Mort almost got a dandy baby blue bathrobe, but after he took it outside to see how it looked in the daylight, he took it back. Yeah. Well, we'll go down and try it again tomorrow. Maybe you'll come along, Marjorie, to help me. Say, there's something missing in this room. I was wondering how long it would be before you noticed the difference. Yeah. <laughs> well, what is it? Come, come, Llewellyn. Don't be coy. What have you done? I took Mr. McGee's present, wiped it out of here, and walked it in a wampus womb closet. Uh, you did, eh? And why did you do that? Oh, just so you could resist opening it before Christmas. Well, that took a lot of nerve. Oh, no, it just took a lot of strength. Yeah. Believe me, before I was through, I bitterly regretted starting the whole proposition. Uh, Willie, I was a wreck. Yes, Mr. Llewellyn worked quite hard. Llewellyn, the next time you poke your probing proboscis into my personal affairs, I'm going to take a swing at it. What was that, Mr. Gildersleeve? <laughs> if you fool around with something that's no skin off your nose, why, by George, it will be. Oh, please, Mr. Gildersleeve, don't lose your temper. Uh, who's losing their temper? But you're raising your voice. Who's raising their voice? You. You're just angry because I hit your present. Oh, is that so? I suppose you know everything that's going on in my mind. <laughs> yep. I can weed you like a dictionary. Yes. If you can read me like a dictionary, why don't you turn to the letter D and under discharged? You'll find that's where you are. Why, Mr. Gildersweave, what do you mean? I mean that you're fired, dismissed, finished, sacked. Now, do you understand? Well, all right. That's the way you feel. Goodbye. Goodbye, Miss Marjorie. Goodbye. Goodbye, wee boy. Goodbye, Mr. Llewellyn. What's he getting so huffy about? I never saw such an excitable fellow in all my life. But the man has got no Christmas spirit. Making me fire him right before the holidays. Hey, he didn't get us paid, did he, Uncle Mort? By Jove, that's right. You better run after him, Leroy, and tell him to come back for his money. Okay, Uncle Mort. Uh, and Leroy. Yes, Uncle? Uh, tell him if he uh, behaves himself, he can come back to work. Sure. Uh, he had no right getting me all worked up after a hard day shopping. I'm not an unreasonable man, am I, Marjorie? Of course not, Uncle Mort. Yeah, I'm just as nice as the next man. Sometimes nicer, too. I couldn't see him anywhere, Uncle Mort. You mean he's gone? Well, it was snowing rather hard. Oh, jumping jeeps. I've turned him out into the cold with only a thin Macintosh. Oh, now, don't you worry, Uncle Mort. Just call him at his hotel tomorrow after you've both cooled off. Yes, of course. Oh, I can't do that. I don't know where he lives. Uh, do either of you? No, I don't think so. Not me. Oh, my goodness. I'm a cad. I'm a bounder. No, not a bounder, just a cad. 
I won't be able to look myself in the face the next time I shave. What'll I do? Say, maybe Bertie knows where he lives. Oh, yes, Bertie. Maybe she does. I'll go find out. Uh, Bertie? Yes, sir? Do you know where... Llewellyn, what are you doing here? Oh, just eating my supper, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh! <laughs> Going down? Hey, wait a minute! Uh, no use, Leroy. They're booking passage on those elevators a couple of days in advance. Uh, let's wander into the furniture department. Well, we've looked every place else for a present. Maybe we'll find something there. Yes. Yeah. I wasn't thinking about Fibber McGee's present, Marjorie. I only wanted to rest. My feet ache clear up to my shoulder blades. Oh, poor Uncle Mort. Yeah. Look, here's a nice big leather chair. Huh? Try it, why don't you? Oh, thank you. I will. Uh... Very comfortable. Now, if I could only take my shoes off, but there I go, daydreaming again. Hey, look at the buttons on the arm of this chair. Huh? I wonder what this one does. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> Help me. The chair is now bent. Oh, Leroy, now look what you've done. Gee, the back goes down and the bottom comes up. Here, I'll give you a hand, Uncle. You know, on second thought, this is so nice, I think I'll take 40 winks. <laughs> Wake me up in 1942, will you? Uncle, you can't sleep there. Oh, yes, I can. Watch me. Say, hey, this is certainly a great invention. Now, I wonder what this button does. Oh, 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 oh. you spoiled everything. It's a chair again. How do, folks? Interested in the Snorwell reclining chair? Oh, is that what it is? Well, <laughs> mighty cozy little one-man couch. And an ideal Christmas present for father, husband, friend, or boss. Uncle McGee, how about it? Yes, yeah. Uncle McGee, how about it? Yes, <laughs> See, that's not a bad idea. In fact, it's the best one I've had so far. Let me tell you about some of the Snorwell features. Oh. Three comfy, cuddly positions. Yes? Sitting, snoozing, and sleeping. Made of the toughest bull leather. Overstuffed, underslung. Why, you couldn't be more tickled if you bought a feather bed. Huh? Buy one for the rest of your life. Catch on? Yes. Oh, brother. Now, there's a salesman. What do you think, Uncle Moore? Well, uh, how much is it? Thirty-nine ninety-five. That's without any of the accessories and attachments, of course. Oh, yeah. You mean it's got attachments like a vacuum cleaner? Yes, sir. The Snorwell is a first fully mechanized chair. Well, I'm interested now. This is for a friend of mine who is rather mechanically minded. Yeah? Yes, he invented an illuminated sundial once. Yeah, for cloudy days, you know. <laughs> yeah. Huh? No, you wouldn't know. <laughs> Let me show you these features. Uh, Here's the overhead reading lamp, yes. also dandy for shaving. Yes. Then we have a combination ashtray and cigar lighter that appears and disappears at the touch of a button. Uh, what does it do with the ashes? Dump them under the rug? Uh, uh, we also have an electric clock and a compartment for sandwiches with a tank for ice water. Uh, Gee, it does everything but sing you to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> It'll do that, too. What? For $24 more, we'll put a little radio inside the headrest. My goodness, if you tack a mailbox on the side of this chair, you could live in it. Oh, this one seems a little damaged. Look at this crack in it. Crack? Yeah. That is no crack. What? It's a slot for old razor blade. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Uncle, the more I hear about it, the more I'm convinced that this is just the present for Mr. McGee. So am I. A young man, how much would one cost with all the accessories? Well, the Super Deluxe Shoot the Works model sells for one hundred and nineteen dollars and ninety-five cents. Oh, my dear! But, but what do you think, children? Oh yes, take it. What do you got to lose? One hundred and nineteen dollars and ninety-five cents. <laughs> well, I guess I'll do it just the same. Gee. I knew I'd sell one of these someday. What? Uh, <laughs> uh, where is it to be delivered, sir? Uh, it goes to Fibber McGee, 79 Whistle Vista, Whistle Vista. Yeah. Can you have it delivered there before Christmas? Yes, sir. We can send it out by express this afternoon. Yeah, good. Uh, charge it to Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Uh, here's my card. Thank you, Mr. Gildersleeve, and season's greetings. Yeah. Merry Christmas to you. Uh, come on, you two. We can go home now. Certainly is a load off my... Well, hello, Judge Hooker. Uh, Christmas shopping, I see. Oh, hello, Gildersleeve. How are you, Marjorie? Just fine, Judge Hooker. Season's greetings, Judge. Thank you. You all look so happy there can only be one reason. Yeah? You've just finished buying the last of your holiday gifts. Yes, that's it. And it certainly was a humdinger. Yes, sir, it was for... Uh, Leroy, let's keep it a secret. It was for a certain very good friend of mine, Judge. Oh, yeah? Yes, yeah, a real pal, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll be seeing you. Come on, children. Let's make another try for the elevator. Uh -huh. Say, could that present be for me? 
After all, I have been a pal to him. I'd just like to know. <clears throat> Young man. Yes, sir? What, uh, I was, uh, my friend who was just here, he mm. told me what he bought, but it slipped my mind. What was it again? Oh, it was a present. A Snorwell reclining chair with $80 worth of accessories. Well, well, that must be for me. Gildersleeve broke the springs in my best lounge chair, and now he's making up for it. Say, now I'll have to get him something better than that flashlight I bought him for Christmas. <laughs> Thank you, young man. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Gee whiz. So that's Fibber McGee. <laughs> going on in this house? Mm-mm. Sounds like somebody's raising a rumpus in the rumpus room. I'm going to investigate. Mm. I don't know why I'm so brave. In fact, I don't know if I'm so brave. I better stop here in the kitchen first. <laughs> now I feel better. Peculiar how much confidence a couple of carving knives gives a lady. <laughs> Stop what you're doing. I got you surrounded. I mean, I got you covered. Uh, Bernie, what are you doing here at this time of the night? Oh, Mr. Gilsley. Oh, my goodness. I thought it was a burglar. Yep. Oh, my stars in the firmament, that was a burglar. Huh? What's that all chopped up, Mr. Gillsleeve? Oh, chopped up? Oh, well, that's uh, the present Mr. McGee sent me. Uh... Oh, then that means there wasn't no burglar no how. Huh? Honest or truly, Mr. Gillsleeve, you ought to be ashamed of yourself what? scaring folks at 3 a.m. in the morning and sneaking around in your pajamas, uh. snooping at your Christmas presents ahead of time. Lucky I caught you before you got it open. Now, you go on back to bed. Yeah, but Bertie. Go on, now, get you understand what that is? No. You what? know what you is? No, what? You is a problem, Uncle. That's what. Yeah. Good night. <laughs> Judge Hooker, yes. Come right in, Judge. I'm still a few days early, but I couldn't wait. Uh, Merry Christmas, Gildersleeve. Well, well, and what's this? Oh, just a little present I picked out for you, Gildy old pal. Uh, for me? <laughs> what is it, Judge? A set of matched golf clubs in a leather bag. Oh, Judge, you shouldn't have done it. By the way, I've got something for you. Oh, no. Well, I didn't expect anything. Well, it isn't very much. Oh, I bet it isn't. Yeah. <laughs> I have it right here in the hall. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Here it is. Yeah. This little box. Huh? Uh. This little box? Huh? Oh. Yes. Oh, thank you very much, Gilda. Oh, uh, won't you come in and look at our tree, Judge? No, no, I've got to be getting along now. Uh, I feel a, a headache coming on. Oh. <laughs> goodbye. Uh, goodbye, and thanks for the wonderful present, old pal. Welcome, and goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> Say, Marjorie, look at the dandy golf outfit Judge Hooker gave me for Christmas. Oh, look at that. It's beautiful. Uh, what did you give him, Uncle Moore? The pants presser I almost sent to McGee. <laughs> Oh, sure. Come on, Marjorie. Uh, what is it, Leroy? Look at this. Somebody tried to get into the box filled with my geese and Uncle Moore. Oh, why, yes. Yeah. Uh, Chips and splinters all around and holes in the box. Uh, why, who could have done it, Uncle? Uh, a mice. Uh, <laughs> hey, we better take a look inside and see if it's uh, damaged any. But it's still four days till Christmas, Uncle. Well, but who knows what's happened to it. We better act quickly. Uh, let me have that hatchet. Uh, thank you. Uh, of course, you know, I'd never open it under ordinary circumstances. <laughs> yeah. Ah, there. Yeah, put the lid someplace, Leroy. Yeah. Well, everything's all right so far. Uh, at last. I'm so excited I can hardly tear off the wrapping. <laughs> now, now we can see what we can see. What's this? Oh, a card. Uh, Dear Chum Gildy. Oh, good old favorite. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And here's your old lawnmower back. 
Signed, Fibber McGee. Oh! <laughs> Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. You know, people who won't try new things certainly miss a lot. Yes, you just can't know whether you really like something or not until you actually try it yourself. That's why I urge everyone to try delicious parquet margarine made by Kraft. Because you're really missing something if you haven't tried this truly modern margarine. First of all, you're missing the delicate appetizing flavor that makes parquet margarine outstanding. Why, Americans from coast to coast have found they prefer parquet margarine because it tastes so good, both for table use and for cooking, too. Secondly, parquet margarine is an economical source of food values your family needs. Now, that's very important these days. Proper nutrition is essential to national defense. You see, parquet margarine is wholesome and nutritious. It's one of the best energy foods you could serve. And especially important in the wintertime... Kraft adds 9,000 units of vitamin A to every pound of parquet, making it a dependable source of this vitamin the year round. Now, with food prices rising, you owe it to yourself to find out how delicious and nourishing economical parquet margarine is. So don't put it off. Ask your food dealer tomorrow for parquet. P A R K A Y. Hand me those pajamas, Leroy. Here you are. Yeah, thanks. And to think that now that extra shirt, Marjorie... It's in the bag already, Uncle. Oh, well, I'll show him a thing or two. Excuse me, Uncle Mort, but where are you going? The Whistle Vista, my dear. I'm going to try and get back my $119 chair before it's delivered to Fibber McGee's house. You aren't going to be way over Christmas, are you? Oh, no, I'm just going to be there Tuesday night. And remind me on the way to the station. I've got to stop at the cut-rate drugstore. What for? To get McGee another pants presser. Merry Christmas, everybody, and good night. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Each week at this time from Hollywood, California, Kraft presents Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, let me tell you about a conversation I had the other day. A lady I know asked me, why do you speak of parquet margarine as a modern margarine? Well, here's what I said. Parquet is a modern margarine because it's so different from the margarine of a few years back. You see, parquet margarine is made by Kraft. And Kraft is famous for its fine quality, delicious tasting foods. Yes, delicate appetizing flavor is the big reason why parquet margarine is different. It's grand both for table use and for cooking because it tastes so good. Another reason parquet margarine is different is that it's a reliable economical source of important vitamin A. Summer and winter, every pound of parquet margarine contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. And that's something every mother and housewife should be glad to know. Besides, parquet margarine is wonderfully wholesome and nutritious. Why, it's one of the best energy foods you can serve. But why not find out how deliciously good this modern margarine is yourself? Tomorrow, ask your dealer for parquet. (laughs) P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now, let's visit our friend, the Great Gildersleeve. Good morning, Uncle Mort. Good 
Good morning. Oh, is that one of your Christmas shirts you're wearing? Oh, uh, no, Marjorie. And that reminds me. Next year, I hope you're more careful about giving my sizes to Aunt Sylvia. She sent me a 13 shirt and a pair of 17 and a half socks. Oh, oh yeah. I'm sorry. Huh? But you know Aunt Sylvia. Yeah. Why, she still thinks I'm a baby. Yeah? She sent me a pound of gumdrops and a Mickey Mouse wristwatch. <laughs> oh, Bertie, are you busy? Uh, no, Miss Marge. What can I do? See if you can sweep up some of the pine needles under the tree. <gasps> it's shedding like a $19 fur coat. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's the kind of coat I got from a gentleman of Queens last Christmas. Oh, well, that's too bad, Bertie. Oh, I don't mind so much. The friendship only lasts until the 4th of July, but the bunny coat didn't start to give out until long by Labor Day. <laughs> Well, I hope you have better luck with your uh, current boyfriend. Oh, yes, Mr. Gillsleeve. Current is right. That boy's a real live wire. <laughs> he done treated me to a course in ten lessons in rumba dancing. Well. Oh, Bertie, are you going to learn to rumba? Oh, yes, ma'am. I've been rumbing for years, Miss Marge. <laughs> I'm just going to improve my technique. Yes. Yeah. Professor Guadalupe, that's my rumba teacher's name, Stonewall Jackson Guadalupe. <laughs> He says I'll be a fine rumba dancer just as soon as I learn to put about twice as much energy into half as much work. Yeah. I can see what he means. Uh, what else did you get for Christmas, Bertie, besides this uh, course in the Cuban can-can? Besides which? Uh, in addition to your rumba coaching. Oh. Well, I received a bottle of the loveliest smelling lavender cologne yes. and a box of the loveliest looking lavender face powder. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, indeed. I I'm at my stunningness in lavender. Yeah. <laughs> Do they match that perfume you had? <laughs> the last time you saw a Harlem? Yeah. No, ma'am. <laughs> this is a new kind called Chattanooga Woo Woo. Yes. <laughs> or, uh... Or tuxedo unction. Yeah, tuxedo unction. <laughs> well, I guess I better get up these pine leaves with the back. Yeah. I just came from Piggy Bank's house, and you know what? No, what? He just gave me a... That is, he wants to give me a, a swell Christmas present. Uh, but, Leroy, Piggy gave you a pair of roller skates for Christmas. Well, he feels it wasn't enough, so he wants to give me a swell puppy, and boy, is it a cute one. Uh, well, if it's so cute and swell, Leroy, why is he giving him away? Because Piggy's father won't let him keep it. He won't? What's the matter with him? Well, nothing's wrong with him. It's Piggy's father. He's got allergics. Yes. Allergic. Sam, it's all right for me to have him, isn't it? Well, I don't know. Is it a very big dog? Oh, tiny? Hey, he's just the right size for this house. Oh, a two-story dog, eh? Yeah. What kind is he, Leroy? Oh, a brown with white spots. What do you say, Uncle Morris? No, I mean, what kind of a dog? A boy dog. A boy. How about a dog? <laughs> well, I've always thought that a dog is a wonderful companion for a young man of your age, Leroy. And he, so do I. Yeah. Uh-oh, here comes more work for me. <laughs> no, Bertie, this dog is going to be Leroy's responsibility. You're to take care of him yourself, young man, understand? You bet. Yeah. You better, because I know from experience when a dog comes snooping around the kitchen for a bite, it ain't particular what it takes that bite out of. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, Bertie. The dog is good for a boy. Yes, I recall the dog I owned when I was Leroy's age. Good old Hector. I can remember when he was a pup. <laughs> what kind of a dog was he, Uncle Moore? Uh, Hector was a pug dog. Yeah. You know, the kind that looks as if it's always standing with its nose against a butcher shop window? Yeah. Uh, we had great times together, Hector and I. Almost broke my heart when I lost him. Was he run over, Uncle? No, Marjorie. He got too big to ride, and I traded him for a bicycle. <laughs> Yeah. There's nothing like a little canine pal. Oh. Oh, oh. oh, goodness to mercy. What's going on in the cellar? Yes. What can it be? Well, uh, uh, that? Well, it might be my new dog, Tiny. Yep. Yeah, yeah I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. I left him in the cellar till I told you on the idea. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I think we better investigate this idea of yours, Leroy. Come on. Sure, and wait till you see him. He's the cutest puppy you ever saw. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Turn on the lights, Leroy. Thanks. Oh, my goodness. He's chewing up all my old clothes. Here, Tiny, come on away from there. You want to get sick? What? Here, Tiny, here, Tiny. <laughs> oh. hey, get off of me with those dirty paws. Ye gods, look at the size of Tiny. He must be a great day. Uh, oh, no, Uncle, he's only half great day. What? The other half is St. Bernard. St. Bernard. <laughs> Oh, 
coat. Oh, boy, look at that doggy. Yeah. His idea of heaven is a back porch full of pork chops. Yeah, look at it. The way he goes at it, you think meat grows on trees. You'll be getting another ten pounds, Uncle. It's not until I arrange for a wholesale raid at the butcher shop, Leroy. Get down, Tiny, down. Every time he hears me mention butcher shop, whoop, quit licking my face, Tiny. And grab his tail, Leroy, before he knocks me over. Get down, doggy. Come on. Yeah, thanks. Hey, he's a smart dog. Every time he hears me say B-U-T-C-H-E-R, he wants to go chop shopping. <laughs> you should have seen us down at the M-E-A-T market. What happened? I tried to train him to carry the package home in his mouth. Didn't it work? No. Tiny thought it'd be easier to carry it home in his tummy. <laughs> well, I guess you can't teach a new dog old tricks. <laughs> hey, it's getting cold out here. Let's go inside. Yes, all right. Hey, come on, Tiny. You can sit beside the fireplace. You promise not to chew the rug for dessert. <laughs> yeah. Don't keep that door open so long, please, Mr. Gillsleeve. This cold well is hot on us tropical folks. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, Bertie. <laughs> yeah, come on, Tiny. Come on. Uh, quit sniffing around that icebox, dog. Ah, Tiny. This way. No, no. Keep away from the stove. I guess he's admiring your cooking, Bertie. Well, he can admire till he's blue in the face, Leroy, but he ain't gonna get none of that there roast. I'm not cooking myself to a shadow over a hot stove for no truck horse of a great Bernard. <laughs> yes, look at there, Bertie. He loves you. Uh, get away from me, dog, before I smack you with your skillet. <laughs> but he's just playing. Well, if he takes one step closer, he's gonna be playing a dog hop. <laughs> Come on, Tiny. Let's go into the living room. The living room? You gonna turn that into a kennel? Oh, no, Bertie. We'll be careful. Careful, he says. What does a hundred and fifty pounds of giddy puppy know about being careful? I don't get excited, Bertie. You just take care of the kitchen department. This dog is Leroy's responsibility, and I've got a feeling in my bones. Oh! I shouldn't have mentioned bones. <laughs> get him off of me, Leroy. And grab his collar. Come on, Tiny, this way. Come on, Bertie. Yeah. Oh. I'm going to have to start training this pup not to jump up and lick you every time you mention F-O-O-D. How do you do that, Unc? Well, you make him understand you're the master, Leroy. Just look him straight in the eye and say, look out for that ashtray. <laughs> oh, his tail brushed it off the end table. Sweep it in the fireplace, Leroy, before Bertie sees it. Okay. Yeah. Be careful, Tiny. Yes, be careful, Tiny. Your tail will wag the room into a shambles. <laughs> Gee, maybe we can teach him to wag his tail up and down instead of from side to side. <laughs> I, I don't think it would work, Leroy. Why not? Well, I'm afraid that would go against the grain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's not only smart, he's a mimic. <laughs> now, come on, Tiny. Lay down like a nice little doggy. <laughs> oh, not over there. Keep, keep away from that Christmas tree. Look out. <laughs> Oh. Of all the clumsy, fumble-footed hounds Get him out of here quickly before he does any more damage Yes, right? Uncle Morse yeah. Come on, Tiny, you gotta go out yeah. Sorry, old man It'll take him a little while to get accustomed to our furniture, Uncle Morse yes. yeah. but Will the furniture hold out that long? <laughs> Help me get this tree back on its feet Help, stop that! Come here, come now, get away from me! Oh, now what? Well, I bet I know what it is but Do something, quick, please Hey, Bertie, what you doing standing in the sink? It's that dog of yours, Leroy. Look. Uh-oh. Uh, what did he do? He just chewed up the roast I had ready for dinner, and now he's drooling at me. Why not, Leroy? I know I'd welcome a nice, big, comfy, warm piano box if I happen to be a dog. On a night like this, thank goodness I'm not. But don't you think you'll get lonesome? <laughs> lonesome? Not if he keeps howling like that, he won't. But, the, but suppose somebody complains. Let him complain. I've had a hard day trying to cope with that baby buffalo, and now I'm ready for bed. <laughs> yeah. I'll probably have a nightmare in which Tiny takes me for a walk, drag me along at the end of a leash. Oh, that'd be awful. I know it. That's what he did earlier this evening. <laughs> well, hey, good night, Leroy. 
Gee, I wonder what that can be about at this hour of night. You guess. Uh, hello? Who? Yes, this is Mr. Gildersleeve. He's one of the neighbors. Uh, what dog are you talking about? <laughs> oh, that dog, yes. No, it's my nephew's. No, it isn't my nephew, it's his dog. What? No, I won't take him in the house. I'm training him. Oh, yeah? I'd like to see you. Is that so? Well, you can go there yourself. Where did he want you to go, Uncle Morse? It's neither here nor there, Leroy. Oh, Oh, I know where it is. Be quiet. Let's go to bed now. Oh, why did Alexander Graham Bell have to do this to me? Hello. Look, mister, I've had enough out of you. If you don't stop bothering me, I'm going to call the police. Oh, this is the police. Uh, Well, hello, Sergeant. (laughs) What can I do for you? Oh, sure. I'll be glad to. Right away, Sergeant. Goodbye. Leroy, I've changed my mind about Tiny. You run along outside and bring him in. That'll keep him quiet. Oh, boy. Can I keep him in my room, Uncle Morse? You didn't think I'd let him sleep with me, did you? (laughs) Oh, hello, Marjorie. Hello, Uncle Morse. Look what I found under the rug in my room. Three bones and an old corset. Oh, more of Tiny's work. Yes, he also ate all the flowers I received for Christmas. Two pairs of silk stockings and almost a pound of my bath clothes. Yeah, that dog did that? Oh, he isn't a dog. He's an ostrich. Yeah. <laughs> now, now, my dear, we must have patience. Oh. Is that you, Leroy? Yeah, me and Tiny. I'm going to take him upstairs to my room. Fine. Good night, Leroy. Wait, Tiny. Good night, Mark. Good night. Good night, my dear. I'm going to bed myself. Oh, my. I feel as tired as last month's lettuce. What's that? Uh, uh, who, uh, who's there? Who's that under the bed? Is that you, Tiny? Oh, my, we always seem to meet. Oh, stop licking my face. Get out from under that bed, Tiny. Get up from there. No, no, don't stand up, you moose. Crawl out. Uh, down, Tiny, down. Uh, this is the last straw. I'll be doggone if this dog isn't gone tomorrow. Of course I'm up. I didn't sleep a wink all night. How are you feeling, Uncle? Terrible. That dog curled up under my bed, and then the bed curled up. <laughs> he didn't give me a chance to shut an eye. Did you try counting sheep? I did, but Tiny kept chasing him around the room. <laughs> See, that's too bad. It's all right. We're going to take this poison pup back to Piggy Bank's house today. But Uncle Moore... I won't hear a word, Leroy. Oh, I've got a splitting headache from lack of sleep. What time is it, anyway? Gee, Uncle Mort, it's half past 11 already. What? Out of my way, Leroy. I've got a 9 o'clock appointment. I think he's hungry again. Uh, Again? Yes. No wonder Piggy gave him to you. Tiny's appetite is enough to break the banks. (laughs) In fact, we've got to find someone to palm him off on before he eats us out of house... See who it is, Leroy. Sure, Uncle. Stay where you are, Tiny. Yeah, he will. It's Judge Hunter. Come on in, Judge. Well, uh, good afternoon, folks. Well, look at the beautiful dog. Christmas present, Leroy? Yeah, isn't he a humdinger? Hello there, old boy. <laughs> How you tell, huh? Good old dog, you sweet old pup. <laughs> isn't that disgusting? Oh, don't you pay any attention to him, old boy. My, I wish I had a little puppy like you. Oh, you do, eh? Well. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Did I say something wrong? Better be careful, Judge, or we'll let him take you home. <laughs> Why, well, I'd be tickled to death to have him. How about it, old man? Want to come home with me and bite into a nice, big, juicy steak? <laughs> oh, now you've done it. Get this element off of me. Get that out, you. Stop, stop licking my face. Hey, take your feet off the nice man's shoulders. Stop, Tiny. Tiny. Get me up from here. Yeah. Call off your dog, Leroy. Help. Help me put him up the judge. Uh, uh, oh. uh, now, let me give you a hand up, hooker, old chap. Don't you hooker, old chap, me, Gildersleeve. Yeah. That's a dangerous dog you got there. You're telling me. He attacked me entirely without provocation. He had plenty of provocation, Judge. You mentioned S-T-E-A-K. Yes, Judge. This is a smart dog. You got to spell out F-O-O-D. 
If you can't pronounce what you're talking about. Gee whiz, I guess the judge won't take him now, Unc. Oh, so that was your game. Trying to stick me with his hamburger, huh? <laughs> Get away from me, Tiny. I'm glad I caught on in time. What do you mean, you caught on? Why, you couldn't catch on to a hippopotamus with a plunger in each hand. Oh, I couldn't, huh? Look who's talking. Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, the Summerfield version of Dumbo. Oop. One more ill-bred remark, Judge Hooker, and the governor will be up all night trying to pick your successor. Go on, go on. I'm not afraid of you, you big gas bag. Oop. Just about 97% hot air. Is that so? Why, you little prehistoric dodo? Say, what's the other 3%? <laughs> Pure, unmitigated gall. Yeah, thanks very much. Why, you little prehistoric dodo? I'm going to pin your ears so far back you'll even look like a jackass. That's enough. That's enough. I'm leaving. Goodbye, Leroy. Uh, Are you sure you won't take Tiny Judge? I wouldn't have him if you gave me the Mississippi River and threw in your uncle besides. <laughs> goodbye, Tiny. And if Gildersleeve doesn't feed you right, buy him. Yes. Goodbye, Judge. And the next time we meet... Oh, oh, oh. Down, Tiny Room! Tiny Meat! <laughs> Oh, well, I bet he wouldn't have given the dog a good home anyway. Oh, Mr. Gillsby, the egg man wants his money. Egg man? Oh, yeah, send him in, Bertie. Now, hold on a tiny Leroy. He probably likes eggs, too. Okay. <laughs> Come right in, sir. Now, how much is the bill this week? Two dollars and fifty-three. That includes the chicken. What's the matter, Tiny? Don't you like chicken? <laughs> uh... Hey, that's a mighty fine-looking dog you got there, Sonny. Well, I'm beginning to have my dogs. Oh, yes, yes. Isn't he a fine-looking dog, sir? Yes. I suppose you have a nice farm where a dog can romp to its heart's content. Uh, lots to eat, no trouble with the uh, fussy neighbors. No, ain't had to fall out with the neighbors since, uh, let me see, guess must have been the April of 1912. Yes. Uh, I remember it as clear as today because Brian was running for the first third time. Uh, later, Lum, later. Uh, Did I hear you express admiration for this imposing canine of yours? No, but Our... I certainly like that dog. Yes, pardon me. Yes. yes. Reminds me of a hound friend of mine gave me in 1906. Or was it 1907? No, 1907 was the year of the panic. Uh, I got married that year, too. (laughs) Uh, What a year. Oh, yes, twerk. We're 07. Got the dog for a wedding present. Yes, a dog makes a wonderful wedding present. I bet you'd like to have one like this to guard your uh, chickens at night. No, I don't need a dog for that. Uh No, I ain't had a hen roost robbery since the summer of 19 and 22. Or was it 19 and... Come, come, 22 is good enough for me. (laughs) Do you think you could use this uh, nice dog? Why, well, certainly could. I need companionship. Uh? Uh, it gets kind of lonesome for me up at my place. Uh. All the children have grown, married, and got kids of their own. Uh, and scattered to the four winds, I suppose. No, nope, they're all sleeping and eating and fighting up at my place. <laughs> See, that's why I need companionship. Yes. Yeah. Well, we find that city life is a little too uh, confining for Tiny here. Yeah. We're looking for a good home out in the country for him. You'll take good care of him, won't you, Mr. Eggman? Of course I will. Yes, well, here's your money for the eggs. Now, let me get Tiny into your car. Hey, come on, nice doggy. <laughs> Gee, Unky wants to stay with you. He does? Uh, let me see. Oh, I know how we can get him to like you, Mr. Eggman. <clears throat> Suppose you tell me how you dispose of the livestock you raise on your farm. Why, with the pigs, I smoke ham, skewer bacon, grind sausage. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Now, you start toward the door. Uh, how about the cows? Oh, make chip beef, <laughs> smoked tongue, <laughs> and liver sausage. <laughs> hey, there, don't you down off me. I'm an old fellow. Here, Keep now. Keep it up, straight man. You made a friend for life. Leroy, open the door. Come on, honey. Don't stop. Head for the car. Go on. Hey, Leroy, open the door. Certainly peaceful around here since we became dogless. Hand me the newspaper, will you, Marjorie? Here you are, Uncle. Thanks. Uh, hmm. Local beauty to give kisses with each defense bond purchased. Well, I think I'll go downtown tomorrow and might buy a few bonds for investment purposes, of course. <laughs> What's this? To Marjorie, here's a picture of that dog, Tiny. Tiny? Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. There can't be two dogs that look that hungry. <laughs> Listen to this. Has anyone seen this dog? Lost, strayed, or stolen from the home of Cecil P. Upshaw, president of the Summerfield National Bank. A valuable young Saskatchewan moose hound. <laughs> reward offered for return. Oh, my goodness. Leroy! What is it, Mr. Ward? Look at this paper. That dog is tiny. 
We've got to get him back to Mr. Upshaw. Well, gee, yes, that reward. Forget the reward. You realize that a lot of people know we had that dog? We've got to return that reindeer spaniel before we're arrested for, for dog napping. Yeah? And we better go right out to the Eggman's farm and get him back. That's right. Then get your cap and coat. Where does he live? I don't know. Do you, Marge? The Eggman? No, no. He's been coming here every Thursday for the past ten years, but he never said where he lives. Uh, does anybody know his name? No, I don't. Neither do I. Well, come on anyway, Leroy. Okay, but where are we going? We'll just have to drag all the chicken coops in the countryside for that bird. The bird. That reminds me. Uh, Bertie? Yes, Mr. Gilsley? Do you know where the Eggman lives? Yes. Oh, fine. Where? On a chicken farm. It's... <laughs> I know that, but where? Do you happen to know his name? Oh, just a second. I think I have it right Well, here. that'll be a little help. Hey, don't forget your overcoat, Leroy. Oh, I found it, Mr. Gillsleeve. I just looked on the side of the carton of eggs he brought today. Ah, uh, that was using the old bean. Uh, what is his name? His name is Grade A Select. You... <laughs> I never saw such a narrow road in my life. Oh, look, Uncle Mort. Here comes a load of hay. Make a whip. Okay. I wish there was room for us to pass it. Yeah. All right, bossy. Uh, let us through the pasture, please, bossy. Well, shout up. That ain't no bossy. That's a bull. It is? Whoa. Gee, let's give up, Unc. Just this one barn, Leroy, then I'm willing to call it quits. Uh, hello in there. Needn't shout, mister. I'm right here. Oh, excuse me. Well, uh, what is it? Uh, we're looking for a man who... Why, it's you. Yeah, hello, Mr. Eggman. Yeah, you remember that dog we gave you this afternoon? That big dog named Tiny? <laughs> sure, sure. Well, we've got to have it back. That's right. There's been some mistake. And uh, now we must return it. I'm sorry, folks, but I can't do that. You can't? Why not? Because that there dog of yours picked up and ran away. That's why. Oh. <laughs> Leroy, it's after midnight. Try not to wake anybody, including me. What do you mean, Unc? I'm practically walking in my sleep. Oh, my tired. I certainly was one wild goose chase, Uncle Moore. Yeah, I know it, Leroy, and your poor, tired, weary old uncle apologizes. Skip it, Uncle. It was partly my fault. Leroy, if we wanted to stand here and blame ourselves, we'd never get to bed. Good night. Good night. Uh, I don't think I'll bother to take my clothes off. Just my overcoat and hat and shoes. Well, I haven't the strength to get the coat off, just the shoes and the hat. Won't hurt me to sleep in my hat for once. <laughs> or my shoes. It, what's that? Great jumping jeeps. Tiny's come home to roost. Come on, Tiny. Gee, Uncle Mort, Mr. Upshaw has a big place, hasn't he? Yes, very beautiful grounds, too. In just a second, I'll ask this gardener. I say, my good man, where can I find Mr. Cecil P. Upshaw? Hi, Mr. Upshaw. What can I do for you? Oh, excuse me. My name is Gildersleeve. Mm -hmm. I brought a dog that I think is yours. Uh, Leroy, bring Tiny here. Oh, there, Tiny. Take it easy. Yes. <laughs> Why, uh, it is my dog. Very good. Oh, thank you very much. Where's he been? That's too big a subject to go into now, brother. Someday I'm going to write a book about it. Why, you? Oh, shame on you. Yeah. What do you mean by running away from a <gasps> yeah. I'm greatly indebted to you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Please accept my sincerest thanks. Gee, Uncle, no reward. Uh, uh, quiet, Leroy. I didn't come here for any reward. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the reward of the newspapers. Uh, yeah. If you'll wait where you are, I'll be right back. Uh -huh. Come on, boys. Yeah. <laughs> goodbye, Tiny. Yes, goodbye, Tiny. Hey, Uncle, I wonder what the reward will be. Huh? I bet he'll give us a lot of money out of his bank. Oh, no, Leroy. The most you can ever expect from a bank is a new calendar. <laughs> I won't be surprised if we get one left over from 1941. I'm sorry I took so long, Mr. Gildersleeve, but here's your reward. Uh, what? Here, you come here, boy. Tell... What? <laughs> Did you mean that after all the trouble we had to bring oh. your blasted big beagle back, you're returning him to us? Oh, no, this isn't tiny. This is his sister, Tootsie. <laughs> oh! <laughs> get down, Tootsie. <laughs> Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. 
But right now, here's a timely New Year's resolution that's not hard to keep. And that's to cut down your food budget and do it in a very pleasant way. Here's how. Start using tomorrow. Delicious parquet margarine made by Kraft. Yes, using parquet margarine is one sure way to economize on food without sacrificing flavor or food value. You see, parquet margarine is no ordinary margarine. It's a delicious-tasting modern margarine that's rich in food elements your whole family needs. Yes, you'll like parquet's delicate, satisfying flavor, whether you use it at the table for pan-frying or as a flavor shortening for baking. And you'll appreciate the fact that parquet margarine is such a nourishing, wholesome energy food and a reliable year-round source of vitamin A. That's why economizing with parquet margarine is no hardship but a mighty pleasant way to cut down your food budget. So in 1942, resolve to try wholesome, nourishing parquet margarine, the modern margarine that tastes so good yet costs so little. But remember, don't just ask for margarine. Ask for parquet margarine, spelled P-A-R-K-A-Y. So, Marjorie, when we told Mr. Upshaw that we didn't want another dog, he gave us this. Oh, isn't that a beautiful basket of fruit? Yeah, it's got just about every kind you ever heard of. Yes, aren't those grapes luscious? Oh, and that pineapple, so ripe and ready to eat. Personally, I like the bananas the best. Yeah. All in all, it's the most beautiful calendar the Summerfield National Bank has ever put out. <laughs> Happy New Year, folks. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Each week at this time from Hollywood, California, Kraft presents Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, times like these call for real thrift. Yes, we must save money to buy defense bonds to help in any way we can. But we must be careful to economize wisely, especially when we economize on food, because the health and well-being that comes from nourishing food are vitally important, too. That's why delicious parquet margarine, the modern margarine made by Kraft, is a good thing to know about these days. First, parquet is so good-tasting, your family will want to spread it thick on toast, hot rolls, and bread. And parquet margarine is an economical source of food values important to a balanced diet. Parquet is a wholesome, nourishing food, one of the best sources of food energy there is. What's more, serving your family parquet margarine is a dependable way to give them vitamin A, because every pound of parquet contains 9,000 units of this important vitamin. So why not start serving parquet margarine tomorrow? It's perfectly delicious for table use and for baking and pan frying, too. Yes, you can economize wisely without sacrificing nourishment or flavor if you use parquet, spelled P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve. 
Yeah, Mr. Gillespie. I cut your extra large portion of roast on account of you must be extra hungry. Well, why should I be extra hungry, uh, Bertie? Because you didn't touch your soup or your salad. Uh. I know you. You saving up your appetite for the serious bills, the meat and the potatoes. <laughs> yes, uh, serious, the meat and potatoes. <laughs> well, to tell the truth, Bertie, I don't think I'll have any. Uh... Uh, you didn't fill up on hot dogs while you was out now, did you? Why, what a question. As if I would. Oh, you didn't, did you, Uncle Moore? Marjorie, do I look like a man who stuffed himself with a lot of sandwiches and soft drinks between meals? Well, Uncle Moore... Uh, I... Leroy, I was asking your sister Marjorie. <laughs> well... I can tell soon enough. Huh? If you eat your dinner properly, then the suspicions I, I am positive of now will prove to be completely erroneous to my total surprise and everlasting amazement. <laughs> now, Bertie, you're a wonderful cook. You've got a right to be proud of your work, but did it ever occur to you that there might be some other reason why I'm not eating my dinner? Such as, for instance, what? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's like this, uh, Yes, I've got it. Funny how I almost forgot. <laughs> Funny how you just remembered. Uh, uh, what is it, Mr. Gill, please? Well, I suppose I should have told you about this before, but I've gone on a diet. A diet? A diet, for heaven's sake. It was kind of sudden, wasn't it, Unc? Yes. No. It was one of my New Year resolutions. But this is the first you've mentioned it, Uncle Morton. New Year's was on Thursday. Oh, was it? Oh, yes, of course it was. <laughs> It always comes on Thursday, doesn't it? Oh, no, that's Thanksgiving. Yeah. Well, I've been thinking it over ever since I made this resolution, and I think I'll try it out for, uh, say, a day or so. Oh, you should try it out longer than that, Uncle Throckmorton. But suppose he gets hungry. Well, of course he'll get hungry. That's the purpose of a diet. Not this one. You see, the real reason... Uh, I'm Leroy, a... remember the old Chinese saying, small boy who talk big seldom get invited to basketball games second time. <laughs> Excuse me for standing here with this here plate of food in my hand, but is you on this diet or is you isn't? I is, Bertie. I mean, I am. I'm sorry. It's a delicious-looking dinner, but... Oh, well, you better uh... take it away, Bertie. We must do all we can to help Uncle Mort keep his resolution. Yes, and but I wish I knew more about this diet business ahead of time. It wouldn't have been necessary to practically ruin a perfectly lovely cow. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I think it's just grand of you to go on this diet, Uncle. Huh? And I'm going to do everything I can to help you stay on it. Oh, well, isn't that nice of you? <laughs> now, if you can't eat, at least you can smoke. You smoke? Hey, by George, you're right. And you haven't even started that box of cigars I got you for Christmas. Oh, yes, them. <laughs> Where are you going, Marjorie? I'll bring you those cigars. Oh, my goodness, Leroy. I received some horrible Christmas cigars in my day, but these are a new low. <laughs> It's the first time I've seen cigars made out of cigar coupons. Oh, gee, if you don't smoke them, she'll feel bad. If I do, I'll feel a lot worse. <laughs> I'm telling you, Leroy, a single whiff from one of those punk perfectos... Ah, back already, my dear? <laughs> Here they are, Uncle Mort. Uh? Oh, I just can't wait to see your eyes light up when you light up one of these cigars. <laughs> uh, it looks like it got a glow, Unc. <laughs> <laughs> well, to tell the truth, Margie, my dear, I... Uh, I also made a New Year's resolution to curtail my smoking. Oh, well, in that case, you can cut these in two. Uh, what? That way they'll last twice as long. Oh, uh, I, I better save them, Marjorie. I think I'll give up smoking altogether for the time being. That was a smart move, Uncle Mort. Yes. Yeah. Well, in that case, I'll just hide the box so you won't be tempted to take any. Oh, you needn't do that, my dear. I feel sure that they're strong enough to keep me at a safe distance. I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm strong enough to keep them at a safe distance, uh, it's saved by the bell. Oh, Bertie's busy in the kitchen. I'll get it. Yeah. Gee, Uncle, aren't you getting pretty deep with those New Year's resolutions? Well, Leroy, you talk as if I were insincere. Well, are you? Young man, that's neither here nor there. Well, look who's here. Judge Hooker. Oh, that old Judge. buffalo. Yeah. Just... See, I hope I haven't come butting into the middle of your dinner, Gildersleeve. Oh, no. In fact, Uncle Mort isn't having any dinner. You aren't, Gildy? What's the matter? Sick? No, I'm not sick. <laughs> going on a diet, Judge. Isn't that wonderful? I'd say it is. Why, do you realize that with Gildersleeve here on a diet, this country won't have to worry about a food shortage? <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. I'll bet you put on ladies' hats at parties, too. And not only that, Unc's given up smoking. Yeah. Oh, now, wait a minute. 
Don't you know, old man, that if you don't smoke, you're bound to eat more, and yes. if you go on a diet, you'll naturally smoke a lot? You just can't do both of them at once. Hey, I hadn't thought of that. Oh, the ordinary person might not be able to, but Uncle Mord is really a man of iron. Uh, who, me? Yes, you're just a little rusty, that's all. Ah, <laughs> oh, go on. Gildy couldn't keep a resolution like that any longer than Hitler can keep a promise. <laughs> is that so? Don't judge everybody by the way you judge yourself, Judge. Why, if I wanted to, I could stay on a vegetable diet and keep away from tobacco for uh, for a whole week. Yes, and lose ten pounds, too. Gildy, it's a good thing for you I'm on the Superior Court bench. Otherwise, I'd make some money betting you you couldn't. Oh, hiding behind your legal gown, eh? Well, it's lucky for you you're not betting. Why, how much would you put up? Uh, any amount of money. Fifty dollars? A hundred dollars. Uh, too bad you're afraid to bet, Judge. Who's afraid? I'll take you up. Yeah, but, but you can't do that. How would it look if anyone found out that a Superior Court judge was gambling? But this isn't gambling, Gildy. It's not? No, this is a sure thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you think, Judge. But here's what I, I'm going to take you to the cleaners. And it's a bet, huh? Yes, sir. No meats, no sweets and cigars, and ten pounds off in a week. Is that right? Right. Shake. Shake. Well, this is going to be the easiest hundred dollars I've ever picked up. Don't you think so, Leroy? Uh, don't you think so, Marjorie? Oh, my goodness, I should have got nods on this bed. <laughs> Good morning, Leroy. Good morning, Marjorie. Good morning, Bertie Lee Coggins. Better fix a great big breakfast for me. What'd you just say, Miss Gilfley? A uh, lovely day, isn't it? I've got an enormous appetite this morning. You better bring me three or four scrambled eggs and some bacon. Oh, no. I'm in more of a ham mood this morning. Whoa, damn, Mr. Gilfley. Haven't you forgotten something? Oh, yes, of course, some waffles. No, Uncle Mort. You've forgotten all about your diet. What? Oh, oh, yes. Well, I've changed my mind about that. But you can't, Unc. You bet Judge Hooker $100 you'd lose 10 pounds inside a week. Oh, yes, yeah, so I did. Well, I fixed a real non-fattening breakfast for you, Mr. Gilfleet. The non-fattening you have? What is it? A nice big glass of hot water and lemon juice. Yeah. <laughs> what a sour way to start the day. How did I ever get into this? But don't you remember, I... Be quiet, Leroy. <laughs> Never mind breakfast, Bertie. I'm going to drive downtown and get to work. But I intend using the car this morning, Uncle Moore. You? What am I supposed to do, walk? Well, of course. The exercise is going to help you lose that ten pounds. It's exercise? But I can't walk all the way downtown, especially on an empty stomach. Oh, yes, you can, Mr. Gilfleet. You just keep your coat buttoned and nobody will notice it. Yeah. <laughs> That walk down here sure made me hungry. Uh, oh, Miss? Uh, miss? Uh, good morning. Do you wish for some breakfast? Yes, I want a lot of breakfast. I want half a grapefruit, a baked apple, a breakfast steak, uh, not too small, and some potatoes. Uh, what kind? Hash brown, french fried, and mashed? Yes. Yes, which? Yes, all three. <laughs> I want some cooked cereal, hot cakes, a pair of eggs, sunny side up, toast and coffee. You got it? Uh, yes, sir. On the number two breakfast? Yes, on the number two breakfast. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, but all that doesn't come down on the number two breakfast. Yes. You could have it on the number six breakfast, except it comes cheap a la carte. Oh, look, God. Well, all right, let me have it any way I can get it, just so it's quick. And, miss, Yes. Uh, bring me a glass of hot water and lemon juice. Put it down right here in front of me so I can sneer at it. Yes, sir. <laughs> hmm, some people. Uh-huh. Uh, I hope she hurries. My stomach feels like an Arizona rain barrel in July. I'm telling you, for the last time, Irwin, not another dollar until... Hello. What are you doing here, Gildersleeve? What? Uh, oh, hello, Judge Hooker. Well, I never expected to see you here. I bet you didn't. What are you doing here? Well, I uh, just dropped in for... Uh, uh, let me see. Oh, yes, uh, for a glass of hot water and lemon juice. Oh, uh, well... Gildersleeve, I want you to meet my brother-in-law, Erwin Pidge. Who? Erwin, this is Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. The pleasure's all mine. Yes, indeed. <laughs> well, uh, don't let me detain you. I'll see you soon, Judge. What are you so nervous about, Gildy, old pal? Uh, who, me? Oh, I'm not nervous. Not a bit, not a bit, not a bit. Oh, yes, you are. Otherwise, why are you putting salt on your finger? If what? Oh, I thought it was celery. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, you're a case, Gildy. Uh, Isn't he, Erwin? Yeah, he acts as if he's got a guilty conscience. <laughs> you kid, John? 
guilty conscience. It is what is known as a play on words. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> we know, Irwin. Say, you are acting rather suspicious, Doc Morton. Uh, who, me? Yes, you. Uh, you're not trying to cover up something like going off that diet and losing the bet, are you? Why, Judge Hooker, how can you think of a thing like that? Uh, excuse me, mister. How do you have it? Rare, medium, or well done? Uh, oh, uh, uh, bring me the lemon juice and water. Well done, please. Oh, but I didn't mean the lemon juice and water. I meant the... Oh, lemon... yes, the toast. Well, I'll have mine rare, yes. Now run along, girl, and tell the chef. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Gildersleeve, this looks mighty fishy. Now, Judge. I'd like to stick around a while and see just what you have ordered. And now, Judge. However, I'd be late for court, so I have to leave. Now, Judge? Yeah. <laughs> Bye, Gildersleeve. Uh, goodbye, Hooker. Come on, Erwin. Yeah. Oh, say, there's an idea. Oh, me? Yes, you. I got a job for you, Irwin. Stick around with Gildersleeve here for the next few days. Now, wait a minute. What's the big idea? I want Irwin here to see that you stick to the terms of our bet. But, but Judge, don't you trust me? Well... Then why waste Irwin's valuable time? Oh, he hasn't anything else to do, have you, Irwin? Not until a baseball season starts anyways. Oh, uh, are you a player? No, nah, but I'm a sort of celebrity in my own right. Oh. Hey, did you ever go out to the ballpark and hear the guy who sits over near third base and yells, throw that bum out? Oh, is that you? No. I'm the guy what sits in back of him and yells down, shut up, you louse. <laughs> You stay around Mr. Gildersleeve for the next few days, Erwin. And remember, if he smokes or goes off his vegetable diet, that means he loses his bet. Yes. Okay, Judge, I'll keep my eye on him. You can rest insured. Yes, yes. <laughs> Bye, Gildy. Watch your step now, or that hundred smackers is mine. Yes. Hey, he's a great guy to judge. The salt of the earth. The very salt. Yes. Hey, what's so great about the salt of the earth, anyway? Uh, so, so, well, sit down, Irwin. I'll try to explain. Yeah. Salt of the earth. You see, oh. in ancient times... Uh, excuse me, please. Here you are. Oh, oh, no. Uh, that's not for me, lady. Uh, this is all for my friend here. All I want is this glass of hot water and lemon juice. Uh, don't I? <laughs> uh, pitch in, Irwin. For me? Say, I'm going to like this job. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Gildersleeve, but I still don't get it. What's so extra special about the salt of the earth? Uh, look, Irwin, you followed me around for two days, haven't you? Yeah, two days and two nights. And during most of that time, I've tried to explain it to you, haven't I? Uh-huh. And you still don't understand, do you? Uh-uh. Yes. Well, let's skip it. It's a mere bag of tell. Oh, that's a good one. What's that? Well, it's French, and it means... Irwin, wouldn't you be happier in some cozy, warm pool room? Oh, no, I like being with you. It reminds me of the time I was a deputy sheriff. Yes. Oh, you were a deputy sheriff. Mm. The judge's influence, no doubt. Yeah. I used it to take prisoners up to the state pen until I had my accident. Oh, you had an accident. Mm. What happened? Well, one of the prisoners stole my badge and had me locked up. Yes. <laughs> hey, where are you going now, Mr. Gildersleeve? I'm going right here to the YMCA. Mm. I'm thinking of taking some reducing exercises. You want to wait outside? No, I'll come along with you. Uh, I was afraid of that. Oh, look, they got a pool table. Yeah. Oh, maybe I can promote myself a game, huh? Yes, sir, and maybe you can. You stick around here while I go into the gymnasium. Hey, say, fellas, how about letting me join you? All right, class, all right. All together now. A one, a two, a right, a left, a shut, the door, a what do you want? Seven, a eight, a come on, speak up. I came to see about my weight, a down, up, a straight, a stoop. Why don't you join our fat men's group? Uh, now, see here, mister, I'm not that fat, and I didn't come here to be insulted. Goodbye. A one, a two, huh? a three, a four. You're going out the wrong door. Uh, what do you mean? Now, now, fast, the boys, don't get me. Dolly, why, sir, that door is in the alley. It, it does? Well, splendid. Now I can dodge a pest that's been bothering me. A one, a two, goodbye to you. Uh, free at last. Now for the nearest cigar store. 
Hey, Mr. Gillis, please, stay away from me. Oh, jumping jeep, sir. <laughs> Say, this is just like being a deputy sheriff again. Yeah. <laughs> Erwin, weren't you playing pool? With them guys... They was playing for matches. Yes. <laughs> hey, n- now tell me, what's with the salt that you ate? What makes it better like the salt that a sea for instance? Yeah. Excuse me, Miss Marge, but I fixed Mr. Gill sleeves dinner. An imitation porterhouse steak made out of roasted peanuts and dandelion greens. You think he'll eat it? Oh, I don't know, Bertie. What does it taste like? Tastes like roasted peanuts and dandelion greens. <laughs> oh, poor Uncle Mort. I think he'd break down and cry if we could slip him a pork chop when that Irwin wasn't looking. Gee, I wish this whole business was over. Uncle Mort isn't any fun anymore. When he isn't groaning and complaining, he's mad at everybody or, or trying to tear the telephone book in two. Well, I tried to get Mr. Gillsleeve to give up that uh, diet he hid, but he's stubborner than a balky mule caught in a tar pit on a hot afternoon. Why, that man, oh, there he is now. Everybody take to the cyclone cellar. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hello, Bertie. How are you, my boy? And Marjorie. You're even more beautiful than usual, my dear. Uh-oh, something's wrong. Yeah, huh? Jill, do you feel all right? Yes. yes. Maybe you'd like to rest a while, Uncle Moore. Nonsense. I never felt better. You know what happened? That Irwin, who's been shadowing me, had to go home. He's got a stomach ache. Yeah, now, maybe I can have a decent meal at last. Well, thank goodness. I've just been itching to fix you some nutriment that don't taste like sawdust. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now I can throw that imitation steak and fix you a real good one. Yeah, that's right. And some biscuits and jam. And a hunk of pie. And hurry up, Bertie. Yes, yeah, sir. I'm going. Yeah. I better catch the door on the way. Yeah. Oh, hello. Yeah, hurry up, Bertie. Uh, yes, Mr. Gill, please. I'm going to get you that roast peanut and dandelion green steak right now. Yeah, Bertie, what do you mean? we got a visitor, and it's Judge Hooker. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, hello there, Gildersleeve. Yeah. Irwin phoned me. He was too sick to stay with you, so I came right over myself. Why, Judge? Because I have a sneaking suspicion that you're responsible for Irwin's stomach ache. Whoa. Look out, Uncle Moore. Here comes another sled. Yeah, yeah. We uh, better get over to the other side of the road, Leroy. Yeah. Gee, they got a horse to pull theirs. Yes, I wish we had. You getting tired, Uncle? Oh, no, I, I can... <laughs> I can go on a while, Leroy. Oh, boy, I think this is fun. Yes, you would. <laughs> but to tell the truth, I, I don't think I'm going to lose any weight this way unless I freeze it off. What's the matter, Uncle Cole? Not any longer, Leroy. I'm, I'm numb. <laughs> I hope I'll be able to get my nose defrosted. Wait till we get to the top of this hill, Uncle Mort. It'll be keen sliding down. Well, I, I don't know if we're going to get to the top, my boy. This sled is a pretty heavy load. Oh, no, it isn't, Uncle. Oh, yes, it is. How about us two changing places? But why? Well, I feel sort of funny sitting on this sled while you pull me all the way up the hill. <laughs> There you are, waitress. Have you brought everything I ordered? Uh, yes, sir. Here it is. Uh, Cream of mushroom soup. It's good. Lobster salad. Mm, um, Filet of sole. Yes, with marjorie sauce. Chicken a la king. My favorite fowl. Uh, baked potatoes. Yeah, big ones, too. Artichoke. Artichoke. And black bottom pie with whipped cream. Oh, boy. Say, how about the cream corn? Oh, right here, sir. Uh, at last. For the first time in days, I'll really be able to give my bicuspids a romp. <laughs> And am I going to make up for all those meals I've been missing? Huh? What's that? Uh, who's there? Uncle Mort! Uncle Mort, wake up! What? It, where am I? You're still in bed and it's half past nine already. Get up, Uncle Mort! <laughs> oh, Leroy, why did you have to knock at that moment? I was just about to have a dream of a dinner. <laughs> big box for, Uncle Mort. Oh, that's a steam cabinet, Marjorie. What you gonna steam, Unc? Me. <laughs> I'm gonna lose that ten pounds if I have to poach myself parboiled. Well, I'd, be, I'd be careful if I were you, Uncle. Oh, it's so simple. Leroy could operate it. Gee, can I? In a moment. 
Now run along, Marjorie, while we try it out. All right, but don't try to lose too much at once, Uncle. Yeah. How much weight have you lost so far, Uncle? Well, I don't know quite for sure, Leroy. These bathroom scales have such small figures, it's hard to read from where I stand. <laughs> What do you mean, Leroy? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, my chest does get in the way a little. <laughs> Why don't you step on the scales now and I'll read the figures? Oh, a capital idea, Leroy. Yeah. <laughs> Careful. Stand still now. Yeah? There, it, it reads 213. Oh, my goodness. I've taken on weight, not off. Are you sure? If sure, I'm sure. Here, hold my robe, Leroy. I'm getting into this steam box right now. Yeah. Now, now, please turn that knob on the side, Leroy. Like this? Yeah. Uh, I can feel the weight dropping off already. Uh, turn it on some more, Leroy. Okay. <laughs> it's foggy, isn't it? What? <laughs> what? Don't, don't turn it on anymore. I can't hear you. What did you say? <laughs> it don't turn it on any more. Oh, more. Oh. <laughs> now, stop, Leroy. It feels like I'm on fire. Fire? Okay. Oh, not fire. Stop it, stop it. Hey, what's the trouble, Uncle? What's cooking? I am. <laughs> it's turned down the steam. I can't. It's so foggy, I can't find the door. Uh, open the door and let me out. Where are they? I can't see anything. If you hurry up, Leroy, I'm roasting. Do something. Oh, gee, wait, what do I do? Get a plumber? No, get a doctor. <laughs> I never heard of such foolishness in all my experience. Yes, Doctor. A man your size and shape, Gildersleeve, trying to boil himself down to skin and bones. I did? And you, Judge Hooker, trying to gamble your friend's health away. I'm sorry. I never thought it would come to this. Why, as a result of this foolish wager, Mr. Gildersleeve is not only suffering from malnutrition, nervous exhaustion, and anemia, but also from blisters. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I wish I'd never made that bet. Would it make you feel any better if I called it off, Gildy, old man? It would it. That's the nicest thing that's happened to me in a week. And it's mighty sporting of you, Judge Hooker. Right. And better rest now, Gildersleeve. I'll be back tomorrow. Yeah. Come on, Judge. All right. Goodbye, Throckmorton. I'll phone to find out how you're getting along. Yeah, thanks, Judge. Goodbye, Doc. Goodbye. Goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Leroy. Yes, Uncle Mort. How are you feeling? Much better. The judge just canceled our bet. Gee, that means you saved a hundred dollars. Yes. But I still can't understand why I gained weight. I dieted and exercised. I didn't smoke. And yet I went up from 225 when I began to 230 now. Oh, no, no, you don't weigh 230. I said 213. What? You mean I lost 12 pounds? Where's that Judge Hooker? Wait till I get my hands on that little welcher. I'll kill him. <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But first, these days it's more important than ever to know the facts about the foods you buy. So here are a few facts about parquet margarine, made by Kraft, so you can judge its goodness yourself. First, parquet margarine is a wholesome vegetable margarine, made of refined American vegetable oils that are highly nutritious and rich in energy value. These oils give parquet margarine its wholesome nourishment and make it one of the best energy foods you can serve. Another thing, parquet margarine is a reliable year-round source of vitamin A. Now, that's important. It means that summer and winter, there are always 9,000 units of vitamin A in every pound of parquet, and never less. As for parquet margarine's flavor, one taste will tell you how delicate and appetizing it is. Kraft, of course, is famous for fine-tasting foods, and parquet is no exception. Yes, thousands of housewives have found that parquet is the margarine with the delicious flavor, Grand for table use and for cooking, because it tastes so downright good. Now, nourishing and good tasting as parquet margarine is, it's economical, too. So surely you should try it. Tomorrow, ask for parquet margarine. Just say parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. <laughs> I'm so 
so glad you've given up all those nasty old resolutions. Yes, yeah, so am I, Marjorie. Now, I've got a surprise for you. A surprise you have? Well, I love surprises. All right. Close your eyes. Yeah, like this? Yes. Now, open your mouth. Uh, like that? Yes. Now, close it again. Yes. What's this? One of the cigars I gave you for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> now, you can smoke as many as you want. Isn't that dandy? Good night, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> at this time from Hollywood, California, Kraft presents Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, times like these call for real thrift. Yes, we must save money to buy defense bonds to help in any way we can. But we must be careful to economize wisely, especially when we economize on food, because the health and well-being that comes from nourishing food are vitally important, too. That's why delicious parquet margarine, the modern margarine made by Kraft, is a good thing to know about these days. First, parquet is so good tasting, your family will want to spread it thick on toast, hot rolls, and bread. And parquet margarine is an economical source of food values important to a balanced diet. Parquet is a wholesome, nourishing food, one of the best sources of food energy there is. What's more, serving your family parquet margarine is a dependable way to give them vitamin A because every pound of parquet contains 9,000 units of this important vitamin. So why not start serving parquet margarine tomorrow? It's perfectly delicious for table use and for baking and pan frying, too. Yes, you can economize wisely without sacrificing nourishment or flavor if you use parquet, spelled P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve, who has, as you know, a nephew named Leroy, who has, as you probably don't know, four rabbits, named respectively Eeny, Meeny, Miney, and possibly Mo. Right now, they are preparing to go to Fairview, where Leroy is to represent his school at the Junior Rabbit Breeder Show, and all six of them are quite hopped up about the trip. <laughs> Now, take it easy, Leroy. Just be calm, like me. No use getting all excited about this. Not at all. Where's my briefcase? Under your arm, Monk. What? Oh, oh, yes. How did it ever get there? Now, about my suitcase. Uh, handkerchiefs, socks, birdie. Yes, Miss Gilsey. Uh, never mind. I found them. Found what, Miss Gilsey? His socks. Well, where found them? I found them. Well, why should you? They're right there all the time. Yes, yes, I know. He found them. Then why call me? Because I couldn't find them. But I thought you said... Oh, that. never mind. <laughs> Yeah, my goodness, anybody think we'd never gone any place before. Well, it's pretty exciting for me, Uncle Morse. Baby, 300 miles. Jeepers. Leroy, you talk like you'd been chained up in the coal cellar all your life. <laughs> Didn't you fly to California and back last year? Well, sure, Unc. Yes, son. We automotored all over the 47 states two years ago. If there are 48 states, Bertie. Yes, I know that. But when we was in Florida, they never heard of California. And when we was in California, the Viper was personal. <laughs> Well, anyway, Leroy, you've done a great deal of traveling for a boy your age, and another 300 miles shouldn't mean any more than going down to the corner on Saturday morning for the Sunday morning papers. But creepers, Uncle Mort, we're going on the train. I've never been on a train. Oh, my goodness, modern youth. 
Why, when I was just a baby, I can't seem to find my military brushes. Where are they, Bertie? I put them in your happy rock bag, Mr. Gill, please. In my what? Bertie, could you perchance mean Gladstone bag? Yeah, that's it. Yes, happy rock. Well, I guess that's it. Hey, wait a minute. Uh, Leroy. Yes, Uncle? Uh, did you mail that letter I gave you last night? Oh, uh, Which letter? Oh, well, yes, of course I did. Uh, good. It was to Cousin Flora, telling her and her husband we're coming to stay with them while we're in Fairview. <laughs> Won't they be surprised? Why? <laughs> Why, Uncle Mort? Well, because it's an answer to a letter they sent, fishing around for an invitation to visit us. <laughs> good thing they ain't coming this week with Miss Marge out of town at that Red Cross training school. Yes. Well, are you sure you've got everything you need, Leroy? Positive. Say, if you're going to be on that train when it leaves, you better get mobilized. Where's your rabbits, Leroy? Out in the hall in that wooden box. The manual training class built it especially for them. Well, they did a bum job, Leroy. That box is full of holes. If holes? Well, that's so the little creatures won't get asphyxiated, Bertie. Yes, but it'll help them breathe, too. <laughs> uh, shall I call up and get you a taxi? Uh, taxi? No, thank you, Bertie. We can pick up one at the drugstore. If we can't, it'll be the first thing I haven't been able to get at that drugstore. <laughs> Come on, Leroy, let's get going. Okay, Unc. So long, Bertie. Don't let any Japs get you. <laughs> Quit picking on us South Sea folks, Leroy. <laughs> hey, come on, young man. I'll take the suitcases. You bring that crate of clover crunches. If Marjorie gets back to town before we do, Bertie, you tell her where we went. Yes, sir. I'll tell her that you had to act as a convoy for a bunch of dumb bunnies. And then she'll say... <laughs> Never mind. I know what you say. Goodbye. Goodbye, Bertie. Bye, Miss Gilsey. Bye, Leroy. I hope we haven't forgotten anything, Uncle Morris. Have you got the tickets? Yeah, the tickets. Don't be ridiculous. Oh, tickets. Oh, wait a minute. I better look to make sure. Yes, here's the envelope. Yo, Great Caesar's ghost. What's wrong, Uncle Morris? Look, here's my letter to Cousin Flora. I must have sent her the railroad tickets. <laughs> oh, now she'll think I want her and that loud husband of hers to come here. Oh, gee, now how are we going to get to Fairview? Does this mean we're not going? Now, wait a minute. Don't rattle me, Leroy. Don't rattle me. If... No time to get reservations. Uh, the next train uh, won't get this there in time. Oh, for what a thick head I turned out to be. So, Uncle, how about driving? Yes, it's driving me. Uh, wait a minute. Driving? Why, of course. Let's get the car. Come on. We can put the rabbits in the rear compartment, load up on gasoline, and beat the train to Fairview. That was a fine suggestion. You're a bright boy, Leroy. <laughs> Gee, I don't know about that, Uncle. I just suggested myself out of my first ride on a railroad train. <laughs> Uh, how far is it to the next town, Leroy? Well, according to the sign we passed ten miles ago, it's three miles. Yeah. While according to the map, it's six. Yeah. But according to all the houses around here, we're almost there. Yeah. Thank goodness. I hope the road gets better from here on. So far, it's been terrible. It's had more hairpins than a dime store. And what's more, it's full of charley holes. Don't you mean chuck holes, Uncle Morris? Yes, but this is a road I don't want to become familiar with, Leroy. <laughs> yeah, we haven't hit a straight stretch for hours. That's right. For every mile forward that we go, we travel two from side to side and three up and down. This isn't a road, it's a Laconga line. <laughs> Why, when I think of... Oh! Oh! Ah, we almost went in the ditch that time. Why don't you try driving in the ditch? It might be smoother. Yes. <laughs> Leroy, this is no time to horse around. Well, if there was a horse around, I'd trade it in for this car. <laughs> kind of hungry. Hungry? Well, so am I. Strange how much exercise you can get just bouncing up and down, isn't it? Let's stop and eat at the next stop and eat. It's all right. That place up ahead doesn't look bad. However, we're so far behind schedule, let's just get some sandwiches to eat along the way. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Come on, Leroy. I'm right with you, Unc. Oh, my. And to think if we hadn't mailed those tickets... We'd have been sitting in a comfortable train, counting the telephone poles instead of dodging them. <laughs> yeah. Let's sit here at the counter, eh? Uh, Tired, Uncle Mort? It's just my eyes, Leroy. Funny, I'd swear I was seeing gravy spots in front of them. That's easy, Uncle. You're looking at the waiter's apron. Yeah? <laughs> oh, of course, yeah, that's it. Uh, what'll you have, Leroy? A ham sandwich. Uh, same thing for me, waiter, and we'll take them with us. Say, look, they've got cherry pie, Leroy. Would you care for a slice? No, thanks, Unc. After that road we were on, I couldn't stand anything else with pits in it. Yes. <laughs> uh, how long did it take you to drive from Fairview, Mr. Toby? Oh, about seven hours, McGuire. 
this rate, I should be in Summerfield by 10 o'clock tonight. Uh, excuse me, gentlemen, but I couldn't help overhearing that last remark. Uh, don't count on getting to Summerfield by 10 o'clock tonight, sir. No, why not? Because these blasted roads are in a blasted condition. Oh, you don't like our roads, eh? Huh? Hey, now, McGuire, take it easy. What's wrong with our roads? What is it? And you take it easy, too, mister. Don't get angry at me just because I warned you about that collection of bumpy ruts ahead of you. I accept that as a personal insult, sir. Huh? Gee whiz, is it your road? Well, I'm the superintendent of road maintenance for this section, and this is State Highway Commissioner Toby. Yeah? What am I supposed to do, get out of my hands and knees and bump my head on the floor? What? If you think I'm going to back up and crawl, Commissioner, you're mistaken. I've done all my backing up and crawling for the day on that blankety-blank road of yours this afternoon. Say, I don't like your attitude, and I don't like your highway. <laughs> Looks like it was surveyed through the bottom of a beer bottle. <laughs> yes, and built by a hillbilly with the hiccups. <laughs> now, look here, you're doing Mr. McGuire an injustice. Yeah. He and his men have been constructing that road for the past six years. I know that. I saw the signs all along the way. Slow men at work. <laughs> Well, that's enough. I'm going to hand this guy a face full of fists. Let me yeah, in. Yeah, uh, Oh, here's our sandwiches, Leroy. <laughs> Mister, you're mighty lucky we're in a hurry. Uh, come on, Leroy, let's stop tearing down the commissioner's highway and start tearing down the commissioner's highway. <laughs> okay, I'm done coming. Gee, you certainly told him off, didn't you? Yeah, did you see the look on that guy, McGuire's face? Well, ain't you going to finish your stay, Commissioner? No, the mood's gone. I, I might as well get started. Oh, waiter, the check. No, 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 no. Uh, let me pay for it. No, no, no. Yes. Well, all right. <laughs> hey, uh, waiter, keep the change. Now, Commissioner, don't let that big blimp get your goat. What does a mug like that know about the heartaches of building roads? Yes, you're right, Squire. Say, I thought I parked my car about here. Are you sure? I think so. I remember it was near this truck. It... Oh, uh, here it is, Commissioner. That's strange. Could someone have moved it? Hey, hold on a minute, Mac. That isn't my car. It ain't. It certainly looks like it. Sure, it's same make, same model, same color, but those aren't my official license plates. Hey, that's right. Oh, now I wonder who could have been so chuckle-headed as to pull a trick like this. <laughs> Brock Morton P. Gildersleeve. What do you mean? What are you talking about? That's the name of the bird that owns this car. Here's his registration certificate. Well, we've got to get that car of mine back, McGuire. We've got to send out a police warning over the radio to the highway patrol. Sure, Commissioner. We'll get it back all right. You needn't worry or get excited. You don't understand. There's been a rock slide on the road near Summerfield and an emergency, and I've got a hundred pounds of explosives in the rear compartment of my car. <laughs> You notice how much more pep the car seems to have now, Leroy? I really get a bang out of driving a car with oomph. Yeah, careful of that bump, Unc. Huh? Yes. Oh, <laughs> quite a bounce, wasn't it? I can't get over how much better the car runs. If it keeps up like this, it'll feel as if we had wings, Leroy. <laughs> Hold on, here comes Kerr. Oh. Yeah. You better go easy on those tires, Unc. Huh? Remember, you can't get any new ones until the FBI investigates you and finds out you're an ambulance or something. Yes. <laughs> well, these tires are good for thousands of miles yet, Leroy. Oh. Hey, these roads. I hope that didn't hurt any of our little cottontail cuties in the rear there. <laughs> well, I guess they're well padded. <laughs> yeah, I can hear the box bouncing up and down. You can? Maybe I better get it and hold it in my lap. No, no, don't do that. They'll be happier if they don't get a look at this road. Besides... Look out for that red lantern. What red lantern? Oh, that red lantern. Oh. <laughs> no wonder I couldn't see it. A big pile of dirt behind it, Leroy. Well, here's the end of the detour. Now I'm really going to hit it up. At Leroy. Yes, Uncle Mort? I want you to keep a sharp lookout and back. If you see any highway patrol cars with red lights flashing and cops in them, you just nudge me. Understand? Yes, Uncle Mort. Yeah, good. Now, I don't expect to get... Oh, Leroy, don't bump me. That wasn't a bump, Unc. That was a nudge. Nudge? It's, oh, my goodness. Yes, now I can see him. i better stop, me. Eh? I can't imagine what in the world I've done. Well, Uncle Mort, I have an idea. Be quiet, young man. Oh, here they come. Uh, uh, good evening, boys. Good evening, Chief. Chief? Shh, he thinks I'm an Indian. <laughs> uh, uh, what can I do for you, boys? Just stay where you are, sir. We'll have the fire out in a minute. Yes, Fire? Just one of your rear brakes. 
Bring me that extinguisher, Mike. Oh. Here you are, Sid. Any button you coat, it's the commissioner. Uh, thanks. Yes, uh, say, uh, what's going on back there, boy? Uh, nothing to get excited about, Chief. One of the brakes must have locked. Oh, oh, my goodness. It's lucky you put it out before it got to that box of rabbits. I better look to see how they are, Uncle. Uh, no, Leroy. They're probably sleeping. Let's let sleeping rabbits lie. I don't think any harm was done. You'll just watch your brakes for a ways, Chief. Well, thank you very much, boys. Anytime I can do anything for you, I uh, got a card here someplace. Oh, we know who you are. Oh, you do? Well, I never knew I was that famous. Sure, you're a big man in this state. Sid, he'd be a big man in any state. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I gotta be getting along now. Goodbye, boys. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, sir. Now, there's the genuine guy, the commissioner. Yeah. Don't act no different than you and me. You or I, Sid. Huh. Uh, you know, he's a lot better looking than his pictures do him justice. Yeah. <laughs> but don't you think he's a little fatter? No, not fatter, Sid. Heavier setter. <laughs> you see, fatter isn't a respectful way to describe a state commissioner. Yeah, but on him it looks good. Well, let's get into the heap and start rolling again. Yeah. Attention all highway patrol. Hey, listen. Be on lookout for large gray sedan, license 4X669. That number's familiar. A state car assigned to Highway Commissioner Toby. Oh, the guy that was just here. Taken from Junction Grill an hour ago by a stout man and a small boy with a black mustache. A small... <laughs> a small boy with a black mustache... Hey, that's the guy who... Why, that fat rat... Handle situation with care, boys. Rear end of car is loaded with explosives. Come on, Mike. Let's go get him. Yeah. There they are. Right up ahead. Get closer. Hey, what are you doing? Shooting at the rear tire. Hey, wait a minute. That car's full of explosives. Oh, my gosh. Don't get too close, Mike. Okay, I'll drop back. Well, what do we do? Say, look at him go. Let's trail him till he slows up. If he slows up before he blows up. Well, we've been making good time, my boy. I thought we'd better stop here in Millville and get some gasoline. Where is that attendant? I think I'll get out and take a look at the rabbits, Uncle Moore. Yeah, that's a good idea. That road was so rough, I bet those hairs stood on end. <laughs> oh, say, Leroy, uh, the police chaps again. All right, stick them up, you two. Hey, it's first, you know, stick them up. Oh, hello, boys. Practicing? Get them up quick, fatso. If that's all. Say, what's the idea? You two, get them up. Now, search them, Mike. Yep, here, 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 here. You needn't be so rough. You've broken a couple of my cigars. Well, they haven't got any guns on them, Sid. Okay, you can put down your hands. But don't pull any funny business, you two. What's the meaning of this unwarranted outrage? Hey, get him. Yes. That's what we did, did we? You stole the highway commissioner's car and it's loaded with explosives. Yes. What's this about the commissioner's car? Take a peek at those official license plates. Huh? Yes. Well, gee, Unc, how did they get there? They were framed. I mean, we were framed, Leroy. <laughs> Well, at least there's nothing to this explosive nonsense. You officers can look in the rear compartment and see for yourselves. Okay, take a look, Sid. Uh, sure. Won't he be surprised, Leroy? Ah. <laughs> uh-huh. You see, it's just rabbits, officer. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Come here, Mike. Does this look like rabbits to you? No, nah, to me it looks like a case of explosives. Well, if you were a rabbit and went through what we've been through, you'd feel like exploding yourself. <laughs> Why don't you come back here and look for yourself? Yes, come on. Let's show these stupid... Oh, my goodness, Leroy. Uncle, what you trembling like that for? Uh, look at that box. It's blasting powder. If, whose car is this? Who slipped it to me? How did that dynamite get in there? That's what we aim to find out, brother. Good. Who we ask? You. If me? <laughs> yes, come on. Say, where are you taking us? To the Millville police station. You're going to hold a little quiz, kid. Yes, sir. <laughs> there must be a reasonable explanation for all this. Captain, will you telephone our home in Summerfield so that our maid can identify us? Now, just keep your shirt on, Stuffy. Yep. I put in a call a few minutes ago. I bet that's it now. Oh, thank goodness. Bertie will clear this right up, Leroy. Hello. Hello. Who's this calling? Uh, long distance from Millville. Oh, I know the answer to that one. It sure is. <laughs> uh, this is the police department. Uh, we're holding a man with a stolen car loaded with explosives. He claims to be uh, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Uh, Mr. Gildersleeve ain't in Millville. He done took the train for Fabview today. Oh, 
He took the train, huh? The train? Who? I've got to tell her about that. Let me talk. Get away from this phone. Uh, this man claims he drove this car as far as Junction City. Oh, that can't be. Mr. Gilsleeve's car's resting right here in the garage. Ah. Well, in that case, I was right all along. Uh, sorry I troubled you. Goodbye. Hey, goodbye. Wait a minute. Well, why did you hang oh, up? Oh, look, you. I've had enough of this. Who do you think you are trying to run things and act so insolent and arrogant? The police? Yeah. Huh? Uh, Mike, put these two in separate cells till morning. Here, here. What's going on here? Oh, hello, Commissioner Toby. Uh, well, I recovered your car for you, sir. Yes, I know. Where's the man who took it? Uh, here I am. Uh, hello, Commissioner. <laughs> oh, so it was the little critic of the state highway system, the uh, little road runner down there. Oh. Well, I'm only thankful nothing happened to my car with all that blasting powder in the back. Yes. What do you mean by letting me carry dangerous explosives? Oh, dry up, you big wet blanket. Oh, sir. You ought to be thankful you're getting out of this mess without going to jail. You mean you don't want him held, Commissioner? No, this man just made an innocent mistake. It was stupid, but I don't think it was intentional. Uh, Come on outside, Gildersleeve, and we'll trade cars. Yes, all right. Hey, good night, Captain. Thanks for the hospitality. Yeah, something he ate, no doubt. (laughs) After you, Commissioner. Come on, Leroy. Say, I better make sure my rabbits are all right. Oh, don't worry. They're safe, my boy. Oh, uh, did you have a look at them? I'll say I did, and they jumped right out of the box and escaped. Escaped? Uh, and now, don't worry. We called out a road gang and rounded them all up again. Oh. Took the best part of two hours. Gee, I hope nothing happened to them. Now, now, they're all right. None the worse for the little romp. They're in fine condition, all seven of them. Yes. Seven? But, but we only had four rabbits to begin with. Commissioner, you found too many. <laughs> Hello, operator. Quick, give me the police department. Police? This is 747 Parkside Avenue, and something's happened here. Didn't you phone me about a man who said he was Mr. Gillsleeve in a stolen car? Well, some policemen did. Well, anyhow, I went back to bed, and I tossed, and I turned, and I turned, and I... Okay, okay, I'll get to the point. I got up, and I went out to the garage to see if it was there, and it wasn't. No, no, the garage was there all right, but nothing else was. <laughs> uh, what do you mean, be more pacific? Oh, well, somebody sneaked in and stole all of Mr. Gilsey's four beautiful, brand new retreads. <laughs> uh, hello, wait a minute, I ain't through yet. At the time these tires were stolen, they was attached to Mr. Gilsey's automobile. <laughs> Leroy, quit pinching me. What's the big idea? I'm afraid you'll fall asleep. Yeah, well, don't worry. If I want to sleep, I'll pull over to the side of the road. Yeah, but the trouble is you'll pull over after you've fallen asleep. Oh, yes. Why, George, it's two in the morning. I'd stop right now. It would make us late for that rabbit. What's that noise? Well, it, it looks like a cop, huh? Another cop? Yeah, the police have been on my neck tonight like a muffler. Well, this time they can't find anything wrong. I'm driving under 40. My lights are all right. It's my own car. All right, pull over to the side of the road. Oh, yeah. Pull over, Leroy. Jeepers, I wonder what it is now. It's probably some officer who hadn't heard that everything's been straightened out between Commissioner Toby and me. You know, I'm beginning to be afraid of cops. Oh, poppycock. You watch me handle this fellow. I'll get rid of him inside of two minutes. Oh, yeah? Yeah, two minutes. You can time me, Leroy. <laughs> You can't hold us any longer, officer. We've been here for two hours already. Two and a half, Unc. I'm still timing you. Yes. <laughs> but look, officer, and you too, Captain. Here, here, Captain. Wake up when I'm talking to you. Huh? What? Oh, uh, you here again? Yes. How many times? Oh, I'm still here. It's just the second time. How soon are you going to set us free? I can't do anything until we hear this party in Somerville who turned in the stolen car report. When they call, let me talk to them, please. I'd like to get my hands on anybody who says I stole my own automobile. Why, well, I'll... If... Oh, yes. Hello, Millville Police Station. Captain Webster speaking. Are you calling the Gillsleeve residence? I don't know. Uh, did you report a stolen car earlier in the night? I most certainly did. You catch it? Yes, but the driver claims he's the owner, Gildersleeve. Yeah. That's the second burglar that did that tonight. This is getting monotonous. Well, uh, he claims that you can identify him. I'm going to put him on. Uh, here you are. Yeah, thank you. No, see here, Bertie. What's the idea of having the police chase me clear across the state? Mr. Gillsley, what you doing in the pokey? Yeah, huh? <laughs> you ought to know you put me in this pokey. Leroy and I took the car instead of the train. Oh, you 
took it. And I thought it was some of them rubber robbers. Yes. <laughs> I wish you'd have told me. Yes, so do I now. We'd have been in fair view by now if you hadn't had us arrested for stealing our own automobile. Now, you tell the captain here that I'm all right. Uh, here you are, Captain. Yeah. Well, what about this man? Yeah. Oh, that's his car, all right. He's my employer. At least he was, as of our most recent conversation. <laughs> I better hang up before he decides to change the status quo and make me a member of the alumni. <laughs> well, Gildersleeve, that looks like a clean bill of health for you. I guess you can go now. Oh, uh, thank goodness. Come on, Leroy. It's time we got to... Yeah, take your hands off me. What's I this? tell you I didn't steal that car. It's mine. I'm State Highway Commissioner Francis X. Toby. Oh, uh, yeah? Well, we had another guy tonight who was also supposed to be the oh, commissioner. Oh, that was... Uh, oh, hello there, Captain. Tell this lunkhead who I am. Well, hello, Commissioner. They got you, too, I see. Oh. <laughs> yes, Gildersleeve, for stealing your car. Well... I told this balloon brain I was innocent, but he wouldn't believe me. Not even when we arrived here and I showed him your car. Huh? Well, I parked right next to it and I said, look... I don't it. care. Orders is orders. Uh, Mike, this man is the commissioner, all right. Huh? Just my luck. Well, now that everything's straightened out, we better be going. I'll have to drive 70 miles an hour if I'm... Oh, <laughs> I forgot. The speed limit is 50, isn't it? <laughs> well, come on, Leroy. Let's go. It... Where's Leroy? Oh, I'd give a lot right now if I could say, move over, Leroy. <laughs> Leroy, this must be it. Let's see, yes. The Fairview Convention Hall, exhibitor's entrance. Yeah, we just made it, too. <laughs> Your passes, please, sir. Your passes? Oh, yes, you have them, I believe, Leroy. Yeah, that's right, Uncle Mort. Uh, here you are, sir. Yeah, just one second till I open the envelope, please. Yeah, it's Porter, I guess. I'm sorry, folks, but these here appears to be the wrong kind of tickets. Yeah, let me see. Oh, suffering whales, Leroy. These are our railroad tickets. What? <laughs> We could have come by train all the time. Yeah. Well, then what did we send to Cousin Flora? The rabbit show passes, I guess. <laughs> well, at least we're here anyway. Yeah, that's true. What do we do about getting in, though? I'll arrange it. Hey, Porter, if you'll help us with this box of rabbits. Yes, I'll be glad to. Yeah, you bring the box in. That You'll, you'll find it in the rear compartment, and we'll, we'll go and find the manager. Uh, glad to, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, huh? Uh, What's the matter? Can't you budge him? Here, let me help you. Oh, my gosh, Leroy. Danger, explosives. It's the commissioner's car again. The great Gilder slave will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now... I'm sure most of you homemakers realize the importance of energy-producing foods to your whole family. We're all working hard and playing hard these days, and the energy we use up must be replaced by the foods we eat. So you should know that parquet margarine, the delicious modern margarine made by Kraft, is one of the best energy foods you can serve. Yes, the wholesome, nourishing American vegetable oil that goes into parquet margarine is one of the best sources of food energy there is. Now, that's particularly important in the wintertime. The food energy in Parquet helps give you body warmth, too. Helps protect you from the cold. And equally important, every pound of Parquet margarine contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A, making it a dependable food source of this important vitamin the year round. So, use plenty of Parquet margarine at the table and for cooking, too. Yes, the delicate appetizing flavor that makes Parquet so delicious for table use makes it a real flavor shortening for baking. Grand for pan frying, too. So, tomorrow, sure, order delicious, economical parquet margarine. Remember, it's parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Cousin Flora would be home when relatives come to visit. What do 
we do now, Uncle Mort? Oh, Mort? we'll kill time till dinner, then come back and see if they're home yet. If, what would you like to do, Leroy? Well, how about seeing a movie? We passed a swell one on the way out here. The movie? Is that so? What's the title? Look Who's Laughing. Oh, that one, yeah. Well, it's playing all over these days, isn't it? All right, let's go. Sounds very amusing. If, if, who's in it? Oh, uh, Fibber McGee and Molly. Oh, anybody else? Yeah, Charlie McCarthy and Edgar Bergen. Is that all? Oh, no, there's Mrs. Uppington and Harlow Wilcox and Lucille Ball. Well, well, yes, yes. Go on, Leroy. Oh, I almost forgot. And Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Look who's laughing. Yeah, good night, folks. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Each week at this time, from Hollywood, California, Kraft presents Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levin. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, remember that these days your family needs plenty of good, nourishing food. And of course, it's mostly the flavor of what you serve that tempts them to eat all they need. Well, flavor is something that wholesome parquet margarine certainly has. Delicate, appetizing flavor never possible in old-time margarine. You see, parquet margarine is the modern margarine made by Kraft. And it's outstanding because it tastes so deliciously good whether you serve it at the table or use it for baking and pan frying. Yes, if you haven't tried parquet, you just can't know how wonderfully good modern margarine can be. Another thing, parquet margarine is good for you. It's a wholesome, nourishing energy food. And every pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. Best of all, parquet margarine is economical, and that's important these days when we're all saving every bit we can to buy defense stamps and bonds. Why not try a pound or two of delicious parquet margarine tomorrow? Yes, just ask your dealer for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. It's made by Kraft. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve, who is about to visit a local furniture store in search of a new bed as a surprise gift for his niece, Marjorie. Now, I like that pink canopy bed in the window, Leroy. How about buying that one for Marjorie? Oh, no. Who'd help him put the top down on nice nights? If, Leroy, that isn't a convertible bed, uh, let's go in. I know the owner of this store. If it ain't my old friend, Chuck Morton P. Gildersleeve. Hello, Stanza. Uh, Slepperman. My, my, you're a sight for good eyes. Yes. Why, you're the very motion picture of hell. Uh, In fact, a double feature. Yes. <laughs> and don't tell me this is little Theodore. I won't. This is little Leroy. My, my, how you jumped out. Well, I remember when I used to bounce you on my knees, sonny boy. Yes, in about one more year, he'll be able to return the favor, Slepperman. <laughs> Guilty, my pal, you took the voids right out of my bridge work. Yes. <laughs> well, let's not stand around on our ceremonies. Will you have a chair? Or were you thinking of buying a Devonport? Well, we, we were interested in beds. Something in a little uh, slumber number. <laughs> oh, hachi Just follow me, please. Uh, okay. Say, Uncle, what's the name of this chair that the man is sleeping in? Uh, that's a Morris chair. Oh, hello, Morris. <laughs> hello, la, la, la. Yes. Slepperman's kid brother. He's 40 years old and still a problem child. Gee, what kind of a clock is this, Uncle? Uh, that's a grandfather's clock, Leroy. And don't open it. There are no grandfathers inside. <laughs> well, here we are. 
I'm telling you confidentially, Trucky, when it comes to sleeping furniture, this store is wide awake. Uh, yes, yes, I know. <laughs> Leroy, quit jumping up and down on that bed. Ah, leave him to be guilty. Let the boy have fun. All right, so he's, suppose he does break a couple of springs. So I'll put it on your bill. Yeah. <laughs> Young man, come down from there. Oh, careful, Mort. I was only making a test hop. Yes. <laughs> what a kitty, huh? He's a regular Mickey Looney. Mickey Looney. <laughs> Guilty? What kind of a bed would you like to buy if I'm not taking too much priority? Yes. It's for Marjorie, you know, Leroy's sister. She's away at a Red Cross training school, and Leroy and I thought we'd surprise her by fixing up her bedroom. What an uncle. An angel without wings. Yeah, I was grounded. <laughs> I wish I had an uncle like you got, Leroy. Uh, Leroy, Mr. Slepperman is talking. Leroy, where are you? Oh, young man, come out of that grandfather's clock. Okay. See, that makes a keen place for hiding. Go ahead, Leroy. Keep it up. I know another keen place for hiding. <laughs> Don't be too harsh on the boy, Trocky. Remember, you were a picking any once yourself. Yes. Look, Sam, do you want me to make up my mind about that bed now, or would you rather have me sleep on it? Okay. How about this creation in solid mahogany with a waterfall design? It's very excruciating. Yeah. I don't know. It looks a little bit too stodgy. Stodgy is the latest trend. Yeah. Gee, why don't you buy this dandy double-deck bunk bed for Marjorie, Unc? No, my boy. What we want is something dainty and feminine, like, uh, say, that pink canopy model in the window. Ah, now you're talking with gas. Well, what's cooking with the bed? <laughs> come on, come on. We can step into the window and give it a closer inspection. Yeah, come on, Leroy. Get away from that folding bed before it traps you. Come in, Uncle Mort. Right up here, Guilty. Careful passing that statue. Inhale. Thank you. Yeah. And look at that bed. Beautiful, ain't it? Uh, I'm telling you, this is a bed of roses. It is? Yes. And it's her own exclusive design. Yeah, whose? My daughter, Roses. Yeah. <laughs> well, she certainly did a splendid job. Is it as comfortable as it looks? And just try it. Lay right down. Go ahead. Take a sample snooze. Yeah, I will, Sam. Ah, uh, yes. Feels very soft. <laughs> you see, you float around like you're 99% pure. <laughs> and why not? It's got a deep sleep mattress, and it's got a double box springs. And I know something else it's got, Unc. Yeah? What's that, Leroy? It's got half the people in town staring in the window at you, too. What? Oh, yeah, come on. Let's get out of here. <laughs> Silly thing for me to do. If, say, Sam, how much is that bed? Well, just the way it stands with that beautiful speed match... Uh, spread, I'm asking, uh, hmm, and it cost me, uh, hmm, but I'll let you have it for hmm, one price, $120. $120, eh? Well, I wasn't figuring on spending quite that much, but, hmm. See, uh, how much will you give me in trade for Marjorie's present bed? Well, it's pretty old. How do you know? You haven't seen it. Well, I have a very vivid imagination. Yeah. He's right. Well, it must be hmm, 50 years old. 50? Why, Leroy, it's at least 150. A very graceful four-poster, Slepperman. Really an antique. I'm sorry, but what you people call antiques is by me strictly second-hand. But this is really better than second-hand. Yeah, it must be sixth or seventh-hand. Yep. Leroy, you get back in the grandfather's clock. Now, Sam, I'll let you in on a little secret. According to an unconfirmed rumor, that bed was slept in by George Washington. Recently? It, huh? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what I'll do, Gildy. Suppose you make me a price for that old bed. Uh, fine. Now, let me see. Uh, how about $20? $20? You're a hard man, Gildingsleeve. <laughs> hard? Why, that's pretty soft for you. Well, it's a deal. Shake. And now that it's set, I don't mind saying that I would have gone as high as $25. Oh, you would, eh? Well, I don't mind confessing, Sammy, old kid, that I would have taken as low as ten dollars. <laughs> uh, hello? No, Marjorie's out of town. I'll tell her you called. Uh, who is this? Uh, John? Uh, which John? Oh, you must be a new John. Yes. Uh, goodbye. Uh, John Lewis. Oh, Bertie. Come as quick as I can. Yes, Mr. Gilfrey. Uh, which is today's stack of messages for Marjorie? The little one, the big, big pile from yesterday. I never saw anything like it. That phone is busier than a burglar in a blackout. Everybody wants Marjorie. 
Yes, and it's worse when I'm here all alone. Hardly no time to do the cleaning or the cooking. I'm busy with my social secretary. Yeah. There's only one thing I hope. What's that, Bertie? That Miss Marge will be able to read all my writing on them messages. Why? Because I can't. Yes. <laughs> Nevertheless, you take care of the rest of them, Bertie. I want to see if those furniture men have the new bed set up yet. Leroy? Uh, hello, men. I see you've removed the old bed and have the new one all put together already. Oh, yeah. Uh, Morris is testing it now. How is it, Morris? Well, you see? It's okay. Uh, come on, Morris. Oh, look at him in the arms of Orpheus. It, you mean Morpheus. Orpheus is the music god. If that's music, well... Morris but... Schlepperman, get up. I know what'll wake him. Hey, Morris, time to go to bed. Uh-huh. It is. I'm coming, Frank. Wait for me. <laughs> that Morris should hibernate for the winter. Say, doesn't that bed look grand? Oh, Bernie, come on in here. Call me, Mr. Gill, please. Well, ain't that the cutest looking little bed? Yeah. I can hardly wait to see Miss Marge climb in and hit the hay. This bed cost $120, Bertie, and that ain't hay. <laughs> oh, you better see who's at the door, Bertie. Yes, if it ain't one thing, it's the same thing. Throw that bedspread across, Leroy, so we can get an idea of how it looks made up. Okay. That's it. Thanks. Why, it's as pretty as a new $20 bill. As six $20 bills. There's a Miss Van Scudder to see you, Mr. Gill, please. Uh, Van Scudder? I wonder who that could be. Well, I better go see. Mr. Gildersleeve? Uh, yes? I'm Patricia Van Scudder, the interior decorator. I'm to redo Marjorie's bedroom. <laughs> Already? Why, Leroy and I just finished a redo job five minutes ago. Oh, there must be some mistake. I received a letter from Marjorie yesterday asking me to decorate her room. Oh, I see. Well, Marjorie didn't know about our little effort. It was to be a surprise. <laughs> well, if it's anything like the usual man's idea of a girl's room, it's probably more of a shock than a surprise. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, hadn't we better look at the room in question now? Oh, yes, of course. Excuse me. Uh, this way, Miss Van Scudder. <laughs> uh, right in here. Mm-hmm. Hello, this is my nephew, Leroy. Leroy, this is Miss Van Scudder. Hello, how do you do? Well, I'm genuinely surprised. Uh, Why, this is a charming, charming room. Oh, you like it? Yes. Why, I can hardly believe you two did this. It's really quite lovely. Well, all we did was some quiet. Quiet, Leroy. Let's hear Miss Van Scudder. Really, I'd leave it just as it is, except for one thing. (laughs) And what's that? The bed. (laughs) But that's the only thing. Uh, Leroy, please. (laughs) What did you say, Miss Van Scudder? The bed. Uh, wrong? Oh, but definitely. The color clashes with everything else. Uh, and the style. Oh, that style. Yeah, some style, isn't it? Oh, yes, quite horrible. Uh, now, see here, Miss Van Scooter. Why, why, to put it in this room is almost as bad as mixing Empire with Rococo. Uh, hey, and what's Empire and Rococo? Shh, I think there are a couple of racetracks. <laughs> Uh, I see. Uh, Then you don't think that Marjorie would like the bed, eh? I know she wouldn't be happy in this overgrown bassinet. Who's a... Oh, she wouldn't, eh? No. However, I'd be happy to go out and find you the proper bed for this room. You would? Well, maybe that would solve our little problem. No, I'd be glad to. Meanwhile, get rid of this pink atrocity, won't you? You're uh, you're still sure it won't do, eh? Oh, dear, no. Uh, Why, I'd just as soon put Heppelwhite next to Chippendale. Oh, we couldn't do that, could we? Why not, Uncle? They don't speak. Oh. <laughs> well, well, I must be going now. Don't trouble to show me to the door. Goodbye. Yeah, goodbye. Oh, our pretty pink bed, Leroy. Now I'll have to send it back. Too bad, Uncle Mort. Yes. Strange how many things there are in this world you could enjoy if only the experts didn't tell you they're no good. <laughs> Hey, Morris, wake up and help me. Here comes your brother. You who? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, hello, Sam. At least you could open your eyes, Morris. It's bad enough to have a pill for our brother, but I got to have one that's a sleeping pill. <laughs> What's this bed you're selling up, Frank? It's the one we brought back from Miss Gildersleeve's house yesterday. Oh, yes, be very careful with it. There's a rumor around that Washington slept in it. However, as of today, the rumor hasn't been verified. Excuse me, sir, but I was looking for something in a bed. Uh, pillows, blankets, or sheets? <laughs> no, 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 you don't understand. I want a bed for a young lady's room. Something colonial, shall we say? 
Sure, let's say colonial. Colonial. <laughs> now, if you'll just follow me, Junior Miss. Oh, oh, but one moment, please. What about this one that the men are putting together? Oh, that? <laughs> oh, don't give it a second thought. It's too old. It is? How old? Uh, 150, 200, who knows? Now, if you want to see some up-to-date, fresh from the factory colonial beds, I'm the man who's got them. Oh, no, never mind. This one is just the thing. Imagine a four-poster in such excellent condition. And a Duncan Fife at that. Uh, please, don't rush me. Remember, this is a genuine Age in the Wood drunken Fife. <laughs> now, uh, let me see. Thirty mm, dollars. But I'm sure that I can use it at that price. I know just the spot where that bed will be right at home. Suppose you send it to my shop on approval. I'm Patricia Van Scudder, dealer in period furniture. I'm pleased to meet you. I'm Samuel Slapperman, dealer in furniture, period. <laughs> Uh, are you sure? It must be. It came collect. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll soon see. Oh, Leroy. Uh, telegram for Marjorie. Yes? What did she say, huh? Uh, regarding redecoration, before you dispose of old bed, be sure to unscrew the left front knob and fish out my string of pearls. If, what does she mean, Leroy? Oh, I remember. She sometimes uses the hollow bed post as a kind of secret jewel box. <laughs> Where are you going, Uncle Mort? In the Marjorie's room to unscrew the old great Caesar's ghost. That was the bed we traded in at Schlepperman's. Now, Leroy, getting those pearls out of the bed in Schlepperman's is a job that requires tact and delicacy. You're right, Uncle Mort. You wait here and I'll go in by myself. You, wait a minute, young man. I'm going to do this job myself. If you care to, you can come along and uh, whistle if you see anybody coming. Okay. Any particular tune you want me to whistle? Well, no. I, I can just, uh, well... Well, hello, Stranza. Hello, Leroy. Coming back for another bit? Hello, Slepperman. Uh, no, Leroy and I are just out window shopping. Oh, of course. What kind do you want? Plate glass, stained glass, or, or plate glass? Yes. <laughs> You don't understand. Uh, Leroy and I just want to look around. You don't mind our browsing, I hope? Oh, no. I do a lot of that myself. You should see me browsing over a herring. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow, uh, suppose I show you around. Oh, no, no, no. Don't trouble yourself. Ah, uh, trouble, he says. Why, my time is your time. What's your time? 11.30. I, I mean, we can look around by ourselves. Oh, uh, let me show you. Yeah. Say, you might miss some of the little gems that are hidden around this store. Yeah, quiet, Leroy. I wasn't going to say anything, Unc. Uh, oh, oh, yes. Uh, but really, Sam, don't bother to come along. Uh, we'll feel uh, freer to... Uh... To help ourselves. Yes, that's it. Uh, we may dig out something we consider valuable if we're left alone. Yeah, at least we hope so. Yeah. All right. And if you find what you want, SOS me PDQ. And I'll be there in a flash for the cash. Yes. Flash for the cash. Come on, Leroy. Yeah. Are we out of sight? Yeah. Can you see it, Unc? Well, here's a four-poster. It, but the knobs in the posts are solid. Here are some more, Uncle. Okay, good. I'll be as quiet as a little... Oh, quiet. Oh, oh, that's me. <laughs> Say, how about this one? No, Leroy, leave it alone. This isn't Marjorie's bed. It's the wrong color and it hasn't any posts. And besides, Morris is sleeping in it. There's Mr. Schlepperman coming this way. Good. Maybe I can pump him about it, huh? Oh, my gosh, I just smiling. Uh, oh, there you are. Yes, here we are. <laughs> hey, by the way, uh, Sam... You remember that old bed of Marjorie's you took in trade? Sure. What about it? Well, I was just wondering what had become of it. Not that I was looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Why, that bed sold like a hot cake. What? You sold it? What? You want it back? You... Well, sort of. I I got to thinking about it, Sam. You know, it was really Marjorie's. Yeah, and she put a lot of value on that bed. Uh, I didn't realize it myself until just recently. And in fact, I never should have traded it into you. Well, if that's the case, maybe I can get it back for you. You can? How? Huh? The lady who bought it took it away on approval. Huh? Possibly if I go to her before she makes up her mind and somehow or the other raise the price, she might turn the bed down. Oh, that's great. I'll, I'll see that you don't lose on the deal, Sam. I know you can put it across. You do? I wish I did. Yeah. Do you want me to come along and help you? No, I think you might complicate the situation. You know, Trucky, in negotiations for antiques, it needs the cool, experienced head of an old hand with a near to the ground to put the best foot forward. Yeah. Mr. 
Mrs. Slepperman, come here. What can I do for you? Ah, this is just a post driver's holiday, whatever it is, of course. Now that I'm here, I might as well inquire if you want to keep that bed you took on approval. Well, the young lady I'm buying it for is still out of town. Well, I've got a buyer who wants that bed right now. In fact, he says he'll pay up to um, $40 for it. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, I hate to be pressing you, but could you give me a quick yes or no? Wait, I think I can get an answer for you right away. Excuse me, won't you? But certainly not. Lord Marjorie, this is Patricia Van Scudder, Mr. Gildersleeve, and I have the nicest news for you. Yes? I found just the bed for Marjorie's room. Well, isn't that nice? Yes. Wait till you see it. You'll be speechless. Well, I bet I'll find something to say. <laughs> now, the only thing is this. How much are you willing to pay? Uh, pay? Oh, anywhere up to 50, 60, even 75, if you think it's worth it. Oh, thank you. That's all I wanted to know. Goodbye. Well, Mr. Slepperman, I think we can do business. My client will pay more than that $40 offer you had. Is that a fact? Mm-hmm. Pardon me, uh, could you be so kindly as to let me use your telephone? Oh, surely, go right ahead. It's in my office there. Thank you. I'll be back instantaneously. <laughs> Hello, Trucky. This is Slepperman. I've located that bed of Marjorie. Oh, uh, you have? Good. But there has developed complications. Oh, what's the trouble? Uh, those people who have it now are willing to pay a good stiff price. Maybe fifty, sixty dollars. Well, I'll give you more than they will, the crooks. Whatever that bid is, I'll pay ten dollars more. As high as, say, uh, one hundred dollars. All right. You're the doctor. Goodbye, Doc. <laughs> well, Miss Vinscuda? I just talked to my client, and he says he'll pay $50 for that bed. Oh, but my people won't let him take it for that. They'll give 60 60 is a nice price. But this fellow so is no cheapskate. He says 70 My clients are just as stubborn as yours. We say 75 I'm sorry, but my man will top their offer 85 Well, Freddy's got us licked. Too bad. They'll be disappointed. Well, you can send your truck over to pick up the bed whenever you want to. Oh, I don't have to do that. Hey, Frank! Yes, Mr. Shepherdman. Wake up, Mars, and come in here. George Washington's bed rides again. <laughs> Be careful, boys. Put it down easy. There you are, Mr. Gildingsleeve. Safely and soundly. Yes, well, thank you very much, Lee Sam. <laughs> now, if you and your men will wait outside for just a moment. Yeah, precisely. Come on, boys. <laughs> Uh, at last, Leroy. Gee, which knob is it, Uncle? Yeah, the left front one. Ah, I've got it. Here's something. By George, it's the missing pearls. Boy, what a relief. Say, now that you have the jewels, what are you going to do with the bed? Maybe Mr. Schlepperman will buy it back. Oh, that's silly, Leroy. He, he just went to an awful lot of trouble persuading somebody to let me have it. Say, I've got to thank him about that. Oh, well, Sam, if, I want you to know that I appreciate all the trouble you've gone through to get this bed back for me. Uh, thanks very much. Oh, you uh, don't mention it. It was a mere trifle, on a big scale, of course. Yes. I was really up against a determined woman. For a little while, it looked like I'd have to kidnap it. Uh, kidnap it? Is that so? Well, I wonder if she still wants the bed. Oh, yes. Why, if I walked into her place right now with that bed, she'd cover me with kisses. Heavens forbid. <laughs> well, in that case, why not let her have it? Excuse me, I don't think I heard you right. Did you say let her have it? Yes, I didn't realize she wanted it so badly. I don't want to be so selfish about all this. Well, I'll be a dog in the manger. Yes. After all I've been through, too. Guilty? If you sell it again, what will Marjorie say when she finds out? Oh, don't worry. That's all fixed. Someone has found a bed that'll make her forget all about this one. Well, that's fine. I'll take it back to the other party. Yeah? Oh, Frank! Oh, Morris! Yes, boss? What is it? Tell me what I want. Go get the bed and put it on the truck again. But we're taking it apart and put it together four times already. I'm getting tired. <laughs> Say, what do you want me to do? Install zippers? <laughs> go, go, go. Uh, I'm sorry to give you all this trouble, Slepperman. Not trouble. This is a dandy bed. I've done more business with this one single article this week 
than I have with all the rest of my stock put together. <laughs> I've got a surprise for you. Who is it? Oh, Mr. Stepperman. What is it? Do you remember that lovely George Washington flute bed? Well, I had to tuck myself blue in the face, but I got it back for you. You did? Oh, you little dear, I could kiss you. Oh, please, please. I'm a married man. <laughs> and do you want the bed? Oh, yes. Then everything is peaches down in Florida. You mean in Georgia? Ever been to Florida? Oh, Frank. Oh, Morris. In again. Oh, there it is. Won't Marjorie Forrester be pleased when she gets this bed? Why, yes, of course. Uh, what? Are you giving this bed to Marjorie Forrester? Oh, no. Oh, that's good. I'm not giving it to her. Her uncle, Mr. Gildersleeve, is. You don't mean by any chance Trotmorton P. Gildersleeve? <laughs> a large, deep man with a thick voice. Why, yes. Are you a friend of his? Speaking strictly from the past, yes. <laughs> Well, the next time I see him, I'll tell him I met you. I don't think that'll be necessary. <laughs> He'll know it. Well, goodbye, Miss Van Scooter. And if you don't see, if I don't see you again, don't take any more wooden beds. <laughs> Ah, oh, it's been a lovely day, hasn't it, Leroy? Yeah, my a man glad that he's alive. Yes. Yeah. Anything happened while we were out, Bertie? Nothing, only that Van Scudder lady's in Miss Marge's bedroom with some furniture. Huh? Hmm. Wouldn't let me get anywhere near it, claims it to be a surprise for you. Oh, yes, the new bed. Well, I'm anxious to see it, Bertie. She says it's going to bowl me over. Dear, maybe it's all ready now. Come on, Uncle. All right, come along, Bertie. Yes, sir. You're making so much fuss over that bed, you'd think George Washington slept in it. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, just a second. It's almost ready. There. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, yes? I want you to see the room properly. Ready? Uh, this better be good. Yes, I'm ready. Close your eyes. Yes? Now, I'll count three, and then you can open them. One, two, three. Well, it's very... <laughs> I don't get it, lady. Don't get bored. This room looks just like it did before. I know, but the bed. That's the one I had so much trouble buying for you. But that's... Oh, my. Yes, that's the same bed that was there in the first place. Oh, no. I picked this bed up at a tremendous bargain, $150. Oh, great jumping jeeps, $150. But, but it's absolutely authentic. George Washington slept in it. Oh! Hey, oh. just a bad old fella, lady. The oh, hurricane is here. No. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Come on, come on. Calm down, Uncle. Yes. After all, you got back Marjorie's valuable pearls. Yes. What's all this talk about Miss Marjorie's valuable pearls? There's nothing but imitation pearls. What? No, oh, that makes it all the worse. I'm getting dizzy. Leroy, bring me a chair. Come on, here. Sit down on the bed, Uncle. Yeah. Yeah, let me help you over. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, if, what's this big lump under the bedspread? <gasps> Morris, you get out of here. Huh? All right, all right. The great Gilder Slave will be with us again in just a moment. But right now, I think you men especially will agree that the evening meal is a mighty important event. Yes, after coming home in the cold from a hard day's work... Plenty of steaming hot food on the table is certainly a welcome sight. Well, men, you need good food. It replaces the strength and energy you've used up during the day. That's why you should be sure there's plenty of energy food on the table. Energy food like parquet margarine, made by Kraft. You see, parquet margarine is one of the best sources of food energy you can serve. Made from American farm products. And parquet is also a reliable food source of vitamin A the year round. Yes, every pound contains 9,000 units of this important vitamin. And parquet margarine is so downright good tasting, it's bound to be a hit with all the family. So men, why not ask your wives to try delicious parquet margarine? They'll find it's grand for table use. A real flavor shortening for baking, too, and just about perfect for pan frying. Yes, ask them to order parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. 
It's the margarine made by Kraft that tastes so good, yet costs so little. Ladies and gentlemen, our president will soon reach his 60th birthday. We can all help him celebrate. We can show him our deep regard and affection by contributing to a cause that's very close to his heart, your local fight infantile paralysis campaign. Let's all say happy birthday, Mr. Roosevelt, by aiding the fight against this enemy of our children. Good night. Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents... The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, do you know what comes to my mind when I think of fresh bread, steaming hot baked potatoes, tasty pan-fried breakfast eggs, luscious cakes and cookies? Well, I think of that delicious modern margarine, parquet margarine made by Kraft. Because parquet margarine makes all those good-tasting foods taste even better. Yes, parquet's smooth, delicate flavor makes it grand for table use makes it a real flavor shortening for baking mouth-watering cookies, cakes, and pastries. Yes, and parquet margarine is a delicious seasoning for hot vegetables. Makes pan-fried foods tastier, too. That's why I think of parquet when all sorts of good foods come to mind. And another thing, whether you serve parquet margarine at the table or use it for cooking, you can be sure it's good for your family. It's made from selected American farm products that are wholesome and nourishing. What's more, parquet is a highly nourishing energy food, and every single pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. So try economical parquet margarine tomorrow. Just ask your dealer for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, the delicious margarine made by Kraft. And now, let's visit our friend, the Great Gildersleeve. More hot cocoa, Judge Hooker? No, thanks, Bertie. I'm warm enough. My, but a nice fire feels good on a cold night, doesn't it, Gildersleeve? How should I know? You've been blocking the heat in front of this fire all evening. If you're not careful, you'll give yourself a high hot foot. <laughs> Gee, Uncle Mort, don't you think the fire is good for Judge Hooker's ideas? Uh, I don't know what you mean, Leroy. Well, you said they were just half-baked. Yes. <laughs> I don't recall. Young man, isn't it time for you to be in bed? Yeah, but you promised I could stay up as long as we had company. Well, that's right. Only I never thought the company... Uh, uh, <laughs> excuse me, Judge. I guess my foot's fallen asleep. <laughs> oh, you needn't hint, Gildersleeve. I'm going... Only it's been so cozy here, and the conversation's been so interesting. Conversation? Sounded more like a monologue to me. Don't they let you talk down in your courtroom, Judge? Poor man, he's just lonely and blue, that's all. Who's lonely and blue? Why, just because I like the family atmosphere around here, in preference to sitting in that big, cold, empty house of mine, does that mean I'm lonely and blue? Yes. Otherwise, you wouldn't come and stand in front of our fire and get all friendly and pink. <laughs> Well, maybe you're right. You know what you need, Judge Hooker, is some good woman. No, no, I don't. I've tried a dozen housekeepers, but they all quit. Well, personally, I don't blame them, Judge. You're as crusty as a carload of peanut brittle. What do you mean, crusty? I'll have you know that I'm still considered one of Summerfield's most eligible bachelors. Yeah, eligible for what? Social Security? <laughs> 
<laughs> Leroy, aren't you in bed yet? Oh, another hint. Bertie, my coat and hat, please. Yeah. Now, Judge, don't leave just because Leroy is going to bed. How about a game of old maid, a rummy? No, thanks, Gildy. You play rummy like an old maid and old maid like a rummy. <laughs> Oh, a bad loser, eh? Here's your wraps, Judge. Now be sure and bundle up well. Thank you. My, my, I don't blame the government for clamping down on the weather reports. Uh, why, Bertie? Well, the less said about this weather, the better. I guess you're right. Well, good night, folks. Yeah. Good night, you little legal loophole. Now, don't be too harsh on him, Mr. Gilsleeve. Huh? The poor man is only hungering for companionship. Yes, and our food. Why, when he looks at you in this nice house with your nice niece and nephew and eating all the nice meals I fix, he gets so green it looks like spring is here again. Yeah. You know, deep down, Bertie, I really like the little duffer. And when I spoke about him needing a good woman, I didn't mean a housekeeper. I meant a good wife. There's some nice ladies that he might take two. It'd take two? That'd be big of me, Bertie. You really only allow one. <laughs> Well, I don't want to count my chickens before they're hatched, but Leroy, I thought I told you to go to bed. You did, Uncle Moore, twice. Well, I'm not going to tell you again. Gee, that's swell, Uncle. It's getting sort of monotonous. Yeah. Okay, okay, I'm going right now. Yeah. Well, up at last, eh, Leroy? The only thing more difficult than getting you to bed at night is waking you in the morning. Ah, uh, good morning, Unc. Say, remember what you said last night about finding somebody to marry Judge Hooker? Well, I, I didn't mean for you to hear that, young man. Well, it's lucky I did, because I've got somebody all lined up. Yep. What do you mean? Who? One of my teachers at school, Miss Cagle. Huh? Boy, the whole class has been trying to figure out a way to get rid of her ever since that family. <laughs> If they have? Yeah, well, they'd be glad when I tell them the judge is going to marry her. If, whoa, here, here, wait a minute, Leroy. First, what sort of a lady is this, Miss uh, Cagle? Well, to give you an idea, the kids elected her Miss Poison Puss of 1942. <laughs> Unanimous. If... Why, she's so... Yeah, but if she's anything at all like that, why nominate her for the title of Mrs. Hooker? Is that wrong? Well, after all, we're trying to make the judge's life brighter. Miss Cagle sounds like a drip of the first water. <laughs> Gee, that's right. Uh, I was so anxious to get her off our hands, I didn't realize what a dirty trick it would be on the judge. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll have to think of somebody else, I guess. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Gilsley, but how about looking here in the morning paper? The morning paper? For what? For the bride. Maybe one of the persons in the personal will turn out to be the judge's dream girl. Well, thanks, Bertie. No harm in looking. Uh, let me see. Uh, uh, oh, yes. Here we are. The uh, Personals. Attractive young lady, a blonde... Wishes to meet sympathetic gentlemen of means. Object, Hollywood. No, I don't think... I don't think that's the judge's style. Read the next one. That sounded better. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, here it is. A well-to-do widow interested in meeting professional man over 50. Have refined tastes and grand piano. Also, private income, own car, and seven delightful children who will add life to any home. Oh. <laughs> Gee, for seven kids. Yes, wrong number. <laughs> I'm sorry, Bertie. I'm afraid our little justice wouldn't have any peace if we snagged him a helpmate out of the help wanted. Oh, Jeepers, look at the time. i got to get over to Piggy Banks' house. Yeah? What for, Leroy? His Aunt Henrietta is knitting sweaters for the army, and I'm to bring her some wool Marjorie left for her. Well, run along by all means, then. So Henrietta Banks is in town. Say, Henrietta Banks. What's the matter with her? Nothing. She's perfect. Uh, for Judge Hooker, I mean. She has a nice social position. Her grandfather was the first white child born in this county. And, <laughs> and she's really not bad looking. Gee, I didn't know you knew Piggy's aunt, Uncle Mort. Yes, I met her about ten years ago. I remembered I'd just ripped my trousers before she came over, and I didn't dare get up all the time she was here. <laughs> <laughs> It really was very embarrassing. She sure sounds like the future Miss Judge Hooker. Yeah, well, I'm going to try anyway. Now, let me have that yarn, Leroy. I'll deliver it. While I'm there, I can sort of subtly get around to talking about the judge and matrimony and things like that. Oh, swell, I'll get your hat and coat on. Uh, but what about that appointment you had to get examined for insurance, Mr. Gilsleeve? Oh, yes, the insurance doctor's due here in half an hour. Uh, you tell him I was called away on business, Bertie. Have him come in a day or so. If I'm going to press the judge's suit, I better strike while the iron is hot. <laughs> Uncle Mort. Uh, thank you, Leroy. You know, I'm getting quite a kick out of this idea. <laughs> Won't the judge be surprised when he finds out all I'm doing for him? Well, here I go. Good luck, Mr. Gilsley. Happy hunting, Uncle. Uh, yes, well, thanks. Goodbye. 
Uh, he's a pretty swell guy, isn't he, Bertie? He sure is. Going to all that trouble just to make two lonely people happy. That's right. Look at him walking down the street. A regular Dan Cupid. Yes, sir. Ain't he got the figure for it? <laughs> yes, 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 I'm coming. Oh, yes. Well, well, little Henrietta Banks. Why, you haven't changed a day since I saw you ten years ago. I haven't? Oh, you're just being nice. Huh? Oh, now, now, don't tell me. I, I know who you are. Uh, you're Mr., um... Oh, Mr. Gilder something. Yeah, that's right. Gilder Sleeve. Oh, yeah. yes. uh, fancy you remembering me all this time. Well, won't you come in, Mr. Gilder Sleeve? Well, I don't mind if I do. My nephew, Leroy Forrester, was bringing over this yarn for you, and he happened to mention your name, and I said, uh, well... Never mind, you'd be surprised what I said. Well, have a chair, won't you? Yeah, thank you. My, I can't imagine how you could remember me. Uh? After all, we only met once before, and you seemed so shy then. You're shy? Oh, yes, I remember. That was just a temporary bashfulness on my part. I suppose I was just afraid of making the wrong uh, impression. Oh, as if you could have. As if I couldn't have. <laughs> Uh, but tell me, Miss Banks, oh, or rather, uh, Henrietta, that is, if you don't mind. Oh, no, no, not at all. Go right ahead. Well, when Leroy told me that you were here, I was greatly surprised to hear that you were still uh, Miss Banks. You were? Yes. My, but I'll bet you put up a gallant fight against all the men who must have wanted to change your name. Well, uh, some girls like a certain independence. Oh, uh, well, I knew that would be the trouble. That attitude of yours is hardly fair to us uh, poor men, Henrietta. Oh, do you think so, Mr. Gildersleeve? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Why, marriage is the most delightful of partnerships, uh, I'm told. And reminds me, uh, there's someone right here in this town who'd be just wonderful for you. Oh, really? Now, I don't know what on earth you're talking about. Now, Henrietta, you do too. I do not. Well, then I'll tell you. Oh, don't. So embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> who is it? it... <laughs> Well, I, I'm not going to mention any names, but this fellow, well, he, uh, he's been awfully lonesome. When I heard your name this morning, I, uh, I mean, when he heard your oh, name Oh, yes, morning, yes, yes, I understand. Well, uh, I, that is, he is, I mean, we... Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, uh? you haven't changed a bit. You're just as bashful and boyish as you were the first time I met you. Well, well I wasn't quite prepared. Uh, possibly I'd better come back another time. Yes, I think I should go now. Uh, you'll be hearing from me uh, later. I will. Oh, goodbye, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, not goodbye. Au revoir, Henrietta. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Oh, hello, Martha. Oh, Martha, you're acquainted with everyone in Summerfield. Well, tell me all you know about this. Uh, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's the one. Yes. Yeah. Yes? Yeah? No. Well, what do you... No. 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 Oh, no. Well, lucky me. <laughs> cases I've ever had to listen to in all my life. Oh, hello, Gildersleeve. Hi. Glad you dropped in. How's everything? Coming along better than you'd ever suspect, Judge. Remember our conversation out at the house the other night? Of course I do. And as soon as I left, I thought of some dandy answers, too. Now, let me see if I can remember. Oh, no, don't bother. But there's one thing I've been thinking about, Gildy, old man. Yeah? What was that, Judge? You remember saying that what I needed was a good woman? Yeah. I didn't give that much thought at first, but now I believe you're right. Oh, that's fine. And I have a little lady who'd be just the person for you. You think she'd know how to run my home right, huh? Oh, yes, and make you very happy, too. I hope she knows how to cook. Oh, yes, I'm sure she's a wonderful cook. Uh, very nice looking, also. Not interested in her looks, Gildy. At my age, a good cook is a lot more important than a pretty face. Oh, well, this lady is both. Um, I mean, she has both. Huh? That is, she is one and has the other. Oh. <laughs> 
Uh, when would you like to meet her? Sooner the better. Well, how about dropping over to my house for dinner next Friday? I'll have her there, too. Fine. Only you needn't go to all this trouble. Couldn't you just meet me here and we could settle the whole thing in ten minutes? Yes. Oh, no, you can't do things that way. Why not? Well, how do you know you're going to like each other, Hooker? Huh? Uh, this is a serious step you're about to take. Huh. You've got to approach it uh, cautiously. Well, maybe you're right. Believe me, if she's all that you say she is, I'll keep her for life. Well, I should hope so. Oh, Judge, recess is over. All right, Bailey. I'll see you Friday night, Gildy. Yeah, all right, Friday night. So long, Judge. Say, Your Honor, if you're still looking for a housekeeper... No, never mind, never mind. Mr. Gildersleeve has found a woman who sounds like a perfect servant. Well, that's nice of him. Yeah, he's a pretty good friend. In his fat, bumbling way. <laughs> Good afternoon, Bertie. Hello, Good Leroy. Hi, Uncle Morse. Well, I've arranged the whole thing. Judge Hooker's coming to dinner day after tomorrow. Oh, then I better fix something extra special scrumptious with a touch of romantic and a dash of lovey dovey. Yes. You invited Miss Banks, of course. Oh, yes. And she was so excited, she kept calling me a dear boy. <laughs> I sure hope she's going to like Judge Hooker when she meets up with him. Oh, of course she will. Just as soon as I tell her that he's the unknown admirer who's been sending her the flowers and candy and poems... Say, did I read you the new poem I sent her last night? No, let's hear it, Uncle. Yeah, I've got a copy of it here under the desk somewhere. Ah, yes, here it is, under the water bill. (laughs) Listen to this, folks. Oh, Henrietta, sweet Henrietta, I can't forget a girl like you. Wherever I go, I see your face in the sun and the snow or any old place. (laughs) Your smile turns the winter into spring and makes my poor heart go ting-a-ling-a-ling. And though I'm so shy, I worship from afar. Way up in my sky, you're the number one star. Oh, Henrietta, sweet Henrietta, I'd sure like to get a girl like you. Oh, gee. Gee, I never knew you were a poet, Unc. You sure have a gift, Mr. Gillsleeve. Yeah, do you like it? I'll give you copies if you want them. Well, that should sure make her feel mushy towards the judge. Yeah. Say, does he know he's been writing her all that guff and sending her all that stuff? Yes. Well, no, I've invited him to come here half an hour before Henrietta gets here. They remind me to button hooker and tell him all about it then. Yes, sir, that's a very good idea. And he won't have time enough then to get cold feet. Yeah. And cold feet has ruined more romances one way or the other than practically anything. <laughs> <laughs> Everything set, Bertie? Yes, sir, right to a T. All the judge's favorite dishes to put him in good humor. You know, I planned to decorate the table with orange blossoms so Miss Banks would feel like a blushing bride, only I couldn't get none. So I used oranges, but we was out. And that's why we got lemons on the table. Yes. <laughs> that must be the bridegroom-to-be now. Let him in, Bertie. Yes, sir. And won't he be surprised to learn of what we used to cook up for him? Yes. Leroy, leave those olives alone. Yes, sir, I was just rearranging them, that's all. Really? It ain't the judge, Mr. Gillsleeve, it's the insurance company. They'd have sent another doctor to give you that examination. Oh, my goodness, I can't make it now. Tell him I'm busy. Have him come here another time. Okay, okay, but you better hurry before the rates go up. The rates. Gee, of all the times to show up just when we're ready to put over a big merger like this. Leroy... I wish you'd include yourself out of this affair. It's a delicate matter involving the future happiness of two fine people. And I don't want you in your juvenile way to mess it up. Oh, don't worry, Uncle Mort. I know my part. As soon as they go in the living room after dinner, I'll start playing those Nelson Eddy Jeanette McDonald records. Well, you're a bright boy, Leroy. That's right. Don't slip up now. The doctor done went, but he's been replaced by another visitor, Miss Henrietta Banks. What? Oh, she's too early, Bertie. Why, the judge isn't here yet. Of all the numbskull females that ever are, oh, hello, Henrietta. <laughs> My, how lovely you look tonight. Oh, thank you, Throckmorton. Yeah? And dear little Leroy, how are you this evening? Oh, just fine, Miss Banks. Oh, come, come, come now. No more of this Miss Banks, darling. Just call me Auntie. Oh. <laughs> well, how are you, Throckmorton? 
The cat still got your tongue. Uh, who, me? Oh, no. <laughs> we don't keep a tongue. I mean, nobody's got our cat. <laughs> uh, won't you have a, a sit down? <laughs> Thank you. Now, uh, come over here and sit beside me. Huh? There. Uh-huh. That's better, isn't it? Oh, yes, considerably. <laughs> You know, I was so anxious to find out what your surprise was, I I just couldn't wait. Uh, That's why I'm here so early. Uh, Do you think I'm acting like a giddy young schoolgirl? Yes. Oh, Throckmorton, you say the most flattering, precious things. (laughs) Almost as nice as your poems. Uh, My poems? But I never wrote you any poems. Oh, come, come now, don't deny them, you shy, modest boy. But there must be some mistake. Why, not at all. Oh, uh, incidentally, Throckmorton, do you particularly like the color of those drapes at the window? Well, I don't know. I never gave it much thought. Why? Oh, I was just thinking about changing them, that's all. Oh, uh, y- you mean... Uh, uh, yes. That's what I thought you meant. <laughs> uh, uh, Throckmorton, am I going to get that big surprise before dinner or afterward? Well, Henrietta, looks like you're going to get it any minute now. <laughs> but there's an important phone call for you. Phone call? Oh, my goodness. Excuse me, please. I'll be right back. Uh, Hello? Who is this? Hello, guilty old chap. This is Hooker. Sorry I won't be able to make it tonight. If what? I got a hung jury that ought to be. If... (laughs) You've got to be here, Judge Hooker. You don't understand all the trouble I've gone to. There's surprises and everything. How soon can you get here? Maybe I can install things. Oh, don't count on me at all. What am I going to do about Henrietta? Uh, Miss Banks. Oh, you mean the new housekeeper? Housekeeper? Uh, just tell her she's hired. Hired? Yeah, I'll take a chance. What can I lose? Uh, but she isn't a housekeeper at all. Then tell her she's fired. Goodbye, get a sleep. Well, now I'm really in the soup. Oh, it's not fun. Is the surprise ready now? Uh, yes, Henrietta, but it's a different one altogether. I, I don't understand. Yeah, I didn't think you would. I asked Judge Hooker to come here this evening. I told the judge all about you, but he can't make it tonight. Oh, well, that's perfectly all right, Throckmorton. What? It is? Uh, surely. Oh, you don't know what a relief this is to me, Henrietta. Why, you impetuous boy. Don't you realize that even if the judge had come, we... We couldn't get married without a license. If if we? If the judge wasn't going to marry us, he was going to marry you. Uh, To whom? To himself. But I I don't know him at all. Oh, yes, you do. He's your unknown admirer. Oh, no, that's you. Oh, no, that's the judge. All right, then then bring him here and let's see. See? Oh, well, I can hardly do that for a little while yet. Oh, you're just like all other men. Uh, After leading me on, it turns out to be a joke. Yes. A cruel, heartless joke. And after I've told all my friends. Oh. Well, you haven't heard the last of this, Mr. Gildersleeve. There are courts and laws to protect innocent girls from men like you. Goodbye. Oh, why was I ever born? <laughs> I'm telling you, Judge, Leroy got it straight from the little Banks boy. His aunt has called in some lawyer named Taylor. Oh, he's a tough man, Miss Taylor. He'll take you straight to the cleaners. <laughs> that's what I'm afraid of. They've been going over those letters and poems that I sent Henrietta. Uh-oh, that's bad. Yes. If they ever read those poems in court, I'll never be able to hold up my head again in Summerfield. Well, it serves you right for trying to marry me off. Gildersleeve, you're a pretty stupid Cupid. If... <laughs> But I meant everything for the best, Judge. Oh, please, can't you help me? Why, yes, Gildersleeve, I'll be glad to help you. If you publish those poems, put me down for a copy. Uh, no, I'll see here, Hooker. That's the wrong attitude after I played John Alton to your Pocahontas. Uh, Gildersleeve, I'm going to get out of here before I get involved in this scandalous case. Goodbye. I'll be seeing you in the funny paper, Gildy. Uh, the old goat. There's gratitude for you. The next time I take pity on him, I hope somebody gives me a good swift kick in the telephone. <laughs> Hello? If who? Oh, uh, uh, Mr. Taylor. Uh, uh, if tomorrow, Mr. Taylor. If, if what time, Mr. Taylor? 
Uh, goodbye, Mr. Taylor. <laughs> oh, now my goose is frigazied. <laughs> uh, Bertie, Leroy. What is it, Uncle? Did you call Mr. Gildersleeve? Yes, more bad news. Henrietta Banks is sending her lawyer over to see me tomorrow afternoon. She's going to sue me for damages if I don't marry her. Oh, Jeff, you can only show her that you'd make a terrible husband. It's nonsense, Leroy. I'd make a wonderful husband. What am I saying? I'd be awful. <laughs> yeah, but how are you going to prove it without marrying her? Uh, huh? Wait a minute. I just had an idea. Yes, I think it'd work out. If I could only convince that lawyer of hers that I'm not worth marrying... But how? I know. Now listen, you two. When Mr. Taylor, the lawyer, shows up tomorrow, Bertie, you'll meet him at the door, and then you'll say to him... Come right in, mister. You can see Mr. Gillsleeve, but you got to promise to be quiet while you're in there, on account of he's a mighty sick man. Oh, sick? Must be something new. Oh, no, he gets this way off and on. Now, here we is, and remember, no getting him excited and no yelling at him. Oh, of, of course not. I brought you a visitor, the gentleman you was expecting. Oh, yes. How do you do, sir? You won't mind if my nephew just goes on feeding me my chicken broth, will you? No, not at all. Uh, maybe I'd better come some other day when you'll be feeling better. Hmm? Oh, sometimes I wonder if I'll ever feel better. No, no. No, no, don't say that, Unc. You still have a fighting chance. Yes, yeah. thank you, my boy. You're such a comfort. Even more chicken broth, please. Okay, Unc. Careful, it's hot. Yes, I'll be careful. Oh! <laughs> hey, that is hot, Leroy. Oh, uh, careful, Unc. Uh, careful? Oh, yes. Oh, the pain. <laughs> If no more soup, Leroy. Well, uh, what seems to be your trouble, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, I could tell you about my troubles all afternoon. But why bore you with an organ recital? <laughs> yes, sir. That man is in no shape to get married. And any lady who gets hitched up with him better be ready to dye her wedding veil black. No, no, Bertie, never say die. Uncle Mort still has a 50-50 chance. Is that so? Do you want to bet? Oh. <laughs> Do you want to finish dictating your will, Uncle? Uh, excuse me for interrupting, Mr. Gildersleeve, but uh, uh, what's wrong with you? Uh, my heart. Oh, high blood pressure? Alternating with low blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Rather unusual. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Yes, anything else. Unc has been given up by ten doctors, six hospitals, and a chiropractor. Yeah, so you can see, I'm, I'm really in no condition to take on new obligations. Well, I should think not. Yeah. I uh, don't see any reason for me to waste any time examining you. I'll just go back and report. Yeah. Oh, oh, excuse me. Uh, hand me the telephone, Leroy. Thanks. Hello? Hello, Gildersleeve. This is Judge Hooker. Say, heard the good news yet? It's all over the courthouse. Congratulations, you lucky stiff. Uh, I don't think I understand. Why, you know what's happened? Henrietta Banks has gone and eloped with her lawyer, George Taylor. Uh, what? Yeah, well, so long. Well, wow, this is wonderful. All my troubles are over. Now she can't sue me. Henrietta married her lawyer, folks. Say, if she... Then who are you, mister? Uh, me? Oh, I thought you knew. I'm the doctor from the insurance company. What? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry you couldn't make the grade, Mr. Gildersleeve. Goodbye. The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, I want to answer some questions. Several people have asked me lately questions like, what's parquet margarine made of? Is it good for you? How can it taste so deliciously good? Well, I'm glad to answer those questions because it will explain why parquet margarine is so different and better than old-time margarines. Why it's a downright delicious food that's nourishing and wholesome, too. You see, parquet is a modern vegetable margarine made by Kraft. And the pure, refined American vegetable oils that go into parquet help make it the highly nutritious energy food that it is. And to its wholesome goodness... Kraft adds important vitamin A to parquet margarine, 9,000 units to every pound. Now, about parquet margarine's delicious flavor, it's Kraft's long experience in making good-tasting foods that accounts for that. Yes, if you think all margarines are alike, 
Just taste parquet. That rich, delicate parquet flavor is making it a favorite everywhere for table use and for cooking, too. But why not find out about parquet margarine's goodness yourself? Yes, try a pound or two of economical parquet margarine tomorrow. Just ask for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, the delicious modern margarine made by Kraft, the makers of famous Miracle Whip salad dressing. you've been turned down, what are you going to do about insurance? Leroy, I'm going to spend that money for some victory insurance. What do you mean? I'm going to invest in defense bonds that'll pay off in ten years, just like an endowment policy. Well, and meanwhile, your dollars will be fighting for you and for Uncle Sam. That's right. It's a wonderful way of combining business and pleasure, isn't it? Good night, folks. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. <laughs> Now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve, who's at the Bundles for Blue Jackets Bazaar, preparing to do his bit by acting as the barker at the booth where the pretty girls are going to sell kisses. Well, well, so this is my booth, eh? Mm -hmm. You know, Marjorie, I think it's going to be fun selling kisses. This is the first time I've heard of it, Uncle Mort. Gee, who are you going to sell your kisses to? Yeah. Uncle Mort isn't going to do the kissing, Leroy. I thought I was wrong about that. Yeah. Yeah. There are going to be a dozen beautiful young ladies to do the work, Leroy. Uh, incidentally, Margie, to be a good salesman, a fellow should know about what he's talking about, you know. <laughs> now, don't you think there's a... No, I guess free samples are out. <laughs> yeah. Gee, why spend a buck for a wet smack when you can get just as daffy on a dime's worth of taffy? Yeah. <laughs> you know, Uncle Mort, that wasn't a bad idea of Leroy, about you kissing any of the ladies. We could charge a dollar apiece. Uh, no, my dear. Why not, Uncle? Because I'd pay a dollar myself not to kiss the type of woman who would pay a dollar to kiss me. <laughs> oh, Miss Marge, I got your lemonade stand all fixed up for you. But if we get the big crowd, I don't think three lemons is going to be enough. Well, you better get some more, Bertie. They're going to open the doors in about an hour, and we're expecting a lot of people. Oh, yes. All the gentlemen in town want to patronize Mr. Gillsleeve's osculation station. <laughs> yeah, they do, huh? <laughs> yes, sir. They'll be buzzing around that kiss booth till them poor girls is all puckered out. Yes. <laughs> and all the ladies gonna line up at that yogi man's tent to have their fortunes told. Oh, you mean Yogi Swamahandra? Oh, Penny Banks met him in New York and he's marvelous. We're counting on him as our main attraction. Oh, there's Penny. Oh, Penny! Oh, yeah. Okay, stop now, Marge. I just had the most terrible news. I don't know what to do. Yogi Swamahandra's missed his plane connections and won't be here in time. A fine fortune teller. Why didn't he look in his crystal ball, see that he was going to miss the plane, and then see that he didn't? <laughs> well, we've depended on the yogi as our big money maker. Well, why don't you get a substitute? Uh, Leroy, do you think that yogis grow on bushes? I don't know. What is a yogi? Uh, a yogi is a man who tells you about your past and future for a present. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Penny, isn't there any other one floating around who can pinch hit for this man? No, well, I don't know of any. Well, why don't you get somebody to dress up and play the part? Well, Mr. Gildersleeve, that would be deceiving the people. What do you think those fortune tellers do? When they look in a crystal ball, they don't see any newsreel, you know. Sure, all you need is 
is a smooth talker with a gift of gab, like Uncle Mort here. Yes. No, wait a minute, young man. Yes, Uncle, if you wore a costume and makeup and a beard. People would still recognize me. No, you could get away with it. It's dark in that tent. But I wouldn't know what to say. Well, we could help you by giving you the lowdown on the customers. Lowdown? But suppose they got the lowdown on me. Oh, they wouldn't if you changed your voice. Uh, oh, say yes, Uncle Mort. Oh, what am I getting myself into? I'm no fortune teller. And something tells me that instead of being in front of a crystal ball, I'm going to find myself behind an eight ball. Well, what are we stopping here for, Unc? The costume place is three blocks down the street. I know, Leroy, but read the sign. Oh. Have your past, present, and future revealed by famous gypsy physique. Yes. That's psychic, Leroy. Oh. Uh, yes. Madame Rosalie, the gypsy who reveals all. Gee, Gypsy Rosalie. I've heard of her. Uh, <laughs> Leroy, that's another one. Uh, I thought maybe I could pick up a few pointers on how to go about this fortune-telling business from this woman here. Okay, let's go in. No, Leroy, you'll have to wait here. I'll be right back. <laughs> You have come to consult Madame Rosalie, the great seeress who sees everything, knows everything, and tells everybody. Yes. Why, yes, that is, if she isn't busy. I shall look in the crystal ball and see. No, I am not. Oh, uh, I see. It's you. Uh, you're free. Uh. No, it will be necessary to cross my palm with silver. Oh, yes, of course. How much? One dollar for three questions. A past, a present, and a future. All right, let me see. Give it here quick. Yes, don't grab, lady. Thank you. <laughs> now sit down and look deep into crystal balls. All right, I'm looking. It, what next? Alla canta umo holo cadorazzi. Excuse me, would you mind repeating that? Alla canta umo holo cadorazzi. That's what I thought you said. <laughs> I'll have to remember that. It, it, what does it mean? I am calling on the spirit of my forefathers. Yeah, they must have been tobacco auctioneers then. <laughs> well, go right ahead, madam. First for the past. I see not long ago trouble. Yes. There was smoke, a dark cloud behind you. Oh, yes, Bertie burned the toast at breakfast. Yeah, very good. <laughs> Madame Rosalie, she never failed. Uh... And now for the present. Mm-hmm. You get into trouble because of man. Uh, what kind of a man? He is dark. Also heavy. Uh, does he have a black mustache? Sure, with black mustache. He gets you in trouble. You know him? Yeah, that's me. I'm my own worst enemy. <laughs> now, what about the future? Soon you will have loss, if not careful. Loss. Crystal balls say honey, terra, wagli, dura, blasto, mix, or blasto, plomene. Uh, what does that mean? Watch out. Uh, well, thank you very much. Is that all? Yes. Unless you wish to ask the $2 question. Oh, uh, I don't think I'll have the time. Let me see how late it is. Uh, by George, what did I do with my watch? I had it. For I... the time, she is now. No, see here, madam. Where's my watch? How should I be knowing? I thought you knew everything. I do not bother with trifles. This wasn't a trifle. It was an eighty-dollar watch. Sir, are you accusing me? Yes. Either I get my watch back, or say, I'll bet you put it in that drawer. No, no, you keep out of there. Is that so? I'm going to have a look. You stop that. It's none your business. Well, well, what's this, madam? You've got enough watches here to start a hot shop. Oh. If, and here's mine. Well, thank you. I guess I'll go now. You, you hessni malokrando seba baninga trumi todo at new dali. What does that mean? No, no, don't answer that. <laughs> so long, madam, and don't take any wooden watches. Not to you, Joe. <laughs> well, a debutante. <laughs> oh, well. Hey, hey, come on, Leroy. Uh, did you learn anything, Uncle Mort? I'll say I did. When a gypsy says watch out, she means you're going to be out of watch. <laughs> What do you mean, Uncle? Well, you see this gold timepiece of mine? Yeah. Well, that gypsy tried to... Oh, my goodness, Leroy, this isn't my timepiece at all. Oh, well, wait a minute, Uncle Mort. Where are you going? I'm going back to get my watch from that gypsy woman. But she hasn't got it, Uncle. What do you mean? How do you know? You laid it down on the dining room table at lunchtime and left home without it. Oh, this is a fine mess. <laughs> I mean, Maharaja. 
Raja. The bazaar is in full blast. Hey, not so fast, Leroy. Is everything all right with my costume? If How about the turban? Your laundry mark's showing. Yeah, well... There, that's better. Oh, thanks. How about this beard? Gee, your best friends won't tell you. From a Hindu, I mean. Yeah. Shh. There's Penny and Marjorie and Bertie. Let's see if we can fool them, huh? You pretend I'm the real yogi. All right. Uh, hey, Penny, uh, this gentleman was outside and said he wanted to see you. Uh, this is Miss Banks, Mr. Yogi. Uh, greetings, Mim Sahib. A thousand pardons if I'm late. Oh, Uncle Mort, you look cute. Yeah, what's the <laughs> I'll never get away with this. Oh, yes, you can, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, sure, Uncle. You look just like you stepped out of Kipling. Doesn't he, Bertie? That's right. I'm afraid he's been Kipling all his life. <laughs> People are waiting there at the fortune store, Mr. Gildersleeve. Now, here's what we'll do. Marge, you sell tickets. Okay. And, Bertie, you and I'll spot the customers and tell Leroy their names and all about them. Yes, ma'am. I'm the old to low down on the high ups. Yes. And then, Leroy, you go around to the back of the tent. There's a hole there, and you whisper the information to your uncle. Well, how will I know when Leroy is there? Uh, suppose I knock three times. Yeah, on a canvas tent? That's like knocking on a wet sponge. <laughs> how about whistling something? Huh? That's a good idea. What do I whistle? How about something boogie-woogie? Yes. No, Bertie, spare me the hot licks. <clears throat> Why not something Indian? Oh, like by the waters of the Minnetonka? No, Marjorie, East Indian, like, uh... The pale hands I love beside the Shalimar. Wouldn't you rather hear deep in the heart of Texas? <laughs> no, Leroy. Pale hands, not clap hands. Uh, that should be easy to remember. Just look at your hands. Oh, just look at your hands. What's wrong with them, Mark? You better wash them. They're not pale enough. People are waiting, Mr. Gildersleeve. You better go in the tent and get started. Wait a minute, girls. I'm getting cold feet. Well, just fold them up underneath you and sit on them, Uncle. Uh, now, in you go. Hurry all up. right, if you insist. Careful there, Stoop. Leroy, what did you call me? Uh, Stoop, Uncle, you'll knock your turban off. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes, of course. I thought you... Well, never mind what I thought you, you said. Just com get comfortable in there, Uncle Morton. We'll start sending in the victims. All right, whenever you're ready, just shoot the gulls to me, gals. <laughs> uh, now, let me see. How do you do this, Mahatma Gildersleeve? Oh, they must be ready to start. Where is that hole in the canvas? Ah, uh, yeah, this must be it. Is that you, Leroy? It ain't Carmen Lombardo. <laughs> get set now, won't you? I'm about to tell you a first fortune. Believe me, I'd give a fortune to get out of here. Who is it? It's some man that none of us knows. Oh, this is going to be one of my bad days. <laughs> Can't you stall him off? They tried, but no soap. So you got to take him first. Well, I'll do my best. Uh, how do I look? Your laundry mark is showing again. If... Get back there. Here he comes. I wish I had a mirror in here. Uh, greetings and salutations, Saib. Hello. Uh, you have come to consult Yogi Swamahandra, the king of the Hindu mystics, no? No. Oh, you didn't? <laughs> you didn't? Oh, well, then, then why did you come here? To ask you about Alice Higgins and Mrs. Belmont of and Marie King. Uh, what about them, Saib? <laughs> As if you didn't know. As if I do. <laughs> come, come, sorry. If you care to gaze in the crystal ball, maybe I can locate these people. They sent me to locate you, Andrews. Uh, Andrews? Uh, you are making some mistake. Yes, I, I am the Yogi Swamahandra. Sure, sure, I know that. Yogi Swamahandra. Alias William Andrews, alias Walter Bunker, alias Louis the Frost, alias Pete Brown. If who, me? Yes. And Detective Lieutenant Quinn from Chicago, where you're wanted for jumping bail on bunco charges. If what? You're also wanted in Idaho for obtaining money under false pretenses, in Baton Rouge for running a confidence game, and in Florida for selling rubber plants guaranteed to grow white sidewall tires. <laughs> We'll hear from the Greg Gildersleeve again in just a moment. Meantime, you mothers and wives of hearty eaters, does the way your food budget is going up ever get you down? If so, have you ever thought of serving parquet margarine made by Kraft? Because using parquet margarine is one sure way to economize and please your family, too. You see, parquet margarine is different from the margarines you may have tried a few years back. Parquet is the delicious, wholesome margarine that's made by Kraft. And like all the famous Kraft foods, it's mighty good tasting. But there's no need to take my word for it. Parquet costs so little, why not buy a pound tomorrow and try parquet yourself? I'll bet you agree parquet's delicate appetizing flavor is pretty hard to beat. Then, too, parquet margarine is a nourishing, wholesome food. It's one of the best energy foods you can serve. And to make it even better for you, 
Kraft adds vitamin A to parquet margarine, 9,000 units to every pound. So give the food budget a break. Order delicious parquet margarine tomorrow. Yes, ask your dealer for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet, the delicious margarine made by Kraft. Now back to the great Gildersleeve, who suddenly found himself a much-wanted man by the police of half a dozen cities. Now, that isn't oh, fair. You do do it for Just a second. Just a second. Hold it. Hold it. Quiet, please. Yes, quietly, Roy. I don't care what you people say. I came here to grab the yoga, and he's going back to face trial. But officer, you're making a mistake. This is my uncle, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yes, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Boy, that's a phony alias if I ever heard one. <laughs> See, you can see he isn't a yogi. Uh, take your beard off again, Uncle. Yeah. Never mind, never mind. I know he's a fake yogi. His real name is Willie Andrews, and he's known as Willie the Tub. Yep. I am not a tub. It's just the way this coat buttons. <laughs> yeah, I knew that when I started to fool folks, I'd get into trouble. My mama done told me. But, but Lieutenant Quinn, if you're taken away now, bundles of blue jackets will lose a lot of money. Why don't you wait till we close down tonight? Well, okay, miss, okay. I'll let this grafter operate for the balance of the show, but I'll be on guard right outside the tent. Is that understood? Well, yes, uh, excuse me. Do you mind if I go home? I'm expecting a bad headache. Now, you, you stay right here, Uncle Moore. Uh, don't worry. We're going to get this all straightened out before the bazaar closes, Mr. Gildersleeve. Come on, let's let the yogi get to work. Come on, Lieutenant. Come on, Marjorie. Leroy. Okay, I'm coming. Uh, take it easy, Uncle Mort. Remember, keep a stiff upper turban. If. <laughs> How can I? I've been in hot water ever since I put on this Turkish towel. Well, we'll get you out of this, Uncle, if it takes us years. Yeah, and it looks like it will, too. Remember, Willie, no tricks now. Yeah. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> yes, Leroy. Who is it this time? The district attorney? You're getting warm, Unc. It's your old pal, Judge Hooker. What? Oh, well, that old crab wants his fortune told. <laughs> uh, this is the first pleasant thing that's happened to me all day. All right, Leroy, go on, go on, go on. This way you come to have your hand read? Uh, no, Saeed. The yogi, he does not work by the hand. He's the crystal ball player. <laughs> uh, please to take a seat down, Judge. Uh, judge? Say, how do you know I'm a judge? You are speaking to Yogi Swamahandra, queen of the Hindu mystics. <laughs> a great soothsayer who sees all, knows all, and tells a little. Well, that was certainly good, guessing my profession. It's not necessary for me to guess, Judge Hooker. What? I know. Now it will be necessary to cross my palm with silver. But I paid my dollar outside. I have no contact with the outside. <laughs> That is separate business. The, the silver, please, in form of a $5 bill. I will not. No, sir, I will not. How about that $5 bill you won at poker last night? Say, how did you know that? Shh, don't worry. I shall not tell a soul you were supposed to draw one card and you picked up two. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thank you very much, Saeed. Now look deep into the crystal ball. Hello, Kantu Mula Hola Hey, 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 what are you doing? I am calling on the spirit of my forefathers. But if you're going to tell my fortune, why don't you call on my forefathers? Because, Sahib, I cannot bark. <laughs> What's that? Wait, silence, please. I am gazing into your past. It is mighty murky. Well, what do you see? I see you have a friend. A dark man with mustache. Is he a fat fellow? No, not fat. Maybe a little plump. <laughs> but on him, he's look good. Yeah. He's handsome dog, no? I wouldn't call him handsome, but he's a dog, all right. <laughs> Enough. You are always abusing this friend fella, giving him the hot foot in his soul. Yeah, that is bad. For you, I mean. You think so? Yes. A we. A da. <laughs> he said in my native tongue, Is that so? Uh, Say, what does it mean? It means be good to Gildersleeves or he give you coughing around. That's what. Uh, 
Say, you're a whiz. I'd like to put you to one last test, though. Yeah. Now, this is a hard one. What's this friend's first name? I know it as well as I know my own. <laughs> He's a Throckmorton P. That's absolutely right. Mm. Say, Yogi, uh, elections are coming up pretty soon. Can you tell me if I'm going to win again? It, let me look in the crystal ball. Yes. Yeah. He, da, I can see the day of election. You can? Yeah, lots of voters, in and out, all day long. Yes, yes, yes. Now it is late, twilight. They close the polls. I see, and then? They are counting the votes. Yes, yes, go on. It's getting dark. They are adding up totals. I see. Well, what is it? I think I see it. Uh, no, I can't. What's wrong? What's the trouble? It's so dark I cannot read the results. Oh. <laughs> hey, Uncle. If Leroy, stop yelling, Uncle. Hi, right, George, I'm ready to yell Uncle myself. I've told about more fortunes this afternoon than Dunn and Bradstreet. Oh, cheer up, Uncle Mort. The next one is the last before dinner. Well, all right. Who is it now? Mrs. Salisbury Twitchell. You, that mildewed old scorpion. <laughs> yeah, you know all about her. I've been a duck now. Yeah, I hope I can hold out. Uh, madam, uh, Yogi Swamahandra welcomes you. Uh... Hello. First of all, Mr. Swami, or Yogi, or whatever you are, I want you to know that I don't believe in any of this nonsense. Why, of course not, Mrs. Salisbury Twitchell. Oh, you know my name. Who told you? I am Yogi Swamahandra. I know everything. Well, I wager that you don't know everything. What was my maiden name? Excuse me, I got to look in the crystal ball. With this ball, I can even look that far back. <laughs> Got it. Madam, before you were married, your name used to be McGillum Cuddy. Uh, babe McGillum Cuddy. Uh, uh, all right, uh, that's enough. You don't need to go on. Your father, she had farm, raised turnips. Oh, now that's where you're wrong. They were beets. Excuse, please. But beets look like turnips because this is not technicolor crystal ball. <laughs> I see many interesting things in your past, madam. Shall I tell you? Oh, uh, no, no. Uh, you know them, and so do I, so why bother? Ah, uh, you have led a very interesting life, madam. <laughs> <laughs> Would make wonderful movie. Uh, do you uh, think so, Joe? Sure. With title, How Green Was My Mr. Twitchell? <laughs> Uh, tell me, madam, you still do not believe in my powers? Uh, no, I've, uh, I've changed my mind. You're positively uncanny. Uh, now, sir, I have a number of problems and I need your advice. Uh, suppose I tell you all about them. Uh, some other time, Mrs. Twitchell. Now I got to go eat dinner. Uh, oh, of course. Uh, why don't you come out to my house? What? Oh, no, I got to relax. And besides, uh, I've already promised Miss Forrester I got to have dinner at her house. Oh, but I must talk to you some more. Uh, I know what. Oh, Marjorie. Uh, what'd you do? Did anyone call me? Uh, yes, my dear. I've become so fascinated with the yogi that I've insisted on his coming to dinner at my place. Uh, you must come, too, and bring your little brother and that uncle of yours, Mr. Gildersleeve. If not him, not Gildersleeve. If he comes along, I'll not be there. Oh, <laughs> I'm getting to like you more every minute. Yes. Uh, very well. Uh, let's get out of this tent. Uh, my car is at the curb. Looks like we're stuck, Uncle. Shh. I've got reading out of my hand, Marjorie. I'm coming, Mrs. Twitchell. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Where do you think you're going? Shh. I'm going out to dinner. Not without me, you ain't. Oh, Yogi. Who is this uh, gentleman? Uh, who? Oh, this. Uh, this is Mr. Quinn. He's, uh, he's trying to get me to do some work for the state. <laughs> <laughs> You, you might as well invite him to dinner, too, because he's going to come along anyway. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, uh, now, Yogi, uh, tell me something about India. Uh, India? Sure, Yogi, go ahead. You're an old Indian faker. Uh, I am Indian fake here. Well, there's no difference between the two, is there? Oh, no more than between a flat foot and a flat head. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, that's a hot one, Uncle Moore. 
Yes, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, that's a hot one, uh, Uncle Mort would have said. Uh, Leroy, finish your spinach. Oh, gee, I bet they don't eat spinach in India, do they, Yogi? Uh, da, where I come from, they stuff children with spinach so they can't talk at dinner time. <laughs> oh, uh, that reminds me I've been meaning to ask. Uh, what part of India did you come from, Yogi? Eh, uh, all of me. <laughs> no, no. I mean, where were you born? Oh, born. Now I grab you. Where was I born? Uh, in my papa's house. Uh, my mama done told me. <laughs> well, I think it's time for me to return to the bazaar. Let me see. And uh, he's already 15 minutes coming to 8 o'clock. Oh, what a beautiful gold watch. Uh, Where did you get it, Yogi? Uh, it was given to me by Gypsy's woman. She thought I was a fellow named Joe. Uh, I must remember to mail it back to her. Excuse me, Yogi. Uh, yes? Your beard is coming off. Oh, my goodness. How's that? Oh, it's crooked. It points off to the left. Oh, how's it now? Any better? Yeah, but we better get out of here before it falls into your finger bowl. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mrs. Twitchell, but now I must make the grand scrap. Yes, and after he finishes tonight, we've got to go on a little trip, don't we, Yogi? Oh, well, aren't you staying in town for a few days? No, no, we have a little legal business to attend to in Chicago. Yes. Why? Well, that's too bad. Madame Twitchell, you said a mouseful. Well, take good care of the Yogi on the trip. Oh, sure. I won't let him out of my sight. In fact, I'm going to simply attach myself to him. Oh, holy catfish. Uh, uh, what did you say, Yogi? Uh, uh, nothing, nothing, madam. I was only praying to the holy catfish of the Ganges River. Uh, uh, goodbye, Mrs. Twitchell. Come on, everybody. <laughs> This is over pretty soon. I'm plenty tired of tenting tonight on the old campground. If... Is that you, Leroy? No, sir, this is Bird. If... What are you doing whistling pale hands? Where's Leroy? It's late. He's gone home, and I'm on the swing ship. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, who's next, Birdie? There's a big gentleman with a dull red gleam in his eyes. Huh? Have y'all been telling some wife or husband's a philanthropist? Bertie, I've told so many different people so many different stories. I don't know what I said. I better get out of here. Bertie, you go out and stall him a little while, huh? Okay, but he ain't the type of stall good. Oh, now if I can crawl under the back of this tent and sneak out before that nosy detective from Chicago discovers it. Oh, hello, Lieutenant Quinn. <laughs> what are you doing here? Get back in there, Tubby, before I take you to Chicago in a box. Yes, so I, I was only after a breath of fresh air. You don't have to crawl out on your hands and knees after it. I'll get back in there, Willie. All right, and stop calling me Willie. Oh, man. Excuse me, but are you the man who calls himself Yogi Swamahandra? It uh, Have you got an appointment? No, I haven't. Then I can't read your fortune. Okay, then I will read yours. If... Take a good look in the crystal ball, Yogi. What do you see? Um, I see nothing. Well, I see something. I can see you tomorrow morning. You are waking up in a hospital bed. If... if... What? Your jaw is fractured. Both of your eyes are black. Your nose is in splints. And your ribs are barbecued. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. What are you talking about? And my predictions come true, my friend, and I'll make sure. Now, wait a minute. Who are you? I just got into town on a late plane, and I find my reputation is ruined. And you've done it, you faker. I am the real Yogi Swamahandra. Oh, you are. Well, I'm certainly glad to meet you. No, you won't be. I'm going to give you a face a retread job. No, you don't. You keep away from me. Oh, Mr. Quinn. Oh, Mr. Quinn. Hey, what's the idea? Now, what are you up to? Hey, grab that man. There's your real yogi. Yeah. Do your duty, officer. Hey, come back here and fight. Uh, nuts for you, Joseph. <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But first, are those Lenten meals becoming a problem to you homemakers? I mean, are you finding it hard to make them as tasty and appetizing as your regular meals? Well, if you do, here's a hint that may be mighty helpful. 
Yes, it's this. You can add rich extra flavor to all kinds of dishes by using plenty of parquet margarine made by Kraft. You see, the delicate, tempting flavor that makes parquet margarine a favorite spread for bread makes it grand for cooking, too. Parquet margarine is swell melted over hot vegetables. It's a real flavor shortening that adds delicate extra flavor to cookies and cakes and pie crust. Parquet makes pan-fried food tastier because it tastes so good itself. In fact, parquet margarine adds extra flavor to all kinds of dishes and the extra zest that makes your family ask for more. Best of all, using lots of parquet margarine is no extravagance. When you find how little it costs, you'll certainly agree to that. And remember, parquet margarine is a highly nutritious energy food that's a reliable year-round food source of important vitamin A. So right now, put delicious parquet margarine at the top of tomorrow's shopping list. Remember, it's parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet, the margarine that's made by Kraft. And there we were, Judge, me and Willie the Tub locked in mortal combat. But I subdued him by sheer brute strength. Well, seeing what you've done, I guess I'll have to forgive you for tricking me, Gildersleeve. Say, I just remembered. What did you do with my five bucks? Oh, that. <laughs> I did the best thing possible with a judge. I've given it to the American Red Cross. Oh. I hope everyone who's listening in will find an extra five spot to turn over to the Red Cross this week, like I did. Huh? It's like you did, Judge. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Gildersleeve has come to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.